Honourable Senators, the President. <coughs> Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this Parliament and that thy wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri's people who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area and pay respects to the elders past and present of all Australia's Indigenous people. <coughs> Are there any documents to be tabled by the clerk? Mr. President, I table documents pursuant to statute and returns to order as listed on the dynamic red. Are there any proposals for committees to meet during the sittings of the Senate? I call the clerk. And committees have lodged proposals as shown at item four of today's order of business. I remind senators that the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator, and I call the clerk. Government business order of the day number one, Climate Change Bill 2022 and a related bill, resumption of second reading debate. Yep. Senator Hanson Young. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy President. This bill is an important step forward because it acknowledges that we need to cut carbon pollution in order to put our climate on a safe footing, but it goes nowhere near enough. We know that we can't keep opening up new coal and gas, putting more pollution into the atmosphere if we are to stop dangerous runaway climate change. And yet here uh, today we see an example of an expansion of a coal mine in New South Wales on the table before the Environment Minister, waiting for her green light. I call on the Minister today, if you are serious about reducing pollution, if you are serious about stopping climate change, if you are serious about protecting our environment, you will reject this coal mine application. But of course, Mr Deputy President, the problem we have here is that our environment laws as they stand don't even require the minister to consider the climate damage of a big project like the expansion of the largest coal mine in several years. In fact, if this coal mine is approved, it will be the largest coal mine opened since Australia signed the Paris Agreement. It will be a huge step backwards. It will make it harder for us to cut pollution. It will make it harder for us to stop the droughts, the floods and the deathly bushfires. It will make it harder for our children to know and believe and trust that their future will be one with a safe climate. We need to fix our environment laws. We need to ensure that all approvals for these big projects, coal, gas, are assessed for their climate damage, and we need a climate trigger in our environment laws to do that. So while this bill is an important step forward to acknowledging that our task now is to cut pollution. We need the tools in the toolbox to do it. We need the action to follow. This bill won't deliver the action, but it does deliver the promise. So the government now must step up, meet this promise, accept 
that coal and gas is not the way of the future. We need an investment in renewable energy. We need an investment in biodiversity, and we need to start protecting the future of the next generation. You can't be serious about tackling climate change if you keep green lighting new coal and gas. Our global partners understand this. The International Energy Agency understands this. The UN and comparable countries understand this. Even the Pope <laughs> gets it. You can't be serious about tackling climate change and cutting pollution if you keep making the situation worse by allowing the development of new coal and gas. And I know, it's a I know it is a struggle for the Labor government. I know they've got members within their own ranks who don't see it like this. But sometimes politics requires pragmatism. Often politics requires leadership. Always politics requires courage. And here today there is a challenge before the Environment Minister herself. If you're serious about tackling climate change, if you're serious about the impact of this bill making one iota of a difference, you will block the expansion of the coal mine before you in New South Wales at Mount Pleasant and send a real signal to the market and to the people of Australia that you are serious about reducing pollution and stopping climate change. Senator Green. Thank you so much. And it is a real pleasure to rise to speak on this bill today, an incredibly important bill. I want to contribute to the debate on this bill in my role as a senator based in regional Queensland because this bill is important for regional Australians. I rise to speak on this bill in my role as special envoy for the Great Barrier Reef because this bill is important for the protection of the Great Barrier Reef. And I rise to speak on this bill as a senator who has a very special relationship with the traditional owners of the Torres Strait because this bill is important for first Australians. Today, during this debate, we will hear views from across this chamber. Some, those opposite, will say that this bill is unnecessary and they don't support it, and others will say that this bill doesn't do enough. Well, both sides of that debate want to continue the climate wars. But as a member of this government, I am proud to speak on this bill, to support it and to call for an end to the climate wars today. So proud to be part of a government that has listened and is acting. After almost a decade of denial and delay and infighting from the former Liberal National Government, finally we have a Labor government and finally we are seeing real action on climate change. I am proud to be part of a government advancing this bill and I'm proud to be a senator that lives in regional Australia who is supporting this bill. Because the truth is, if you support regional Australia, then you would support this climate change bill. Regional Australians have the most to gain by this bill being passed, and they have the most to lose if it fails. Regional Australians want to see an end to the climate wars. Now, I concede they do not want convoys rolling into their towns and telling them how to think, but they also don't support a government that puts its head in the sand and tells them that nothing needs to change. This bill will create jobs in regional Australia. This bill will save jobs in regional Australia. This bill will create new industries in regional Australia. And this bill will reduce the cost of living because it will invest in cleaner and cheaper energy by signalling that that is what this government intends to do. This bill will ensure that regional Australians make the most of the opportunities that the action on climate change creates. This bill provides certainty for regional Australians. And this bill is welcomed 
by business and industry because it sets the pathway forward after 10 years of delays. This bill acknowledges that our farmers are on the front line of climate change and have been calling for a coherent climate policy for years. Regional Australians that live on and live off the land support this bill. This bill acknowledges that our First Nations Australians will be the first Australians impacted by climate change. Those regional Australians living in the most remote parts of Australia in the Torres Strait welcome this step forward. They welcome this bill because as custodians of the land and the sea country, they are already witnessing the impact of climate change to their homelands. I know that that is uncomfortable for those opposite to understand, but the Torres Strait and those First Nations communities are part of regional Australia too. And finally, this bill takes the necessary steps to protect one of the biggest economic assets in regional Australia, the Great Barrier Reef. And as special envoy for the Great Barrier Reef and far north Queenslander, this is especially important to me and the communities that I serve. The reef is not only a beautiful natural wonder, it is an economic powerhouse. The reef contributes more than $6.4 billion each year to the Australian economy and supports around 64,000 full-time jobs. And yes, the reef is resilient. And we have seen from recent reports that the reef is being managed very well. It is a wonderful place to visit and attracts tourism from around the world. But the greatest threat remains, as those reports indicate, that the Great Barrier Reef, the greatest threat to it and the jobs that, it relies, that rely on it, remains to be climate change. Climate change continues to be the greatest threat to the economic powerhouse that is the Great Barrier Reef. And let's be really clear on this. Let's be very clear. The former Liberal National Government dangerously threatened the Great Barrier Reef both in real terms and reputationally across the globe. They threatened the Great Barrier Reef by failing to take action on climate change and in doing so threatened the reputation of the reef by placing the reef at risk of an in danger listing. That type of recklessness stops today. The Albanese Labor government is getting on with the job. We've heard the message and we are delivering today because we know that this vital step is not just about how our nation stands on the world stage, but for the jobs and the stability that comes from this bill. Despite what others in this chamber might claim, it is time to end the climate wars, and it's time to support this bill. Now, in regards to the bill more broadly, it is important to be clear about what this bill will achieve, because after a decade of denial and delay on climate, and chaos on renewable energy and energy more broadly, Labor's climate change bill will give certainty so desperately needed for businesses, industry, energy investors and the wider community. With a 2030 target of 43 per cent, this bill will put Australia on track for net zero by 2050. It's not just symbolic, and our targets are a floor, not a ceiling. The kind of certainty is important to ensuring Australia reaps the economic benefits of the energy transformation already underway in the rest of the world. We are legislating 2030 and 2050 net zero targets because it is best practice to do so. This bill also will restore transparency and accountability in government action on climate change and confirms the important role of independent expert advice. The minister will be required to report annually to parliament on Australia's progress towards meeting our targets set in the bill, and this will keep the government accountable for the actions it is taking to reduce emissions. No longer will the national government in this country be able to put their head in the sand or wish to do so, because we are including transparency and accountability measures in this bill to be upfront with the Australian public about where we stand. 
it, the, this report will include to the Australian people progress being made towards international developments on climate, climate change policy and the effectiveness of the Commonwealth climate change policies in contributing to the achievement of targets. Now, our government is showing the rest of this parliament the way forward. It's an opportunity for the parliament to come together and chart a new path. How we can lower emissions, hit targets and keep and create good jobs in the process. We're doing this practically to ensure stability and certainty for Australians and Australian businesses. By listening to the science, by acting on climate change, we can create new jobs, and we intend to. We can enter a new era of Australian manufacturing, and we can make things right here. Our future energy needs, batteries, wind turbines, new technology, these are things that we should make here, right here in Australia. It should be made in regional Australia, and Australians will do that work very proudly. They will be able to build their lives on those good, secure jobs, and I'm so proud of this because I'm so proud of this government. I'm proud to be the special envoy for the Great Barrier Reef. I'm proud that one day, when my daughter is old enough to understand, I can tell her that I was part of a government that made this change. My daughter's backyard is the Great Barrier Reef. It's full of life and it is beautiful because we, because we know that it is important to stand up today and say enough is enough. This government was one that ensured she and the Great Barrier Reef had a future. And I really want to thank those in this place who have been part of this constructive process. Because for our government, this legislation is so important. There's a reason it was one of the first pieces of legislation we introduce. We want Australians and the rest of the world to know that we mean business. We will be the government that shapes the future for the better. We will be the government that delivers action on climate change. The former government continued to put their head in the sand and tell regional Australians that nothing needed to change. Well, regional Australians want action on climate change. They want the climate, change, climate wars to end. They want to see jobs, cleaner energy, cheaper energy, and they want to protect the Great Barrier Reef. So I implore senators to support this bill today. Senator Canavan. Thank you very much, uh, um, uh, Mr Deputy President. Uh, uh, this bill uh, is totally out of step with the rest of the world. It will do nothing uh, to help the global environment. Uh, it will only increase uh, living cost pressures for Australians. It will cost us jobs uh, in this country, and it will continue the total scam that is carbon trading around the world. I want to start today with a, with a conversation that I had recently with a mayor in Western Queensland, the uh, mayor of the Paru Shire, which uh, uh, surrounds the great country town of Kunnamulla in Western Queensland. There at the moment, uh, thanks to the scam that is carbon trading, 40 per cent of properties in the Paru Shire have been destocked. Cattle are taken off their land for the purposes of creating this ridiculous paper of carbon credits. It does nothing for the planet. Nothing for the planet. The farmers are happy. The farmers they make money. The investment banks come up from Sydney and buy the properties. Uh, they can go retire if they like on the coast. They get paid. But it's the it's the it's the tyre mechanics. It's the cafe owners. It's the hotel owners in the towns like Kunnamulla that pay the bill. Because when you get rid of all that cattle around Kunnamulla, Kunnamulla is only a small town. But when you get rid of all the cattle. There are no fencing contractors coming to town anymore. Uh, there are no stock camps coming in at the end of their muster to have a drink. And all of that business is lost from Kunnamulla. And what happens with this? What do we do? What do we get from have destocking 40 per cent of the properties in Kunnamulla? The mayor was telling me there's, you go down a road there at the moment, there's 12 pastoral properties on this road, big properties, big road. Nine of them are totally destocked. Just three of the 12 now with cattle on it. This is the front lines of the climate battle that doesn't get reported on down here. And the victims of this are the small country businesses uh, that are told your, your way of life, your lifestyle is no more, and it doesn't do anything for the environment. It doesn't do anything. You know what happens to these properties when the cattle go? Weeds come in, pests come in, pigs come in. Come and have a look sometime. Come and have a look sometime. It's a total dis environmental disaster because there's no one left to manage it. These investment banks in Sydney. They don't come and manage the property. They don't come and get, take out the pigs. They don't come and manage the weeds. You know what they're doing? They're collecting their checks on the carbon credits. They're clipping that bill and making a lot of money, a lot of bonuses off this scam that is carbon credits. 
Uh, and you've got to look at any of this sort of legislation. You've always got to look when things go through this place and we debate this thing. You've got to ask that question in the Latin phrase, cu, cu, cu bono. Who benefits, right? Who benefits from this legislation? It's not going to be the environment. It's not going to be the Great Barrier Reef. Great Barrier is doing fine. Coral was at a record level. It is going to be the bankers who run these scams of carbon credits and carbon trading schemes. That's why the banks all support it. That's why the banks love this. They're all in favour of all this because it's another line of business to get them more bonuses, to buy that other house, to extend a, uh, the butler's pantry in the kitchen. That's why they want this legislation. It doesn't do anything for the environment. And we're out of step with the world now. We're totally out of step with the world. I hear this. These conversations about how the world is, is uh, here in this building, the world is, is waiting on bated breath uh, for our parliament to, uh, to put in this 43 per cent target ahead of a European winter. Is anyone watching the news? Does anyone turn on a TV in this place at the moment? The German Greens Party, the Greens Party in Germany, has reopened 21 coal-fired power stations this year. 21. They're in government. The Greens Party in Germany are in government with. Uh, with the, the Socialist Party and I think a libertarian type party. And, uh, and, and they have been responsible. It's the energy minister there, Mr. Habeck, is a, is a Greens Party politician. He has been responsible for reopening 21 coal fired power stations. We've only got 19 in Australia. <laughs> They're opening more coal fired power stations in Germany than we have. And we have. <laughs> That's right. I'll take the next senator. Antic. He's a hero. He's a hero. This Greens minister. He's trying to provide energy to his people. That's what he's prioritising. Just as just as the new prime minister in the United Kingdom, Liz Truss, is doing when she says she's looking to overturn the ban on fracking in the UK. That's happening in the UK. If you turn on the news at the moment, that's what's happening in the world. If you turn on the news at the moment, China, China has announced plans to expand its coal mining by 300 million tonnes a year. India are looking at boosting their coal mining by 400 million tonnes a year. We only produce about 450 million tonnes of coal a year in this country. And together, just those two countries alone are looking at increasing their, car, their coal mining by, by more than what we produce in any one year. Why are they doing that? Because they're worried about where the energy of the world is coming from. They're worried about the cost of living. People are on the streets all around the world protesting the fact that they can't, can't afford their energy bills anymore because of this insane uh, net zero agenda uh, driven by a Swedish teenager. Uh, we are taking advice on our energy system uh, from school children who strike from, at, to, to want a day off school. I wanted a days off school when I was a kid, but I don't think I should have ever been put in charge of the energy policy settings of the world. But that's what we're doing. That's what we're doing, and the consequences are there for all to see. For all to see. Uh, uh, because I, I have been very much against this agenda. I, I, I think it's a little, bit of a, a little bit strange that we should seek to fundamentally transform the way we make energy and food in a generation without thinking a bit about it. And I'm the, I'm the radical. I'm the, I'm, I'm, I'm the extremist in this debate. So let's just, see, let's just take a temperature check of where we are. The mainstream position in Australia, in polite society in Western countries, is that we should, we should fundamentally transform how food and energy is made within 30 years, within a generation, without, without the technologies around. We don't have a lot of the technologies that people want. This green steel, uh, uh, fertilisers not made from natural gas. Look how that worked out for Sri Lanka. Uh, that, that stuff doesn't exist. And we are playing with fire here because, we, as you can already see, in Sri Lanka, in the Europe, they are struggling to feed and warm their own people because they, they are not taking uh, proper advice about how things are. They do not understand how the world works, really. They don't understand how food is grown, how steel is made, uh, how we manufacture things in the world. They just flick a switch and things happen. So the, the flick a switch generation who think you just push a button and things turn up, you, know, you go into an app and your food arrives in an Uber, uh, uh, you, you, you set your thermostat and everything's fine. They have no idea how coal is mined, you know, how, how a blast furnace works in a steel mill. They've never been to these places. And that's why we're ending up in the situation uh, we are in. Now, on this piece of legislation, the funny thing about this is it, it continues its agenda, which is enormously uh, damaging uh, for the world and, and it's causing enormous pain right around the world. But this particular bit of legislation doesn't do all that much, at least in its primary form, its primary, primary bill we're debating here. All this legislation does, for all the rhetoric and high rhetoric we've, we've, we've heard from the Labor Party, how they're saving the planet uh, and you know, the oceans are, 
uh, 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 breathing again, all this rubbish. They, 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 this doesn't do anything. All it does, all this bill does, is say, OK, our nationally determined commitment to Paris is this in this bill. It's a very short bill. It just says, OK, 43 per cent is now our target, as is net zero by 2050. We don't need legislation for that. They don't need this bill, and the, and the government has admitted this, the, the, the climate change minister Chris Bowen has admitted, they don't need uh, legislation to enshrine our Paris Agreement target. So what are we doing? People are struggling to pay their bills in this country, uh, uh, interest rates are going up, and we're wasting all of this time on a piece of legislation that is unnecessary. We do not need to do this. We could be doing other things with our time here for, you know, for the Australian people. The Labor government could still enshrine those Paris targets without this legislation. Now, some may argue, oh well, this, this locks in the Paris targets then uh, for any future government. Or any, if the Australian people dare vote for a government in the future that wants to change our Paris commitments, they're trying to lock us in. They're trying to deny future Australians that agency. But even then, who cares? The Paris Agreement doesn't have any penalties. Like none of this, none of this actually binds. If a future Australian government does not meet 43 per cent emissions by 2030, guess what happens? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing happens. There is no penalties. Uh, you do not get kicked out of any kind of club. And we can see that because the rest of the world is ignoring these, these things. As I said, Germany is opening up coal plants. Asia is opening up coal mines. Everyone has, been, has and is ignoring these climate agreements, except ourselves. Except ourselves. We're, we met the Kyoto Agreement. Uh, we, and I think New Zealand, only one other country. No other country did. <laughs> no other country did. Uh, and and, and we are imposing these costs on our people, uh, denying our, our country air job opportunities, and the rest of the world is having a big laugh. I mean, Xi Jinping didn't even bother turning up at the uh, at the Glasgow conference. Neither did Vladimir Putin. I think both of them they would just have too busy laughing. They couldn't. I mean, they wouldn't have been able to hold a straight face at Glasgow if they turned up because every other countries of the world were happy to commit economic suicide. Uh, uh, to make it harder, as I say, to feed and clothe them and warm their people, uh, and, and China and Russia can go on their merry way. Does anybody in this place believe? I mean, actually, some people do. Some people seem to think that because China's committed to net zero emissions by 2060, they're going to somehow meet that. I, I mean, uh, how stupid can we get? How, how stupid can we be that you'd believe a Chinese communist dictator uh, at his face value? I mean, they, they might say something and do something different. That might happen, and it is happening. That, that's, that's all the evidence we see. Now, there is some parts of social legislation I do want to highlight that, that are risky. Most of it is completely innocuous, doesn't really make a difference to the world. However, the government is also enshrining the climate objectives and net zero emissions objectives into a bunch of agencies, uh, into a bunch of the Commonwealth agencies uh, in this legislation, like the Northern Australian Infrastructure Facility, like Export Finance Australia. And this could have a big consequence because it will deny job and other opportunities to, uh, uh, to investments in those spaces. And more importantly, what I worry about here is it's going to weaponise our courts. It's going to weaponise our judicial system. We've seen this in the past with the EPBC Act and other issues where stuff that we thought was rather innocuous going through this place becomes a huge, huge weapon in the hands of an activist judge who seeks to expand. Uh, what is uh, actually enshrined in this place. We have seen that with climate legislation overseas. Uh, the Heathrow Airport has not been able to expand because of climate legislation in the United Kingdom, something that I do not think any or many of the members of the House of Commons realised at the time uh, that the legislation they propose is now putting caps on the number of people arriving in London. It is hard to get into the place now because of that climate legislation. We have seen it in the Netherlands, where uh, European Union nitrogen targets have led uh, to this absurd rule in the Netherlands where farmers have got to reduce their production by 30 per cent. They have been asked to cull their cattle in the Netherlands. And those of us that do flick on the news, as I say, not many people seem to watch the news in this place, but those of us who do flick on the news can see that there is a revolt happening in the Netherlands right now of farmers, of a farmers, new farmers' party that has been formed against uh, this unilateral shutting down of the world's second largest exporter of agricultural goods in the Netherlands. An amazing thing, but that's the consequence of these kinds of targets sometimes that we don't understand. And it brings me back to where I started: the victims, the the, the victims uh, of of um, of the, this type of legislation. They're, they're the people, the people who shower after work rather than before work. They're the ones that are going to cop it with this legislation, right? Now, most of us come to this building. With, I have a shower usually before usually before work. Thanks, to my colleagues. Thank me for that. 
Um, but if you're a farmer, if you're, if you're working in a steel mill, if you're working in a coal mine, definitely, you'll have to shower after work, right? Right? because you'll be smelly and dirty and you've been working outside. Maybe you'll shower before, but you'll have to shower after work. Those are the people that we see on the tractors in the Netherlands that are, that are going to cop it from our e e e naive uh, and not thought through changes to the way food and energy is made yeah, yeah. in Western countries. Uh, and, and, then, and then those people will typically be the ones be asked to go and fight wars and other conflicts that will arise from this that we see in the Ukraine, because there is a straight line between the naive uh, environmental and net zero targets that Europe has adopted and the extra strength and leverage has been given to Vladimir Putin to invade Ukraine. Absolutely happened. He has got a lot more ability uh, to, to pressure Europe uh, to, to, to take a risky decision. Uh, to invade another country because he's not scared of Europe. He is not scared of those countries because they rely on him for their gas. They have totally re removed their own independence and sovereignty uh, and have become vulnerable to aggression and bullies that do exist around the world. Do exist because news uh, to the Greens and their naive followers in the Australian Labor Party, there are people that wish to do us harm in this world. Uh, there are countries that don't necessarily want to see Western and free and democratic nations prosper and grow, uh, and we are playing into their hands by, by unilaterally reducing our economic strength, our industry, our capability uh, to grow and manufacture the things that an industrial economy needs. Uh, because the primary reason I'm against uh, these radical changes is because I do not trust the Chinese Communist Party. I do not trust them. I do not trust what they say. I do not trust their relations with other countries. And while ever, while ever uh, they cannot be trusted, we cannot afford. We cannot afford to continue to export our, job in, our jobs, our manufacturing industries, our commanding heights of our economy to a country that we cannot trust. We cannot trust. They, China is not a place at the moment you can do business in. You can't. People can't even travel there from this country. But they are the world's largest emitter of carbon by far and growing because the Western world, Western world continues to rely on them for cheap goods, subsidised materials, and we're doing nothing about it. This legislation only entrenches that trend. It only makes it harder for us to walk away from that dependent state we are sleepwalking into. We should oppose it because we should be putting this country first, we should be making our own energy again, and we should be ensuring that those people who work hard for us have a great job and a good future. Thank you, Senator Canavan. Senator David Pocock. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I'd like to start by thanking Senator Canavan. I really appreciate how much he stands up for communities who have relied on fossil fuels for generations in terms of workforce. It's going to be a really important part of this in the transition to actually look after those communities. And it's actually a huge opportunity for regional areas if we get this right. And that starts with actually having some certainty after a, a decade of uncertainty, uncertainty of, of inaction, of delay, to actually have the big, the big picture settings that say we're heading in this direction will allow that transition to happen, will allow us to actually look after regional areas. I'd like to touch on a, a few of the things that Senator Canavan mentioned. Um, most of it with which I disagree with, uh, but that's the beauty of this, this place. He rightly talked about cost of living. We're in a cost of living crisis around the country. The economics of climate action have changed so fast. I understand that that's some people in this place are still maybe going off old figures. This continues to change, and we're now in a, in a position where electrification offers households savings of thousands of dollars a year if, if, if we get this right. We've seen it done with rooftop solar, started by the, the Howard government. We now have some of the cheapest rooftop solar, solar in the world. Many people across the country are benefiting from this. We can do the same thing for, for batteries, for heat pumps, for electric vehicles, and unlock real savings, not just a, a one-off you know, discount or fuel excise cut, but thousands of dollars every year going forward for, for everyday Australians. Another comparison which, which I disagree with was comparing us to, to Europe. Europe buy a, a lot of gas from Russia. We don't buy any gas from Russia, yet we're subjected to international 
prices for gas because members of, of both major parties have allowed gas companies to charge us export prices for our own gas. That's a, that's a real failure of legislation and I think it really speaks to just how much influence the gas companies have at a time where they're making up to 500 per cent more profit just the, the thought of actually recouping some of that to invest into our regions doesn't seem to be, to be on the table. The last thing I'd like to um, respond to was Senator Canavan's concerns about the judicial system and litigation. This is already happening. Tiwi Islanders are currently in court against Santos about a gas project to try and access some of Australia's dirtiest gas from their, their, their homelands. The Gomeroy people in the Narrabri are also taking Santos to court about their proposed Pilliga project. And it, in the, the former government was taken to court by young people in Australia saying that the government has a duty of care to actually protect young people in their futures. And this is really what climate action is about and what this bill is a start to get us right on, the, on the right track. It's clear human influence on the climate system is now an established fact. Our greenhouse gas emissions are warming the planet and the results are disastrous. Just turn on the news. More intense floods, fires, cyclones, heat waves, warming and rising oceans. Climate change is the greatest challenge we face. It will affect all the people and places we know and love. Our communities around the country are demanding action. Action from each other, action from corporate Australia and action from government. Jurisdictions from the UK to New Zealand have adopted climate laws that give a framework for climate action. Some Australian states and territories have done the same. The ACT who I proudly represent, passed a Climate Act in 2010. Victoria passed a similar act with broader functions and powers in 2017. As with so many aspects of climate change policy, after a decade of inaction, the Commonwealth lags woefully behind. There are more than 80 pieces of legislation relating to energy and various elements of climate policy. The sum of these parts is not an effective framework, a more complete and, ambas and ambitious climate law would provide this framework. It would in include guiding principles, adaptation, action plans and an emissions budgeting framework. This bill has none of those. What it does have and do is perform two key functions. First, it sets two targets, 43% by 2030 and net zero by 2050. And secondly, it provides an accountability framework for climate policy. The science on the target is clear. 43 per cent by 2030 is not enough. Scientists like former chief scientist Professor Penny Sackett and eminent climate professor David Caroli are unequivocal. According to Professor Caroli, the emissions reduction target is too weak to represent Australia's fair share of global emissions reductions needed to meet the Paris Agreement target of lim limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees. I'd like to thank the many eminent Canberrans who have been pushing for action. Professor Frank Yotso, Professor Mark Howden, Professor Will Steffen, Professor Nerly Abram, Professor C Colin Butler, Dr Arna Greta Hunter, and many others. We clearly have a moral obligation to act on climate change. As a wealthy country, doing the bare minimum does not cut it. We can and should be going harder and leading the world. We stand to lose so much from inaction, from the incredible Great Barrier Reef to many of our beaches heat-sensitive species like the greater glider and an uninterrupted summer of cricket, to just name a few. Yet we, gain to, we stand to gain so much from bold climate action. 
we can build a better future, a livable future, and an economy for the future. We can protect and conserve so much of what makes this nation great. Unfortunately, the, the new Labor government has been explicit that 43 per cent is as high as they're willing to go. While I'd like to see more ambition, climate scientists would like to see more ambition, I think millions of Australians would like to see more ambition. 43 per cent is certainly an improvement on where we were 12 months ago. And legislating a target is a significant step forward. This target will provide certainty to encourage the large-scale investment that will be needed in the transitional, transition to renewable energy. This is a development the community supports. After more, more than a decade of climate wars, we need to bank some gains and move from the what to the how. Perfect should not be the enemy of the good, and so if the government is unwilling to be more ambitious, I support the legislated targets. Outside of the targets, I call on the government to support my amendments to improve the accountability and transparency mechanisms within this bill. The bill has three primary accountability and transparency mechanisms. First, the annual statement on climate change from the minister. Second, publicly available advice from the Climate Change Authority on that statement. And third, publicly available advice from the Climate Change Authority on updated emissions reduction targets. Each of those mechanisms should be strengthened, and I'll move amendments to do just that. Accountability and transparency on climate action is so important, particularly in the context of Australian climate policy. We don't have a carbon price. We don't have a cap-and-trade system. We have a set of overlapping and complex policies that provide a mesh of incentives and penalties. All this complexity makes inaction and damage easy to hide or to dress up as action, as we've seen in the past. Without accountability and transparency, it'll be hard to identify and measure the impact and effectiveness of policies. Without transparency, we are putting our climate and our future behind an opaque window. Beside that window, while we debate this 43 per cent in both the lower house and the Senate, Another government minister is spruiking the opening of 46,000 square kilometres of new offshore oil and gas exploration. Fossil fuel subsidies remain at the same time that we're seeing fossil fuel, sub fossil fuel companies making extraordinary profits. At the same time, we're hearing that the cost of actually helping everyday Australians is, is too much for the government to consider. We've seen climate wrecking projects like Beedaloo, Scarborough stay in the pipeline. Thousands of carbon credits with questionable integrity continue to be issued. And this attitude of just trust us, what we'll get there, is, is not good enough. And Australians are demanding better. I believe we should know what impact federal budget measures will have on our emissions reduction targets. We should know how much of the targets are to be achieved by different sectors of the economy. We should know how developments in climate science are influencing climate policies and targets. If science is not being followed, we should be told why not. Science is referred to just once in this bill. By contrast, it appears seven times in the UK equivalent. We should know whether Australia's emissions reduction targets represent our fair share of the reductions needed, and if they don't, why don't they? We don't have to look far to see our Pacific Island neighbours crying out for climate action. For many of them, this is an existential threat. They risk losing their homes, and they're crying out for both more action but also leadership from their, their neighbours. Australia has a moral obligation to act on climate change. We are, relatively speaking, an extraordinarily wealthy country. And with that comes a responsibility to lead, not just do the bare minimum as we're seeing in this bill, but to actually step it up. So while this is an important symbolic 
sort of getting back to the, the table. Let's not pat ourselves on the back too much about this, this bill. It's a first step. There's so much more to be done. And with climate policy, everything has to be looked at through the lens of integrity. Because a target without integrity is just a number. It's not going to matter. And future generations will judge us harshly for our inaction, for some of the ridiculous arguments that we've, we've used to avoid acting on what is the biggest challenge humans have ever faced. We have to act. We have to act decisively. I support, I support this, this bill, and I look forward to working with my colleagues here in the Senate to ensure that this is just the first step of not only ending the climate wars, but of winning them, of going from an embarrassing laggard when it comes to climate action who turns up to international summits to talk about climate action and spruiks gas companies, who tries to water down agreements where you have countries who have hardly contributed at all to climate change and are paying a massive price. You, you turn on the television and watch what's happening in, in, in Pakistan. You see some, some of the, the famines happening in Africa. We know the awful consequences to not only human life but to ecosystems around the world with unchecked climate change. We're starting to get a glimpse. What happens next is up to us. We can act decisively. We can be part of actually building a better future together. We can lead in the, in the global community. We've heard concerns raised by Senator Canavan about what countries like China are doing. We should be out there demanding more action from the international community. It's clear that developed countries need to lead this. It's a huge opportunity for us here in Australia, not only in terms of our economy, building economy for the future, unlocking energy savings for, for households, having a, a cleaner environment in our, in our cities, but also then being part of exporting that intellectual property, exporting those ideas around the world as everyone has, has this transition. It's happening. It's going to happen whether we like it or not. The speed at which it happens is up to us. What an incredible opportunity to be part of. We stand here as one of the first generations to know the scope of this issue, this problem, and one of the last to actually be able to act. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Pocock. Senator Polly. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. It's been a long nine years in energy policy in this country, with many policies from the former coalition government failing to stabilise our energy market, lower energy prices, address climate change or invest in renewable energy jobs. What Australia really needed was an energy target. The National Party wouldn't let the Liberal Party set one. What Australia needed was courage and leadership, but we were left bereft of both. Let chaos reign in energy policy was the former government's mantra. There was no substantive policy or mechanisms to get our country on track in this space. At the May election, Australians were rightly tired of sideshows and slogans from the former government. They were tired of delay. They were tired of lack of action. The people of Australia were heard loud and clear. They threw out of this place the former government and in the other place because they did not represent their communities when it came to energy and climate change policy. They threw out the sceptics, the deniers and the enablers of delay on climate policy. Our country's mission has always been to lead not to follow in the wake of other countries. Investing in renewable uh, future is a move away from the old adage of the Liberal nationals who are the great believers in denial. A move away from almost total reliance on fossil fuels. We have seen over the last decade the power of our climate, fires, floods, cyclones and droughts. They are deeply acts they are deadly acts of nature which have power to break families and cripple into uncertainty. Climate change may be the world's most significant hurdle to leap over, 
but it is in fact Australia's biggest economic opportunity. And so we must grasp that opportunity with both hands. We are one of the most successful social democratic countries in the world because we have risen to this occasion time and time again to overcome adversity. When regional Australia is struggling with drought or flood, our cities respond in kind. We are one country, regardless of where you live, and climate change at its worst will affect us all. When climate events strike, they not only damage our natural environment, but can displace individuals and families. They can have catastrophic effect on the price of goods. Food shortages push prices up, and we have witnessed this in supermarkets across the country as the cost of living increases. We invest, we innovate and we collaborate for the positive change, and that is how the Albanese government has been approaching energy policy in this country during the 47th parliament. We know Australians are among some of the best innovators in the world. Professor Martin Green at the University of New South Wales and his colleagues invented the modern efficient solar panel as we know it. That is Australian way. It is innovation and collaboration not delay and division. That is what we must celebrate, and when we celebrate innovation and invest in it, we move our country forward. Investing in it is supporting ARENA and the CEFC and the CSRO and our universities to do what they do best. An Albanese Labor government is committed to prog progress on all fronts when our energy policy priorities are concerned. We must embrace technology and learn from global initiatives in the private and public sectors. We must understand the opportunities that science and renewable energy provides for our country and provides for rural Australia in particular. Our country has the space for, for renewable energy. Solar farms are possible on a large scale. We have the space and skills to make energy cleaner and cheaper. With the correct framework, framework of investment with a government that takes full advantage of the opportunities they can make energy and export energy well into the future. We must back the private sector. Companies like Line Hydrogen and Firmus Tasmania, who are leaders in the energy and storage space. In my home state of Tasmania during the federal election campaign, Anthony Albanese, Chris Bowen and the Labor team announced $70 million in funding to start the production of hydrogen at Bell Bay in northern Tasmania, supporting local jobs and renewable energy. Labor also announced $5 million to ensure Lion Hydrogen will invest in green hydrogen production and co-locate with solar farms in to replace diesel Tasmanian trucks uh, for um, our trucks and our buses. The first stage of the project is set to include hydrogen production and up to 30 trucks and buses, buses will be leased to industry partners. Over time, Line could also build at least five hydrogen refuelling stations across Tasmania. The project will create 215 direct and downstream jobs, 135 direct jobs and 80 downstream jobs. I'm so proud of these commitments and will be working hard with our Minister, Minister Bowen and Prime Minister Albanese to secure a renewable future in Tasmania and right across the country. Only today it was reported in the Examiner that Countrywide Hydrogen has signed an agreement with German company Wiso Energy to pursue solar to hydrogen opportunities together in Tasmania. We once again see Tasmania leading in renewables, leading in the energy market. The Australian people deserve so much more than a government that has tried to abolish the renewable energy target at every opportunity. And we heard you know, the contribution this morning uh, by Senator Canavan. And this is why, in the first weeks of the Albanese Labor government, we committed to reduce emissions in this country by 43 per cent by 2030. This is what courage and leadership looks like, to end the climate wars and look to a more hopeful and a more promising future. The Australian government has been 
The Australian government has been left behind for too long when the private sector in this country has been leading the way on renewable energy future. The Business Council of Australia knows that the Australian government must build a framework which the private sector can follow. This will allow business to invest in new technology, and they can do that without an emission target. The global momentum for renewables due to decarbonisation is now unstoppable. Governments, markets and communities must work together to this end. This is what this bill will achieve. This bill will put Australia on track for a net zero by 2050. No ifs and buts, it will happen. Our Powering Australia plan, which we took to the election and, de and will deliver 604,000 jobs across the country and bring on 82 per cent renewables by 2030. And while legislation is not essential to deliver Power Australia, the Albanese government regards enshrining our national determinate contribution in law as best practice. This bill will proudly bring Australia into line with countries such as France, Denmark and Spain that have legislated net zero targets by 2050. Countries such as Canada have also legislated their 2030 targets. Importantly, the bill will restore transparency accountability in government action on climate change and confirm the important role of independent expert advice. I note that periodic independent reviews of the operations of the bill will ensure legislation remains fit for purpose as the international response to climate change evolves and Australia proceeds towards net zero. The bill will also ensure our commitments under the Paris Agreement of holding the increase in global temperature to well below 2 degrees Celsius, above pre-industrial levels and pursuing efforts to limit temperature increase to 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels are reflected in the objects of this bill. Australia can lead the world in a clean energy future. The opportunities in renewable energy and renewable jobs are boundless. We live in one of the most extraordinary natural environments that can harness the energy production of the sun, water and wind. I know too well by my lived experience in Tasmania, we have 100 per cent renewables. It is possible. Our energy mix in Australia must change and the time for delay is well and truly over. We took to the election a 43 per cent target. That is what the Australian people voted for. This place needs to support Labor in government, getting on with our better future plan, and we will deliver for the Australian people. I commend this bill and I encourage my Senate colleagues to vote in support of the future. Thank you, Senator Polly. Senator Van. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Without a doubt, the tra transition to net zero is inevitable. However, this bill is unnecessary and unachievable. The world is moving towards producing carbon neutral energy, and this is a good thing. The globe will at some point in time reach net zero, and I would say ideally sooner rather than later. Given the, however, given the Paris Accords rules, Australia already cannot walk back our NDC for 2030, even if anyone actually wanted to. And the government knows this. So the bill before us today is a redundant piece of legislation. On top of that, with the solutions we have today, according to some of the best scientific minds, the target of 43 per cent today is not achievable. The mechanisms to achieve this will cost the taxpayers billions, and the government have not shown us how this will be achieved. Australians understand that the sooner you want something built, the more it costs. Lowering emissions is not just a slogan, but a massive integrated effort encompassing the entire economy that needs to be built. Now, this Labor government would like to say they are ambitious with their emissions reduction target of 43 per cent. This bill before us today reflects their decision to lock Australia into this commitment. Personally, 
I am more ambitious than those opposite to what I would like to see our emissions reduction target be. However, I am not blind to reality, unlike those opposite. I believe we need to be as pragmatic as we are ambitious. The Paris Accord allows us to update our targets when we know we can meet them, and I believe that this is the approach Australia must take. Yes, I too believe that renewables are part of the future, but, but while planning for the future, we must also concern ourselves with the present. But it does no good to small business owners, Australian manufacturers, the elderly and those struggling to keep the lights on if all we have is a plan to increase renewable energy in the future, but no plan for how we're going to keep the lights on today at an affordable price. Now, let us not forget that when Labor first announced their plan to legislate a 2030 target in December 2021, the now Prime Minister stated, and I quote, Labor's plan to create jobs, cut power, cut power bills and reduce emissions. He pitched to the Australian people not one but two targets, backed by, and I quote, the most comprehensive modelling ever done for any policy by any opposition in Australia's history since Federation. Prime Minister Albanese said that through their policies, and again I quote, it will see electricity prices fall from current level by $275 for households by 2025 at the end of our first term if we are successful. And now we've seen the government already, 110 days roughly I think it is, walk back on that promise. Not at the end of their first term, 110 days or thereabouts. In fact, those opposite have been so fearful that the promise to reduce power bills by $275 that they won't even utter those numbers anymore. Because while those opposites sat in opposition, they had the ability to grandstand and to talk about emissions reduction without giving a single thought about energy supply. However, those with any sense know that you cannot talk about emissions reduction without also talking about supply of reliable energy. These two factors are intrinsically linked it's called physics. As published by the International Energy Agency, the world is experiencing the first global energy crisis in history. Yes, in a large part, this is because of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, and I'll have more to say on that later today. However, it highlights what should be a bleedingly obvious point. There are and always will be unexpected outcomes and events. If the last three years teaches us anything, it is that we really do not know what the future holds and that we can only be prepared for the future by ensuring we are protected against a whole range of scenarios. This means ensuring we have a secure, reliable supply of energy. Russia's invasion of Ukraine has highlighted how running into this transition with your eyes closed will only end in tragedy. And the country Germany stands as a stark reminder of this. It has spent more than $743 billion US transitioning its electricity system, boosting wind and solar to more than 45 per cent of generation since 2000. And as we have heard in our environment and communications hearings into this bill, even after spending all this money on renewable energy, they are struggling to get to the target of producing energy below 300 grams of carbon dioxide per kilowatt hour. In fact, Germany now has Europe's most expensive retail power and cannot function without imported Russian gas. And in June, Germany announced it would be restarting some of its coal plants due to the shortages of grass, gas due to the Ukrainian war. And what is more surprising is that this announcement came from the German Greens finance minister. However, it should not be a surprise that when faced with the complete and utter economic failure due to the inability to create power, even the Greens in Germany seem to make some sense. Mind you, the German Greens have a far better hold on reality when it comes to national security than those opposite me. JP Morgan's 2022 annual energy paper explicitly states that countries, uh, countries that reduce production of fossil fuels 
under the assumption that renewables can quickly replace them, face substantial economic and geopolitical risks, as, you, as Europe currently shows us. If the energy transition is to succeed, we cannot disconnect the generations we currently have uh, before we have a replacement for it. Europe severely miscalculated, and they are now paying the price of it with a likely recession, low rate of growth, and a decline in competitiveness of exported energy intensive goods, higher food prices, and domestic political tensions. Now, I'd like to remind everyone that anyone who starts talking about re renewables without first talking about firming does not know what they are talking about. And if they start talking about batteries as the answer to firming, <clears throat> then they doubly do not know what they are talking about. We've heard those in Labor and the Greens say that the solution to firming is batteries. Currently, batteries are not actually fit for grid-scale storage to address our emissions reduction and are unlikely to be before 2030. And the outlook on when or if these will even uh, ever be available is uncertain. However, Australia is a key producer of critical minerals for batteries, and I do believe we can play an important role in processing, manufacturing of batteries, processing those minerals, manufacturing of batteries, and exportation uh, of those batteries. Now, the Labor Party are correct when they state that renewable energy is the cheapest form of energy, but only correct in a very small part. Again, as JP Morgan's energy paper stated, putting more renewable energy on the grid will not guarantee lower prices because energy prices rest on an average cost of generation, not just the actual cost of a power source that can deliver uh, energy, on a continuous basis unsupported. As AEMO's 2022 Integrated Systems Plan states, we need to treble the firming capacity from dispatchable storage, including pumped hydro and gas-fired generation, to firm renewables that are coming onto the grid. Now, as I've said before, we do not have batteries on the grid to firm the power supply as it is. And Labor's policy to fund 400 community batteries of about the size of uh, 500 kilowatts is simply inadequate and does not constitute a virtual power plant or VPP. CSIRO data found that Victorian households use an average of 22 kilowatts between sunset and sunrise each night in winter. In this situation, a 500 kilowatt battery could provide sufficient overnight power for only 23 households. This is the equivalent of needing to one on every street not in each suburb as Labor plans. Assuming the 22 kilowatt nightly load, it would take over 80,000 batteries to meet the power consumption needs of Melbourne's 1.8 million households. Even if the 400 proposed batteries were built in, all built in Victoria, they would only meet 0.5 per cent of the city's winter nighttime demand. On the other hand, Snowy 2.0 has a capacity of 350 million kilowatt hours, with a capacity to meet Melbourne's nightly demand for over a week. Labor suggests that they can source batteries at $500,000 each, which equates to <coughs> $1,000 per kilowatt hour. The Snowy 2.0, costing $4.5 billion for the 350 million megawatt hours, comes out to only 12.9 cents per kilowatt hour. Far more sensible, I suggest. There are currently viable firming technologies such as hydro and gas, as we invested in when we were in government, as well as viable future technologies such as green hydrogen and CSS. Furthermore, a clean and reliable source of firming our grid is through nuclear technologies, which is established in over 30 countries and produces electricity with very, very low carbon emissions. Now, the climate change and energy ministers calling nuclear energy the slowest and most expensive form of alternate energy is simply wrong. As we heard in the Senate hearings into this bill, the CSIRO is quoting costs for large third-gen nuclear power plants, which have a high variability in cost in the first place, 
not the small modular reactors that are currently being built in other countries. So we could look to that as the alternative, not the old big third gen plants. While it is true that technologies such as wind and solar are lower when the, uh, that the cost of wind and solar are lower when wind is blowing, the sun is shining. However, when you add in the cost of transmission lines, storage backup, backup or other firming methods, the levelised cost is actually much higher. And evidence was, of that was given to the committee and shows that the cost of the renewable system is about 80 per cent higher than if we use nuclear. We only have to look at France with about 60 to 65 to 70 per cent of its electricity generated from nuclear. Their carbon footprint is less than 50 grams per kilowatt hour compared to Germany, who is struggling to produce energy below 300 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour. If energy transition is to succeed, we have to build firming sources like Snowy, is, like the, the, uh, the Snowy Corporation is with 2.0 and Kuri Kuri, or we have to keep coal-fired generation and other gas generation until the end of its natural life or fix the ones that are broken. It also means that we have to release more of our natural gas resources and invest in things such as blue and green hydrogen. The ACCC gas inquiry report specifically states that to address the projected shortfall of gas in 2023, as per the AMO significant additional volumes of gas will be needed to be produced. Now, I don't see how the government will be able to stick to their promise of reducing power bills if they do not sp specifically support the additional production of gas, particularly in my home state of Victoria. And this lack of support is hurting Australians already with a report highlighting that users are now receiving offers at higher prices with less, less flexibility. As I said at the start of my speech, I want to see the world transition and move to net zero as quickly as possible. However, as nations as, such as Germany are finding out, by rushing in with your arms wide open and your eyes closed shut will only lead to pain, insecurity, instability and higher power prices. The government must start talking about how they are going to address the, these issues before they hurt Australians even more, as this bill will. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Ban. Senator Rice. Thanks, Acting Deputy President. It was during my second week here as a senator in July 2014 that the Abbott government scrapped the price on carbon and began the long years of federal government inaction on climate that Australia has suffered through until the election in May this year. It has been such a long eight years. My actual first speech in this place, the this is not my first speech, first speech, was to speak to the bill that scrapped the price on carbon. I talked about the science of the impacts of climate change, overall increasing global temperatures, increasing climate variability, increasing rainfall variability, increasing extreme weather events, increasing sea surface temperatures, sea level rise, increasing acidification of our oceans and the melting of glaciers and the ice caps. Eight years on, this is our reality. I talked about the cost of climate change, particularly the cost of bushfires, their increased frequency and severity and their increase spread across the country and across the year, beginning earlier and continuing later. I said, think of the likely loss of life that will occur and the personal losses, the personal costs and the public costs of dealing with increased bushfires. Victoria's Black Saturday bushfires of February 2009 cost the community more than $4 billion. And this does not include the health and social costs and the flow-on costs for business. Yes, think about that in the context of our black summer fires that we experienced over the summer of 2019-20, where the cost to agriculture alone was $5 billion. And the estimate of the cost to restore the bushland which was lost is a staggering $73 billion a year for 30 years. And I talked in that speech about the impact on people. And I said I spoke this week to a young woman whose family has a vineyard in South Australia. Her father is despairing. He does not have any superannuation. His whole wealth is based on his vineyard. He can see the value of his vineyard evaporating before his eyes every year when the quality of his grape crop crashes because of extreme summer heat or when it's affected by smoke taint from bushfires occurring, where bushfires have just not occurred before. 
She is advising him to sell up now before it's worth absolutely nothing. He is reluctant but is depressed and despairing. This is the cost of climate change. Eight years on, I wonder how this young woman and her father are getting on. So you can imagine, after eight long years, how relieved I am to be speaking to a bill to set a target to reduce our carbon pollution and to have hope that this will be the government that begins to take the climate crisis seriously. You will note, however, I am still talking in the future tense, and I am only talking of hope, not optimism, because this bill is just a beginning. It is just a first step. I mean, let me quote a scientific analysis of what a 43 per cent emissions reduction target means, written by IPCC lead author Bill Hare from Climate Analytics. The ALP's 2030 target of a 43 per cent emissions reduction is consistent with two degrees of global warming. Un under this level of warming, if sustained, the Great Barrier Reef would very likely be destroyed, along with all other tropical reefs in Australia and elsewhere. At a global level, the most extreme heat events could be about three times more frequent than in recent decades, and in Australia, the highest maximum temperature is about 1.7 degrees hotter. In other words, an intense heat event that might have occurred once in a decade in recent decades could occur about every three years and would be significantly hotter. We need more ambition than that. This is not a safe climate. Surely we can do better than to count the death of the Great Barrier Reef on our watch. We are seeing, we are feeling, we are being devastated by the impacts of 1.1 degrees of warming now. We see more than 1,300 people dead in Pakistan in recent weeks, with over a third of their country underwater by an intense monsoon and melting glaciers, millions of people without food and homes, our own floods in Brisbane and northern New South Wales, where the reality of needing to rehome people away from high flood risk areas is only now just hitting home, and massive wildfires across Europe and North America following record heat in recent months, and of course our own black summer where two billion animals were killed. We have First Nations lands and people suffering from increased temperatures, degradation and destruction of cultural heritage and natural resources such as plants, grasses, timber and clean running water, which provide a basis for First Nations peoples to practice culture. Before 2002, there was just one megafire year in Australian records in 1939. Since 2001, there have been three megafire years when more than one million hectares of land has been burnt, including ancient Gondwanan rainforests in Tasmania and Queensland, which are just not adapted for fire. This is with 1.1 degree of heating. Labor policy, what is in this bill, a 43 per cent target, and continuing and expanding the mining, the burning and the export of coal and gas has us headed for two degrees or more. As I said in my actual first speech, we have a duty of care to people and nature suffering and under threat from global warming. We do not have the right to turn a blind eye to the consequences of our dirty economy. I said my agenda for my time here is clear. I want to be able to look my grandchildren in the eye and tell them it was during my time in the Senate that Australia turned the corner and legislated to begin the shift to a zero carbon safe climate economy. And I had a few suggestions of what needed to happen to get us on our way, to set pollution reduction targets based on science, to stop subsidising fossil fuels, to create more jobs by boosting clean energy production and energy conservation, to start closing coal-fired power stations, say no to new coal and gas, and to make the big polluters pay for the damage they are doing. Obviously, the climate denialism of the Abbott Turnbull Morrison government over the last eight years means there has not been a lot of progress made on this agenda. The big progress, obviously, despite the government, has just been how much of an increase in clean energy production there's actually been over the last eight years. The potential of renewable energy production in Australia is only just kicking off. It is massive. So, yes, we actually have been able to start closing coal fired power stations and more closures are on the cards. We need a plan, though, and a commitment for a just transition 
managed by a transitional authority so that workers and communities don't get shafted in the process. But the rest of the agenda that I set out fail. And is Labor planning to address it in this term of government? No. Fail again. We have not yet turned the corner. I cannot yet look any grandchildren to be in the eye. Do we have pollution reduction targets based on science? No. That would, as the science says we need a 75 per cent reduction in our carbon pollution by 2030 if we are going to keep below 1.5 degrees of warming, and even faster to reach zero carbon that would actually achieve a safe climate. We haven't got a safe climate now. There is no carbon budget left. We need to be reducing our carbon emissions absolutely as quickly as possible. Fossil fuel subsidies still continuing. Billions of billions of dollars that could be spent on encouraging clean energy production, instead subsidising the mining and the use of coal, gas and oil. And making the big polluters pay? Nope. That could be done through a price on carbon, such as was scrapped by Tony Abbott. And of course, the big, lumbering, polluting elephant in the room, the new coal and gas. The Mount Pleasant coal mine expansion that's currently before the minister at the moment. The Beedaloo Basin fracking, which would be a carbon bomb bigger than the Adani coal mine. Scarborough Gas, the 114 new proposed coal and gas projects. Any government that was serious about addressing the climate crisis would have said an immediate no to these new projects on taking office. Or at the very least, they need to commit to a climate trigger in our environment laws so that the damage these projects are going to do to our global climate are at least assessed. There's a final really incredibly important issue that I talked about in my first speech eight years ago that I have championed ever since in this place that is crucially relevant to the bill before us today, and that's protecting our forests. Getting timber and wood chips from plantations, not native forests, and no burning of native forests in furnaces for energy. Now is the time to do this. The Senate committee that inquired into this bill heard stark evidence how the burning of wood from native forests for energy can in no way be considered renewable. In fact, burning native forest wood for energy actually emits more carbon than burning coal. So I'm pleased that the Senate committee recommended reviewing the renewable energy status of wood from native forest and that the government has agreed to this recommendation. I mean, Labor rejected classifying the burning of wood from native forest as renewable energy in 2011 and 2015, so I recommend that they dust off their thinking from then and make this change as a critical part of protecting our forests. And if they needed any further prompting as to the importance of protecting our forests and the link with, our, with acting on climate, they should have a read of what the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change found in their sixth assessment report released earlier this year where they said the protection, improved management and restoration of forests and other ecosystems have the largest potential to reduce emissions and or sequester carbon, and that safeguarding biodiversity and ecosystems is fundamental to climate resilient development. Our forests they need to be protected for their own sake. In, they need to be protected because of the role that they play in soaking and storing up carbon. They need to be protected as the, as the traditional lands of our First Nations people, for their totems and songlines, and for water, for wildlife, and for their beauty, rather than burnt in forest furnaces for fake renewable energy under scam systems that undermine the integrity of real renewables. So, in summary, this legislation is a start. It's a beginning, but so much more needs to be done. And I urge the government to work with us Greens to do the real work that's required for Australia to be playing our part in tackling the climate crisis. Thank you, Senator Rice. Uh, Senator Marl Smith. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. And I am so delighted to be in the chamber rising to speak in support of this bill. Because finally, after a decade of inaction on climate change and energy policy, finally this chamber has an opportunity to start the work required to end the climate wars, to take serious and urgent action to address the crisis of climate change. 
At the May election, the Australian people voted resoundingly in favour of action on climate change, and our government promised we would take it. We would do the work required to lower emissions while continuing to invest in communities, create jobs, improve energy security and make Australia a global leader on climate action instead of an embarrassment. Before us today is the bill that gets this work underway. After a decade of denials, of delays, of chaos on renewables and energy, our bill, this bill before us, this Labor bill, finally gives business, industry, energy investors and our wider community the certainty it so desperately needs. Through its 2030 target of 43 per cent, this bill puts Australia on track to meet net zero by 2050. But let's be clear, this is a minimum aspiration. It's not a cap on our aspiration. And together, we can delete, deliver better across our economy. But without this certainty, we will continue to miss the opportunities and economic benefits of the energy transformation before us. This bill is simple yet powerful, and I am proud of it. After serving for three years in this place, watching those on the other side squib and squander the opportunities of renewable energies before us and duck their heads as the climate catastrophe unfolded around us, we have this opportunity to act now. It has been clear and indisputable that climate change poses an existential threat to Australia and the world. We have been in a climate crisis. With each passing year, we see its dramatic impacts unfolding before our eyes. The CSIRO reports consistent increases to temperatures in Australia exacerbated by climate change will lead to more ex regular extreme heat events and increasingly severe drought conditions. We know climate change also exacerbates extreme weather events in Australia, causing more frequent and severe natural disasters. With the Royal Commission into natural, National Natural Disaster Arrangements finding that bushfires and flooding which have decimated our country over recent years, will increase in frequency and intensity as conditions worsen. Now, the people in my home state of South Australia know the dangers of these worsening disasters all too well. In the summer bushfires of 2019 and 2020, we watched parts of our state burn. The loss of lives, the loss of livelihoods, the loss of wildlife. Lives lost in those fires, not just in our state, but right across the country. The unprecedented loss of wildlife at a scale which was just heartbreaking for everyone in our country. And we know for our river, the lifeblood of my state, climate change places conditions under further stress and threatens the water supply, which is so vital to our future. We are living through a climate emergency and we must act. This bill is an opportunity to do so. In my first speech to the Senate, I spoke about the importance of placing intergenerational fairness at the heart of the decisions we take in this place, to leave our children a better world than the one that we inherited. And I spoke about how, for the first time in our modern history, we weren't set to deliver that. This is one of the ways we do. Our parliament's failure to act consistently and effectively on climate change is a key way in which we are failing our younger Australians. Because although Australians are already feeling the impact of climate change, we know it's young Australians who are of course set to feel it disproportionately, to be paying the costs, higher costs and for longer. If we don't act, we leave them with a disaster. We leave our children and our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren with a catastrophe, environmentally, socially and economically, and not seizing the opportunities as well, which come from acting on climate change, the economic opportunities which will lead to better and greater jobs. If we don't do that, we portray these young South Australians, these young Australians, the generations to come, and how can we in good conscience stand in this place and decide to ignore their future, a future we know which is competing at a global scale where other countries are acting, where other countries are skilling their workforces and preparing their economies to deal with this challenge, to reap the rewards of the opportunities presented in these new industries. If we don't do that, that is a huge betrayal of our young people. 
And of course, we cannot ignore the vulnerable populations across our globe who also feel this pain gravely, this hardship gravely and disproportionately to other places in the world. It's about being globally responsible, being good global citizens in a world which is ever connected. This is good environmental policy. It's good social policy. It's brilliant economic policy. And thank God it is a policy after a decade of nothing, after a decade of wasting time, of wasting opportunities, of failing to provide that leadership, that indicator to the market of where to invest, of failing to do the things, the bare minimum things we know we need to do to address this crisis and this catastrophe. These bills give us an opportunity, this parliament an opportunity, to end these stupid climate wars to come out and be part of a global community taking action, to take the action which our business community expects of us, which our community expects of us, which our young people expect of us. We are committed to ending these wars, and the other side of this chamber has an opportunity to do so too today, to accept the mandate, to put that rubbish of the past decade behind us, to come together as a chamber, to act like grown-ups, to be responsible to the young people in our community, to be responsible to our environment and to our economy. They have that opportunity in this moment to give industry and businesses, our communities, the, the security, the policy certainty that they are crying out for. That's what this bill does. It provides some leadership from the federal government, which has been so lacking over the last decade and which is costing us environmentally, economically, socially. After a decade of failing our nation on climate, supporting this bill is the least that they could do. So I urge everyone in this chamber to take this moment to put the embarrassment of the years before us, behind us, to show the Australian community that we're grown-ups, that we get the catastrophe before us, that we will take action together, that we heard the mandate they gave us at the election, what they have been calling for, because they're smart. They see what's before us. They see the risks of inaction. This is our opportunity as a chamber to do better by them, and it's our opportunity to correct one of the fundamental ways in which we are denying the next generation of Australians a better and fairer future. I absolutely commend this bill to the Chamber. Thank you, Senator Smith. Senator... Hmm. Oh, that, oh, look, I'm going to come to you, Senator Macdonald, because there's no other... The others are missing in action. Senator Macdonald. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr Acting oh, Deputy time. President. I'm uh, delighted to rise to speak on this uh, climate emissions uh, reduction bill, which truly must be one of the most uh, poorly considered uh, legislative positions that have been taken in recent times. Not because of its, uh, its intention to reduce emissions. I think uh, we all understand that we're on a pathway for emissions reductions uh, under the previous government, and that will continue. But it is the speed, it is the speed uh, an impact that this legislation will have uh, on, on the very most vulnerable in our communities, families, regional people, but right across Australia, the impact on investment and others. And I, I rise to fly the flag for people facing the terrible prospect of cutting their food budgets and power use thanks to this rushed and ill-considered push for legally enforceable emissions reductions. So the, the uh, energy minister, Minister Bowen, has already made the point that, um, that legislation was not required. Uh, immediately upon forming government, the, uh, the new government went to the UN and made the new emissions target. And yet we have charged ahead with legislation that is going to open the door on uh, on greater activist legislation, or, uh, activist situations, on lawfare, which will pull up projects, projects that are critical to the development and investment in this nation. Legislating an emissions reduction targets is the hallmark of a government 
that doesn't trust its people, and it reeks the way of, of going about governance, setting high targets and then penalising people, instead of incentivising innovation and technological change, which was the pathway that we were on before. Uh, the, the nervousness I have for uh, particularly the resources sector, a sector that we rely on for uh, the great royalties and tax income, the, 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 the money that pays for us to have high environmental standards that allow us to see more women and Indigenous people going into uh, mining companies in well-paid, uh, purposeful, meaningful jobs. Uh, these are all things that are now threatened by this headlong, headlong rush to emissions reductions within too short a time frame. I've been speaking to resources companies uh, right across Australia who are telling me that, uh, particularly following AEMO's report last week, that South Australia will be looking at further blackouts, that Victoria and New South Wales will suffer under the same uh, going forward in, over the next uh, two years, that we already know we do not have suitable uh, energy generation in this country. Uh, we know that the investment in transmission lines that's required to bring online uh, more renewable power, uh, but of course we also know that we don't have the capacity to mine the critical minerals and the uh, rare earths that are required to build solar panels and wind farms within the time frame that this legislation is outlining. We actually can't do it. And so mining uh, and resources companies who have to make the decision about investments, billion, multi-billion dollar investments uh, over the longer term, uh, they are now looking at Queensland in particular, but Australia more broadly, and saying, is this the place that we can trust to invest our dollars? And there's a big question mark over that. We compete in the world. The Fraser Institute uh, confidence survey uh, that is done every year has seen a Queensland specifically uh, slip from 12th to 18th for investment confidence and has seen um, uh, the, the understanding of regulation and confidence in that in the state slip from 3rd to, to 19th. These are appalling statistics. Western Australia, I'm pleased to say, still, still sits at one. But already these companies are looking at that, the slowness of, of approvals, the subjective nature of approvals, and now they've had to add one more element, and it is the, whether or not there is going to be adequate supply of power to run their projects. Uh, we, know, we know that they are now having to run the ruler over Australia as a destination and compare it to places like Canada, which has invested in pumped hydro and doesn't have the emissions uh, reductions um, that are, that are um, in line with, with um, some of the power generation in this country. And so they will be considering investing in Canada, in South America, in the US, in South Africa. These are all places that are competing with Australia for investment dollars. Investment dollars in Australia do a, a range of things. It's not just the introduction of royalties. It's not just the introduction of company taxes. Uh, it is also the personal PAYG taxes that are paid by those people who are employed by mining companies. And it's not just miners and, uh, uh, and engineers, it's, it's the chefs and the camps, it's people right across the industry who are receiving at least double the average salary in that sector than the average wage in this country. And they won't be replaced. They won't be replaced by any other industry that we're considering. They train our young people. They give them careers, well-paid careers, but in innovation and technology that we can then export around the world, whether it's mine rehabilitation, whether it's environmental scientists or whether it's engineers. Australia leads the way in a, a range of sectors that are associated with our resources industry. We should be proud of that. We should be proud of that and encouraging that and doing everything we can to ensure that those investment dollars come to this nation rather than choose to go to another jurisdiction. When we consider the, the tax income, uh, we think about big companies, we think about the, the big uh, industry leaders who invest in this nation, but we also have to remember the juniors, the explorers, the drillers. And when you consider every project that talks about hundreds of millions or billions of dollars in, in investments, those dollars are spent on Australian-based businesses who carry out the infrastructure, whether it's building a new rail line, uh, whether it's building roads, camps, 
uh, supplying the food, uh, the tyres. These are all spent on Australian businesses, who then in turn pay their own tax, employ their own employees. The depth of the impact that this ill-thought-through and rushed legislation is going to have on such a critically important part of our, our economy uh, and our nation, uh, I think, is terrifying. And we should do well to consider uh, what it is that, that we are um, proposing. So it is important in the dissenting report that was tabled uh, by the coalition uh, to this legislation, we sincerely um, looked at this idea of how we can review the impact of the legislation. Uh, we would like the Productivity Commission as the most logical, well-resourced uh, and focused group to review the impact of this legislation uh, as, it's, as it would play out in Australia. It needs to be regular. It needs to be at least five yearly, uh, and it needs to particularly understand the impact uh, on regional Australia, uh, which is where, of course, most of these resource activities happen. Uh, it needs to understand what is the impact on energy generation. Uh, we have not talked at all about the requirement for new transmission lines to allow renewable projects to be hooked up uh, to the grid. That requires new transmission lines. It requires more copper, more copper than we're currently mining, and yet we're not seeing new copper projects being bought uh, online in a speedy and fast manner. And in fact, we heard from the Japanese ambassador uh, several weeks ago, but also more recently, last night, the Minerals Week, uh, where he gave a speech which clearly outlined the undermining of confidence that uh, Japanese uh, companies, amongst others, are uh, now having, and their uncertainty about continuing to invest in Australia, not just in coal, but also in copper, in hydrogen, in rare earths. These are all critical investment decisions. Australia is a relatively small country with our 24 million people. We do not have the investment dollars to build some of these projects ourselves. We rely on being a destination for investment dollars. And I am worried about what this means for Australia not next year, not even in three years' time, but Australia 2030, Australia 2040 and the Australia that my grandchildren will live in. We hear a lot about that emissions reduction is the most critical thing we can do, but we had a plan, we had an effective plan to be able to use technology, not taxes, to use innovation and the very uh, smart people that we have working in this country to slowly, methodically and in, a, in an organised manner reduce emissions in this country. But instead, we are driving out investment dollars. We are driving out our resources sector. We are smashing the, the regional parts of our country. And I'm worried that we will slip back to being a very basic economy, one that we used to have in years gone by, where we didn't enjoy the high salaries, the high quality of life. I mean, we are blessed in this country that we have a quality of life, a standard of education, uh, of healthcare services, um, of uh, you know, even, even with our limited um, uh, skills and, and uh, workforce at the moment, we still have uh, childcare systems that are all something that we can be incredibly proud of. We do it in a way that is to the world's highest standards, both environmentally, but also to make money. It is not a dirty word for companies to be able to make money to make investment decisions in this country. Where are our trucks going to come from? Where are our drivers going to be able to get a return on their investment if they're not driving materials around Western Australia, Queensland, into Northern Australia? Where are we going to get the resources and the companies that are paying for these services? Uh, because our young people want to engage. They want a future. They want it to be safe. They want to work in an industry where a workplace safety is important. They want to work in an industry where environmental outcomes are important. They want to be paid for it. They want to be able to pay off their home. They want to be able to buy a new car. They want to be able to go away for the weekends. They want to be able to afford to train themselves and their family and their kids to have a better lifestyle than the one we've had today. And yet I sincerely worry that this rush to legislation, this rush to these emission uh, targets is not actually going to end up in the best outcome for Australia, much less for the world as a whole. 
We have some of the highest standards of coal, both metallurgical and thermal, in the world. But if you were to believe the rhetoric, we would stop, we would stop mining our highest quality resources and we would push those offshore to companies and countries that don't have the same standards we have that don't have the highest grade minerals and, and coal that we have. So whilst Australia might have reduced its emissions, the rest of the world won't have. Surely, surely that is not the outcome that we seek to pursue as a nation. We have a responsibility, both in this Senate and in the other place, to be making decisions that are good for this country, that are good for our young people, that enable everybody to be secure, and confident, and as I started, that are not making the decision about whether or not to buy food or to turn on the electricity. These are very, very serious discussions we're having, and I'm, I'm concerned that the, retro, the, the practical nature of our nation, of the industries that we rely on, are being lost. They're being lost in a really lovely statement. We've got to do more for the environment. We've got to do more for the world. I, nobody disagrees with living in a, a cleaner, well-managed uh, planet and nation. But what we do, we do have to seriously understand is that we live in a very competitive world. We compete every day as a nation for investment dollars, for our young people to stay in this country and work. Uh, and for the high quality of life that we have come to enjoy on the basis of the development of resources and agriculture in this land. And this legislation, this legislation is, is looking and will see this come to an end. And there is no replacement, there is no alternative to mining, to agricultural production for food security for both Australia and our near neighbours. So uh, I, I cannot support this legislation. I, I would hope that the government would, at the bare minimum, consider uh, passing uh, an amendment that would uh, see the Productivity Commission review the legislation and the impact on our nation, uh, and that it would do it regularly, and it allows for a pause to be set, uh, as we're seeing is happening in the UK, in Germany, in Europe, where they are discovering that the impact of uh, emissions reductions legislation that is too fast uh, just leads to the loss of jobs, to increased electricity prices, which will most impact the people in our society who are least able to get around it. The leafy green inner city seats uh, are not going to be impacted by this. They will be able to pay their way out of the impact of increased cost of food. Of, um, of electricity, and they may even be able to go without the well-paid jobs uh, that the resources sector and mining se and agricultural sector provides. But this is our responsibility to look after those people and ensure we don't legislate against them. Thank you, Senator McDonald. Now, Senator, Senator Pocock. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you, Senator Acting Senator Deputy Pocock. Chair. I rise today to speak in favour of this legislation. I was elected with a crystal clear mandate from South Australians to get action on climate change, and it's the reason that I'm here. South Australians are already feeling the devastating impacts of the climate crisis. In the summer of 2019-20, we experienced the Black Summer bushfires. They destroyed 196 homes. They injured our frontline responders including firefighters, and they tragically took the lives of three people. These are our families, our friends and our loved ones. And the fires also impacted our environment. They burnt about 280,000 hectares and they damaged 17 national parks and close to 70,000 livestock were killed and 40 to 50,000 of our beloved koalas. Every year we're experiencing worsening heat waves and droughts which are forecast to increase in intensity as the planet heats up. This affects the health of South Australians, particularly those who are most vulnerable, including our older people. It threatens our livelihoods and all the things we love most about our state and our country. It impacts our farmers, food production, the Murray River and our world-class wine industry. 
Many South Australians live on or enjoy our beautiful coast, but rising sea levels are forecast to put thousands of homes at risk of flooding towards the end of the century. And of course, we are witnessing an international crisis around climate change that affects not only our beautiful state and country, but is imposing terrible costs on the people of Pakistan and many other countries. These impacts are felt by everyone, but not felt equally by everyone. We know that climate change is having the worst impacts on those who are most vulnerable. We see this with the recent economic shocks caused in part by climate change, inflation from supply-side shocks. This has affected South Australians already struggling to make ends meet. It has affected the most vulnerable first and worst. Above all, we need to think about our young people. South Australian young people and our kids and their children to come who don't yet have a vote or a voice. They will be most impacted by the action or lack of action that we choose to take here in Canberra. Any decisions we make need to be first and foremost considering them. I'm constantly inspired by the activism and the active hope of young people, of school kids in our state. I joined the school strike for climate action not so long ago, and the young people there were calling for three things. An end to coal and gas, to move as quickly as possible to 100 per cent renewable energy generation, and certainly by 2030, and to fund a just transition for all those who work and live in our communities uh, where fossil fuel is a major area of economic activity. I'm also inspired by the farmers, the agronomists, the scientists, the engineers who are working hard to adapt to, to the impact of rising temperatures, of changing patterns of rainfall, of diminished rainfall. Um, they are working so hard to adapt our food production, our transport systems uh, and to make the changes that we know we must make. As I said in my first speech, I ran for senator because I made the mistake of reading the 2018 IPCC report and listening to the scientists studying climate change, just as I was asked to think about coming here. And I'm here so that I can look future generations in the eye and say I did everything I could with my colleagues. And South Australians have made this clear too. In polling conducted just before the federal election, a clear majority of South Australians indicated that change on climate action was a most important factor in deciding their vote. A clear majority indicated that the federal government needed to do more to address climate action, and we saw these results across our state, from the city and throughout our regions, in the polls and on the street. People were calling for urgent action to reach net zero emissions and to, to make sure we don't do any more uh, new coal or gas uh, uh, mines or, or coal-fired power stations, which only add to the crisis we face. South Australians know that a cleaner, greener future lies ahead and is possible. Our state has led the way with a renewable energy transformation. We switched off the last coal-fired power station in 2016, and at least 60 per cent of our electricity is now generated by renewables, second only to Tasmania. Last year, renewable energy generation exceeded demand in South Australia for 180 days. We know the solutions on climate change. We've got the tools we need to implement them, and South Australians are clear. Our Pacific neighbours are clear. The science is clear. We must stop opening new coal and gas fields. We must put the future of our kids before the interests of a small group of fossil fuel profiteers, mostly foreign-owned and paying too little tax, who are determined to wring their last fortunes out of its extraction while putting our future at risk. And we must restore confidence in our democracy by excluding fossil fuel money from politics and rooting out corruption. This bill represents a first step. It's not enough. We need to move faster and further than this bill allows. But the ratchet mechanism secured by the Greens means the target can be increased over time and won't go backwards. But we need more. We've already reached one degree of warming. South Australians and people across our country and the world are already experiencing the effects of this, including loss of livelihoods and life. If we want to make a tangible difference, this bill must be followed by strong action. We need to end all new coal and gas projects. 
We need to legislate a climate trigger to ensure new emissions intensive projects do not blow Australia's remaining and rapidly diminishing carbon budget. We need to increase our national targets to align with 1.5 degrees of warming and, most importantly, we need to make sure no one is left behind in our transition. This is why the Greens are calling for the implementation of a transition authority to support coal and gas communities, as well as advocating for women and for First Nations people to get a fair share of the jobs that are emerging in this new and growing economy. Labor cannot claim to take climate action seriously while backing new coal and gas. It just does not stack up. We know the transition to a low-carbon economy has to happen. The question is when. South Australians elected me because they want to see real action now. They know a cleaner, greener future is possible because we are already leading the way. It's time for Labor to catch up. It's time to get it done. Thank you. Senator Brown. Uh, thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. I rise today to speak on the Climate Change Bill 2022. Droughts, fires, pandemic and floods, four words which sum up the past decade. And I want to highlight the story of a former bus driver from Ballarat, the late Peter Gaylor. Although being a local and loved bus driver took up a fair chunk of Peter's day today, he still managed to find time to be a volunteer firefighter. In fact, he was a driver of fire trucks. Peter was also a proud and loyal member of the mighty Transport Workers' Union, and who I know, along with his colleagues, miss him dearly. Under the conditions of his enterprise agreement, Peter was able to take four weeks of paid leave to volunteer during the Black Summer bushfires in northeastern Victoria. Peter spent four weeks day in and day out protecting lives and residences, bushland and native habitat. His skills as a qualified heavy vehicle driver saved lives and his knack for driving protected the team of firefighters who were with him. The fires that Peter faced, faced head on were what many refer to as unprecedented. Lives were lost, species were put on the verge of extinction, 24 million hectares were burnt and more carbon dioxide was released into the atmosphere than Australia emits in a year. It is indisputable but that the sheer magnitude of what Peter and so many others faced during the bushfires was ex exacerbated due to climate change. The consequences of climate change are complex and interrelated. Acting on climate change will lead to a safer workplaces and safer roads for all road users, and we need to act now. We have seen climate change intensify with numerous challenging and devastating weather events in recent years. The science is clear and advancements are unanimous. Human activity has caused changes in our atmosphere. The changes have led to significant ongoing disruption in the world's climate. The IPCC sixth assessment report paints a stark picture of Australia's vulnerability. From a decline in agricultural production due to hotter, drier conditions through to the destruction of low-lying coastal areas due to rising sea levels. Importantly, addressing climate change brings with it a wealth of opportunities to support a transition which benefits working people and our communities. In Tasmania, the building of hydro has led to countless Tasmanian jobs, both directly and indirectly. The announcement made by the Prime Minister of an accelerated delivery of fee-free TAFE places will provide us with the skilled workforce that we will need to tackle a warming planet and a changing climate. We have a once-in-a-generation opportunity to shift to net zero economy. A report by the Business Council of Australia suggests that addressing climate change could add as much as $890 billion to our GDP by 2070. The immediate opportunities for Australians is grasping the renewables revolution. Under Labor's Powering Australia plan, the government will invest $20 billion to update our electricity grid to support more renewables 
coming into the system. The impact climate change is having on vulnerable communities is indisputable. Vulnerable communities already experience financial and social disadvantage with fewer resources to cope with, adapt to and recover from the effects of climate change. The purpose of the bill I rise to speak on today is simply to ensure that Australia's emissions reduction targets are recorded not only in international agreements but also in Commonwealth legislation, providing certainty and demonstrating commitment that is what this bill will achieve. Further, the bill will place obligations on the Commonwealth. The consequential amendment bill will insert the consideration of emissions reduction targets into 14 pieces of federal legislation. The legislation will cover Commonwealth departments, entities and schemes that are or could be contributing to national emissions reduction. Embedding emissions reduction targets in legislation will ensure that not only can Commonwealth departments, entities and schemes contribute to emissions reduction targets, but they can be a springboard for any future targets. Policy on the run is not the prerogative of this government. We will be informed by experts every step of the way. This legislation will bring experts back to the table by requiring independent review, independent advice from the Climate Change Authority when it comes to future emissions, reductions, targets and the action we, will, we take to reach them. This advice will be public and the minister will be obliged to both formally respond to it and take the advice into account in decision making. By requiring the minister to make an annual statement to parliament on the progress the government is making on climate change, governments can no longer avoid scrutiny. They will be directly accountable to the parliament and the Australian people and will have to explain the results of their actions with references to independent expert advice. This has been sorely missed over the last decades we saw our public service hollowed out under successive coalition governments. Our government is committed to revitalising our public service and encouraging frank advice. The legislation that we have before us is good. It's good for the country, good for the economy and good for young people. We know young people are taking action in their everyday lives to address climate change. Now they finally have a government who will take action alongside them. Today, being part of a government legislating the Climate Change Bill feels momentous, years in the making and fought for, for so many, by so many. It's important when we talk about young people because they have been on the front line of the chorus call for change. I know myself with two young children, 21 and 17, the work that they have been advocating for to, to ensure that we get to this day, that this day has finally come to be. And it's time to get on the right side of history. And I say that to those that are seeking to vote against this legislation. The reports, the advice, the scientific research, the reports from business, from all sector, all sectors of our society, and a plea for young, from young people to get this done, to start this necessary work before it is too late. All of those people are saying to those that are still, still on the wrong side of history, that still insist that taking action on climate change is not good for our country, is not good for our uh, economy, is not good for our young people. They're wrong. 
and it's not just the government that is saying that they're wrong. It's near every sector of Australian community, the business community, unions, scientific community. Young people are pleading with you. And I ask again to give up this fight that you have conducted over nearly the last 10 years and before and before and put this country first put the economy first put our young people first and join with the government to support what is going to be a, a momentous day. We will come back and we will look at this day when this piece of legislation goes through as being a, a momentous day, a day where there's going to be tra proper transparency and proper accountability. This what, that's what this bill seeks to do, to put into legislation to ensure that the minister responsible is accountable to not only the Australian community but to the Australian parliament. And that's what's been sorely missed over this last decade. And as I've said, it's important um, that we take time to consider the young people of Australia because they have been doing a lot of the heavy lifting, raising the debate and the discussion and engaging with politicians through their schools, talking to one another, talking to their parents, talking to their co-workers. They have been at the forefront of the campaign for this day. They are the front line of, the cli of climate change, change. They also are going to be on the front line on the, of innovation and action that we will need to take on climate change. And we know young people are already taking action in their everyday lives to address climate change. And now they have finally a government who will take action alongside them, alongside them. So I say to the opposition, do not ignore them. Come, put aside these failed debates that you your failed ideas that you keep continue to cling to because you're not doing this country any good. As I said, I'm so pleased to be part of a government who is finally taking climate change seriously. And I hear a collective sigh of relief everywhere I go that the Labor Party were elected as government, but the Labor Party has taken up the challenge of climate change. And I commend, Mr Deputy President, this bill to the Senate. Senator Stilljohn. Thank you. It has been almost a decade since we have had meaningful federal climate policy in this country. Now, in that time, we have lived through fires, we have lived through floods, we have endured heat waves of intensifying frequency and unimaginable scale, all of our own making. And by our own making, we must now urgently take action on climate change, the action that the public has demanded that we take. 
the ten thirsty years we have endured, all of us withered in the parched wasteland of climate policy, desperately calling for the government to act. Thrust into this very position of action, we find that the best that the Albanese government can offer the community, the student strikers, the doctors, the industry experts, the activists, those championing renewable energy that are demanding, that are so desperately hoping for urgent action to address the climate crisis. The best the Albanese government can do is offer a flimsy 43 per cent emissions reduction target that would be delivered too late to matter. This bill, as has been passed through the House, does not by any imagination, by any attempt to stretch the truth or the science go far enough to address the unravelling climate crisis that our community faces. This bill is the policy equivalent of pushing the food round your plate to create the illusion that you have eaten. Now we know ex precisely why the Albanese government has stopped so far well short of the targets that we know are needed within this bill to address the climate crisis. It is not because there is any doubt uh, around the veracity of these targets or their urgently needed nature, not because they would destroy the economy or cause the power industry or any of the other litany of feculent excuses that the government uses to muddy the rising waters, the reality around us. It is plainly because their fossil fuel paymasters, their corporate overlords, have said so. This is why the Albanese government last month opened up 50,000 new square kilometres of ocean and, uh, uh, and of land to, to gas and oil exploration. 50,000 kilometres. And yet in making the case for this piece of legislation, the Albanese government looks the community in the eye, it looks the climate strikers in the eye, it looks the members of Extinction Rebellion and of so many other organisations coming together to campaign for climate action. It looks them in the eye and says that this is action, while in the next breath opening up new coal and gas projects. It would be funny if it wasn't so cruel. The persistence of the fiction of Australian clean coal, this great technological delusion that has captured Australian politics for so long because it is so convenient to the donors and particularly the political parties that accept donations from the fossil fuel industry. It is why this government sits here in support of the Scarborough Gas Project, of the opening up of the development of the Beedaloo Basin, why they have refused to rule out uh, supporting uh, new fossil fuel projects as long as they stack up environmentally. I mean, give us a break. It's like endorsing asbestos as long as it doesn't cause mesothelioma. It's like endorsing great plagues of mosquitoes as long as they don't spread malaria. It is an absolute insult to the intelligence of the Australian public to suggest that on one hand a government can be taken seriously when suggesting it is acting on climate change while at the same time proposing to open up the Scarborough gas fields, to open up the Beedaloo Basin. 
Now, last week, the Senate uh, committee inquiry report on this bill revealed to the public uh, what uh, the community uh, have well long known that new coal and gas developments are fundamentally inconsistent with Australia's climate obligations. The world's two leading authorities on the issue, the International Energy Agency and the UN's Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, emphatically agree that not a single one of these projects stacks up if the object is to act, is to act on climate change. What that means is that the bill, as passed by the House and delivered to us in this Senate, categorically and objectively is not good enough. It does not stack up. However convenient it might be for members of this place to delude themselves that this bill goes far enough, it does not. The Greens' amendments that we will bring into this chamber are in line with the very bare minimum that we need to meaningfully mitigate catastrophic climate change. The bare minimum means, and say it with me, folks, a moratorium on new coal and gas. That is why the Greens are proposing amendments uh, to the emission reduction target of at least 75 per cent, not 43 per cent, by 2030. It means uh, that net zero needs to be achieved by 2035, not by 2050. And they will mean that working uh, towards uh, reaching negative emissions thereafter. Now, these sets of amendments which we shall bring, as I say, these are not the ceiling. This is not the astronomical height of human ambition. This is not the legislative equivalent of the Apollo program. This is the bare minimum. This is, for the young people of this country, a fighting chance. The opportunity to have for their generation the ability to live in a community that is not constantly battling climate crisis after climate crisis. You know, I was meeting with the Australian Red Cross just yesterday, and they were talking to me about the structural challenges that their organisation faces. A premier auxiliary uh, component to Australia's uh, disaster relief program. And do you know one of the main things they're facing? One of the main realities they're facing now? They were designed for a period of time when the Red Cross's disaster relief lasted four months. They have been in constant disaster uh, support mode for nearly four years now as constant natural disaster has fa followed continual natural disaster. Now, there may be some of the coal-powered ghouls in this place that mock the amendments, dismiss the amendments brought by the Greens uh, to this legislation as a half-baked lefty fantasy. I can see it now. The tweets are writing themselves in the office of the National Party, the Liberal Party and, I'm sure, in some right-wing sections of the Labour Party as well. But let us make no mistake. 75 per cent emissions reduction by 2035 is backed by unequivocal, unanimous, global scientific consensus global scientific consensus. There is no confusion. There is no debate. This is what is needed for our species to survive. And if we cannot get this right, we have no business taking seats in this place. The Greens have long been the lone voice in this place calling for climate action, actual climate action. It is the Greens who agitated 
uh, for what became the Clean Energy Act of 2011, which successfully reduced carbon emissions uh, before the coalition government repealed them in 2014. And now, once again, it is the Greens who will seek to legislate strong climate policy in this country. By supporting this bill, as put to us uh, in the House, particularly in the absence of the critical amendments that we have tabled in this chamber. Uh, the Greens have shown uh, our willingness to work with the Parliament on this, on this issue in the interests of just bloody getting on with it, of clearing a path for all of us to engage in the real work that must follow. The Australian public sent us a clear message at the May election. Take action on climate change and take it now. This is our mandate. This is our solemn sworn duty. This is our opportunity. This is our survival. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much. I rise to speak to the Climate Change Bill 2022. A more accurate name for this legislation would be Australia's Surrender Note. If you're about to be sacrificed to a false god, you should go kicking and screaming to the altar. In this case, the Labor government would have us go meekly to slaughter and thank the witch doctor holding the knife. This legislation is not in Australia's best interest. This Labor government is not acting <clears throat> in Australia's best interest. <clears throat> it is legislating drastic emissions reductions with virtually no indication of how this will be achieved or how much it will cost Australian taxpayers. In selling this stupidity, Labor promises a jobs bonanza in industries that do not exist and emissions reductions from technologies which do not exist. And with this legislation, Labor promises to make even larger cuts to emissions. This isn't going to stop at 43 per cent. The only guarantees from Labor's climate change folly and this legislation will be the death of Australian manufacturing and innovation, chronic high unemployment, reduced living, living conditions, standards, and even greater rises in the cost of living and doing business in Australia. It will make our current cost of living crisis seem like a walk in the park. If you don't believe me, just ask the Europeans. And it will make absolutely no meaningful di difference to global greenhouse gas emissions. Australia's total annual emissions are just shy of 500 million tonnes. The CSIRO, CSIRO stated this is our emissions is just over 1 per cent of global emissions. China's total annual emissions are approaching 12 billion tonnes. That's billion. In the past 20 years, China's share of global emissions has doubled from 15 to 30 per cent. China's emissions are projected to continue to increase for another decade, adding at least another 2 billion tonnes to their annual total. It will completely negate any reductions Australia might achieve. And what are you going to do when China reneges on its commitments, impose trade sanctions, or tell them how they're destroying the globe? I'd really like to know. What are you going to say or do? Labor wants Australians to live in tremendous pain for absolutely no gain. For decades now, Australian governments have spent many billions of taxpayers' dollars building wind farms and putting solar panels on household roofs. The result has been massive increases in the cost of energy for most households and businesses in the order of 300 per cent or more. At the same time, coal-fired power stations have been shut down prematurely and much of Australia has faced shortage of energy with worse to come in the future. And how has this been in Australia's best interest, especially given the global greenhouse gas emissions continue to rise, not fall? And just how friendly to the natural environment are all these wind farms and solar panels? You need 800 tonnes of concrete for the foundation of a single wind turbine which in turn requires burning up to 45 tonnes of coal to produce. 
Even more coal is used to make the steel and other metals in these turbines. Actually, it's about another 220 to 260 tonnes of coal to make one wind turbine. In North Queensland, they're clearing thousands of hectares of rainforest for wind farms killing our native flora and fauna. Great for the environment again. Where is screaming about that one? Are these your environmental credentials? Give me a break. And this is not long-lived technology. The turbines last about 20 years before they need replacing. Solar panels don't even last half as long. Look at the prime farming land being forever ruined to install solar panels. When they're broken up by a hailstorm or something, they leach toxic metals and chemicals into the soil. Where are all the useless old solar panels and wind terms going to be disposed of? Landfill? They do in America. Tell me what's your plan. Labor has plans everywhere. You're telling me you've got plans. What's your plan for this? Where are the solar panels and wind turbines? Maybe the Greens can tell me. They're pushing for this. I'm not against renewables, but this unnecessary rush is crippling us. And if these technologies are so great, let them compete on a level playing field instead of subsidising them at enormous cost to the taxpayers. We must manage the transition much better with a mixture of low emission coal, gas, hydro, wind, solar and nuclear, with the main priority being not to add to Australia's cost of living and ensure reliable supply. Consider the plans to increase the cost to consumers of purchasing and using vehicles with internal combustion engines <clears throat> to promote more uptake of electric vehicles. How will this do anything other than once again raise costs for consumers? Where is all the energy needed to power these EV fleet when we are already facing energy shortages that are only forecast to, forecast to become worse? Will the government subsidise the enormous cost of replacing the batteries in these fire-prone vehicles? How will it pay for it? In the end, all of these additional and increased costs must be borne by taxpayers and everyday consumers already struggling with sharp rises in the cost of living and rising interest rates. All of this will be imposed by elected people in this building who are not struggling with the cost of living and who have job and wage security that most Australians can only dream of, imposed by people with little scientific acumen, if any. Who cares what clueless politicians think about climate change? We should be listening to the credible scientists, those who don't peer review themselves anyway and make policy accordingly. This will hand un counted billions of dollars to foreign-owned multinationals already well-versed and exploiting weak labour and coalition governments and feasting on Australian taxpayers. This is the bright future Labor and its Greens and the Teals cohorts, and I've got to say, a couple of few of the Libs are thrown in there as well, like Senator Birmingham or Senator Bragg, or um, you know, and I can still name a couple more. And the rich are getting richer and the poor getting poorer, reducing our standard of living and making us a third world country. It's all based on the ridiculous idea that unless Australia does this, the entire world is doomed. That is completely untrue. It's all based on climate change modelling, which has been proven completely inaccurate. I wouldn't even trust or believe a word the IPCC say. Remember how we were told Australia's coast would be inundated by the sea while our dams went empty? Even we've had um, a Labor Party get up and say, well, the seas are rising. Well, they're not. Actually, some of the islands are growing in size. So this, and where is everyone wanting to, to sell their homes from the shoreline? No, they're not. I'm sure there's some prominent people in, in this place and business people who own prime land by the seaside. Why aren't they leaving? Why aren't they selling their properties? And we've had these predictions, the world's coming to an end, by countless people are saying the world's coming to an end. Really? Has it happened? So how have we been told? Actually, sometimes, and it hasn't happened. Remember how we were told we'd experience more frequent storms and bushfires. Well, we've heard that today. 
Well, it hasn't happened. The fact is natural weather-related disasters were more frequent before 1960 than they are today. You know, we don't relate to any, any, um, anything in this country before 1910 by the records because, you know what, there was hotter temperatures then in the late 1890s at that time, but we don't go back that far. Stop scaremongering in this chamber and in our schools. Our decisions must be based on the true proven science, not for political or individual financial gain. It isn't. We don't control the weather and we don't control the climate. It's been completely proven beyond any doubt that changes to the Earth's, Earth's axle tilt and orbit, solar cycles, volcanic activity and ocean temperature oscillations have a far greater influence on our climate. No matter what we do, it will never change our planet's national, natural occurrences that has occurred for millions of years. It's abundantly clear Labor and the Greens are deliberately ignoring the valuable lessons being delivered right now by Europe's failed experiment with renewable energy. European nations are now scrambling to fire up coal power stations to make up the shortfall of energy caused by an over-reliance on wind power. They've learned they can't rely on these intermittent technologies and that they must have reliable energy to keep homes heated and the lights on. In Germany, householders are now turning to firewood for energy to heat their homes. There is, in fact, such a high demand for wood, they're importing it from neighbouring Poland. In Britain, people are dying for lack of energy to heat their homes because it isn't available or it simply costs far too much. Labor is legislating the same disaster for Australia. Those Australians seeking to impose this disaster on our country has been hoodwinked by false prophets such as Tim Flannery to Al Gore to Greta Thunberg. Our children are being brainwashed into believing the world is coming to an end. If you accept this unproven rubbish, then maybe the deprivation and pain to come from this legislative disaster is a harsh but necessary lesson to follow the facts and the science rather than worshipping false prophets of doom. Malcolm Roberts, Senator Mar Malcolm Roberts has actually on many occasions have, has, um, stated he would debate Larissa Waters with regards to this and yet no one will take him up on it. Where have we really had the true debate? I'm not talking about, you know, we're politicians in this place and we have to make our decisions based on what we research and what we understand. I think this is beyond us and we really need to hear from the true scientists, not those that do their own peer reviews or those that push in their own agenda because they've been given jobs in, in organisations and getting paid, very well paid now for the positions that they hold. The decisions that we are going to make, and I'm pushing this 43 per cent, and this is only the floor of emissions targets in the country, this is going to have an impact on the cost of living to Australians. The cost of living to Australians now is, is killing them. They can't manage. People can't put food on the table. They're struggling to put a roof over their head. Families are living in their cars. This is only going to add cost to it. As I said in my speech, I'm not against renewables, but you actually have to look at what's happened in Europe and other countries around the world who have pushed this far <laughs> for a longer period of time than what we have, and we're heading down this path. Can't we see the impact it's going to have on our people here? To say you're going to create 600,000 jobs is a load of bloody BS as far as I'm concerned. Actually. Some of the science I've been told, it's actually going to lose that many jobs in Australia. How can you go to renewables when you're going to actually increase jobs? Where are the jobs coming from? Solar panels, you're clearing prime agricultural land, you're sticking the solar panels on it, and that's it, you walk away from it. Where is putting a wind turbine? Where has the jobs been created? I know industries and manufacturing are shutting down because they can't afford the electricity to run it in this country, so they're going overseas. That is what you're going to do to this country. 
and the things that we have relied on. You talk about the coal. How is digging up coal, which we should be using for our own energy in this country, we're exporting it? No problem. Let's export it. We're getting the dollars for it. So you've got a problem with exporting to China or India or any other country like that, and they're burning it. This is global. So what are you worried about? Do you think we have a blanket over our country that cutting back our emissions is going to save us? It doesn't work that way. This is global. So if you want to make the tough decisions, then cut down all, all the coal mines then. I'm against it because it doesn't make sense to me. We have new fire coal power stations that are 90 per cent emissions free. We have the coal. We have the resources. We have everything here. And you just want to shut it down? And we will end up a third world country because I warn you, in Africa you have countries there, 70 per cent don't have electricity. They're cooking in their homes by fires that gives them health issues. You've got children who can't do the homework because they don't have electricity. They don't have fridges to keep their food in or the medications. They are in poverty. This is where you've got us headed. This is where you've got the Australian people headed. So this is a stupid bloody policy that I and One Nation will never support. Put a plan uh, on the table where we will move forward with a renewables and other resources of energy that will build our country, not destroy it, and future generations. Senator Sheldon. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on the Climate Change Bill 2022. This is a bill that delivers on the government's commitment to restore national leadership on climate change. It provides the certainty and confidence needed to drive the transition to net zero by 2050. A decade has been squandered ignoring the urgency of the task before us. But now more than ever before, there is no time to be lost facing the reality of climate change and how it can devastate our lives. As Special Envoy for Disaster Recovery, I have been meeting communities directly affected by climate change. I have listened to what they have had to say. Now, we know that because of climate change, natural hazards will become more frequent and more severe. Floods, bushfires, violent storms and cyclones. And all too often the outcome of these natural hazards is a humanitarian disaster. If we apply real leadership to the disaster recovery task and listen to the communities affected, this does not always have to be the case. There is an alternative. Disaster recovery does not only involve cleaning up the days, weeks and months afterwards, it also means working alongside communities to reduce their future disaster risk through preparedness and mitigation. In the six weeks since being appointed to the Special Envoy role, I have visited communities in the Bega Valley in southern New South Wales, the Lockyer Valley in Queensland, the Hunter Valley in New South Wales, Western Sydney and the Northern Rivers region of northern New South Wales. In Cabago last week in the Bega Valley, I met locals including Zena Armstrong. Zena and others in her community have worked tirelessly since Cabago was knocked sideways by the 2019-20 Black Summer bushfires. Roads, bridges and other infrastructure were destroyed. Six people unfortunately lost their lives and 3,000 hectares were wiped out—300,000 hectares. And all this happened in a community of just 2,200 people. And yet Cabago is slowly pulling itself back together. Now, Zena told me, and she said, it helps to have a good stock of social capital before disaster hits. By social capital, she means a community's capacity to face immense hazards and overcome disaster, however adverse the circumstances that has arrived. A capacity derived from community cohesion and ability to adapt to quickly changing circumstances. Zuna also went on to say, there is also the challenge of legitimising unexpected leadership at times of crisis and balancing the wide range of community needs that arise. Last week I was in Ballina, Lismore, Huonbrook and Mullumbimby in the Northern Rivers region of New South Wales. I visited Cabbage Tree Island and an Aboriginal community in Ballina which was devastated by this year's floods. Chris Binge, the CEO of the Jali Local Aboriginal Land Council, gave me a tour of the island, which until the events of March was a thriving community of 27 homes. Now it's like a ghost town. Its residents have been relocated for safety reasons to nearby Wardell, 
while plans for the community's future are developed. Chris said, Mr Binge said, we are the biggest landholders in the Ballina Shire area, but we have struggled until now to get real attention. If we were a white corporation, people would be knocking down our doors to deal with us. I hear your plea, Chris. President, uh, Acting Deputy President, climate change and therefore disaster recovery is an area with national interest, not political point scoring, must take the lead. Last week in Lismore, I announced a $30 million return to business recovery grant. It was a perfect example of the bipartisan way in which we must go about disaster recovery. To announce the program, I was joined not only by the state member for Lismore, Janelle Safin, a good friend of mine, but also by the Nationals member for Page, Kevin Hogan, and the Lismore Mayor, Stephen Krieg. Steve is both an independent councillor and a business owner in the CBD. Steve spoke for his fellow business owners when he welcomed the Commercial Landlords Grant, saying it would take a great deal of pressure of businesses like this struggling to get back on their feet. But even as the disaster recovery has been, must be a bipartisan affair, that does not say improvements can't be made on previous approaches. Previously, funding arrangements have been, have been seen the vast majority of disaster funding going to immediate recovery rather than mitigation. That is, even though the evidence for the, from the US National Institute of Building Sciences shows that for every one dollar spent on mitigation, six dollars is saved in recovery, Disaster costs $38 billion annually, according to a 2021 Deloitte report. The same report calculates that without any changes to our approach, by 2060 disasters will cost the economy $94 billion per year. We need to significantly strengthen our capacity to cope with a disaster. That means we need to do more, not just to respond when disasters hit. The Albanese, gov Albanese government Disaster, refund, disaster Ready Fund will enable us to spend $200 million each year to change how individuals, communities and industry think about and act on disaster risk. In other words, increasing strength. The Disaster Ready Fund will replace the former government's $4.8 billion of emergency response fund, which failed to complete any mitigation projects that in the lead-up to the February-March floods. In the three years, it did not complete a single mitigation project or release a cent in recovery funding. Instead, it earned the government more than $800 million in interest, taking the total to nearly $5 billion with nothing to show for it. Now, during my recent visit to Cabago and Corma in Bega Valley, I heard from local woman Danielle Murphy and Christina Walters how the previous emergency response fund did not adequately focus on community needs for rebuilding after the Black Summer bushfires. Danielle describes, and I quote, withdrawal of supports which never realised their full potential and the herd mentality of recovery was her concerns. While in Bega last week I met with Arthur Roris, the Secretary of the South Coast Labor Council, Arthur has this week pulled together the very successful Union Town Conference in Wollongong, which directly addresses the important role of community in withstanding disaster. I also had an extensive briefing last week from Leanne Atkinson, acting CEO of the Bega Labor, a Local Aboriginal Land Council. Leanne told me of the importance of having local recovery agency on the ground and where they can, I quote, she said, remain nimble, which enables them to respond to the ever-changing needs of the community. The arm's length of Sydney or Canberra centric approach simply does not work. Now, our focus on investments in mitigation projects will help reduce some of the burden on taxpayers' funds that would otherwise have been incurred. Addressing vulnerability and the root causes of disasters is key to managing systematic risk, risk that increases as the effects of climate change mount. Repairing damaged and destroyed infrastructure is helpful and may protect some in the short term but alone it will never be, enough, never be enough to protect everyone or to ensure Australia's prosperity. Rather, inclusive and collective disaster risk reduction plans, efforts and actions are key to building communities and our response.
We've now reached a hard marker. I shall now proceed with Senator's statements. Senator Shikoni. Thank you very much, Deputy President. Thank you for that. Um, Tuesday last week was National Forestry Day, and uh, as most people would know, I'm very uh, not just passionate, but uh, it's an industry is very close to my heart. And uh, the communities that this industry support right across Australia, and particularly around the many regional communities uh, in my home state of Victoria. I think it's a great time to be talking about uh, forestry in the context of, of the Albanese Labor government's plan to tackle climate change, as well as the Jobs and Skills Summit from last week. I had the pleasure of returning uh, to Australian Sustainable Hardwoods, or ASH, as it is commonly known, in, in Gippsland last month, accompanied by the Minister for Forestry, uh, Senator Watt, and the local federal member for Gippsland, Darren Chester. Ash is Australia's leading manufacturer of timber products. And I visited their impressive facility uh, several times now, and it was great to return with uh, my good friend uh, Senator Watt as part of the government and, of course, uh, the Nationals MP, Darren Chester. Labor took a bold vision to the election. We have set ourselves the task of building a, a better future by bringing the country together. We know we need to invest in skills and to create good jobs, the very kind of jobs that you can support uh, not just yourself but also your family and your community. Ash is a model employer. It sets an example for the kinds of businesses that we want to encourage uh, in our our economy, but also in regional communities. Uh, the company employs uh, apprentices, it trains people right on the site, and provides clear career pathways. All the managers at Ash have started on the shop floor. They uh, invest back into their business to create more opportunities, more opportunities for their workers, more opportunities for the local community. And we heard about the growing number of women uh, in their workforce, thanks to investments made in advanced manufacturing processes. And it was great to meet uh, with a number of the, of the workers, particularly Kerry, one of the delegates on site, and a long-standing uh, employee of Ash. They have also have a very strong working relationship uh, with the union. For the record, uh, the CFMEU, the manufacturing division, that is. Uh, work very constructively with management and with the, uh, the workers and other members of the community. They work together to professionally address any issues on site and both make an important effort to advance the forestry industry. They know that protecting and growing the industry is in the interests of the workers and of the business. Ash also supports the local community by providing funding for projects undertaken by groups like the local sporting clubs. These practices of education, investment, cooperation and community engagement are exactly the kinds of practices that we were discussing just last week at the Jobs and Skills Summit. And these are the principles that the Albanese government believes must underpin our economy. It is great to see this spirit of cooperation at individual businesses like Ash and at a macro level at the Jobs and Skills Summit. This is what it will take to tackle the big challenges that we are facing as a country, including addressing the labour shortages, the wage stagnation, the rising cost of living and, of course, climate change. Speaking of climate change, no discussion about our forestry industry would be complete without talking about the significant contribution it makes to reducing our carbon footprint. Plantations, tree plantations in Victoria, store around 8.4 million tonnes of carbon dioxide each year, and this timber can be used instead of less sustainable products to manufacture products and buildings. Timber really is an ultimate renewable source. 
That's what makes it even more infuriating when supposedly environmentally minded activists attack this industry. Anti-forestry propaganda damages our ability to take meaningful action on climate change. Last year in this chamber, I spoke about a paper that was published by the Centre of Policy Studies at Victoria University entitled Zero Greenhouse Gas Emissions by 2050, what it means for the Australian economy, industries and regions. The paper showed that in taking action to pursue net zero, our forestry industry would almost double in size. This clearly demonstrates that forestry is key to our low emissions future. So not only are anti-forestry activists disrupting the lives of our timber workers and hurting industry that supports regional communities, they are making it more difficult for us to reach our climate goals. So when Minister Watt, Darren Chester and myself were being shown around ash in Hayfield, we were looking at the kind of business that Australia's future must be built on. A business providing good jobs, training and career pathways. A business that works collaboratively with the union movement and also a business that through its activities is playing an important role in tackling climate change. Ash is not only the only forestry-related business that I've had uh, the pleasure of visiting recently. I also spent some time at the Sorbet Paper Company Mill in Box Hill, down the road from my electorate office. Sorbent has a really sophisticated operation, and it was great to meet, and so not just meet, but also get an understanding of how we produce a very sophisticated product, uh, Deputy President, Australian toilet paper, our facial tissues and hand towels, which I'm sure all Australians were in desperate need during the last couple of years during the pandemic. And I don't think uh, any of us in this place ever expected toilet paper to be such an important subject of public debate. But panic buying brought on by the pandemic ensured that toilet paper was all over the front pages and social media. But it just showed us how important it is that we do need to have a very secure and sustainable supply chain in this country. I enjoyed hearing from the Sorbent team about how they managed to supply through this period to keep a steady flow of stock to supermarkets and other retailers, and how they are continuing to innovate and produce Australian-made products. I want to thank Denise Campbell-Burns, the National President of the CFMEU Manufacturing Division, for setting up this visit to the Sorbonne facility. It was fantastic to meet many of the members and workers who were there and who have kept this mill going for many, many years. Some of these workers have been there for decades, actually, Deputy President, producing goods that Australians use every single day. And I think sometimes these sort of jobs get lost in discussions about work, whether that's in parliaments, the media or academia. We sometimes think of these long-term secure jobs as things of the past, but these are jobs that we should all aim to build for the future. There's no reason that well-paid, secure jobs with long-term career pathways have to be a thing of the past. Ash and Sorbent are already showing us that these jobs can and should exist in a modern Australia. Good businesses and strong unions working together to create secure jobs. I'm proud to be, of an, be part of an Albanese Labor government that is committed to making sure that more of the jobs created in Australia look like these jobs. We'll achieve this by resisting the politics of division. There are some that do want to put businesses and unions against each other, big business against small business, workers against unions. But this is not the approach of this Labor government. Our approach was on display last week at the Jobs and Skills Summit. We have big challenges and big opportunities ahead of us to meet these challenges and seize on these opportunities so that we can all work together. Governments, business, unions, civil societies. And I'm encouraged by the spirit of cooperation that we've already seen around the country, whether it's at businesses like Ash or Sorbent, at the 100 local jobs and skills summits helped by the government right across Australia or indeed at the main event last week. And I want to thank again 
Minister Watt for visiting uh, Gippsland, to Darren Chester for uh, showing us around his uh, great electorate, as well as the CFMU Manufacturing Division and the Sorbent Company for organising that visit in Box Hill some weeks ago. Senator McGrath. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy President. It is important today that I use this time to reflect on my home state of Queensland and in particular praise the Brisbane City Council for their significant contribution to Brisbane over the past decade. In particular, I want to recognise the great work over the last three years under the leadership of Lord Mayor Adrian Schrinner. While there are over 500 local government bodies across Australia, the Brisbane City Council is Australia's largest council serving a population of over 1.2 million people. It goes without saying that the successful administration of this grassroots local government does not come without, without its challenges, especially with a constituency of this size. As such, much praise is due for Team Schrinner's work in putting the Brisbane City Council on the map and furthering Brisbane's reputation as Australia's most livable city. If we take a moment to reflect upon the financial stresses and pressures facing ratepayers and small businesses during the height of the COVID-19 pandemic, the Brisbane City Council's commitment to their constituents during this time was both firm and unfaltering. Rates were frozen for council residents and CBD businesses, providing much needed support where it was due. Fast forward to when the International Olympic Committee selected Brisbane as the host city of the 2032 Olympic Games. The Brisbane City Council got to work immediately, engaging all levels of government to ensure the timely and successful delivery of the world's largest sporting event, an event that a former Lord Mayor of Brisbane, Graham Quirk, had the foresight and the vision to argue for for many years, saying it was Brisbane's time to hold the Olympic Games. We have city-shaping projects like the Brisbane Metro, Green Bridges and the transformation of Victoria Park, which are underway thanks to the forward thinking of Team Schrinner in recognising these as important infrastructure assets in reading Brisbane for the Games but also for the future. In particular, the Council's commitment to city-shaping transport infrastructure is really shown in the delivery of the new Brisbane Metro. The Brisbane City Council is providing the turn-up-and-go metro that Brisbane residents need to get home sooner and safer. Gone are the days of inefficient and unreliable public transport, with great progress being made to link the city to the suburbs and the suburbs to the suburbs. Team Schrinner must be commended for its functional execution of fully electric, high-capacity metros that are ensuring Brisbane remains the most livable city in Australia. Not only that, but the Brisbane City Council is also actively growing a greener Brisbane. More than 13,000 trees have been planted along the residential footpaths as part of the Greener Suburbs project, while bringing people together through community planting initiatives. Meanwhile, the Council has also managed over 9,500 hectares of natural conservation areas whilst facilitating nature-based activities and for the protection of our biodiversity. A cleaner, greener Brisbane is a key priority for Team Schrinner. However, it cannot be forgotten that all of this has been delivered despite the devastating flooding which affected Brisbane residents particularly hard earlier this year. The sheer volume of rain experienced had a devastating impact across the city. It affected more than 20,000 properties and almost 200 community and sports clubs across 177 suburbs, grounding city cats and ferries and damaging roads, parks, paths and bikeways. The outstanding work of Team Schrinner both during and after the floods was commendable. Under Team Schrinner's direction, the Council single-handedly provided more than $4.5 million in rates relief for affected residents and greater than $1.5 million in financial relief for community organisations. This was alongside the cleaning of 170 kilometres worth of bikeways and the filling in of more than 70,000 potholes. We've seen Councillor James Mackay's satellite landfill initiative to streamline the waste clearing process and Councillor Sarah Hutton's recharge station initiatives for powerless residents, and Ryan Murphy's transport reforms, 
all fantastic, fantastic examples of Brisbane City Councils getting creative to deliver for their constituents and demonstrate their initiative and the vision that Team Trina offers Brisbane residents. It is clear that the Brisbane City Council have made an impressive commitment to build back better and protect the lifestyle of all Brisbane residents. At all, levels of, at all levels of government, especially local government, residents want and expect their elected representatives to deliver the basic services they need to make their life easier. But, but, but Deputy President, while, te while Team Schrinner keep delivering for Brisbane, there remains one obvious handbrake on progress in Queensland, and that, and that of, course, that of course, is the Queensland Labor government and that shiny, shimmering, red carpet-hugging Premier Anastasia Palaszczuk. From cancelling cabinet meetings—and this is true—so she can sail with her boyfriend and billionaires and celebrities on a glitzy yacht off Hamilton Shiny. Island, to integrity and health crisis. Remember when goons from the Premier's office raided uh, the, the, the private office of the Integrity Commissioner and stole the laptop and had it wiped? We all wonder what was on the laptop, don't we? What photos were on that la laptop, Premier Palaszczuk? Uh, Queenslanders have clearly had enough of Palaszczuk and the rotten Labor Party in our state. But unfortunately for Queenslanders, Anastasia Palaszczuk is more concerned with how things look rather than how things are, which says a lot about why she's hired the entire press gallery in Queensland to avoid media scrutiny. How many? Well, she now has a, she now has a media uh, Senator Scar, I'll answer your question. She now has a media team the size of which no Premier or no Prime Minister in Australia has ever had before. She has cross government over two hundred and fifty full time minions 250 taxpayer-funded staff who are all about the image of the Premier and her ministers. So, oh, keep it. We've got low, low unemployment in Queensland thanks to, to the government employing everybody in, in the Premier's office. So, in her own private media team, uh, she has more than any, any particular newsroom in, in Queensland. So she's very good at hiring externos. She's very good at making sure that her image is out there, but she's not very good at delivering for Queenslanders. Now, if you look across Queensland, there's a lot of problems in Queensland. Now, Queenslanders have to wait over seven hours over the recommended time in emergency wards. That's seven hours over the recommended time. People are dying in ambulances outside hospitals because the ambulances are being ramped, but people are dying, in the hospital, are dying in the ambulances. This is what's happening in Queensland today. This is not some third world country where they don't have operating hospitals. This is Queensland. 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 And that's right. Remember, this is the Premier who said during the height of COVID, said that, oh, Queensland hospitals are for Queenslanders. Not about that hospitals are actually for sick people. Not about playing this, this petty partisan politics. Now, 40 per cent of ambulances are ramped, but the Premier she's got hundreds of press officers. Babies are being born on the side of highways because regional maternity wards are being closed. The AMA recommends at least an extra 1,500 hospital beds just to meet demand. Now, Premier Palaszczuk and her, her failed dunce of a health minister you know, gallivant around the state cutting health spending in real terms and rubbing shoulders with anyone but our hard-working frontline workers. Their priorities are cooked. Their vision for Queensland is cooked. Their, their service for sick people in Queensland is completely cooked because it's Queenslanders who are paying the price of this arrogant, out-of-touch Premier who would prefer to spend her time at the at first nights, on glitzy yachts, the at the Logies. She is the premier for, for first nights. She's not the premier for overnight in hospital because she doesn't want to see that the sick state that Queensland is in because of her mismanagement. There are 55,000 people in Queensland waiting for elective surgery. That has doubled by, by more than, by more than 25,000 since she came to power. But it, but it gets worse. They've got a waiting list for a waiting list. There's 230,000 people on the waiting list to get on the waiting list. 
So welcome to Queensland. You know, perfect one day, sick the next day, under this, this malignant, this, this poisonous Labor government who want to just play politics and not want to get on and ensure that Queenslanders have the health system that they deserve. And I'll give a, give a teaser. I'll come back tomorrow and talk about what some of those other cabinet ministers are doing in Queensland. And guess what? It's not good. Senator McKim. Thanks very much, Acting Deputy President. Well, uh, Takaina Takai, on uh, in the northwest of uh, my home state of Lutruida, Troana, Tasmania, is stolen land. It was never ceded by Aboriginal people, and it still belongs to them. It's also one of the most beautiful places in the world. It's a place uh, of peaceful rivers, of, uh, of rugged mountains, of majestic um, forests. It's a place of the most striking uh, rocky coastlines and um, sweeping beaches that are pounded by um, the westerly and southwesterly swells that sweep in from the Southern Ocean. It's also home to some of the cleanest air in the world that travels three quarters of the way around our globe before it strikes those coastlines. It's globally recognised uh, for its link to the ancient supercontinent of Gondwana land. And the forests, of course, in Tekina Tarkine are an incredibly important carbon sink. It contains a massive tract of Gondwanan cool, temperate rainforest. And those forests, the mountains, the coastlines, the rivers of Tekina Tarkine are worthy of protection. And they're not worthy of the exploitation that they are facing at the moment. What we should be doing is listing Tekina Tarkine as part of the Tasmania Wilderness World Heritage Area. We should be making it a national park and we should be returning it to the people under whose stewardship it existed for many, many tens of thousands of years, the Tekina people. Now, in that area, there is a company, MMG, a Chinese state owned mining giant. And MMG has a plan to destroy nearly 300 hectares of this precious place, of that precious, carbon-rich, threatened species-rich rainforest, in order to build a toxic tailing dam at their mine site near Rosebury. Now they've made an application to uh, to do this under the EPBC. Act and the decision now, as we sit here today, rests with the relatively new environment minister, Ms. Plibersek. This minister is now the seventh consecutive environment minister to ignore the Australian Heritage Council's findings that Tekina Tarkine holds outstanding heritage values and has a high probability of meeting the criteria for World Heritage Listing and the Australian Heritage Council's recommendation that the area actually be listed on our country's national heritage list. That's what the minister should be doing, listing this beautiful place on the national heritage list as recommended by the Australian Heritage Council and nominating it for inclusion in the Tasmanian Wilderness World Heritage Area. But instead, the minister is now considering MMG's application for a toxic tailing stamp. It's important that folks understand that MMG has an alternative solution for its tailings, and that is actually what the company should be pursuing. And in recent times, thanks to a massive citizen science project, the Bob Brown Foundation took hundreds, many hundreds of recordings of masked owls, an endangered species, a listed endangered species, on the very site of the proposed tailing dam. And those recordings included breeding calls and chattering calls, which indicates, of course, that juvenile 
masked owls uh, live in that forest. Now, it's not just the masked owl, a magnificent and striking um, predator bird, an endemic species to Tasmania, um, that are going to have their homes destroyed by this proposed tailing stand. We've got the spotted, ta spotted tailed quoll, uh, the wedge tailed eagle, and the Tasmanian devil, all resident in this area. Successive governments and successive ministers have failed in their duty to protect Tekina Tarkine, failed in their duty to nominate, nominate that area for inclusion in the Tasmanian Wilderness World Heritage Area, despite, despite the International Union for the Conservation of Nature having twice requested that the, name, that the nomination be brought forward. So, to Minister Plibersek, Plibersek I say, do the right thing, protect Tekina Tarkine on behalf of the people of Tasmania, the people of Australia and the people of the globe. Do it for people alive now and people who are not yet born, and do it as soon as you possibly can. And as part of that, please reject this application from MMG for a toxic tailing stamp. That is an unacceptable imposition on one of the most beautiful, important, carbon-rich places in the world. Now, it's not a coincidence that as the fight to protect nature and climate gets ever more desperate, governments around this country are doing more and more to protect big corporations from ordinary people who are fighting back. And that includes folks involved with the Bob Brown Foundation down in my home state of Tasmania, but it includes people all around this country who are fighting to defend nature, who are fighting for real climate action by putting their bodies on the line and good on them and more power to them for doing it. We've seen in Tasmania and other states governments smashing freedom of speech and freedom of action and passing draconian anti-protest laws. It's a pattern we're seeing repeated around the country. And it's being done because they're trying to arrest their way out of the citizen rebellion, which is growing by the day in this country. Well, they will soon find that they haven't got jails big enough for us all. That's what they will find. Because on the one side, you've got the big corporations run by psychopathic CEOs and senior managers who are determined to strip as much profit as they can out of this late-stage disaster capitalist system that we are living under, while burning the planet just as quickly as they can. And then they've got their agents in this place, politicians from the major parties, the agents of those psychopaths who come in here and do their bidding. That's on one side. And on the other side, and these are the real climate wars I'm talking about, not Mr Albanese's um, confected climate wars. These are the real climate wars. And on the other side are those brave, heroic people who are standing up against those massive corporations, putting their bodies on the line to defend nature, to defend our climate and to call for real climate action and real action to protect biodiversity. We in the Greens know which side of the fight we're on. I invite other folks in this chamber to have a think about which side of the fight they find themselves on. Some of us are prepared to stand up and take the fight directly to those psychopathic corporations and take the fight directly to their agents in this place, those people who are purchased by those massive corporate donations, the institutionalised bribes that flow so rapidly and uh, at such size around this building. At the behest of their big polluting corporate donors, Liberal and Labor governments are trying to bankrupt people 
and put them in prison when the only thing they've done is try to stand up for a livable planet and stand up for a sustainable future for their children and their grandchildren. Well, silencing people will not work. No amount of anti-democratic, draconian legislation is going to protect big corporations from the consequences of their actions. The people of Australia want nature protected. They want real climate action, not the facade being offered by this government, and they want a safe, inhabitable climate for themselves and for their children. Senator Sheldon. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Acting Deputy President. Well, one of the major criticisms of the Morrison government was that they never took accountability for their mistakes. They went to great lengths to never admit when they were wrong. Now, this new Labor government is committed to being accountable. And in that spirit, I want to acknowledge that our bargaining system, with which both parties have contributed towards, does not work. The single enterprise centric bargaining system introduced by Labor in the 1990s is no longer fit for purpose. To end the right for workers to pursue multiple employer agreements was a mistake. That system laid the groundwork for subsequent coalition governments to launch a full-scale assault on the rights of workers to collectively bargain. It opened the door for the Howard government's work choices legislation and some of the most extreme anti-worker legislation ever introduced into the developed world. Labor sought to repair that damage done by work choices through the Fair Work Act in the late 2000s. And the Fair Work Act included in a provision for multi-employer bargaining in low-paid industries, but that provision has failed. It has failed to create a real multi-employer bargaining option for low-paid industries. And worse still, the Act has had loopholes that employers have been exploited to drive wages down. The nine years of the Abbott, Turnbull and Morrison governments were the worst period for wages in Australia's history. It was a lost decade for the Australian middle class. We've had almost an entire decade where wages and the standard of living for the Australian middle class has gone backwards. This government was elected on a mandate to ensure that Australian workers do not go any further backwards. We were elected on a mandate to ensure that we get real wages growing again. But to be blunt, wages will not grow if we do not fix our industrial relations system. It's that simple. We've seen productivity growth, we've seen massive profit growth, but none of that is getting through to workers. Fundamentally, that means Australian workers do not have enough power to bargain for their fair share. If you don't have power to bargain, all you have left is the Oliver Twist approach, favoured by the last government, where workers have to come on their hands and knees to their employer and say, please, sir, can I have some more? And even where good employers want to give their workers a fair go, they are inevitably undercut by dodgy employers who want to squeeze every last penny out of their workforce. So how do we get put real power back in the hands of Australian workers? Firstly, we need to undo the mistakes of the last few decades and cut the real red tape preventing multi-employer bargaining. We need multi-employer bargaining in industries where low pay is entrenched as part of doing business. And I'm talking about such industries such as childcare, where today thousands of workers are taking strike action to fight for a fair go. I'm talking about industries like aged care, where nine in ten workers are hired in, on insecure part-time or casual contracts. Unless workers in these industries can bargain collectively, they do not have the power to get paid the fair value for their essential work. Ray Collins, an aged care organiser at the Health Workers Union, told the security, job security inquiry last year, and I quote, the business model to operate when you're using a casualised workforce is to keep everybody hungry, lean and green. Ray told us how aged care employers hire their entire workforces on part-time contracts where each worker is only guaranteed a few hours a week. They might work a 30-hour week, but they are only guaranteed three hours. So if anyone complains about having not having PPE or not having enough time to properly 
care for residents, the employer can take almost all their hours away and throw them into poverty. If someone doesn't agree to take on a shift with one hour's notice, they lose their hours. Aged care workers are put in a position where they are constantly on call, where they can't take leave, where they can't speak up about any problems, because at the drop of a hat their employer can take all of their hours away. Sherry Clark, an aged care nurse, told the Job Security Inquiry, and I quote, When my mother went through cancer, I couldn't tell her that I would support her to, to her cancer appointments. Because if I'm not available to pick up a shift, they don't offer you the shift the next time. And Sherry can't do anything about this because they do not have a real voice or real bargaining power. And it's, only happening in the, it's not only happening in the care industries that have been underpaid and undervalued for years. Even in jobs that used to be well paid and strongly unionised, the lack of worker voice is driving a race to the bottom. Now look at aviation. Getting a job at Qantas used to mean a lifelong career. It used to be where, where you're a pilot or a flight attendant or a ground handler at Qantas, you were the cream of the crop. You could raise a family. You were highly trained and highly experienced. You took pride in your work and because you were the best of the best. And you were paid a rate of pay that reflected that. That was the spirit of Australia. But not anymore. Our industrial relations system has failed Qantas workers as it's failed many Australians. It has failed to give them proper voice and proper power. And Alan Joyce has steamrolled them all and led the way for so many more. Qantas has set up shell companies to hire workers on lower paying conditions than direct Qantas employees. And he gradually moved the entire workforce onto these shell companies. Or worse still, he moved them to external labour hire firms. He illegally outsourced nearly 2,000 people. And the federal court said that he did not have to rehire them because he would probably sack them again anyway. And on Four Corners on Monday night, we saw brave and current former Qantas employees speak out about this. There was Matthew Olsop, who was a flight attendant at Qantas for 16 years. And to quote Matthew, I was with a Qantas group of companies just shy of 16 years. I worked for wholly owned subsidiaries or labour hire firms, but I never actually worked for Qantas Airways. On any given day, you would have crew employed under four different contracts. So we had our wholly owned New Zealand-based subsidiary, the UK-based subsidiary, and then you had in your two Australian subsidiaries. And each time they slowly erode the high value of paying conditions that once existed in the legacy air part of the airline. And Alan Joyce can do this because Qantas workers do not have real bargaining power. If you have workers on one plane being hired by five different companies, but they can't even bargain together, you have no power. And it's the same story in the mining industry. BHP has dusted off the Alan Joyce playbook and set up their own shell company as well. They call it BHP Operation Services. Now, BHP told the Job Security Inquiry that not only 20, that only 29 per cent of workers on their mine sites are actually employed by BHP. Only 29 per cent. The rest are employed by the shell company or external labour hire firms. And they are paid an average of 24 per cent less for doing the exact same job. A 24 per cent pay cut for these workers because they do not have the real bargaining power. They can't bargain directly with BHP because BHP is not technically their employer. And if you want to fix the wages disaster of the last decade, we need to fix bargaining. Because Qantas, BHP and so many others are making a mockery of our industrial relations system. And again, if today, only today, if you look at the ABS statistics that has just come through, and you'll see that the sorts of figures that have come through and the effect on so many Australians and the disconnect with what's a fair labour return. Real unit labour costs have dropped for four successive quarters as a result of the previous government. 
while the labour share of income has fallen to a new record low and the profit share has hit a new high, according to ABS national accounts data released today. It's companies like Qantas and BHP that have gamed the system over the last decade. There is an opportunity for us to change that system where there's a fair share for all, and all Australians, all Australians and the Australian middle class can get their fair share of the Australian pie. Senator Van. Deputy President. The situation in Ukraine affects us all. Russia's unjust and illegal invasion has upended Europe and the globe through food shortages, fuel shortages and inflation. The knock-on effects are reverberating around the world, yet only a handful of countries are assisting, many are not, and some are not even condemning this heinous breach of international law. As a major exporter for critical food supplies such as wheat, barley, corn and sunflower oil, we, we will likely see an increasingly more volatile and unstable world as food shortages increase. This will affect our security more directly as many of our closest neighbours are heavily reliant on Ukrainian wheat and they will be impacted by not only the high pro, uh, high prices, but by the lack of supply. One only has to look to Sri Lanka for the effect of poor economic conditions and food shortages as had on the, that nation's stability. As some will be aware, I recently travelled to Ukraine, not just to Kiev for a photo op, but into the theatre of operations in Donbass, to see where the Australian donated bushmasters, built and donated bushmasters, are being used by the Ukrainian troops. I was able to gain an immense amount of first-hand knowledge by being there and speaking to the people and seeing the war unfold before my eyes. Which is why it's an absolute travesty that this government has not reopened its, our, our embassy in Ukraine. Some of you will know that our embassy uh, in Ukraine shares a building with the Canadian embassy. And it was truly a sad sight on my morning jog, the first morning I was in Kiev, to see a Canadian flag flying above that building, but not an Australian one. Many, if not most other countries, have returned their embassies to Kiev, and I call on this government to send our wonderful ambassador, Bruce Edwards, back from Warsaw to Kiev, along with a defence attaché and a large defence contingent. Why? Because there is a lot to learn from this war and in this increasingly complex strategic environment that we find ourselves, we should be doing everything possible to learn as much as possible about how this war is being fought. In fact, that is why many embassies in Ukraine have sent in a somewhat large defence contingent located in country so that they cannot just support Ukraine to the best of their ability, but also so that they can learn as much as possible and incorporate that knowledge into future fighting plans. One of the major lessons I learned from my time in the Donbass Theatre of Operations was the importance of com combined arms fighting and how this is shaping the battlefield. And despite what many analysts are saying, combined arms is working incredibly effectively in that area. And this just goes to show the importance of having people in country learning firsthand from the events on the ground. One of the things I learned is that the Ukrainians are using our bushmasters more like an infantry fighting vehicle than a protected mobility vehicle, which was what they were built for. But they are proving effective in battle and saving lives, even though this is something that they were not made for. Yet in the meantime, this government is sitting on its hands and not making any decision on the Land 400 Phase, B, phase 3B project, a project which would put our troops in much safer vehicles than the current Bushmaster or Boxer. Let us not forget that if Russia stops fighting, uh, the, the war will end. But if Ukraine stops fighting because of a lack of support, the Ukraine ends. 
as a country. However, Ukraine needs a firepower to end this war. This means Australia and other countries, particularly European countries, whose part of the world this war is being fought in, must provide more weapons to Ukraine. From Australia, this should include more Bushmasters, at least 60 more than uh, have already been committed to arm another brigade. I met with the, the commanding officer of the 80th Brigade, the uh, air assault troops that are using them to plug the lines when the Russians try and break the battle lines. But as uh, Ukraine's ambassador uh, suggested this week, we should be sending Hawkeyes, another protected mobility vehicle. We should be sending 777 howitzers and the 155 ammunition that, uh, that they're fired from, as well as the high technology weapons such as the Defentex drones that we've sent in there and the drone shield air defence system, all made in Australia. Other countries should be sending air defence uh, materiel as well, including fighter jets, guided missiles, as well as more armour, particularly tanks, especially tanks like the German Leopard tanks, of which there are thousands of sitting idle, as well as IFEs and more artillery. Yes, helmets are helpful, but it won't help Ukraine win this war. We must also reassess who we look to in the future to complete defence deals with. The war in Ukraine has highlighted how many countries in Europe have been unwilling in meaningful ways to help one of their closest neighbours in this fight. If we are to shore up our own security, we cannot be relying on those who won't protect their neighbours, let alone a country on the other side of the globe. As Ukraine comes into winter, we must also start looking at providing them with more humanitarian aid. The word that everyone's using over there at the moment is winterisation. How do they protect their people who are being damaged by the war, their homes destroyed by Russian missiles and rockets? How do we protect them during the cold of a Ukraine winter? Ukrainian winters get down to minus 10 quite often, and the fear is that more people will die of cold than from Russian bullets and missiles. With temperatures like that, provisions such as materials for housing repairs, which we don't need to ship, we could pay for, or replacement shelter like flat pack housing, warm clothes that they've lost when their houses have been blown up, and energy such as more coal and gas shipments are desperately needed in the coming winter. The Ukrainian people are warm, generous, resilient people and are dedicated to defeating the army of Putin's murderous regime. Virtually everyone I met there, from cab drivers to baristas to hotel workers, were all saying to me how much they were looking forward to joining the fight when they were called up. And all of them were disappointed that they hadn't been called up by that point in time. And I think Australians share many, if not all, of the traits and values of the Ukrainian people. So I call on this government to learn all it can from this war and feed that into the upcoming defence review such as, so it's not just another talk fest and start arming our defence forces with everything they need to defeat an autocratic, aggressive force. As I wrote for the Lowy Institute before the invasion, if Europe does not stand up to Russia and Ukraine, a clear message will be delivered to China on the question of strategic ambiguity over Taiwan. It will signal that the West does not have the strength or the will to defend smaller liberal democracies and that if you push hard enough, the West will capitulate. I think it is arguable that that point is arguable more now than it was then. This is not something that we can allow to happen here in our region, and we should be doing more and more and more to assist the Ukrainians, defeat the Russian army, push them back over the borders and, re and restore the rules-based order. Thank you. Senator Steele-John. Thank you. 
um, acting chair. Um, housing is not a commodity. It is an investment. It is, in fact, a human right. Every uh, Australian deserves to have the security of a safe place to sleep, a safe place to live without the worry of eviction. No one should have to deal with the anxiety of whether their landlord will take the opportunity to raise the rent this week, whether this will be the week that a landlord decides that they want to renovate and in so doing evict. Australians are facing an unprecedented housing crisis right now. Homes are more unaffordable than they have ever been and inflation is driving up the cost of living and has made mortgages unsustainable. If you are a renter, it is even worse. Me and my office have heard story after story of people being priced out of their rental homes due to the greed of landlords trying to exploit what they see as a quick profit. If you are a victim of this exploitative behaviour, a new rental can be almost impossible to find. In my hometown of Perth, the vacancy rate on rental properties is just 1%. And those numbers, if you can imagine it, get even worse in regional towns uh, like Bunbury, Albany and Broome. This has empowered landlords and rental agencies to increase rent by literally hundreds of dollars, with 50 people or more attending uh, home opens every week. Uh, rental uh, bidding is all too commonplace. The devastating impact of this unsustainable and exploitative market has been dire. People have been forced to sleep in their cars, on friends' couches, on the street just to get by. Now, this is a catastrophic situation, and the worst of it is, is that it is avoidable. As members of this place, it is our collective responsibility to regulate the market, and the only good market is one that works for all Australians. That is why the Australian Greens are calling for an immediate freeze on rents and rent increases. It is not uh, even unprecedented to take this approach, to freeze uh, rate, uh, rent increases. Uh, it is something, in fact, that the Scottish Government has agreed uh, to do uh, just most recently. In their most recent budget update, uh, they have uh, executed a complete freeze on rent increases and evictions until 2023. The Australian Government has even done it. During World War II, rents indeed were frozen. It is time for the government to side uh, with workers, uh, with people and with renters and immediately freeze rent increases. Now, as part of the broader and urgently needed affordable, accessible and inclusive housing agenda, um, we as a community um, and the federal and state governments have a fantastic opportunity before us. There is a little-known process going on right now uh, by which Australia is constructing, recreating its national construction code. And as part of that review process, uh, the states and territories have been given the opportunity to embrace new sustainable uh, housing construction code guidelines um, and new accessible and inclusive uh, construction guidelines, particularly for residential properties, uh, for houses, for rentals, um, etc. Now, I am really pre pleased and proud to say that it is the Greens here in the ACT that championed inclusive design standards at the national level. And so far, the majority of states and territories have bought into that system, have uh, agreed that from 12 months' time, every home constructed will be accessible for disabled people. Every state that is except two. One, my state of Western Australia, the other, New South Wales. The Greens will continue to push until WA 
comes on board with inclusive design standards. Senator Dodson. Thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, this week I was moved by the first speeches of our new colleagues. A senator's first speech is a unique insight into their character. But when you listen to several, as I have uh, this week, it is impossible not to realise that they hold a common thread across the political divide. They reflect a shared desire that our time in this chamber will leave a country in a better place. Despite the cynical public view sometimes, most of us occupy our places here because we want to do good. We want to contribute to the difficult but rewarding work of nation building. We want to shape a fairer, a more just and a freer society. We want to look back when our time comes and we're done with this place to tell our children and our grandchildren and their grandchildren, that we were part of putting things right. Those of us in this 47th parliament will be asked to make a choice on one such issue of nation building, whether or not to support a referendum on a voice to parliament. As envisaged in the Uluru Statement from the Heart, a voice to parliament is a modest and generous invitation to the nation. Out of the torment of our powerlessness, it weaves a simple and hopeful suggestion for a way forward. It proposes a First Nations representative body to advise the parliament on the laws and policies uh, that uh, will impact upon their lives. And it proposes that this body, the voice, be enshrined in the constitution to ensure it has a place of recognition, responsibility and contribution into the future. Importantly, a voice is not the work of the Labor government or any other political party. It is, the, it is the culmination of decades of advocacy by First Nations peoples and their leaders. There is a clear line of advocacy of early leaders such as William Cooper from the 1938 Day of Mourning, the 1963 Yirrkala Bark Petition and the 1998 uh, 88 uh, Barunga Statement, to the regional dialogue processes that birthed the Uluru Statement from the heart. The process brought together over 1,200 First Nations delegates in 12 regional dialogues across the country. In a final convention at Uluru, it resulted in a historic consensus around the proposal for a voice. It was the largest consensus, consensus of First Nations peoples on a proposal for recognition in Australian history. It is about recognition in the Constitution and it is also about practical outcomes. It is a long history, and we know it, of failed government programs, broken promises and waste. Everyone knows that. A voice means that First Nations peoples, the people who know what work, will advise the parliament in a, in a focused and consistent manner about laws that impact their lives. It is about shaping better policies and strategies that make a practical difference. It is about getting it right for the first time. It is about giving a constant voice to the people who don't have one. It is not the end of the road. It is, it is not the only thing we need to do, but it is the next significant nation-building step in our journey towards reconciliation. In my own first speech, I made a commitment to work with my fellow senators to build a better country, a stronger, just and inclusive Australia. As I hear the new colleagues across the chamber express similar sentiments, I feel hopeful that together we can play our part in responding positively to the generous invitation of the First Nations people contained in the Uluru Statement of the Heart for a voice. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Madam uh, Acting Deputy President. Well, yesterday I made a two-minute speech with regards to the trip to Israel that I took under AJAC and some of the disturbing things that we learnt when visiting Ramallah and meeting with the Palestinian Prime Minister. And I did begin to touch on some absolutely appalling behaviour that has apparently been endorsed 
by the Australian Broadcasting Corporation, the ABC. In a recently deleted Twitter account, Fawood Abu Ghosh, who has worked as a news producer for the ABC since 2004 and, in fact, even appall more appallingly, won a Walkley Award in 2016 on his reporting from Syria. But we know what the status of the Walkley Awards are in this current day and age. But uh, he has now deleted his Twitter account, but it is important to note, prior to him deleting this account, just a week or so ago, Abu Ghosh's page read an official title in his uh, Twitter account, Middle East producer for Australian Broadcasting Corporation, opinions are mine and ABC's. So I do think the ABC potentially has some up questions to answer, because in October last year, Abu Ghosh warned that there is a great Zionist project to dominate and control all Arabs in the region. Yep, that sounds very anti-Israel to me. Is that the view of the ABC? But it gets worse. Surprisingly, it gets worse. Just in April this year, there were further posts in response to a screenshot of an Israeli police men detaining an unidentified civilian. Now, for those of us, and, and I was lucky enough to be there just last week, for those of us that have actually experienced Israel, who understand where the borders are and what is actually occurring within the different areas, particularly around Jerusalem, Bethlehem, and around the different parts, the Temple Mount, all of the old city of Jerusalem and the very, very holy lands, uh, that what uh, is portrayed in the media is not necessarily what is actually going on. But, you know, as we know, never let the facts get in the way of a good story. But, particularly in the ABC, because in response to that photo, Abu Ghosh tweeted, and, and you know, this, this is what he tweeted, and apparently is the view of the Australian Broadcasting Corporation. Is. This is how the Nazis treated the Jews. Maybe it is time for dot, dot, dot. Shameful. I mean, that to me is up there with one of the most appalling things I think you could possibly say. But this is the view of the Israeli correspondent in the Middle East who, on his Twitter account until recently deleted, uh, determined that these were not only his views but the views of the ABC. So David Anderson, Ida Buttrose and the rest of the ABC deserve to give every Australian who pays for this organisation an explanation and let not only Jewish Australians, not only our friends in Israel, let them know if that are these view, their views, but all Australians who fund them. Because it seems to me they are going out of their way to ensure they alienate huge sections of the community and contribute to the misinformation that is consistently being peddled. And look, I will touch on another issue very, very briefly, and I'm sure I will come back to this, because one of the things that we heard whilst in meetings in Israel is this new piece of propaganda that somehow Israel is a state of apartheid. And this emanates from an anti-racism uh, conference in Durban, which was deliberately put there in coordination with a group of Arab states and the Palestinian Liberation Army. I mean, the PLO, PLO, Arab states put together a, an anti-racism conference in Durban, and somehow they compare Israel, which is the most inclusive state for those that have ever been there. Uh, but one of the uh, people that we met with, who was absolutely amazing, is an Arab citizen of Israel. He's been a journalist there for over 38 years, and he actually said that he was incredibly grateful to live in Israel. And I would have thought, if you were an Arab, Israeli, and this was really a state of apartheid, that's probably not where you'd want to be. But as I said, I'm going to come back to this because Amnesty International has used a definition of apartheid that has never been signed by a Western nation, was actually only developed by the USSR, to also claim that Israel is apartheid state. Amnesty is discredited, it is disgraceful, and the ABC owes an explanation. Senator Tyrrell. Afternoon, Acting Deputy President. The Tamer is in a shocking state. Launceston should be living on a river of gold. Instead, it's a river full of mud and poo. It's sad to say it, but it's true. 
I hate to imagine the stuff that's floating around in that water. I cringe at the idea of going for a swim. Those signs that say no fishing, no swimming are on the money. You wouldn't dip a toe in there most days. This is what we're doing to Tassie's clean green image. The tamer is brown, it's brown for all the wrong reasons. The grass creates big dirty mudflats that destroy breeding grounds for our birds and wildlife. You can hardly get a kayak out there because the mudflats are impossible to bring a boat over. And I have no idea where I'll take my lab Charlie for a dip. If he ever jumps in the river, he'll look like a completely different dog. These problems are way worse than what you can fix with another task force talk fest, like Federal Labor are saying. And we need to do better than a bit of extra dredging, like what the Tassie government is doing. Dredging might tidy things up for a little while, but the locals know that the silt and mud comes back in the blink of an eye. Together, Liberal and Labor's so-called 10-year plan is to clean up five or six hectares of wetlands when we've lost 100. We still have no idea when they're even going to get started. This thing has been going on for yonks, and we're still tinkering around the edges. Why don't you get it, you guys? Doing little bits and pieces is never going to work. It'll never get you anywhere. You're changing the spark plugs while your engine is broken. These kinds of problems don't get solved by going around the edges. It's time for action to hit the bullseye. That's why I reckon we should look at a barrage. A barrage is gates that open with the tide going out and close when the tide comes in. It flushes the water and pollution out to the ocean and stops it flowing back. We'd have a freshwater lake where the polluted river is now. Trust me, barrages create beautiful waterways. The tamer's muddy low tides would be a thing of the past. Think Adelaide, Canberra and Singapore. Clean and pretty waterways that people want to be around. We'd also get flood control. We could empty the lake down to Bass Strait and close the gates to stop the tides going upriver to Launceston and inundating the place. Yes, a barrage costs money, but it makes money too. For a start, we can sell the fresh water to irrigators and hydrogen energy operators, rather than building a ridiculous 50-kilometre pipeline to Lake Trevallon. Even better, we'd bring in more tourist dollars. All that fresh water would kill off all the bloody rice grass and give us lakeside beaches so Lonnie tourism would get a boost. I bet all those little caravan parks and hotels would love to catch a break after the few years they've had. It's a big idea, but that's what we need. The river's been stuffed for years. Will Hodgman set up a task force in 2017 and promised things would get better. Peter Gutwin put money aside for more dredging before the last state election, money that still hasn't been spent. Now the Federal Labor Party are chipping us over a few bucks to tidy up things here and there. It's all too slow, too little, too timid. As usual, the politicians talk and talk, while the rest of us are up, are left up the creek without a paddle. Thank you. Senator Green. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I'm very pleased to finally have the opportunity to rise in this place and talk about the Jobs and Skills Summit that was held in Parliament last week. Uh, and I'm particularly keen to talk about this Jobs and Skills Summit, not only the events that were held and the discussions um, that we saw take place in Canberra, but what work was done in the lead up to this summit, which I think goes, um, uh, goes to the power of the summit itself. Because as we know, many members of the government um, held round tables in the lead up to the summit. And what we were able to achieve by setting a date and telling the rest of the country that we would put everyone in a room and we'd want solutions on the table is that people started to come together. People from all walks of life, people who not necessarily agree with each other all of the time, people who might have different views about what we need to do to fix some of the challenges. But holding the summit itself led to outcomes before the summit even began. And what we saw after the summit was 
um, 36 concrete meaningful outcomes that came from the agreements before and during those discussions. For my part, in the lead up to the summit, I was determined to make sure the unique views of people in regional Queensland were heard and part of the discussions. Um, I live in Cairns. I'm based in far north Queensland. There are many different diverse communities all across regional Queensland, and I wanted the opportunity to be able to hear from just a few of those communities in the lead up to the summit. So over one week before the summit was held, I held three regional roundtables in regional Queensland in, across three different electorates. And I have to say they were very well attended and I really appreciated the effort and enthusiasm that people brought to these opportunities. From Mariba in the Atherton Tablelands to Townsville and to Cairns, I heard from diverse, passionate Queenslanders who were working hard for their communities. Everybody who came to the summits understood that we weren't going to be able to solve every problem there and then, but they were there with ideas and there with a contribution, with an understanding that that feedback would be taken into the summit itself. Now, I'm very pleased, it was very good to see, that a number of regional Queenslanders were actually present in the summit. And we know that there were mayors, like Mayor Anne Baker from um, Moranbar was there, Professor Alan Dale, who actually is based in far north Queensland but chaired one of our roundtables in Cairns, had the opportunity to attend the summit in Canberra. So there were people in the room from regional Australia. But I definitely wanted to make sure that these views were held, they were delivered to the Treasurer and the Secretary Task Force, and I joined in many the same ways that many of my Senate colleagues and MPs in the other place in listening to communities in the lead up to this opportunity to make sure that these voices were heard. And what we heard was very clear, resoundingly um, from Mariba all the way through to Townsville and Cairns, we heard that there have been 10 long years of wages going backwards and not keeping up with the cost of living. Queenslanders understand that our challenge doesn't end with just getting people into work. We also have an op opportunity to make sure that workers are treated with respect and paid for a fair day's wage. Everyone at the summit recognised that our industrial relations system is desperately in need of an update, and that is coming from businesses and from workers alike. Workers and businesses told me that workplace laws were too complicated, and I was pleased to see agreement between business and union groups over the summit itself, demonstrating a commitment to work together in Australia's national interest. While we still need to work through what the details of these plans will look like, there is definitely consensus, not only through the government, but in with, with businesses, with industry, with unions and employers, with workers on the front line, that we need to have a look at our workplace laws so to make sure they are fit and proper for, for, for the future. Uh, in particular, in regional Queensland, our tourism agricultural industries indicated that the skilled labour shortage had disrupted migration settings, meant that they experienced concerning labour shortages. Just as difficult as it had been to attract workers to regional Queensland, it is equally hard to retain them in the current conditions. Vital community infrastructure like housing, health and internet are central to keeping regional towns afloat. We are hearing all too often that without community infrastructure and services, workers see no incentive in making a regional place their home. So we need to make sure that if we're encouraging workers to come to regional Queensland, that we certainly have the infrastructure and services to make sure that they want to live there and raise their family as well. Now, finally, I think Minister Gallagher summed it up perfectly when she said that women nailed it at the summit. And so did women across regional Queensland. I'm very proud that at my roundtables in regional Queensland, we had a lot of women around the table. And they were telling me that the cost of childcare and parental leave issues are causing them to make the decision to leave the workforce or work fewer hours than they would like to. When we are in desperate need of workers to revive and grow our economy, we must look at ways to clear every obstacle that women face in entering and staying in decent work. 
Finally, a more detailed summary of the North and Far North Queensland contribution to the Jobs and Skills Summit was delivered to the Treasurer and the Task Force Secretary, and I was very pleased to have the opportunity to meet with the Treasurer, Jim Chalmers, to talk with him directly about these issues. He is certainly no stranger to regional Queensland, but it was important to make sure that the regional issues that we were talking about weren't lost on the national scale. I am proud to be a member of a government that seeks to find common ground and invites cooperation so that we can reap the benefits for, for reform. It is very clear that the Jobs and Skills Summit was a success, and I can understand those opposite wanting to talk down the success of the Jobs and Skills Summit because, unfortunately, they failed to turn up. They failed to understand that this was not a moment for politics but a moment for our country to deal with a lot of the issues that we are facing, coming together, putting aside differences and building a consensus on how we can move forward. Whether it is the cost of living, whether it is um, skill shortages, whether it is getting women back into work after childbirth, it is important that everyone around the table shares the same concern to make sure that these issues are dealt with by a reforming government, a government that cares about people, a government that is focused on delivering jobs in places like regional Queensland, and a government that is clear and crystal clear that we will always put the national interests ahead of our political interests. That is what was on display at the Jobs and Skills Summit, and I couldn't have been prouder to be part of a Labor government on those days. I shall now proceed to two-minute statements. I call Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you very much, Acting Deputy Chair. And today, early childhood educators are walking off the job. Uh, and their message to us is clear. Give us a reason to stay in our jobs and pay us what we are worth. Value early learning properly as part of our education system and put children before profit. And to the early educators who are taking this action today, I want to say that I stand with you. I stand with you because the work that you do is completely essential. And I stand with you because you are completely undervalued for that work. And I stand with you because I know you've tried absolutely everything to be respected for the work that you do, and that this is the only action that you have left to take in order to be heard. Uh, and let me tell you that right here in the parliament today, we hear you loud and clear. Early educators are absolutely essential. Early educators are qualified. You are dedicated. You are professional. You provide a play-based learning experience that is tailored to the unique needs of every child. You are incredible. You do incredible work. Uh, and you are completely undervalued and underpaid for the work you do. Completely. 22 bucks an hour. That is a joke, an absolute joke to literally hold the nation's future in your hands. We cannot ask educators to continue educating our nation's children when they can barely earn enough to support their own. We cannot. So I stand with educators who are walking off the job today. I know it's a tough decision that you have taken. I know our industrial system is completely broken for you. I know this is the only way that you can be heard and we hear you loud and clear. Thank you, Senator Walsh. Senator Antic. Thank you. History tells us that civilizations and empires are transitory. There are, of course, increasing signs now that Western culture has re re reached a tipping point. Left-wing activism, supposedly based on equity, diversity and inclusion, uses its allies in the media, the corporate sector and in politics to prohibit any views it disapproves of. Too many of our modern leaders are not across this threat. They seem to think that defending our values is beneath them and that we have time on our side. We do not. Suicide and depression rates in our young people continue to skyrocket. We've failed to instil in them a sense of meaning and purpose, replacing it with empty modern ideologies like climate alarmism. On leaving school, young adults have little knowledge of history, a result of a curriculum denuded of Western history, replaced by critical race theory and a sense of victimhood. Sadly, too many have cowered before these ideologies, afraid of being called the various isms and phobias, and it's now wreaking havoc across the West. 
If a principal defence of liberty was ever needed in this country, it was over the past two and a half years, yet we were told that those concerned with freedom were dangerous extremists. We need more brave men and women to stand up for future generations of Australians and hand them a culture that is greater than the one left to us. The relative prosperity and peace we've enjoyed has allowed us to become complacent, thinking that such a decline couldn't happen here. But the time has come for our leaders to stand up for what is right. Without urgent, Order. strong leadership, the West Senator Ante, is please doomed. Please resume your seat. Have you finished your contribution? You have finished your contribution. I, I just want to draw the attention of the senators to these are short statements, two minutes, and I do expect members to be able to be heard without interruption. Senator Thorpe, Senator Thorpe, you are out of order. You need to contain your commentary to an appropriate standard for the Senate. You will not be heard. You will not be heard. I call Senator Faruqi. Oh, sorry, Senator McGrath. A senator in, the, in this place uh, just called another senator a, a racist, and I'd ask for that to be withdrawn. I think that's entirely reasonable, Senator Thorpe. President, I was stating a fact. Senator Thorpe, you must stand and withdraw. I'm not withdrawing because it's a right. fact. Take I'm not seat, standing Senator up. Senator Thorpe, turn off the microphone. I'll take, some, I'll take some uh, advice from the clerk. Take your seat. Senator Thorpe, Senator Thorpe, please resume your seat for a moment. Senator Thorpe, you have an opportunity. I'm going to give you an opportunity to withdraw. Will you stand and assist the orderly business of the Senate by withdrawing? Can you tell me what well, happens no, if you, I I'm don't? I'm not going to tell you anything else. I'm going to ask you to stand and for the benefit of the Senate and the orderly progress of business for you to withdraw, Senator Thorpe. With all due respect, Acting Deputy President, could you please inform me what the ramifications would be for me to remove my remark about somebody being racist and I me not feeling safe. I don't want to safe. give your platform to I need to know the what the ramifications are. Could I Turn seek off advice? The microphone. Senator Waters, uh, Senator Thorpe, resume your seat. Sorry. Senator Thorpe, you have the opportunity to assist the Senate by acceding to our standing orders and withdrawing a remark that was uh, unparliamentary. That is, that is what you're being asked to do. It doesn't remove it, but I am asking you for the benefit of the Senate to withdraw a remark that was not parliamentary. I'll take a point of order from you, Senator Faruqi. Um, Deputy President, I just want to raise this point of order, and it's happened in this chamber before, that often when there is racism thrown around in this chamber, Sen Senator it Faruqi, is the people who Senator Faruqi, the please people resume who your raised seat for a moment. Please resume your seat for a moment. I just want to be clear that we're not going to re-prosecute every time that offences occurred in the chamber. And, and, and this historical uh, contribution, I don't think, is assisting at this point. Um, I, I, I need you, as a fellow member of this chamber, to advise your colleague about standing orders and principles. It, it would be appropriate for the senator to withdraw. If she is unable to take that on, what what they are doing and how it's impacting sorry, on other people. Sorry, broadcasting. Do not give the microphone unless I call the senator's name. Senator Faruqi, please. A, a point of order. What is your point of order? So my point, point of order is this, um, Deputy Chair, that I think when we make 
when decisions are made in this chamber, I think consideration needs to be given to the impact of comments from other senators on, uh, on appropriateness and on racism. I have to agree with you, Senator Faruqi, and that is why we have standing orders. So I thank you for your point of order. Please resume your seat. I am going to give you one final chance, Senator Thorpe, to withdraw, withdraw your comment that was unparliamentary. You can either withdraw or you may not. What is your choice? With all due respect, Deputy President, can I need to be pointed where using the word racism in this parliament. So I Senator need to know Thorpe, where it's unparliamentary because I don't understand. Thorpe, I'm feeling violated. Senator, re resume your seat. I'm assuming that you are refusing to withdraw and I will re be reporting this matter to the Senate. You do no longer have the call. Uh, we'll return to the program because it has taken up people's time that they want to speak. Senator Faruqi, um, you have the call to make your contribution. Thank you. So today, I want to give a shout out to unionists and the union movement. Over the last few months in New South Wales alone, we've seen the strength and energy of educators, nurses and midwives, rail, tram and bus workers and university staff and students amongst many other unionists. Yesterday, we felt that energy from TAF unionists on National TAF Day. Today, the lawns of parliament are full of early childhood educators who have shut down the sector for the day, closing centres and rallying around the country to draw attention to the impact of their terrible pay and conditions, conditions made much worse by a critical workforce shortage. The solidarity shown in the movement and from the public for each of these actions has been tremendous. As a lifelong unionist myself, I could not be more proud of and inspired by all this work. The Greens recognise the vital place of unions in our society and will continue to fight alongside them for fair pay and conditions. We will keep joining you on the pickets and do everything we can in this place to unwind the decade of union busting, worker undermining garbage of the former Liberal government. We will push the new government to give workers real power to organise, to bargain, grow, participate fully in your workplaces and communities. I'm with you all the way. All the Greens are right with you in fighting for your rights and conditions. There's never been a more important time to join your union. Collectively, we can change the world. I do have a bit of time, so I do want to address the matter that was before the parliament just a minute ago. In this parliament, racism is thrown around so easily, and the people who call it out are the people who are penalised. When will this chamber and this parliament actually seriously consider the Jenkins report the behaviour standards in this chamber and actually act on them and not keep shouting down and not keep you know, shutting up people who actually call out bad behaviour and call out racism. Thank you, Senator Faruqi. I call Senator Marielle Smith. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Today is Early Childhood Educators Day, where we get to celebrate every single early educator across our country for the absolutely life-changing work that they do. But these educators have been doing it tough. Through the height of the pandemic and beyond, they have not been valued in the way that they should be for the vital work that they do each and every single day. They're not appreciated enough and they're not paid enough. So it's no surprise today that thousands of these workers are walking off the job to stand up for their wages and conditions at work. I'm here in the Senate today standing in solidarity with these workers. If I was in Adelaide, I'd be joining my son and my daughter's carers as they walked out of their centre. I'd be standing with them because I value them. More than that, like many families across Australia, I depend on them, I adore them. They are an extension of our family, and I know they deserve so much more. Our industrial system has been failing these workers. It's failed to deliver the pay rises that these workers deserve like workers right across our care economy, workers in female-dominated industries who have been let down by the current industrial system and unable to access the right compensation for the incredible work they do, the essential work they do. I know the answers aren't always simple here, but I want every early educator in Australia to know that I am advocating for you every step of the way that I see the work you do as an extension of the families who place their trust in you, but also what you do for our nation. 
the work you do with our littlest and most precious minds is fundamentally important to our success as a country. We value you. We see you. Thank you for the work you do. I know it's a tough decision to walk off the job today, but we understand and in solidarity. Thank you, Senator Smith. I call Senator Cadell. Madam Deputy Speaker, Acting Deputy, when I gave my first speech the other day, I spoke of my happy upbringing and my time at my parents' property at Cliffy, as well as the land we had. We had Hedden Greeter Speedway across the road and a drive-in just a kilometre or two down the road. With the energy of youth, life was great, and all of those locations were visited more than once. I walked the speedway track and imagined myself racing around it. But the speedway closed long ago. The track turned into housing because change happens and change is inevitable. And today it has been advised that the director is about to call time, to call cut on the other local icon, the Head and Greeter Drive In. It has survived bushfires, floods, global pandemics, with its facilities used for COVID testing at the virus's peak, but it cannot beat change. It cannot fight time. And it has been, notice has been given that the metaphoric curtains will be closing with a development application for more housing to be lodged. Whilst the facility has been around since before my recollections, it most recently came un, uh, to life under Scott Seddon, who reopened the turnstiles in 1996 with a double feature of Babe and Apollo 13. Since that evening in March, it reintroduced itself as a cornerstone of local entertainment amongst those with a strong car culture in the Hunter Valley. With the iconic advertising slogan of, if you don't like the movie, you can slash your seats, young lovers, families that couldn't be bothered dressing up to go out, and groups of friends all attended. It was more than a movie, it was an event. There was no more jumping into boots or burying kids under blankets to dodge a ticket as we paid per car and had a ball. Thank you, Scotty, for bringing this back into our lives. Good luck in your development and good luck for finding a site for a proposal to construct a new facility. Come here. Thank you. Senator Cadell, I call Senator Lambie. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, I'd like to stand up and thank the people of the West Coast who I regularly visit down there in Tasmania. We like to call that the rugged wilderness, and my goodness, most of you people in here wouldn't survive over its border, I can assure you. That's where we have the drop bears. Those people in Tulla, um, great to see you guys. Uh, I see uh, it's great to see tourism really starting to pop down there again. Uh, the people of Rosebury, whether it's the Okra Medical Centre, um, you are doing a wonderful job. It is great to hear that you finally have a wonderful new GP down there servicing that area. And uh, I know that the uh, people in Rosebury are very grateful because her husband is a great footy player and he's playing for Torac down there, and that's giving the doctor a whole new standing in that community, which is uh, very entertaining in itself. I want to thank also the people in Queenstown. I can tell you uh, 12 months ago, 18 months ago, it was frightening to go through that. I, 12 months ago, 70 per cent of those shops were closed. I think when I went down there this time, there was two shops and they look like they've got new lease signs on them. Um, that's very fabulous. It's going great guns down there. I can see the bike track, your new mountain bike track down there is really starting to draw attention down there uh, for the tourists. You've obviously got your walking track that should be built over the next couple of years. We also understand that you have a housing issue down there and I know and I ask that the mines the mines get back to the tables and talk about those housing issues down there and start looking at to seeing what they can do to provide um, houses for the workers down there and their families. We need those workers and their families down there. We do not want to see didos, which is drive in, drive out. That's, how, that's what's going to make these communities function in the long run. Uh, so it would be lovely to see that. I do apologise to the people of Strawn. I didn't get to see you this time. I want to also thank the Mayor and the General Manager of the West Coast for the time that they continually give, give us and fill us into what's going on the West Coast. The West Coast people, thank you very much. Uh, call Senator Green. Thank you. Madam Acting Deputy President, 
Today is Early Childhood Educators Day. So, like so many of my colleagues today, I want to speak on the important work that our early childhood educators do. Our early educators have a mammoth task on their hands every day that they go to work. Not only do they care for our youngest Australians, allowing parents across the country to go out and to participate in their own jobs and build the economy, they also do an incredibly important job of giving our youngest Australians the very best start to their education. Yet this predominantly female workforce is seriously undervalued and underpaid and they are tired. Educators are leaving the sector in droves. But today, in just a few hours, educators will stand right outside this place and speak up for their worth. They will speak out about the unjust way that they have been treated for far too long. And I and my colleagues are proud to stand with them. Our government understands that the current early childhood education system is not working for educators, which means it is not working for families, which means it is not working for our economy. And we want to see that fixed. We know that beyond praise, educators need and deserve better wages and conditions. Their pay packets should reflect the important and very skilled work that they perform every single day. We know that a lot needs to be done to reform this sector, but childhood educators across the country can rest assured that we see you, we stand with you, and we will deliver for you. Congratulations on the very important step that you are taking today. We want to make sure that you understand that we stand here in solidarity with you and the important work that you do. Thank you, Senator Green. I call Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. It's well known that Western Australia is blessed with an abundance of natural resources, iron ore, oil and gas in particular, and the West Australian mining sector has benefited from Australia's economy, uh, benefited Australia's economy for decades. Western Australia is being presented with new opportunities and has the potential to take part in an industry that is gaining global momentum. I speak of hydrogen. Recently I met with the team at the Dampier to Bunbury pipeline. The Dampier to Bunbury uh, pipeline stretches 1,539 kilometres and pipes 845 terajoules of natural gas each day, from which natural gas fuels approximately 50 per cent of WA's energy needs. With changing energy de demands globally, AGIG, the operator of the pipeline, are working on a plan to start blending hydrogen with the natural gas. They aim to have 10 per cent hydrogen and natural gas blend by 2030. This is the first step towards adapting our current gas infrastructure to carry only hydrogen by 2040. Now, even more exciting, with the production of hydrogen in the northern WA and the infrastructure to move it, we open up opportunities to export hydrogen to global energy markets. This is about seizing market opportunities. It's not some woke pursuit of ideology and reckless abandonment of reliable, low-cost energy. We must continue to invest in traditional energy sources while exploiting every opportunity that, uh, to establish new markets with new sources of energy. So I look forward to working with West Australian companies and industry to explore the opportunities that hydrogen can bring, whilst also supporting those traditional businesses that need to continue to explore their uh, resources and that, so that we can bring energy not only to Australia but indeed across the world. Thank you, Senator O'Sullivan. I call Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Um, I made some remarks earlier today um, towards Senator Antic, and I'd uh, like to withdraw those comments. Thank you, Senator Thorpe, for assisting the chamber. And you have the call for your two-minute contribution. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. First Nations people in this country are the oldest living, continuing culture in the world. We are sovereign to our lands, waters, skies and totems. This is sovereignty. Violent colonial invaders never sought an agreement to live peacefully alongside us. The colonisers say that they are sovereign. We say that we are sovereign. Treaty is an agreement to share sovereignty. First Nations people have always fought for this right. 
to make our own decisions when it comes to our people, our culture and our country. In the 1930s, Yorta Yorta man William Cooper petitioned King George V for Aboriginal seats in Parliament. In 1963, the Yakala Bark petitions called for land rights. In 1988, the Barunga Statement called for self-determination. In response, Labor Prime Minister Bob Hawke promised to begin working on a treaty by 1990. Now, the states have taken up this Labor visionary's work, Victoria, Queensland and the Northern Territory, all having treaties in the works. You know who suggested we change the constitution? John Howard. In the lead up to the 2007 election, John Howard promised that the coalition would hold a referendum to recognise Indigenous Australians in the preamble of the constitution. Why is Prime Minister Albanese following John Howard's lead? Why is the Prime Minister out of step with the Labor-governed states? Treaty is not an overnight process, which is all the more reason to start laying the groundwork now at the federal level. Treaty is an opportunity to celebrate this nation together. Thank it's an you, opportunity Senator to unite Paul. and mature. I call Senator Roberts. As the Reserve Bank raises interest rates another jumbo-sized half per cent, we grasp at the audacity, the cheek, of all major parties talking about cost of living. Decades of Greens, Liberal, Labor, Nationals policies slowly destroying our country caused the cost of living crisis. In just three months under the coalition, groceries got 5 per cent more expensive, an increase of 20 per cent per year. Fuel prices will jump again when Labor cancels the 22 cent a litre tax discount. Wholesale power prices are at record highs and will flow through to power bills. That's why Labor quietly crab-walked away from their election promise to reduce your power bills to $275. Both sides take turns to gradually destroy our country. Both forced intermittent wind and solar pipe dreams driving up power prices. High power prices make everything else more expensive. The coalition now laughably claimed to be fiscal conservatives, yet ran the largest money printing operation our country has ever seen. $508 billion conjured out of thin air in electronic journal entries. That supercharged demand, the culprit in runaway inflation. Neither side will talk about it. Labor now plans an immigration flood. 200,000 new arrivals each year will drive up demand for housing and services, making cost of living worse. This is the difference between keeping lights on or in sitting in the dark between eating healthy groceries or walking the supermarket canned goods aisle, between new school uniforms or sending children off to school with holes in their socks, between a roof over our head or being out on the street. Instead, One Nation policies will build an environment making our economy stronger. Stable breadwinner jobs will flourish. Our policies will unlock Australia's abundant natural resources so we can be the world's energy superpower, as we should be. One Nation policies will return Australia to the world's cheapest power bills. We are one community, we have one flag, we are one nation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator Roberts. I call Senator Rennick. Thank you. Uh, I've uh, raised today to speak about vaccine injuries and the lack of help that uh, the Albanese Labor government is not providing to those injured by the vaccine. Uh, I receive many uh, issues and uh, stories of people being injured every day and they are seeking help. Uh, I've been contacted by one constituent whose wife has suffered an extreme systemic reaction to her first AZ dose. She's had multiple trips to her GP as her condition worsened and two trips to emergency prior to paralysis episodes from GBR. She was then admitted, taken by ambulance and admitted to hospital in June 21. She suffered a brain bleed and brain inflammation. She was subsequently diagnosed with multiple conditions, all attributed to her reaction to AZ. These conditions have lingered on uh, for 15 months uh, and has been linked to acute onset lymphedema, uh, severe hypokalemia, uh, and it has left her with severe permanent disabilities, including an acquired brain injury and ongoing chronic conditions that need constant care and treatment. She has provided the, uh, the couple has provided evidence uh, to the uh, indemnity scheme, uh, including five letters from her GP, a Horns, uh, hospital admissions, uh, one letter from a, a medical registrar, another letter from a consultant phys physician, clinical uh, immunologist, uh, another letter from another uh, immunologist. Uh, another letter from a neurologist, another letter from a haematologist, another letter from a neurologist, uh, and 
And despite all of those uh, evidence and people, they, these experts saying that her injury was caused by the vaccine, the indemnity scheme uh, has refused her claims. And it's not a lot; it's only twenty thousand dollars topped out. But yet this couple is suffering severely. Now I'm calling on the Albanese Labor government uh, and the finance minister, uh, sorry, the health minister as well as uh, the minister for social services to do the right thing and look after these people. Thank you, Senator Rennick. I call Senator Pratt. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, today I took a point of care glycated haemoglobin test thanks to the Pathology Technology Australia visit to Parliament today. And I have to say how pleased I was with this technology because as someone who had had gestational diabetes and found the test where you have to fast and then pump yourself up on sugar to then come crashing down, uh, it was a horrible experience. But this technology is a terrific replacement for that. And so I really want to see this point of care testing become more accessible to the Australian people so that, so that uh, women and anyone who needs to do one of those other horrible tests is able to uh, do a much more rapid and accessible test where appropriate. I think this should be affordable uh, because it is simply replacing uh, a different kind of test in our Medicare subsidies. So I very much look forward to this technology being more widely available. Currently, for example, it can take a long time uh, for test results to get to and from remote communities, uh, where we've got a high burden of disease, for example, in some remote Indigenous communities, it would be terrific to be able to see this technology uh, diagnose high blood sugar levels there and there on the spot, so people can get their di uh, diabetes diagnosed uh, and protect their lives and their kidney. It was an entirely pain-free, easy uh, experience, and I very much want to thank the Pathology Technology uh, Australia Association for being here in Parliament today. Thank you, Senator Pratt. Um, we'll now move to question time, and I call Senator Birmingham. Thank you, President. President, my question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Wong. When did the Albanese government first become aware of concerns within the Solomon Islands government about its financial capacity to conduct its elections on schedule in 2023? Thank you, Senator Birmingham. Minister. Uh, thank you, um, um, President, and I thank uh, uh, the Senator for the first, I think, the first foreign affairs question in this Parliament. I appreciate his interest in Solomon Islands, and uh, obviously, uh, it's uh, a, a, a matter of record uh, what occurred uh, in relation to the Solomon Islands under the previous government. I'd make the point. I'm asked about electoral assistance. I, I would make the point, and he may not be aware of this, that Australia has actually been providing. Uh, electoral assistance to Solomon Islands for many years on the parties of both governments. Uh, so obviously, the question goes to when. When does it, when did the Australian government become aware of capacity uh, to to engage in an election? I, I will just make the point that Australia has in fact been providing assistance to the democratic processes in Solomon Islands for years. We are already partnering with Solomon Islands Electoral Office to support electoral reform and administration through, through both the Australian Electoral Commission's program uh, and the UNDP's program aimed at strengthening the electoral cycle in Solomon Islands. Uh, Australia has always taken the view uh, that uh, democracy, democratic processes and democracy matters. I would reiterate the standing offer the Australian government has to support Solomon Islands' next election, whether held in 2023 or 2024. Obviously, as I've, as I've made clear publicly, the timing of the election is entirely a matter for the government and the parliament of Solomon Islands. Uh, I would assume that my colleague, Senator Birmingham, would share the view uh, that democracy matters, democratic conventions are important, and that Australia's support for uh, democratic processes through the Pacific, including Solomon Islands, uh, is a matter of bipartisan support. Thank you, Senator Wong. Senator Birmingham, first supplementary. Thanks, President. Is it correct that the Australian government only made a formal offer of financial assistance to the Solomon Islands government 
less than a week ago on 1 September. Why did it take so long after questions were first raised by the Solomon Islands about its financial capacity to conduct its scheduled 2023 elections for the offer of financial assistance to be made? Minister. Uh, uh, the, uh, I don't accept some of the assertions in the question. I would again go back to my primary answer, uh, which is that uh, this, there have been uh, a long-standing practice of governments of both uh, political persuasions to provide uh, support for democratic processes in Solomon Islands. Uh, as I said, uh, we, we you know, I think recently provided support for the for, for, for PNG, and I think uh, uh, some of those opposite may have been invited to observe the election uh, process. Uh, we will support Solomon Islands uh, next election, whether held in 2023 or 2024. Uh, I would uh, indicate to the Senate that, you know, obviously this is uh, an offer that has been reiterated on more than one occasion, including uh, by uh, Minister Conroy uh, as well as Thank by you, officials. Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Birmingham, second supplementary. Thank you, President. Did the minister advise the government of the Solomon Islands? that she was going to publicly review last week's offer of financial assistance from Australia before doing so? And how does the minister respond to assertions from the Solomon Islands government that the timing of her public disclosure is an assault on their democracy and a direct interference in a foreign government's domestic affairs? Minister. Uh, will I again make this point that support for an election which is held uh, when the Solomon Islands Parliament and government determine that election can be, uh, uh, is uh, an offer respectful of the sovereignty of Solomon Islands. That is the, the nature of uh, uh, the answer I gave and the offer that has been made by the Australian government. You know, and I, I would make this point. I understand the Shadow Minister has to ask these questions that, unlike those opposite, we have ensured uh, that the Prime Minister, the Foreign Minister uh, and others are um, engaging with Solomon Senator Islands Wong, rather than the, the, the ducking Wong. and weaving we saw Senator from those Wong, opposite. Senator please resume your seat. As Senator Birmingham. Thank you, President. Point of order on direct relevance. The series of questions, and particularly the supplementary question just asked, did not query the merits of the provision of financial assistance for the conduct of elections, which the Minister keeps referencing. The supplementary question was specific about the public disclosure of the latest offer of financial assistance and whether the minister had conveyed her intention to publicly disclose that to the government of the Solomon Islands prior to doing so. Uh, thank you, Senator Birmingham. I do believe that the minister has been relevant and I'll continue to listen for the next 16 seconds. Uh, thank you. Uh, as, as the senator knows, uh, the uh, uh, you know, this government does seek to transparently answer questions which are made by, by journalists. We did so uh, in relation to an offer which is consistent with the practice of past and this government Thank to you support Minister. democracy. Your time has expired. Senator Walsh. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister for Finance, representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. <coughs> Senator Gallagher. The June quarter national accounts figures were released today. Can the minister outline to the Senate what the national accounts say about how the national economy is performing at the moment? Minister. Uh, thank you, President. I thank uh, Senator Walsh uh, for the question uh, and congratulate on her, her on her appointment as chair of the Economics uh, Committee. Uh, today's national accounts reflect an economy that's rebounding from the disruption of the pandemic but is being held back by capacity constraints, skill sh shortages and declining real wages. This is a, fam a familiar story uh, that we're seeing and certainly familiar in terms of the economy and the economic challenges that we've inherited on forming government. While the headline figures are encouraging, the data released today confirm the pressures that are being felt by Australian households and that are weighing on our supply chains. The national accounts figures released today show the economy grew by 0.9 per cent in the June quarter 2022 to be 3.6 per cent higher through the year. GDP increased 3.9 per cent over the 21-22 financial year, and that growth reflected 
the continuing pandemic recovery and was concentrated in the services industry, particularly as this was the first full quarter of reopened domestic and international borders since the pandemic began some two years ago. The quarterly increase was driven by increases in household consumptions, uh, consumption, which was 2.2 um, per cent, net exports and new business investment, partly offset by inventories and dwelling investment. In particular, household consumption grew by 2.2 per cent in the quarter and I think uh, was 6 per cent higher through the year um, and contributed 1.1 per cent points to real GDP growth in the quarter. The household savings ratio fell to 8.7 per cent in June. Uh, down from 1.1 per cent in March. Dwelling investment fell as most states continued to experience material, material and labour shortages and inventories detracted from growth driven by drawdowns from the mining industry and from agriculture. Thank you, Minister. Senator Walsh, first supplementary. Can the minister advise how the October budget will address the challenges that Australians are facing in the economy today? Minister. Thank you, uh, President. The October budget will be our way of delivering on our commitments and delivering on our economic plan. The Albanese government's economic plan is a plan to boost productivity, take the speed limit off the economy, and particularly in some of the data that we've seen in national accounts today, and build up the right kind of growth to make a meaningful dis difference on cost of living pressures for households without adding to inflationary pressures. A key element of this week, uh, this was last week's Jobs and Skills Summit, where we saw representatives from across the country come together with 36 concrete outcomes to help deal with the issues that we face. I was particularly proud of the emphasis on women during the summit, with agreement that improving women's workforce participation is critical for Australia's future economic prosperity and resilience. Of course, there's also our plans on cleaner and cheaper energy, better training and skilling our workforce, investing in cheaper childcare, upgrading the MBN to better capture the di digital economic opportunity and creating a future thank made you, in Minister, Australia. Your time has expired. Senator Walsh, second supplementary. Uh, thank you, President. How will Labor's economic plan respond to the challenges that we are currently seeing in the economy and that are highlighted in the national accounts data released today? Thank you, Senator Walsh, and I thank uh, you for the supplementary question. Our economic plan will address the challenges that are facing us. We know that these challenges have been made worse by nearly a decade of wasted opportunities and wrong priorities from those opposite. Our policies will put the national interest first, whether it's through our climate change policy that will address opportunities for investment, innovation and jobs, or whether it's addressing the skill shortages that are affecting different areas of the economy, particularly through our fee-free TAFE <coughs> policies as well as measures we announced in the Jobs and Skills Summit last week, such as increasing the permanent migration ceiling to 195,000 for this financial year. And of course, there's our very significant investment, over $5 billion to make childcare cheaper, which will make <coughs> childcare more affordable for families, improve productivity and improve workforce participation. Thank you, Minister. Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, President. Yeah. Uh, my yeah. question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, uh, Senator Gallagher. Um, the Albanese government's decision to expand the distribution priority area classifications to include suburbs of capital cities means towns like Mildura <coughs> are now competing with the suburbs of Melbourne for overseas doctors. The only bulk billing medical practice in Mildura has had to close because doctors can now move back to the city and have chosen to do so, leaving 15,000 patients wondering how they're going to receive adequate medical care in Mildura and the Sunraysia area. Will the minister apologise to the Mildura community for effectively cutting their health services? Senator Gallagher. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, um, uh, Madam uh, President. Sorry. <laughs> I'll get there one day. Thank you, President. And I welcome the opportunity to talk about the important role that primary health care plays in, across Australia's uh, health system. Uh, as we know, and again, this is one of the things we inherited from the last government, that primary health care and the pressure of GPs has, has never been worse than it was on us Admiral, coming to government. Please resume your seat. Senator Rustin. Thank you. A point of order on relevance, uh, Chair. Um, I was actually um, specific 
in my question around the distribution priority areas, and I would ask you to draw the minister's attention to the, the matter that I was asking the question on. Thank you, Senator Rustin. I do believe the minister is being relevant. We are talking about GPs and primary health care, and I'll, uh, um, I will listen carefully to uh, yep. her continued yep. answer. Just uh, on the point of your ruling sure. on the point of order, um, Chair, um, I wasn't talking about primary health care. I was talking about distribution priority areas. Sure, and GP services sit within that broadband. Uh, thank you, Minister. Thank you, Minister. Uh, thank you. Well, the issue of um, access to doctors is directly relevant to the 24 seconds that I had in uh, giving my answer. Uh, I can assure Australians uh, that we will be doing absolutely everything we can to make access to primary health care more affordable, uh, increase access and take the pressure off GPs as they are currently experiencing it. The issues of bulk billing are serious. Access to a high quality primary care, if you can't get it, creates problems downstream in the health care system. I, I don't accept uh, the proposition that uh, the Shadow Minister for Health has put at the end of the question, or will we apologise? We won't apologise for actually investing more in primary health care by having um, our Medicare Minister, Task Force. Minister, please resume your seat. Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, on a point of order again, um, could I draw your attention once again to the fact that the question is specifically on only about distribution priority area changes. Uh, the minister is talking about absolutely everything else apart from addressing the specific question that I've asked her and the specific topic I've asked her about. Um, Senator Rustin, as you're aware, I can't direct the content. Order. Order. I can't direct the content of the answer, and I do believe the minister continues to be relevant. Minister. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I am not fully briefed on the issues in Mildura, which I think is where you raised in your first question. Was it? Was it in Mildura? And I'm happy to come back to the Senate with if there is any further information that I can provide. But I will stand by the commitment we took in the election, which was supported by the Australian community, which was to strengthen Medicare with almost a billion dollars of investment to have our urgent care clinics, to have $750 million into the strengthening Medicare fund and $220 million going direct to GPs to make sure that they can do the work we need them Senator to do. McGrath. Uh, Senator Rustin, first supplementary. Thank you, um, President. Um, well, specifically, um, Minister, your government's decision to expand the DPA classification for international doctors and bonded medical graduates has meant that a doctor who had planned to move to Huonville in Tasmania has now decided to stay in Hobart. Will you apologise to that community for effectively cutting their health services? And maybe you could explain to us what the DPA is in your answer. Uh, Minister. Order. 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 Sarah. Uh, Senator Watt and Senator Hume. Interjections across. Order. Uh, Senator McGrath. Senator Watt. Senator McGrath, I note you just accused Senator Watt of being disorderly. I wish you would take your own advice. Minister, please continue. Minister, please continue. Uh, thank you. Well, all I'd add um, to the previous answers I've given is that Labor is about getting more doctors. That's right providing more doctors to more communities right. so they can see more patients cheaper. That is what we are trying to do. After nine years Order. of neglect under this government, undermining Medicare every single opportunity Minister, they could. Your seat. I'm waiting again. Thank you. Please, Minister, continue. Um, where was I? Um, <laughs> You're winning. You're winning. <laughs> we are about making Medicare more accessible to more people and supporting the work of general practice. So I think the slant that the shadow minister is putting on it is unfair. Our commitments are about getting more doctors into primary care and when we've got them into primary care, supporting them um, with minister, the work that they do. Uh, senator Rustin. Am I getting a point of order or the third the second supplementary? 
as the uh, Sorry, I couldn't hear you because Senator Dunningham is busy interjecting to Senator Watt across the no. chamber. <coughs> Senator Dunningham, you have your own manager on her feet. Thank you. Please continue, Senator Rustin. Um, thank you very much, President. Can the minister explain what advice formed sorry, the— Sorry, you've now— oh, no, I, 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 I thought minister, you were raising a point of order. I was raising order. a point of order. I was just well. So could I seek whether? Well, I, uh, no. I think, I think the we're minister both sat confused. down. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yes. yes. Well, unless you hadn't sat Senator down. Senator Wong. Yes. yes. <laughs> and <laughs> right. Who's running, the joint? <laughs> Who's running the joint? Yes. Good question, Senator Scott. Order. Order. Let's just clear the slate, and I'm calling you, uh, Senator Rustin, for your second supplementary. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, President. Can the minister please explain what advice formed the basis of your government's decision to expand the DPA, DPA classification so that it now includes suburbs of capital cities, and what consideration was given to the impact on regional, rural and remote communities this policy is meant to support, particularly given the Rural Doctors Association of Australia has said your government's changes could cost the lives of rural and remote patients? Minister. Uh, thank you, um, President. And I think what the Shadow Minister is arguing is that we don't uh, provide additional incentives for more doctors to go to more places. Um, we are not trying to remove. We are. The policy is about getting um, more Minister, doctors and incentivising. Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam President. Um, in the interest of um, assisting the, the minister, um, are that you was raising not a point of order? Saying. She said, "Sorry, the Senator minister... Rustin, are you raising a point of order?" I would ask you to um, ask the minister not to verbal me. <clears throat> Thank you. Please continue, Minister. Thank you, Madam President. I think the shadow minister is criticising us for extending an incentives program to attract doctors to areas where there is workforce shortages. There are workforce shortages in suburbs. There are workforce shortages in Canberra. I, have, I, was, I was health minister here for eight years. We had a massive GP shortage. Minister, like there is shortages in seat. towns. Order. 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 Senator Hughes and Senator Watt and Senator Rustin. I want the minister to finish her answer. Thank you, minister. I have. I have. We obviously have a different of opinion about it, but we have deliberately not changed the regional incentive uh, pro payments that doctors receive for working in remote Australia so that we don't detract from there, but we do acknowledge there Thank are shortages minister, elsewhere which expired. matter to— Senator Thorpe. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Immigration, Citizenship and Multicultural Affairs, Senator Watt. Your government has recently withdrawn the appeal of Montgomery. Prior to that, an estimated 10 to 15 people asserting their sovereign Aboriginal identity were still in immigration detention. Has the Labor government released all Aboriginal people from immigration detention? And if not, when will they be released? Thank you, Senator Thorpe. Minister. Uh, thank you, President, and thank you, Senator Thorpe, for the question. This is an important issue, uh, and a significant uh, decision was made by the government to not pursue that litigation, as you're aware. Uh, I will have to get you the exact details as to the numbers that you're seeking, uh, and I'll provide that to you as quickly as I can. Senator Thorpe, uh, first supplementary. Thank you, Minister, for your uh, answer. Uh, my second question is, when will the Labor government reinstate the visas of Aboriginal people released from immigration detention so as to restore the rights they held prior to the coalition government cancelling their visas? Thank you, Senator Thorpe. Minister. Uh, thank you, President. And again, uh, Senator Thorpe, uh, I'm happy to come back to you with the precise details of that. I am aware that there has been some action taken to implement the effect of that decision. I just want to make sure I've got the absolutely correct details before I provide them to the chamber. Senator Thorpe, second supplementary. Uh, President, thank you, Minister, for your response. Uh, and thirdly, will the Labor government include a special condition 
on an Aboriginal person's visa to guarantee a right of re-entry to Australia. Thank you, Senator Thorpe. Minister. Thank you, President. And again, thanks, Senator Thorpe. That does go beyond my knowledge as the representing minister, but again, I'm happy to come back to you as quickly as I can. Thank you, Minister. Senator Payman. Uh, my question is to Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Wong. Can the Minister update the Senate on the government's plan to make medicines cheaper for millions of Australians? Um, Minister. Uh, thank you very much, and I thank Senator uh, Payman for her question and for her extraordinary speech uh, that we were privileged to listen to yesterday. Um, the cost of living crisis that this government inherited is a decade in the making, uh, a decade in the making, and it will not be solved overnight. But the government, the Albanese government, has already hit the ground money, running, arguing for successful, successfully arguing for an increase in the minimum wage, something not argued for under them, introducing legislation which will drive investment in cleaner and cheaper energy and putting downward pressure on power prices, also something you could never see from a coalition government. And of course, today we are introducing legislation to make medicines cheaper for millions of Australians. For the first time in its 75-year history, the maximum cost of general scripts under the PBS will fall. On January 1, we are cutting the cost of general scripts by 29 per cent, with the maximum cost to drop by $12.50, dropping the price from $42.50 to $30. This will save someone taking one medication a month $150 a year, a family with two or three medications $300 to $450 a year. And we know patients continue to tell community pharmacies of the increasing pressures of having to choose between food on the table and medicine for their family. This morning at Capital Chemist in Kingston, the Prime Minister met Greg, a single dad whose son lives with diabetes, type 1 diabetes, and Greg told the Prime Minister that the government's plan to cut the cost of medicine will make an enormous difference to his family. An enormous difference. It will ensure he can continue to afford the life-saving life medicine his son needs. So I, I, what I say to those opposite who are interjecting about how long it's taken, you know, we, we've been in government for just over 100 days. You were in government for about 3,000 days. So, but we are the ones who Thank are actually you, introducing legislation. Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Wong. Senator Wong, order. Senator Payman, uh, first supplementary. Fabulous response, Minister. Thank you. How will my first supplementary? My first supplementary question is: How will Australians benefit from making medicines cheaper? Minister. Thank you, uh, President. Well. The maximum cost for, to general patients for PBS medications has doubled since the year 2000. And of course, regrettably for Australians, those opposite when in government did so little to help. Did so little help. In fact, the ABS advises that the high cost of medications on your watch, you don't like the truth, do you? Don't like the truth. A quote, the ABS advises that a million Australians were delayed or didn't fill their medications in 2019-20. They were left in the lurch by the coalition. Cutting the maximum price by nearly one third will mean more people can afford to get the medications they need to stay healthy. And the change will put close to $200 million back in the pockets of Australians each year, the same Australians who are left in the lurch by a coalition who was more interested in political games than Thank delivering you, Minister, for Australia. Your time has expired. Senator, Senator Payman, second supplementary. Thank you, President. Um, Minister, how many Australians will benefit from these changes to the PBS? Minister Wong. Thank you, President. Well, approximately 19 million Australians are eligible to benefit for this change, with about 3.6 million, million Australians to immediately benefit once the legislation comes into effect. And those of us on this side understand that making medicines cheaper will ease the squeeze on household budgets for so many Australians. But you know, one difference also. In a di another difference between us and them is we on this side understand that Medicare and the PBS are the foundations of Australia's world-class healthcare system. And you know why we understand that? 
because their Labor reforms, their Labor reforms, both initiatives of Labor governments, and it is only Labor governments that make these nation-building reforms to transform the lives of Australians. The PBS, a legacy of Curtin and Chif the Curtin and Chifley governments, and of course Medicare, a legacy of the Hawke government. This government will continue to strengthen both Medicare Thank you, and Minister, PBS. Thank you, Your time has expired, Senator Hanson. Senator Hanson for the second time. Thank you. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Climate Change and Energy, Senator Wong. Would the Minister please explain in, to the Australian people and I what net zero emissions actually means in layman's terms? Thank you, Senator Hanson. Minister. Well. I'm not sure how to explain it other than to say it means net zero. There's, there's, I mean, um, you know, I think, and, and, and I understand that the senator, it's one of those situations. I, 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 I will, I'll think through if I can uh, provide a, 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 an explanation to make it clearer than that. But to me, the words net zero are quite clear. Uh, I think we all Order. understand what net emissions Order. means. Um, uh, I am reminded of a, a time when I was climate minister and I think Senator Fielding uh, wanted uh, an explanation and I, I got in the chief scientist uh, to try and take him through it and we did get to a point where I thought I don't actually know uh, and neither did she at that time how, how to break it down any further but I, I will have a think about that. Uh, I think it's a commonly understood objective and it's an objective that, as the senator knows that is shared by those opposite I thought. Maybe not. Uh, well, obviously not Senator Canavan, I know that, Your but policy, the coalition, I thought broadly, had, had agreed to net zero emissions by 2050. Uh, yeah, and that was your policy. Oh, well, may, maybe Senator Canavan is indicating a change in policy under the yeah. coalition, uh, under Mr Dutton. Uh, and uh, and uh, obviously, uh, I think it's 84 per cent, I could be wrong, of Australia's exporters have also, sorry, export markets have already signed up to the same target that was discussed at the G20. So there's broad global agreement about the need um, to, to— Minister, please resume your seat. Senator Canavan. Uh, thank you, uh, um, uh, Madam President. Uh, just on, on relevance there, uh, the question was clearly about uh, the definition of a term. It was a very simple question. And now we're talking about uh, what other countries are doing and signing um, up Senator to. It's totally Canavan, departing. It's got no nothing to do with the original question. Um, Minister, did you wish to continue? Senator Wong, have you finished your first question to the answer? Um, Senator Hanson, first supplementary. Well, actually, I'm gobsmacked from the first answer. I don't know whether I, I don't know whether I should actually ask the second one. Now you got me. Now, all right. Well, then, how much will the government policy to reduce emissions by 43%, which you don't know what net zero is anyway, by 2030? I would really not like to know how much it's going to cost the government by 2050. But it, I doubt I'm going to get an answer on the first one. But if you can answer my question. How much is it going to cost the Australian taxpayers to, for this um, reduced emissions by 43 per cent? Uh, please resume your seat, Minister. Uh, well, th thank you, um, President. Thank you to Senator uh, Hanson for the question. Uh, and she may be aware uh, that the Labor Party in opposition did model this uh, 43 per cent uh, reduction by 2030 uh, policy. Uh, and issued the modelling uh, transparently, and that modelling showed that the plan, uh, which includes a 43 per cent reduction, would in fact create 604,000 jobs, with five out of six new jobs to be created in the region, that it would spur $76 billion of investment, and it would deliver, it would deliver an 82 per cent renewable energy by 2030. So I think what, what we have seen, what we have seen uh, is uh, uh, Power, generating capacity exiting the, energy, the energy generation system over the life of the, 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 those, the government of those opposite. Uh, and that reduction in supply without new capacity coming on stream is, is central to why power prices Thank you, Minister. are doing Your what they are doing. Your time has expired. Senator Hanson, second supplementary. How is the government's plan to bring more than a million immigrants to Australia in the next five years consistent with efforts to reduce emissions? 
Thank you, Hans uh, Senator Hanson. Minister. Well, I think, well, first, uh, I'm not sure about the figure, but we, we have, uh, as a result of the Jobs and Skills Summit, indicated 195,000 um, um, uh, places, uh, uh, and that is as a, as a consequence uh, of the capacity constraints in the economy and the skills crisis that uh, we, we, we know you know, from talking to business and if you look at the data, uh, ex exists. Uh, but you know, the focus will be on permanent skill migration and that will add to the capacity of the Australian economy. Uh, it's important to recall that one of the things that we all have to do, and Australia will have to do, is to ensure that the link between GDP and populations and emissions uh, is, is that they are delinked. Uh, and that we can continue to grow our economy in ways that don't continue uh, to produce as many emissions. And, and the way we do that is by uh, these sorts of investments in renewable energy that Thank our plan you, Minister, will deliver. Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, President. So my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Social Services, uh, Senator Farrell. My question is why is the government's temporary announcement to support pensioners to keep most of what they earn time limited to the end of this financial year? Thank you, Senator Reynolds. Um, Minister. Uh, thank you, um, President, and uh, thank uh, the, um, uh, the Senator for her, uh, her question. Um, I think it's fair to say that uh, this government is doing uh, so much more for uh, pensioners, uh, even in its first uh, <coughs> couple of months, than uh, you've done in the uh, previous uh, your previous uh, <coughs> ten years. Um, and uh, we're going to continue. We're going to continue uh, down this track to try and uh, <coughs> improve the lives of. Uh, Australian uh, pensioners uh, that you um, um, minister please resume your seat yep. senator reynolds uh, thank you point of order president uh, on direct relevance my question was very clear and specific it was why is it time limited to the end of this financial year thank you uh, senator reynolds um, the minister has started to talk about pensioners and like you i'm listening carefully and we will um, order Order. Order. Minister Farrell, please continue. Thank you, President, and uh, thank, uh, thank the, the uh, Senator for her uh, intervention. <coughs> um, uh, look, um, as I uh, made very clear in the few, few seconds I had to uh, answer this question before uh, I was rudely, rudely interrupted by. Senator Reynolds, we we are going to do more. We're going to do more in the time that uh, we have in the government than your government did in the previous uh, ten years. Um, these are these are issues. These are issues. These these are issues that, uh, of course, are uh, constantly uh, under review by uh, the the minister the minister for. Um, Social uh, services, um, and uh, we. Uh, uh, Minister, please resume your seat. Senator Birmingham. President, it's uh, it's a point of order on relevance. It's agonising that uh, Minister Farrell can't get beyond the broad concept of pensioners, and hasn't even turned to the actual policy proposal of the government, which is a copy of part of an opposition policy proposal. Uh, for an extension of pensioner work rights when the precise question from Senator Reynolds was about those pensioner work rights and why the government has adopted it only to the end of the financial year. Thank you, Senator Birmingham. And, uh, in the time remaining, I will direct the minister to the specifics of the question. Thank you, Minister. The, 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 so, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, President. Thank you, President. Um, as, as the Prime Minister has said time and time again, and as Thank you, Minister. The... Time has expired. <laughs> Senator Reynolds, first supplementary. Uh, thank, thank you very much, President. I do have a supplementary question. And in fact, 
Given that uh, the minister representing the Minister for Social Services didn't answer the question, I ask him the same question again. Um, can the minister please uh, explain why it is only time limited until the end of this year? Thank you, Senator Reynolds. Um, minister. Thank you, uh, thank you, President, and uh, thank uh, the Senator for her supplementary Order. question. As I, as I started to, uh, to say before uh, I uh, was required I'm to sorry, sit down— I'm sorry, Minister. Could you resume your seat? Sorry. I'm waiting until there's quiet before I call the minister back up. Oh, Senator Brown, Senator Brown, I've just called the chamber to order. That includes you. Um, minister, please continue. <coughs> thank you, uh, Madam President, and uh, thank uh, Senator Reynolds for her question. Um, we, this, this government continues to do whatever we can to assist Australian pensioners in a way that the previous government never, ever did. Uh, and uh, one, of the, one of the ways in which we're uh, doing that, of course, is that uh, uh, we're strengthening the— um, Minister Farrell, uh, sit, please resume your seat. Uh, Senator order on direct relevance. Uh, I've given the minister representing the minister uh, two opportunities now to answer a very simple question, and if I could ask that you uh, remind the minister of the question. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator Reynolds, and I will remind uh, the minister of the question, but I, I think he was going to, in the next breath, um, answer it before, before the point of order was called. Thank you, minister. Thank you, President, and uh, thank, uh, thank uh, Senator Reynolds for her constant uh, interruption. Um, what I would <laughs> that will be the next question, uh, Senator. Um, we continue to try and assist and make life easier for pensioners in this thank country, you, and that's Carol, why we are strict. Order, order, Senator Reynolds, second supplementary. Thank you very much, President. And uh, given in the first two questions, I didn't get a straight answer. I was going to ask whether they would look to extend it beyond July of this year, given there is a great need. However, I will ask the same question again. And, President, I noted that Senator Wong said she had the answer, so maybe you might like to hand it over to Senator Farrell. Um, but the question again is. Uh, why is it just time limited? Why, in a policy, is Thank it time you, limited Reynolds, until the end of this year? Uh, it is not helpful when senators, particularly those on my right, call out time. Thank you, um, Minister. Minister. Thank you, thank you, uh, President, and thank uh, the uh, senator for her uh, supplementary uh, question. Um, well, I, uh, one observation I would make, uh, Senator, is that. Uh, there is a facility uh, under, the, uh, under the decision that has been made for, uh, and to extend the period of time in, uh, um, in extenuating uh, circumstances. So I think your, uh, your general principle is not completely accurate in the sense that there, are, uh, there is an ability under the, uh, under the proposal uh, to— I'll give him a chance. Uh Minister, uh, Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, President. Again, a point of order on direct relevance. Um, again, I'll just remind uh, you, President, of the question. Why is it just time limited to the end of this financial year? Third thank time lucky, I'm hoping, in the last 20 seconds. Thank you, Senator Reynolds. Um, the minister was being relevant, and I'll call the minister again. Thank you. Um, look, uh, I've, Senator I've, Smith. I've tried to be as directly relevant uh, as I can, uh, President. Um, the proposition that's being put to me by the senator is not correct. There is an ability under the proposal in extenuating circumstances you, to minister. extend the Your time the period. has expired, Senator Faruqi. Thank you, President. My question is to Minister Watt, representing the Minister for Early Childhood Education. Today, thousands of early childhood educators around the country have walked out of centres. The low pay and difficult conditions these workers are subjected to are a national shame. Educators deserve professional pay that reflects the skill and responsibility of the work that they do every single day. 
but instead of immediately committing the funding necessary to lift these w uh, workers' wages, the Labour government is going ahead with the stage three tax cuts for the wealthy. Tax cuts that economists tell us will overwhelmingly flow to men as well. Why is the government sticking with the obscene stage three tax cuts when you should be using the money to lift wages of early educators and carers who are mostly women? Thank you, Senator Faruqi. Senator Wong? Point, point of order, um, uh, and S Senator Watt may well, President, be quite willing to answer those bits within his portfolio. But um, a question on tax cuts, just because it is juxtaposed with a political statement about childcare, does not make this part of the portfolio that Senator Watt is representing. If the, if the, if the, senator, well, if the senator wants to make, ask questions about tax cuts, they're obviously uh, rep representing ministers who can be asked. But I make the point that the, the, the responsibility uh, is uh, is not in the portfolio to which the question is addressed. Now, obviously, the remedy is, is the senator can answer the, the minister can answer the question insofar as it relates to his, the portfolio he's representing. Uh, thank you, Senator Wong. I'm responding to the point of order, Senator Fruki. Um, I just remind senators that uh, questions do need to be addressed to the correct portfolio holder. Um, did you have a point of order, Senator Fruki? I do. I just this is a question about childcare and childcare workers and early educators and workers and their pay. And if the minister who represents the minister for early education and care can't respond to that, then I'm not sure what to do about it, to um, be frank. Senator Faruqi, uh, just a moment, Senator Wong. Senator Wong, please resume your seat. Senator Faruqi, that was not the totality of the question. And as the point of order by Senator Wong went to the issue of tax cuts, which is indeed um, another portfolio holder. Um, so that you don't have a point of order, I'm going to go to Senator Watt now to answer whatever part of the question that relates to his portfolio. Senator Watt. Thank, thank you, President. Uh, and thank you, Senator Faruqi. Uh, Senator Wong, of course, is correct that um, if you go back and look at the question that was asked, it was about tax cuts. But I'm certainly happy to talk about uh, early childhood educators, uh, a group in our community who I very much value, and everyone on this side of the chamber very much values. Uh, and it's particularly appropriate uh, that we be talking about these issues today, because today, of course, is Early Childhood Educators Day. Uh, and that's why not long after question time, I and no doubt many of my colleagues here will be going to meet with early childhood educators on the front lawns of the parliament. Uh, and I would certainly encourage every, every worker, uh, every uh, uh, member of parliament to do the same thing. Um, Labor has long recognised uh, the problems regarding the low pay of early childhood educators. Um, and I certainly know that from personal experience in terms of my children and the early childhood education they received. Uh, I've actually spent time in early childhood centres uh, with educators observing the work that they do, which is incredibly demanding and incredibly valuable, and that's why they do deserve a pay rise. Uh, and that's exactly why our government is committed to reinvigorating bargaining so that we can improve productivity but also grow wages, particularly in the sectors like this, like early childhood. Uh, that's why our government has successfully argued for a pay rise for the lowest paid workers in Australia, a pay rise I might admit and acknowledge that those opposite opposed. Um, on 1 July this year, the Fair Work Commission minimum rates order increased pay rates in modern awards, including the Children's Services Award, by 4.6 per cent, something that our government called for in a submission, a pay rise for the lowest paid workers in our community, including early childhood educators. We know the work of women has long been undervalued, and that is definitely the case for the early childhood education and care sector, where more than 90 per cent of the workforce are women, and we will keep Thank acting you, on this. Senator Watt. Your time has expired. Senator Furuki, first supplementary. Minister Watt, in your own Facebook posts as far back as 2018, you've described early childhood educators as grossly underpaid and identified the wage discrimination that exists for traditionally female-dominated workplaces. You know that the pandemic and workforce shortages have made the crisis worse. So why have you given up? When will you commit? When will you commit to giving early childhood education workers the immediate pay rise that they deserve Thank you, Senator and make Faruqi, early education free for all? Minister. 
Uh, thank you, Senator Faruqi, and, and I thank you for acknowledging my consistency of position when it comes to the fact that early childhood educators are grossly underpaid, something that the former government did absolutely nothing about and something I might say the Greens will never have the opportunity to do something about not being a party of government. The only party that will ever be responsible for delivering an, a wage rise to early child educators is a Labor government, and that is exactly what we are doing right now. This notion that we have given up on this issue could not be further from the truth. As I say, already since we have been in office, the Fair Work Commission minimum rates order increased pay rates in modern awards, including the Children's Services Award, by 4.6 per cent. And that, of course, followed a Labor government making a submission to the Fair Work Commission arguing for a pay rise for those lowest paid amongst our community. I am very happy to put my credentials as a supporter of early childhood educators up against any member of the Greens, any member of the opposition, and I know that everyone on this side Thank of the you. chamber would do the uh, same Senator thing. Senator Watt, your time has expired. Senator Faruqi, second Min supplementary. Thank you. Minister Ward, I've spoken with early childhood workers about the burnout that they are facing, their rising workloads and the low pay that is causing many to leave the sector. There is no time to waste on your vague plans and distant timelines. We need action, and they need action right now. When will the government bring in legislation in this parliament to lift wages, to improve conditions, and to deal with the critical workforce shortages in early learning and care? Thank you, Senator Faruqi. Minister. Um, thank you, President, and thank you, Senator Faruqi. I know that whatever the issue, um, the Greens' tactic is to get up and make speeches demanding something when it's actually Labor governments who deliver those things. And for the third time, for the third time, I can point out that in the very short time this government has been in office, we have delivered a pay rise to the lowest paid in our community, including early childhood educators. It might suit the Greens' frame to say that nothing is happening, but it's already happened and we've been barely in office for 100 days. And that's before we get to the changes to bargaining that we expect to make an even bigger difference to the lowest paid in our community, including including early childhood educators. Uh, I don't just speak to early childhood educators. I'm a member of the union that represents early childhood educators, the United Workers' Union, who have a proud record of backing in those early childhood educators for years. With the support of Labor, we are already delivering and we will continue to do more because these people deserve a pay rise. Thank you, Minister. Senator Urquhart. Thank you. President, my question is to the Minister for Tourism and uh, and the minister, uh, the minister representing the Minister for Social Services, Senator Farrell. Minister, the last few years have been incredibly difficult for the tourism industry, which was then further exacerbated by the former government's near constant delays and inaction. How did the Albanese government ensure the sector was an integral part of the Jobs and Skills Summit? Minister. Thank you, uh, President, and uh, thank uh, Senator uh, uh, Urquhart for that question, uh, and of course she's absolutely right. Um, very few industries have uh, had it as tough as the tourism and travel sector over the last uh, couple of years. From bushfires, floods, the pandemic, the industry has weathered significant challenges, uh, which have Im impacted the uh, business's ability uh, to retain and to recruit staff. Uh, those in the sector understand that skill shortages were an issue before the pandemic but have been exacerbated uh, by the ongoing uncertainty and lack of action by the previous government. <coughs> Hearing their voices and working together on solutions uh, is and will continue to be a priority for the Albanese Labor government. To this end, last week I was joined by almost 100 tourism and travel stakeholders who detailed their challenges and how the lack of staff is limiting their recovery uh, for, from the uh, pandemic. Throughout the sessions, we discussed suggestions and opportunities to solve these problems, um, and those were then fed through to the Jobs and Skills uh, Summit. President, unlike the previous government, who were more focused on their own jobs than the tourism sector, come on, respond, <coughs> respond, <coughs> do say something. Don't just sit there. Don't just sit there. The Albanese government, the Albanese government is committed to supporting the visitor economy and addressing the skills crisis which is limiting their recovery. We understand the, we understand we understand the value of tourism and tra the, the tourism and travel sector 
and we want to see a return uh, as a heart of the, uh, uh, our economic uh, uh, narrative, particularly in the great state of Tasmania. Thank you, Senator Farrell. Uh, yeah. Senator Urquhart, first supplementary. Thank you, President. As the minister is aware, the overwhelming majority of tourism businesses are small and medium-sized. How will they benefit from the outcomes of the Jobs and Skills Summit? That's right. Minister. Thank you, President, and I thank the Senator, Senator for once again her important Thank question. Uh, it's true that the majority of tourism and travel businesses are small to medium businesses in this country, with 95 per cent of all businesses employing uh, fewer than five people, and that's particularly the case in the state of uh, Tasmania. This offers both challenges and significant opportunities for these dynamic and resilient businesses. The Albanese Labor government um, has heard the feedback of these small and medium businesses and have announced a number of measures following the Jobs and Skills Summit which will provide uh, assistance. Uh, this includes uh, an announcement uh, uh, that uh, has been made uh, along with the Minister of Social uh, Security, Amanda Rishworth, of the establishment of the Visitor Economy Disability Pilot to help people living with disability secure jobs in tourism. In addition, tourism businesses will benefit from those changes Thank which you, would Minister. enable the pensioners— Thank you, Minister. The time has expired. Senator Urquhart, second supplementary. Thank you, President. Uh, Minister, building on the Jobs and Skills Summit, can you please provide some further details of this week's announcement to connect people with disability that you just talked about to meaningful work in the tourism sector? Minister. Thank you, President, and thank uh, the Senator once again for her question. As mentioned uh, earlier, Today, as a result of the uh, Jobs and uh, Skills Summit, I joined the uh, Minister of Social Secu Security, Amanda Rishworth, in announcing a $3.3 million visitor economy disability pilot to help people living with disabilities secure sustained jobs in tourism. The pilot uh, will address uh, barriers previously identified by small and medium-sized business tourism businesses in recruiting, retaining and progressing staff with disabilities. This includes a lack of time and capability to recruit people living with disability confusion on how and where to seek support and employment services provided focusing on supporting job seekers only rather than uh, on uh, employers. We know that 88 per cent of people living with disability uh, and those uh, who work <coughs> don't actually need the modifications on their uh, workplaces to do so. President, employ Thank you, Minister. The time has expired. Senator Hume. Thank you, Madam President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Wong. I refer the Minister to the questions asked of the Prime Minister and the Minister for Regional Development, Local Government and Territories in the other place. Can the Minister please confirm that the Minister for Regional Development, Local Government and Territories has breached the Prime Minister's ministerial code of conduct? Minister. Thank you, um, President, and I, and I thank the Senator for her question. And obviously, I've been here, so I haven't listened to every word that has been uh, uttered in the other place. And with all due respect to, to my senatorial colleague, I, I'm not necessarily going to uh, take as read her assertion about what has been said. But I, I would make the point that the opposition. Uh, in their attack on this is seeking that this government uphold a standard they never did. That's right. A, a standard they never did. You never did it in government and never in opposition. Never in government and never in opposition. And the reality is, is we have strengthened the ministerial code of conduct so that ministers are not able to hold shares of blind trust. And if you had this standard in government, would you like to know who would be in breach? The Leader of the Opposition would be in breach. The Leader of the National Party would be in breach. The Shadow Treasurer would be in breach. The Manager of um, Opposition Minister, Business would be in breach. Please, I know the truth hurts, Minister, doesn't it, Senator? Minister, please resume your seat. Uh, thank Senator you. Hume. A point of order, Madam President, and that's direct relevance. I only asked whether it was true that the Minister for Regional Development, Local Government and Territories has breached the Prime Minister's Ministerial Code of Conduct. The current Prime Minister's Prime Ministerial Code Thank of Conduct. Thank you, Senator Hume. Uh, I do believe the Minister is being relevant. It is a question about the Code. Um, Minister. Well, I'm asked about the Ministerial Code of Conduct and breaches of same or alleged breaches of same, and I make the point that the Code of Conduct that applies uh, to, the, to the executive under this government is a standard that those opposite, including Senator Hume, never held themselves to. Never held themselves to. 
so uh, I would I would make the point uh, that point. Uh, uh, I, um, well, I, Minister, please resume your seat. Minister Wong, please resume your seat. Senator Hume. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Senator Wong, I'm sorry, that was an imputation on me, directly on me. Thank and you. I don't think you've actually read my register of interest, because then you'd see that, unlike uh, many Senator people Hume, on your side of the chamber, I don't Senator, own any shares. Senator I don't Hume, own any shares. This is Senator not shares an opportunity there. for debate. Um, Minister Wong. I acknowledge uh, it was not intended in the way it was. It obviously was heard, and I, uh, I withdraw that. Thank you. I do withdraw that. And, I've always taken the view it's just easier not to own anything as well. Um, but uh, I, I would make that point. Uh, I, I'm sure the Prime Minister has answered whatever questions that the Leader of the Opposition or uh, his tactics team have put to the Prime Minister. We've made clear uh, that the Ministerial Code uh, does require— uh, um, Minister, please resume your seat. Senator Birmingham. President, I, I note the Leader of the Government of the Senate has spoken generically about the Ministerial Code, made a number of other assertions irrelevant to the question, but has spoken about the Code. There was a direct question about whether a minister has breached the Code. Uh, the Leader of the Government indicates that she's not aware of the precise details. In the 13 seconds remaining, she should take the question on notice so she can provide a direct answer to the direct question. Uh, thank you, Senator Birmingham. I'm, I'm struggling with your point of order. I accept that you acknowledge the minister is answering the question. Um, I note the comments you made in relation to her most recent statement. Um, I don't believe that's a point of order, but it's up to Senator Wong whether she takes it on notice or not. Minister. Thank you. Uh, as is my practice, uh, I will obviously provide more information if I'm able to the chamber. Thank you, Minister. Um, Senator Hume, first supplementary. Uh, thank you, Madam President. When did the Minister for Regional Development, Local Government and Territories first contact the Prime Minister or his office to notify of a breach of the Prime Minister's Ministerial Code of Conduct? If you don't have the date exactly, Senator Wong, you can also return to the chamber with that. Um, Minister. I think in opposition we asked quite a number of questions which went to you know, what the knowledge uh, of the minister uh, that the senator here in this chamber is representing. Uh, obviously, this is one of those. Uh, if I can provide further information about, about that, I will, I will do so. Thank you, Senator Wong. Uh, Senator Hume, second supplementary. Thank you, Madam President. The Code of Conduct for Ministers was published online on 8 July 2022. Did the Minister for Regional Development, Local Government and Territories take any action to comply with the Prime Minister's Code of Conduct before media reported on her breach almost two months later? Minister. Uh, uh, again, uh, I will. Uh, obviously, that's not something I have any personal knowledge of, but uh, I again uh, will see if there's any further information I can find. It, it is the Prime Minister's expectation uh, that ministers uh, do comply with the code. Uh, that, that is, he's made that clear uh, both privately and publicly. I would also make the point. Uh, I would also make the point that this is a higher standard that has been applied uh, uh, in. Uh, in the Commonwealth of Australia for nearly a decade. Uh, and uh, obviously, uh, it's a different standard to the standard that was applied by those opposite. Um, and on that basis, President, on that basis, I ask that further questions be placed on notice. Cards, we're out of time. Senator Hume. Uh, Senator Hume, please resume your seat. Uh, the minister had finished answer. Senator Hume. Senator Hume. Order. 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 Senator Hume, the minister had finished her answer and asked order. I am giving a direction. It is not a debating point. Senator Wong had finished her question and had then asked that further evidence, further questions being put on notice. There is no point of order. Thank you, Senator Hume. I'm not entertaining further points of order on that matter. Sure, happy to do so. Ha 
Senator Hume, I am happy to do so. Re please resume your seat. Please resume your seat. I would ask senators in this place to respect the direction I give. I accept that you may not like the direction, but you need to accept it. I have agreed to review the tape. I do not need you to keep talking when I've asked you specifically to sit down. Thank you. Senator Watt. Senator Watt. Thank you, President. I have uh, a couple of answers to the questions that were asked by Senator Thorpe. Is now the appropriate time to respond to that? Certainly. Thank you. Uh, Senator Thorpe, I have some partial answers to your questions. I may have to come back with some further answers tomorrow. Uh, in relation to your first question, uh, of course the Montgomery case that you're referring to follows some similar litigation, the Love and Tom's cases, which I'm sure you're familiar with. Uh, since the High Court's judgment in Love and Tom's, and as at the 29th of August this year, 13 non-citizens have been released from immigration detention on the basis that they meet or the detaining officer suspects they meet the tripartite test. Five non-citizens have been released from immigration detention directly or indirectly as a result of court judgments concerning whether it was reasonable for officers to suspect non-citizens were aliens in particular circumstances but did not involve conclusions that they meet the tripartite test. These individuals may still be required to be detained in the future in the event further inquiries demonstrate more conclusively they do not meet the tripartite test and they do not hold visas. Uh, in relation to your second question, uh, the Department of Home Affairs continues to manage individual cases that raise claims of meeting the tripartite test and continues to consider the implications of the High Court's decision for Commonwealth programs in consultation with other Australian government departments, including the Attorney-General's Department, the National Indigenous Australians Agency, the Department of Finance and the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet. In relation to your third question, there are currently no plans to alter the visa scheme to introduce special conditions. As I say, if those responses don't fully answer your questions, I'll come back with some further detail. And as I've mentioned to you, I'd encourage you to have some discussions with Minister Giles about those issues. Um, in addition, uh, Deputy President, yesterday in question time, I took answers asked by Senator Canavan on notice in my capacity as the Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry relating to biosecurity. I have written to Senator Canavan to provide additional information, and I table my letter to Senator Canavan for the information of all senators. Senator Wong. Uh, thank you, President. Yesterday in question time, I undertook to seek further advice on questions asked by Senator Tyrrell to me in her capacity, uh, in my capacity as the Minister representing uh, the Prime Minister relating to the Australian Future Leader for Leaders Foundation. I have written to Senator Tyrrell to provide additional information and I table my letter for the information of all senators. Senator O'Sullivan. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. President. Uh, Deputy President, beg your pardon. I move to take note of the, uh, of the answer given by Senator Gallagher to the question asked by Senator Rustin on, uh, on the DPA and, uh, and health. Now, the Albanese government's recent decision to expand the classification of the distribution priority area to include suburbs of state capital cities, frankly, is more bad news for regional Australia. Indeed. Regional communities from my state of Western Australia who are already struggling already struggling to get doctors will now have to compete with large metropolitan areas. The whole idea of the DPA was to identify areas experiencing low, lower areas of GP services and provide unique channels and incentives for them to be able to attract uh, GPs and to be able to retain them in these areas. Now, three areas in Western Australia where the, the Labor government have now granted full or partial DPA status include Quinana, Kalamunda and Brigadoon. Now, for those not familiar with Perth, these, are, these suburbs are actually hardly even considered outer metropolitan suburbs. In fact, I live just south, just north like of, the, of one of these places, and this is hardly, hardly a, a regional area certainly not a remote area. And what is the government doing? What is the government doing? It's just going to bring and draw in, of course, people to work in these areas. Now, 
I'm not at all disputing the fact that there would be need for GPs and for GP services in these, uh, in these localities across, across Perth and indeed across Australia, where the other locations uh, we know that Fishwick is, is listed. Now it's just down the road from here. Uh, Tugradong is another one, just, just down the road down there, not too far at all. Not too far at all. I mean, now there might be, there might be need for GPs, but I can tell you, Mr. Deputy President, you need to come for a drive around Western Australia to some of the regional communities that are in desperate need for adequate services, adequate services provided by GPs. You don't have to even go that far, but you go out to, to somewhere like uh, up in the Kimberley, across the Halls Creek, Fitzroy Crossing, Kununurra. How do these places attract staff, attract GPs and GP services? If you, the, those incentives that are designed to support those communities and those regional areas, if you're have, if you've just providing those same incentives, those same initiatives, right there in the capital cities. I've got no doubt that these locations may be struggling to attract and retain GPs, but it should not be at the expense of GPs leaving regional and remote areas of Western Australia, who are already battling already battling to ensure that they're able to access sufficient health services. It's not too difficult to work out in general the health status of people declines the more remote they are, the, more f the further they are from capital cities. Therefore, it's hard to imagine that the changes that the government has made will, will strengthen the ability for West Australians in, in regional and remote areas to be able to access GP services and how it will be able to be improved. Now, what we know, I'm wondering if there's going to, we're going to start to see a pattern here. We know that when the government, when the Labor Party was last in government, they they started to really tinker with the health services. Now, one of the things they tinkered with a lot was the pharmaceutical benefits scheme, where we saw the delisting of medicines, the delisting of medicines on the pharmaceutical benefits scheme. Yet we have. While we were in government, the whole time that uh, I was uh, in this place, I was sitting on the other side, uh, for every day of the last term, we listed an equivalent of one new medicine for every day of the last term. Now, I don't know about you, Senator Rennick, but I, it's one of the great things that I'm proud of that we were able to achieve as new senators in this place to see that happen, to see that track record. Yeah. Because we know that this mob on the other side, they don't have the ability to be able to manage the books. They don't have the ability to be able to manage the affairs of this government appropriately. What Australians need is a government that's actually sensible about the needs, about the services that are required. I prepare to stand up. I prepare to do what's necessary, and not just rob Peter to pay Paul to provide the services that are required. And that's exactly what we're seeing here. It's exactly what we're seeing here. What we need is services in the bush, and all this is doing is taking Thank you, away Senator from Senator O'Sullivan. Senator Green. Thank you. Um, sometimes it's difficult to understand whether the opposition understands what a DIXA is, because this question is an opportunity for those on this side to talk about the appalling history under the Morrison government of the treatment of Medicare and GPs, particularly in rural and regional areas, and what our government is doing to fix the mess that you left. Let me break this down for you. Let me break this down for you. You so utterly broke the Medicare system and the reliance on GPs that it was so incredibly difficult for people to see a GP in rural and regional areas that now, now we have a situation where we have had to step in and make sure that people can see a GP. But it's very, very, interesting, very interesting to see from those opposite that they are opposed to the use of distribution priority areas, because I am wondering whether senators on this side have consulted with members of their own party, because I know that in, in Queensland, Cairns is a distribution priority area. The member of Leichhardt hasn't opposed that listing. Townsville has DPA status. The member for Herbert hasn't 
um, oppose that listing. Mackay has DPA status, the Whit Sundays. Certainly haven't seen that happen from the member for Dawson. And Harvey Bay has DPA status under the Labor government. And we know that that means that the member for Hinkler must be very supportive of our policy. But it is clear that under the Liberal National Government, the former Morrison government, that at every opportunity that they had, they ripped out funding from Medicare. They made it harder to see a GP. They, we know that they froze the Medicare rebate for six years. And if you speak to a GP, whether they're in the city or the bush, they will tell you that the former government ripped the heart out of Medicare when they froze the rebate. They went so as far as to cut access to telehealth appointments for regional Australians. And they also made sure that people living in places like Emerald were waiting 12 weeks to see a GP. Now, we had a Senate inquiry and we put that motion to this place, and those opposite who are going to get up today and talk about access to GPs voted against that inquiry because you said that there was no problem. There was no issue, nothing to see here. There was not, no problem to be fixed. But when we held that inquiry, initiated by Labor, we heard horrible stories from people around the country about the treatment that you lot put them up to so that they couldn't see a GP. That is why, that is why a Labor government is strengthening Medicare. And we were very clear at the election and we were supported at the election to form a government with the core value of strengthening Medicare and protecting it. We will be delivering urgent care clinics in regional areas and across the country. We have developed the Strengthening Medicare Task Force, an important opportunity to bring so many people around the table to fix this workforce issue caused by your former government. And we have delivered DPA access to areas that are desperately in need of GPs. We will not stand here and be lectured by a government, by a political party, that sacked nurses in Queensland. Queenslanders will never forget that. And we know that Queenslanders are so pleased that we finally have a government that values Medicare. I won't, be, I won't stand here as someone who lives in a regional area and be lectured to by those opposite about who cares about access to GPs and Medicare. And I notice that the previous speaker raised the issue of medicines. Well, I have fantastic news for you, because today we have announced that we will be making medicines cheaper for millions of Australians. This is a fantastic step forward, the first time in 75 years, the first time in 75 years are you, opposed? Are you opposed to having cheaper medicines? Because there is a choice here. You can support that policy or you can be opposed to it. But we know that, this, that on this side of the chamber, our government is making medicines cheaper. We will be introducing legislation. You'll have the opportunity to support that legislation to make sure that people have access to the medicines that they need. Because Labor built Medicare and we will always protect it. You tried to rip the heart out of Medicare. You made it harder to see a GP. That is why our Labor government is fixing it. And we will always stand here on our record. And it is completely, complete rubbish from your side of politics to lecture us about access to GPs in Thank rural you, and regional Green. areas. Senator Rennick. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy President. And I suggest uh, Senator Green go back and actually do some study on the history of health care in this country. I stand here as the son of a maternity, uh, a maternity nurse, a midwife, and, a G and, and, and she had a general ticket as well. And she actually uh, worked in many hospitals in four states, as a matter of fact. She did a training at St Vincent's in 1953 in Sydney. And um, would you— uh, Senator Green, please restrain yourself. But Senator Rennick, you did, you did give some commentary during Senator Green's— um... Well, I've actually got something important to say because I actually know the history of health care in this country. And let me tell you, the state governments have taken advantage of the good nature that uh, Medicare was set up for, and they have cost-shifted from the states onto the federal government. And I know that because when I grew up and had to go and see a doctor, I would sit in a uh, thing called outpatients in a public hospital. Now, they, that's been renamed emergency. And the reason why they renamed it emergency is so that people don't go to emergency and the state governments want it that way because then they don't have to pick up the cost. By sending it to a doctor in the primary health care system, they get the federal government to pick up the cost. 
Now, the problem with that is that has overloaded the system on, on the, doc, uh, the doctors, and what we need in this country are more doctors on fixed salaries, and we need the, the public health system in the state system. Actually, to be honest, we need to go further than this. We need to actually get one level of government trying to run health care in this country, because we're getting this cost shifting all the time in this blame game between federal and state governments, and this, uh, ambiguous re these re ambiguous responsibilities result in nothing but name calling rather than problem solving. And um, now I just want to touch on something that uh, Senator Green uh, was talking about in this so-called discount for the PBS scheme. That may sound very well at first, uh, at first intentions, but the point is, is that you need to ask the question. I know this, there was a cholesterol drug called Liptor uh, that was actually a, a prescription drug that was painted by Pfizer. Now, the Australian government, this goes back a decade or so, was actually paying about $50 a uh, bucks for this particular drug. Um, and of course, Pfizer were collecting about $40 of the $50, right? So, but the, the, the fact was, was that the, there was a similar generic drug that came off patent that you could have bought for $2. So it's all very well saying that you're spending billions of dollars on the PBS, but the question needs to be asked whether or not there's suitable generic drugs out there that you can use that isn't going to line the pockets of rich pharmaceutical companies. Uh, so, you know, I, I would like to see greater detail with this PBS scheme. But getting back onto the actual use of doctors and, and having these uh, priority schemes for doctors, the fact of the matter is, is that we've got an undersupply of doctors in this country, and we need to also uh, point the finger at our, uh, our um, the professional bodies of the medical industry, who quite frankly aren't training enough doctors here in this country. Now, I touched on this in my maiden speech, that it's an absolute insult that Australia, a first world country, is importing doctors from underdeveloped countries because our own AMA and our doctors are running a cartel in this country where they're restricting the supply of, of specialist services in order to make sure that they can maximise their fees. And we've got to have a serious look at this, and I, and I don't want to get you know, bipartisan here because I'm sick to death of the health issues that we've got in this country. But if we're meant to solve this problem, we really need to actually get one level of government taking responsibility for health full stop. And that requires, and you know, I'm, I'm happy to work with Labor on this, uh, and, I, and I mean this, because regional health is very, very important to me. You know, in the last 30 years, I've seen under the Queensland state Labor government, and I know that it happens in other areas, other states as well, the closure of over 30 maternity wards in regional Queensland. Now, that's a combination of factors, but one of those factors is that we just will not get doctors to go to the regions. They don't want to take on the insurance because you know, they work in the private sector. We've got a problem with training nurses. Many nurses now either do general practice or midwifery, but they don't do both. If you want nurses out in the regions, you need to get them to do both be a G, uh, uh, get their general ticket as well as mum would always call it a general ticket um, and, and be a midwife as well because out there, there you know there isn't enough babies being born every day to have a full-time midwife they need to be able to also be general nurses as well um, but look at the end of the day here what we really need is is better front-end services and we need to so in order to do that I would like to see I would actually well I'd like to get rid of states altogether, but it is absurd that we've got nine health bureaucracies in this country while our front-end services are suffering, and we've really got to get serious about having a big overview. If you want a job summit, I'll tell you what, you should have a health summit, and I will turn up to that one. I guarantee you that. Senator O'Neill. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Deputy President. And, uh, I think you can see in that, that flow of consciousness contribution from Senator Rennick, as generous as it was in its intention, a, a bit of a map of the former government's way of planning the health sector, chaotic and destructive, not doing anything valuable that was actually going to stand up to Australia's real needs. Let me remind you of a bit Senator of Rennick. history. Senator Before Rennick. Medicare was— Excuse me, Senator Rennick. Senator Rennick, you, you were heard in silence. I. I remonstrated with Senator Green, and I, I appreciate. So, so that's not that, Senator Senator Rennick. That's not a point of order. I appreciate it. I appreciate that you're very passionate about it. But Senator O'Neill is entitled to be heard in silence. Senator O'Neill, you have the call. Thank you very much. Just let's get to the reality of what Medicare does and why we're talking about GPs today, because the government of the last nine years 
and its various iterations over the last few decades have attacked Medicare at every turn. The main cause of bankruptcy before Medicare was medical debt. People, Australians died or they sold their house. And finally, the Labor Party moved to make sure that that was no longer the case and Medicare was established. Now, in establishing that, we changed the course of the health of this nation in a very positive way. It was attacked relentlessly by every iteration of federal Liberal National Party government that came after. And that's what we've actually seen over the last nine years. So let's get a little bit of fact on the record here. So the reality that we confronted when the Rudd-Gillard government was established was there was a declining number of GPs being trained. We completely changed that and ramped up training our own because Mr Abbott's solution as health minister was to stop training Australians and bring overseas trained doctors. Short-term decision, bad long-term decision. And the reality is that those wonderful GPs that we trained happened to come out into a, a medical profession that was being ripped asunder by the Abbott government. When they froze Medicare, they basically kicked out from underneath the business model of our GPs their sustainability as a practice. So what happened with those smart cookies who were training to be GPs? They came out, they had a look at these businesses in collapse, destroyed by the Australian government, and they said, well, hold on, I don't really want to be a GP anymore. We don't have a training problem in terms of the numbers. We have a problem of a broken business model that has destroyed GP practices across this country. Right across this country, it's the Liberal National Party who always pump themselves up as being great understanders of businesses that broke the, G the back of the GP business model for Australia. Now, the reality that we confront right now is because of that failure, because they broke access to GPs, they decided to tinker with this thing that they called the DPA, the, the District of Priority, Distribution Priority Area. On the record in the other chamber today, the Minister for Health very clearly indicated that the changes that we were being asked about here today, the changes to the DPA that Labor has instituted, are changes that was a reverse to a cut made by the former government in 2019. A reverse to what that government had done in terms of denying Australians in this country access to a GP. They did that as a response to the failure of, of their own policies in ruining Australians' access to GPs. And then they thought they could just shrink, shrink the places in which it was distributed. On the central coast, on the central coast, there was evidence given to our committee, and it was a Labor-instituted GP inquiry, GP shortage inquiry. It was our committee that determined the reality uh, to tell the reality of what's going on in Australia. Now, whether we were in Victoria, Queensland, New South Wales, or out in Wyala taking evidence, it was the same story everywhere. A completely ruined system. Communities in desperate need for doctors. And it's the responsibility of the former government that we do not have that workforce today. Now, Labor's come in. We've been here, what, 108 days. We can't undo everything that they did wrong. But this really egregious move of, of cutting the DPA in 2019 was a con job by the former government. It didn't fix the problem. It bought them time. But what it didn't do was give Australians access to the health care that they pay for and the health care they deserve. Labor is on to the job of fixing the mess that we have been left in the health sector by the former government. And Australians can trust. Australians who, uh, the Labor Party who built Medicare will restore the integrity to the system that it deserves. Thank you, Senator O'Neill. Senator Scar. <laughs> I thank you, Mr Deputy President. Perhaps I can uh, strike a, a somewhat more conciliatory note as we uh, discuss what I consider is a very important issue, and that is, and that is the access of Australians to general practitioners across this country. And I might just, especially through you, Deputy President, for those in the gallery, uh, explain what we're talking about here, and that is what's referred to as distribution priority areas. 
And those areas which are classified as distribution priority areas, there are various incentives in place to attract medical professionals to go into those areas and be general practitioners. And those benefits to attract medical professionals into those areas include uh, international medical graduates and foreign graduates of accredited medical schools will have access to Medicare in DPA, those distribution priority areas only. So if their overseas medical practitioners come to this country, they can access Medicare as long as they're practicing in those areas. So the whole intention of this policy is to try and provide an incentive for that pool of professionals to provide general practice services to Australians living in those rural and regional areas. And that's the issue we're talking about. And I think, uh, in my view, Mr Deputy President, the system is broken. The system is broken. And we shouldn't be focusing so much on the history. Uh, we should be fo focusing on the way forward. The way forward. How do we fix the system? And we know the system is broken because the system has now there is such a lack of general practitioners, we now have the absurd situation where the incentives which are meant to be given to a medical practitioner to go to a place like Emerald in my home state of Queensland, which is three hours from Rockhampton, are the same as the incentives which are provided to medical practitioners to practice at Fishwick 13 or 15 minutes down the road from Parliament House. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. Of course they get sick, Senator O'Neill. Of course they do. But of course they do. But the issue, well, as I said, I'm trying to strike a more conciliatory tone and look forward. The issue is, if you're providing the same incentives, if you're providing the same incentives for someone to work 15 minutes down the road from Parliament House as you're providing to someone in Mildura over five hours from Melbourne or Emerald, three hours from Rockhampton, obviously the incentive isn't going to work. So the problem is so widespread around this country that there's a, there's a fundamental issue with the incentive system. There's a fundamental issue with the incentive system, and that's what we're talking about here. There's also, in my view, a fundamental system with the, what's referred to as the modified Monash, Monash model, which is the way in which different areas are categorised. I've spoken to different communities across Queensland with respect to the application of that system. And to give you one example, a town in my home state of Rosewood is put in the same classification as, a, as Ipswich, which again is uh, one of my patron seats as a senator, and the demographics and the geographical challenges and the ability to attract medical staff is completely different between those two areas, but they're considered in the same category. It just it doesn't this system, this modified Monash system, does not reflect what happens on the ground, the realities of local communities. And it is a system which we really should look at. It really is. And uh, uh, I'd like to finally, with indulgence, um, thank someone who brought this to my attention. And that's Mr Lyle McEwen. And Lyle has served for many years as chair of an aged care facility in a little town called Rosewood. And he talked to me about his frustration in terms of as, as the chair of a community organisation providing aged care services, he talked about the issue in terms of attracting health professionals to that aged care facility when he's in the same category as Ipswich, which is more of a major metropolitan centre. There, there are major, major issues with this, with this system, major, major issues in relation to this system and in relation to every Australian's legitimate expectation legitimate expectation to be able to access health services, GP services in particular, whether or not they live in Mildura, whether or not they live in Fishwick, down the road from Parliament House, or whether or not they live in Emerald in country Queensland. And, and that is something which all of us should be united in attempting to fix. I'll just put the questions in a fruity and then I'll, I'll give you the call. I'll put the question. Those for the questions say aye. Against no, the ayes have it. Senator Faruqi. Um, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Um, I take note of Minister Watt's response to my questions on the pay and conditions of early um, learning workers. Please proceed. The minister was talking very big. The rhetoric was very big. But where is the action to address the low pay and the really difficult conditions that early childhood educators are subjected to? 
There is none. Today, on Early Childhood Educators Day, thousands of early childhood educators have walked out of centers. Right now, they are gathering in the parliament's front lawns to give a message to the government and to all parliamentarians to say that enough is enough. And the Greens are right with early childhood educators as they shut down the sector today. We give them our full solidarity. But we give them more than that. They can be assured that we will be fighting for better pay for them, for better conditions, and for free and universal early childhood learning and care. And Parliament needs to hear these calls for an immediate pay rise. Early childhood educators, who are now predominantly women, have been taken for granted for far too long. And they've also said, enough. They are burning out, and they are leaving the sector in droves. Literally every week, I meet some of these educators who are telling me that they are working more and more from 6 a.m. in the morning to very late at night. These are not conditions that educators or any workers should be subjected to. And educators do deserve professional pay that reflects the skill and the responsibility of the work that they do every single day. We know that early childhood education and care is an essential service, and it should be treated as such. It is critical for children in the early years of their development, and it should be well-funded, it should be universal, and it should be fee-free. We know that it benefits children, it benefits women, it benefits families, it benefits society, it benefits community, and yet, the can has been kicked down the road. <clears throat> the Greens are calling on the government to bring legislation to lift wages and to improve conditions of educators and deal with the critical workforce shortage in early learning and care. These steps, hand in hand with the Greens' plan for free early learning and care for all, are absolutely vital to building a better future. So when will this government come to its senses and dump the $244 billion in stage three tax cuts, commit to essential public services like free and universal early learning and care, like giving early childhood educators and workers an immediate pay rise that they so well deserve. We need to make sure that educators have, have the best pay and conditions. And we need action on this right now. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I also, uh, responding to Senator Watt or Minister Watt, and thank uh, the Minister for his response and follow up. Uh, but I do want to also add that uh, the previous uh, government, who actually uh, invented this new Aboriginality for uh, sovereign people, uh, created some um, heartache and pain to many families. Uh, we had an Aboriginal man who was deported, uh, who died uh, waiting six years as an Aboriginal man in another country for this government to uh, allow him back in the country. So he died waiting. Uh, and he came back in a body bag as a result. That family are still picking up the pieces. Uh, the number of children that this gentleman has is, are still reeling in the grief of not only not seeing their dad for six years, but then uh, he, their dad coming home in a body bag. So uh, this is an urgent uh, plea to the government to fix this problem, this uh, this decision that this, um, the, the ex-government made that was di clearly discriminatory uh, and we had a situation where we have the government or the parliament making decisions on who's Aboriginal and who's not in this country, which is going into very, very dangerous territory uh, and it's not up to any uh, government to decide who's Aboriginal and who is not in this country. That, that completes... Um Motions take. Oh, I'll put the question. Those are the questions say aye against. No, the ayes have it. That completes uh, the mo time allocated for motions. Take note of answers.
Are there any notices of motion to be given for another day? Senator Gallagher. Thank you, President. I give notice in general terms that on the next day of sitting I shall move a motion to provide for the consideration of the Climate Change Bill 2022 and a related bill. Thank you. Um, I believe Senator Shoebridge was seeking the call. Senator yes, Shoebridge. Yes, President. Uh, pursuant to Standing Order 78-1, uh, Senators Tyrrell and myself give notice of our intention at the giving of notices on the next sitting day to withdraw business of the Senate Notice of Motion No. 1 standing in our names for that day, proposing the disallowance of the Financial Framework Supplementary Powers Amendment Prime Minister and Cabinet's Portfolio Measures No. 2 Regulations 2022 made under the Financial Framework Supplementary Powers Act 1997. Thank you, Senator Shoebridge. I shall now proceed to the placing of business. Um, is it desired to postpone or rearrange business? Uh, I call the clerk. A postponement notification has been lodged as follows. Business of the Senate notice of motion number one for today, standing in the name of Senator Tyrrell to the 12th of September. No extensions have been lodged. Thank you. I remind uh, senators that the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. I shall now proceed to the discovery of formal business. Um, so we'll go to business of the Senate notice of motion number two, standing in the name of Senator Rice. Senator, Senator Rice. Thank you, President. I ask that business of the Senate notice of motion number two, proposing a reference to the Community Affairs References Committee, be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Rice. I move the motion. Senator Dunningham. Do make a short statement. Is leave granted? For one minute, I'm sure. I'm sure leave. <laughs> yes, that's correct. <laughs> Senator Dunningham. I don't want minute. to. Thank pre you. <laughs> Thank you, President. Uh, it's the opposition's position that this notice of motion is considered much too broad for the Community Affairs References Committee to conduct a meaningful inquiry. This extensive scope and the proposed inquiry of the proposed inquiry rather would be unable to be completed in a timely fashion, place extensive pressure on the committee's resources, and would be unlikely to provide measurable new insights into these matters. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Rice be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Um, we will now move to uh, government business number two, standing in the name of Assistant Minister for Education, Senator Chisholm. Uh, I ask that government business notice of motion number two, relating to the approval of works within the parliamentary zone, be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Chisholm. I move the motion. So the question is that the motion, as moved by Senator Chisholm, um, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Um, we now move to general business notice of motion. Oh, beg your pardon, Senator Chisholm. I know we've still got one outstanding. I'm coming back to that. Um, so we will now move to general business notice of motion number 27, standing in the name of Senator Steelejohn. Senator Steelejohn. Thank you, uh, President. I seek leave to am uh, amend general business uh, uh, notice of motion number 27 before asking that it be taken as a formal motion. Is leave granted? This is for the amendment. Leave is granted. Thank you, Thank Senator. Thank you. I amend the motion in the terms circulated in the chamber um, to omit paragraph B. Uh, to D and ask that the and ask that it be taken as formal. Any objection to this being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Steele. Oh, are you objecting? No, no I call Senator Steele, John. I uh, I move the motion as amended. Thank you, Senator Chisholm. Seek leave to make a short statement. A is leave granted. Leave is granted for one minute. The government will not be supporting this motion. I can advise the Senate that since 1 February 2021, the Australian Federal Police International Command has not provided to the Myanmar Police Force any training, capacity building, purchasing or gifting of any equipment or technology or advisory activities. 
The AFP International Command does not engage with the regime or military. Documents requested by this motion may reveal operational sensitivities and undermine the AFP's international partnerships, comp compromising Australia's national security interests and the security and protection of Australian citizens. Thank you. Uh, Senator Steele John? I seek leave to make a one minute statement. Is President? leave granted? Uh, leave is not granted, Senator Steele John. Um, I'm now going to put the motion as amended. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 27, standing in the name of Senator Steele John, as amended, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. Against? No. Uh, I believe the noes have it. Aye. Division required. Um, ring the bells for four minutes.
lock the doors. So the question is that general business uh, number 27, as amended by Senator Steele John, be agreed to. Those of that opinion uh, shall move to the right, and those of that opinion shall move. Uh, and the no. Let me start that again. The eyes shall move to the right of the chair, and the no shall move to the left of the chair. And I point Senator Kim as teller for the eyes, and Senator Askew as teller for the nose. Order. There being 16 ayes and 31 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. I just advise senators there may be another division. We'll now move to government business um, number one, standing in the name of Senator Gallagher and Senator Chisholm, when you're ready. Uh, I ask that government business notice of motion number one relating to the consideration of the Climate Change Bill 2022 and a related bill be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Chisholm. I move the motion. Senator Dunningham. I seek leave to make a short statement. Our leave is granted for one minute, Senator Dunningham. Uh, thank you, President. Uh, while the opposition is not against additional sitting hours, we don't accept that this proposal is appropriate. Firstly, we note these extra hours are being brought on just one day after the bill is introduced into the Senate, and there's been no attempt to even use the normal hours of the Senate. Secondly, the bill changes nothing as the targets it legislates have already been adopted by the government and committed to under international agreements, so there's no urgency uh, in this bill that actually changes nothing. And thirdly, the government has been making a big deal about a more family-friendly parliament and sitting hours, yet here we are in a greatly hypocritical move with the government proposing an open-ended debate that could see people sitting here well beyond midnight for a bill that changes nothing, and we oppose the motion. Thank you, Senator Dunningham. Um, Senator um, Hanson Young. Thank you, um, Madam President. I just uh, seek leave to make a short statement. Is leave granted? Leave is granted for one minute. Senator Thank you. Uh, the Greens will be supporting this motion. We believe and understand that taking climate action is an urgent priority. It should be an urgent priority for all of us. And uh, while this bill is largely symbolic, what this does is now binds the government to a promise that they will get on with it. So we want the bill dealt with. We have worked to strengthen it, get it done, and then get on with the real work. Yeah, yeah. 
Thank you, Senator Hanson Young. So the question is that uh, government business number one, standing in the name of Senator Gallagher, as moved by Senator Chisholm, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. I believe the ayes have it. Division required? Do you four minutes or four minutes, please. Order, lock the doors. So the question is at general business, notice of motion number one, standing in the name of Senator Gallagher, is moved by Senator Chisholm, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart as teller for the ayes, and Senator Askew is teller for the noes.
Order, there being 32 ayes and not correct. Uh, there being 33 ayes and 30 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. I now move to general business. Notice of motion number 28, standing in the name of Senator Payne. Senator Askew. Um on behalf of Senator Payne, who is actually, I ask that General Business Notice of Motion Number 28, proposing an extension of time for the Joint Select Committee on Parliamentary Standards to, be, to report, be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Askew. I move the motion. So the question is that uh, General Business Notice of Motion Number 28, standing in the name of Senator Payne and moved by Senator Askew, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against. I believe the ayes have it. Now move to general business notice of motion number 29, standing in the name of Senator Cash. Senator Askew. On behalf of Senator Cash, I ask that general business notice of motion number 29 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Askew. I move the motion. So the question. So the question is that uh, general business notice of motion number 29, standing in the name of Senator Cash and moved by Senator Askew, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. We we'll now move to general business notice of motion number 30, standing in the name of Senator Cash. Senator Askew. On behalf of Senator Cash, I ask that general business notice of motion number 30 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Askew. I move the motion. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 30, standing in the name of Senator Cash and moved by Senator Askew, be taken as a formal motion. Is there any uh, those of that opinion say aye? Against, I believe the ayes have it. Now move to general business notice of motion number 31, standing in the name of Senators Lambie and Tyrrell. Senator Lambie. Um, thank you, Madam President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 31, proposing the introduction of a bill, be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Lambie. Thank you, Madam President. I move that the following bill be introduced, a bill for an act to amend the Parliamentary Privileges Act 1987 and for related purposes. So the question is, the motion is moved by Senator Lambie be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Lambie. I uh, thank you, Madam President. I present the bill moved that this bill may proceed without formalities and now read for a, read, now read a first time. So the question is that the um, motion is moved by Senator Lambie be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Parliamentary Privileges Act 1987 and for related purposes. Uh, we'll now move and I'll just call you again, Senator Lambie. Thank you, Madam President. I move that this bill now be read a second time. We seek leave to table an explanatory memorandum relating to the bill. Is leave Thank granted? You. There being no objection, leave is granted. And Senator Lambie. Thank you, Madam President. I table an explanatory memorandum and we seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard and to continue my remarks. Thank you.
Uh, is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Lambie. Uh, I now move to general business notice of motion number 32, standing in the name of Senator Roberts. Thank you, President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 32 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Roberts. I move the motion. The question is that the motion is moved by Senator Roberts be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. And that concludes general business. And we will now move to um, an urgency motion. Thank you, Senators. Uh, if you're not participating, I encourage you to leave quietly. Thank you. Uh, I inform the Senate that at 8.30 a.m. today, 33 proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75. The question of which proposal would be submitted to the Senate was determined by lot. As a result, I inform the Senate that the following letter was received uh, from Senator Thorpe. Uh, Sorry, two seconds. Uh, that stage three tax cuts will cost $244 billion over the next 10 years and give billionaires, CEOs and politicians a $9,000 tax cut, while people on the minimum wage get nothing. Repealing these unfair and unjust tax cuts would fund immediate cost of living relief and make people's lives better by putting dental and mental health care into Medicare, building, uh, building affordable housing and making childcare free. I understand that formal arrangements have been made to... Oh, sorry, uh, is this proposal supported? Indeed, OK. Uh, I understand that formal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers in today's debate. With the concurrence of the Senate, I shall call the clerks to set the clock accordingly. I call Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Last week, the uh, Prime Minister sorry. announced that uh, the Labor government. Sorry, Senator Thorpe. Can I just get you to move the motion first? Oh. My apologies. Uh, I move the motion. Thank you. You may proceed. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Last week, the Prime Minister announced that the Labor government will not be repealing the obscene Stage 3 tax cuts. Over the next 10 years, these will strip $244 billion out of the budget. You will all be aware by now how these cuts are benefiting the most wealthy people in this country, usually the ones that are responsible for the stolen wealth, but that's another story. This means that men will get $2—$1 more than women receive. However, there has been little consideration for how these tax cuts will impact on First Nations people. And as always, my people will benefit the least. Across the country every day, in everyday people in this country are struggling to make ends meet in the most simple ways. People are struggling to pay rent, pay for food, pay for health care, and too often those impacted the most by cost of living pressures are First Nations people. In the lucky country, the average personal income for First Nations people was around $35,000, compared to just under $50,000 for the rest of the population. That's 29 per cent lower. That will have lifelong impacts on my people's lives. With the proposed tax cuts, First Nations people will be paying, on average, $95 less tax in 2024 and 25, compared to $430 less tax paid by non-First Nations people. 
This means that First Nations people will receive about $1 for every $4 others get from stage three tax cuts. First Nations people will see the least benefit and be the hardest hit by this tax reform. These tax cuts will only worsen income inequality between First Nations people and the rest of the population. If the government allows these tax cuts to go ahead, it is choosing to give handouts to the stolen wealth billionaires instead of funding crucial services that our people are calling out for. The $244 billion could be redirected towards funding community-controlled health, housing and legal services that would and could pull thousands of people in this country, and in particular First Nations people, out of poverty. If this Labor government is truly committed to closing the gap, they will scrap these tax cuts and put the money back into providing proper housing, proper health care, good education for First Nations people in this country. We know that stolen wealth is also an issue in this country. And many, many people, many white people, many of the colonisers actually benefited from stealing these lands. In fact, they still benefit today because of generations and generations of wealth creation for their families. And I'm sure you know that story. But it's time to pay the rent and it's time to acknowledge that you're on stolen land. Uh, Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. And I rise to speak on the urgency motion before the Senate today. Uh, and during the election, we made a commitment that we would provide certainty and clarity around tax to Australian working families. And our position on the legislated stage three income tax cuts uh, has not changed since the election, because after an incredibly difficult few years for our country and the world, certainty is what Australians deserve. The legislated stage three tax cuts are not due to commence for another two years, and so they won't do anything to address the near-term economic challenges that we face, including. Uh, with the growing inflation challenge that we have right now. Uh, instead, our government's priority when it comes to tax reform is ensuring that multinationals pay their fair share of tax here in Australia. And uh, our priority is cracking down on the waste and the rorts that have contributed to the $1 trillion of debt left to us by those opposite with absolutely nothing to show for it. A trillion dollars of debt and nothing to show for it. We, uh, the Albanese government, need to repair the budget mess left by those on the other side so we can get on with delivering the meaningful investments that maximise economic impact and meet community needs. Australians are paying the price right now for a decade of missed opportunities and absolutely messed up priorities under the coalition government. A trillion dollars of debt, high and rising inflation, rising interest rates and a cost of living crisis. These are the consequences of a, dec a decade of complete economic mismanagement by those opposite. And Australians understand that we didn't create these challenges, but they elected us to take responsibility for fixing them, for addressing them, and we are. Our economic plan is a direct and deliberate response to the challenges facing the economy, including the rising cost of living that is hurting so many Australians today. We are getting on with the job and we are delivering on our commitments. We are delivering on a better future for all Australians. We committed to rebuilding our economy with stronger wages and more secure work, and we are doing that. One of the very first acts of our government was to successfully argue for a minimum wage increase for our lowest paid workers. 
uh, and that was an, an out, that was an outcome which helped around 2.8 million Australians. Uh, and we followed that with a submission to the Fair Work Commission that unequivocally supports a wage increase for aged care workers, for the tens of thousands of aged care workers who do essential work every day but are completely undervalued with absolutely no action from those on the opposition benches. We brought employers, unions and the community sector together at the Jobs and Skills Summit to discuss how we can get wages moving, how we can lift living standards and how we can improve productivity, um, which was nothing short of sluggish under the previous government. And in so doing, um, we've ended up with uh, a positive plan bringing unions and employers together with the government. Uh, and in so doing, we've ended the decade of division and delay from those opposite. We are delivering concrete outcomes from our Jobs and Skills Summit. We're delivering consensus on the need to improve the bargaining system and get wages moving again, as well as allowing age pensioners to work more and more and earn more before it affects their pension. We committed to investing in Australian skills, in Australian jobs, in Australian manufacturing. Uh, and as the new government, we are doing it. We've secured a one billion national skills agreement with the states and the territories. Uh, we're delivering 180,000 fee-free TAFE places in 2023, with 15,000 set aside for aged care to meet the workforce challenges uh, that we've been left with by a decade of inaction from the previous government. Uh, and we're working hard to deliver on our commitment to invest in advanced manufacturing. We committed to backing clean energy and ending the climate wars, and we are doing it. We have reset Australia's commitment to action on climate on the world stage, sending a huge signal, an important signal, to the rest of the world that Australia is at the table, that Australia will do our part in the race towards net zero. Uh, we're working just this week, right here, right now, to legislate our target of a 43 per cent reduction in emissions by 2030. Uh, and part of that is ensuring that our government is accountable to these targets uh, and providing the certainty that the Australian people want that we will actually deliver against those targets. As part of our response to the climate crisis, we're making electric vehicles cheaper with our electric vehicle discount bill this week, uh, which we hope the opposition will support, uh, and our national electric vehicle strategy. And we are securing Australia's future by delivering our Powering Australia plan. We are making the largest ever upgrade to our energy grid uh, and driving down power prices for households and small businesses, again after a decade of complete inaction by those on the other side. We also committed to easing cost of living pressures for Australian families, and we are doing that too. We are getting on with the commitments that we made, and we are delivering them. Our budget in October will include our plans for cheaper childcare, and that will make a huge difference to the household budgets for millions of Australians. Uh, next year, 96 per cent of Australian families will benefit from cheaper uh, early learning. Um, they will benefit from quality, affordable early childhood education under the plans that our government took to the election, under the plans that we are ready to implement right now. Uh, and we are removing the penalty for parents taking on extra hours or extra days of work. Uh, and of course, that was a huge priority that came out of the Jobs and Skills Summit. Uh, we know that one of the biggest things we can do as a nation to improve workforce participation is encourage more carers of small children into the workforce. That's usually women. Uh, and so providing quality, affordable, accessible early education is critical to our, nat our nation's economic future. Today, we've introduced legislation to reduce the cost of essential medicines, the first time any government has reduced the PBS co-payment. 
uh, and what that is going to mean for people uh, is around um, $30 less um, per month um, for essential medicines that people are accessing on the PBS, um, saving around $300 a year um, for the average person uh, who re is relying on those PBS medicines. So we're helping to ensure that fewer people have to miss filling a script because they just can't afford it. Uh, and the stories of people having to do that are extraordinary. We don't want people to have to choose between taking painkilling medication on the one hand uh, and another medication they need to address their underlying condition. That should not be happening in Australia, and we are getting on with fixing that problem. There is no denying that the last few years have been difficult. We know that Australians are doing it incredibly tough. We don't need economic forecasts to tell us that because we are listening to Australians every day. And what Australians want is certainty from their government on the way forward. They want a government that does what it said it would do, and that is the Albanese government. They want a government that will stick to our word and deliver on our commitments. It's exactly what we're doing. The legacy of those opposite is a decade of mistakes and missed opportunities, a decade of waste and rorts, a decade of division and delay. They had no plans past the last election. They had no vision for anyone's future but their own. In May, Australians sent a strong and clear message. They wanted change. They wanted a government they could trust, a government who would bring the country together, not divide it, and a government with a plan to address the challenges that families and businesses are facing right now. And that's exactly what we are delivering. The Albanese Labor government was elected with a clear and ambitious plan to build a stronger, more equal Australia. That's what we're doing. We're keeping our promises and working hard to deliver the better future Australians deserve. Thank you, Senator Walsh. Senator Canavan. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, uh, well, what we need uh, as a country right now is to grow our economy, to, uh, uh, to increase the size of the pie, uh, so to speak, because that is the best way to manage the uh, enormous public debt uh, we now have, uh, first thanks to the uh, excessive spending of the Rudd-Gillard years and uh, then over the last couple of years because of our necessary response to a global pandemic. We now, of course, uh, uh, have a, a public debt of uh, approaching or, or soon to be above uh, one trillion dollars, and 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 the best way uh, to help manage that, to deal with that, uh, is to grow our economy, uh, and uh, uh, therefore, we'll, by doing so, uh, we'll have more tax revenues, more wealth uh, to manage that debt. We now have, or we do now have, a debt to national income or GDP ratio uh, at a level we haven't seen since uh, the years after World War II. Uh, and in the years after World War II, the way we came back from that crushing level of debt uh, after defeating uh, the evil of fascism uh, was to grow our economy. Uh, the economic growth of the 50s and 60s were periods of uh, uh, massive uh, economic change and growth in this country we have not ever seen. Uh, that was on the back of the, the, the world opening up after the, the war, uh, the Menzies government uh, at the time keeping a an open and, and uh, uh, vibrant economy, and we need to learn those lessons here after a global pandemic, uh, which has not been as devastating as that war, but has left similar consequences of large public debt. We have to keep an open economy. We have to get our tax rates down and be competitive so people will invest and work and thrive in this country uh, and make more wealth for all of us. The reality right now is that our tax system is not competitive uh, to the rest of the world, especially our personal income tax uh, system. Uh, we have a high corporate tax rate, but it's often forgotten or not commented that we have a, a franking credit system, that we do not double tax corporate profits. And so our actual impact of the corporate, profit, corporate tax rate of 30 per cent is not as high as it might seem on a direct comparison with overseas countries, because when you get dividends, you can also usually get franked credits if the company's paid taxes on that, and you won't pay your top marginal rate. You'll pay the difference between the marginal rate and the corporate rate. But uh, there's no such 
no such equalising factor uh, for those earning labour income and the workers of this country. They get slugged at a rate that is higher, much higher than the rest of the world. Our top rate of uh, 45 per cent, or really 47 per cent when you add the Medicare levy, uh, cutting it at $180,000 a year is one of the highest rates in the developed world, and it cuts in at a level of income uh, much lower than many other countries in the rest of the world. To, to use a few examples, uh, in the United Kingdom, their, their top rate is about ours at 45 per cent, but it doesn't cut in until someone earns £150,000. That's over $260,000 Australian dollars. In the United States, uh, the, the top rate is just 37 per cent. A uh, full 10, 10 percentage points lower than Australia. And even in New Zealand, uh, their top rate is just 39 per cent. So we're way out of whack with many of our comparable countries uh, that would be competing for talent, especially in a world where borders are opened up and people can move. Uh, uh, additionally, we also have high tax rates below that level for middle income people. And what the Stage 3 tax cuts are all about is making sure that middle income people can have the aspiration to become higher income people and become healthier and provide a better future uh, for their children because these tax cuts these tax cuts the so-called stage 3 tax cuts that cut in or come in uh, in 2024-25 uh, will actually provide a, a tax cut a tax saving for any australian that earns over $45,000 a year that is a lot of people that's a, a lot of australians in fact 95% of australian australian taxpayers will benefit uh, from, uh, from these tax cuts in a few years' time. So we hear a lot of rhetoric about these tax cuts being for the rich uh, and benefiting those that are well-to-do. Well, we've got to look at the whole series of tax cuts here, that these tax cuts will uh, get rid of one whole tax bracket, make our system much simpler and easier uh, for people. Uh, the 37 cents tax bracket will go. Uh, the tax rate will be 30 cents in the dollar for anyone over earning over four, well, no more than 30 cents in the dollar. For, sorry, 30 cents in the dollar at least for anyone earning over $45,000. And then the top rate will only kick in at $200,000, which will remain the same. Uh, so that is a big tax cut for middle Australia. The stage three tax cuts are a tax cut uh, for middle Australia. Those Australians, dead smack in the middle class, earn money, earn income somewhere between around that $45,000 a year up through to $200,000 a year. That is middle Australia. Uh, they, they, some of those people at the higher end are very lucky and do very well, but all of them probably have worked hard in their life to get to that level and they deserve reward for effort. We want to encourage Australians uh, to continue that effort, future Australians to continue that, so these tax cuts are the right time at the right place for our country. If we continue to have higher uh, tax rates uh, than the rest of the world, that will punish effort. It will mean People will think twice about why start a business, why go and uh, work a bit harder to try and get ahead, to maybe uh, put your kids through school or, or do something when the tax office is going to take so much of what you earn. Because the other point to make here is, look, already in this country, people, the average tax rate just sits over at 30 cents in the dollar or so. That's not the marginal rates, but the average rates that people pay. And that means, when you think about it, that means that you know, when, you go to, when most people work, start work on a Monday, all of Monday is for the tax office, all of it. Every bit of work they do on the Monday is for this place, is for money to come down here uh, uh, to Canberra. And then most of, a little bit of Tuesday too, about half of Tuesday for the average taxpayer. Also, you start the day on Tuesday, you're also on the Canberra clock, uh, just working uh, for the government down here. It's not until after Smoko on Tuesday afternoon that you actually get to work for yourself. That's when you start getting to work for yourself. And what we're saying is maybe, maybe we should move that, that, uh, that, that, that point from lunchtime to morning tea so you, you can, from big lunch to little lunch if you like, so you, you can earn a little bit more for yourself and take it home for your family uh, to help them and, and, and give them a better future. Because I don't know, I've been here a few years now and uh, I don't think we spend that money all that well. Uh, I don't think uh, that uh, supporting this motion, if we supported this motion, say let's 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 not let's. I don't think you're going to do any better, Senator Chisholm. I think it's a disease in this place that the money that comes here, a lot of it gets wasted. A lot of your money, that work you do on that Monday and Tuesday morning, doesn't always generate uh, the public services that some people like to claim down here. And maybe, maybe, if we do have an issue with affording the stage three tax cuts of having to deal, at least temporarily, with a bit of lower tax revenue, we could look at what, what is spent here 
in Canberra and in the bureaucracy uh, to make sure your money, your hard work, is actually providing value for the Australian people. Because I know every Australian family does that. And if after if, if these tax cuts, hopefully, hope, hope in God, they go through, and, and those, that middle Australia gets a little bit more money uh, to take home, I know they'll spend it very carefully. They'll think about where that money should go and how it should help their children and their families. I'm not so sure we always do here. And, and that's why we can afford these tax cuts, and they will make for a stronger, stronger Australia if they go through. Senator David Pocock. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. People want a fair tax system. They recognise that paying tax in Australia allows us to have the quality of life that we have. It allows us to have the services that we have. And don't be conned by Senator Canavan that taxes simply come to Canberra. Taxes are paying Medicare. They're providing funds for, for aged care so that our elderly can actually live in dignity. They're providing a world-class medical system here, here, in, here in Australia. We've heard so much from the Labor government over the last 108 days about the failures of the Liberal National Government. Everything's their fault. They've inherited a total mess worse than they possibly thought. They didn't create any of these challenges, but they're going to fix it, which is great. You can't say that and at the same time stand by bad policy when it comes to stage three tax cuts. We're in a cost of living crisis. We're going to give the wealthiest Australians. Yes, some people on lower wages will get some tax back. But if you're a registered nurse on $72,000 a year, you'll have an extra 681 bucks in your pocket. If you're a politician here, like, Mr. Mr. like Senator Canavan, on $211,000, you're getting $9,000 back. I don't see the fairness in that. And I think Australians at this time would recognise that this is not the way that we want to go. This is not how we should be spending our money, given the challenges that we face. We hear from the Labor government that they can't afford to increase shared paid parental leave. That has consensus coming out of their Jobs and Skills Summit. There simply isn't the money. Well, here's $243 billion that we're going to give back mostly to wealthy Australians, mostly to men, rather than actually spending it on things that Australians want, actually spending it on addressing the crises that we face, the cost of living crisis. We've got people here in Canberra who we're now calling the working homeless. That's, that is shameful for a country like Australia, to be still considering these tax cuts when so many people are doing it tough. And the Labor government should be ashamed of this decision. It is unconscionable to stand by this when you're the new government, to stand by bad policy that may have been justifiable years ago when it was, when it was legislated. Sure, there may have been, a, been an argument for it, a lot, a lot has happened since then. We had bushfires. We've had a two-year global pandemic. We've had geopolitical con conflict, Russia invading Ukraine, energy prices going through the roof, rising inflation, cost of living. Cost of living pressures putting so many everyday Australians under strain. And the Labor government wants to give $243 billion to mostly the most wealthy, wealthy Australians, mostly men. It's frankly ridiculous, and the pressure's only going to mount. I'd urge you to use your political capital. We hear a lot about how popular the, the new Labor government is. Use that. Be decisive. This is not going away. This is going to come into effect just before the next election. Uh, be really interested to see how that, that plays out, given how tough so many Australians are doing. Thank you, Senator Pocock. Uh, Senator Bragg. Thank you very much. It's nice to see you, Mr Acting Deputy President. And uh, it's always good to know when the clock starts ticking, because that's the uh, opportunity to make some remarks about this uh, very important matter. Now, of course, 
when it comes to the philosophy here, uh, it is very clear that there are different views about the role of the state and the role of uh, money within our society and within our economy. Uh, personally, my view has always been that the state has no money of its own. Uh, it must go and levy that from its citizens. And that is what we do. And we do that to provide services and the like. Uh, and we've done it in the last few years on a scale that hasn't been seen for some decades as a result of this uh, economic shock and um, health crisis. Uh, but uh, in relation to philosophy, um, we are committed to the idea that people's money is their own and we should only seek to levy their incomes and salaries and wages uh, to pay for services which are required and nothing more than that. Now, the stage three tax cuts, as they're called, and I think in hindsight it was a mistake to have uh, broken it down into three stages, it should have been done in one go, uh, are effectively saying, uh, look, we're going to simplify the five brackets down to four and we're going to ensure that middle income earners in particular are able to work an extra shift or do some extra work and not be penalised uh, by being pushed into a higher uh, income bracket and people might, for example, be uh, paying uh, 32 and a half cents in the dollar rather than 30, 30 cents in the dollar if these uh, tax cuts were repealed. And that's what we're talking about here. We're talking about a proposition of repealing tax cuts, which would result in a tax increase. Uh, and it would result in a tax in increase to, uh, yes, higher income earners, and it would also result in a significant tax increase to middle income earners. Uh, people who are earning sixty or seventy thousand uh, dollars would pay additional taxation because they would be pushed into a higher tax bracket. We'd be going back to five tax brackets which would not be in their interests. We want to have an economy where people want to work, additional shifts, uh, take on more hours uh, if they want to. Um, now, I know it's not fashionable to look at the issues facing the higher end of the tax spectrum, but the reality is that the people that were here last week at the Jobs and Skills Summit were talking about the issues that face Australian business, and I think legitimately they have raised the issue of access to skills. Now, we are in a point in our history where we are competing for capital and we are competing for labour, skilled labour. And if you look at our closest competitors, uh, their tax rate, their top tax rate, uh, cuts in, in the case of Singapore, at 335,000 Australian dollars, and in Japan's case, $417,000. So we're looking at almost double our threshold, which is quite low compared to our competitors. And if we are serious about this nation's competitive position and we are serious about attracting skilled people to take on roles in this country where Australian businesses are saying they can't get access to these people's skills, then why would we want to put lead in our own saddlebags and have an even more uncompetitive situation in relation to taxation. And sure, I know that part of the argument may not be particularly fashionable, but that is the truth, that at $200,000 uh, it is a relatively low threshold relative to our competitors. And we can imagine ourselves as some locked away, protected, subsidised economy as we had in the 1970s and 80s, and you can look at the history books and see how that went, or we can be realistic and honest about the challenges the nation faces in relation to skilled workers. And uh, that, is, that is the truth. So the middle income earners would face a tax increase by being dragged into a higher bracket, and it will be harder to attract higher income earners which are needed to fill the skill gaps that we heard about last week at the talk fest. And we've heard the Treasurer today 
talk about his 36 concrete recommendations. Well, I mean, if you can go and listen to the business people, they will say to you that access to skills uh, is one of the most important things. So, um, look, it, it is true that the government cannot be held uh, as responsible for every single problem in the economy. And having been in office for a relatively short period of time, uh, it would be ridiculous to claim that um, all the ills should be put at their feet. But over the medium to long term, uh, you have to try and get the fundamental position right, and that is that we, are, we need to be a dynamic economy whereby we have a competitive tax system and a flexible labour market which allows our businesses to be competitive. Now, clearly, uh, on a day that the RBA has uh, decided that it will, will raise interest rates, and that will make it difficult for people which have large, who have large mortgages. And certainly, representing New South Wales, I'm very aware that there are people with large Sydney mortgages that will be finding this recent uptick in interest rates very difficult. Um, and I'm pleased the government is reviewing the RBA. Uh, I would say that uh, the RBA governor, whilst not making any personal criticism of him, um, has made statements in the past that didn't need to be made, that set market expectations uh, in a way that I think has made things more difficult than they should have been. Um, sometimes it's better to say fewer things. Sometimes fewer words are better. And uh, I do think that uh, there are a lot of people now that will struggle with paying uh, their mortgage repayments. And some of the, the Commonwealth Bank data shows that 30 to 35 per cent of people uh, in the capital cities um, are on a very thread, have a very threadbare position when it comes to paying back uh, their mortgages. So um, ultimately, um, we don't want to make things any harder than, than they will be. And one thing that would make it harder for people would be to increase taxation, because by increasing taxation, we'll be saying to the rest of the world, we're not interested in new investment. We're not interested in, in having a dynamic and competitive economy, and therefore there will be fewer jobs, there will be fewer high-paying jobs, and of course one of the things that's within the government's preserve is tax policy, and there is no case to remove the tax cuts uh, that are designed to improve the investment profile of the country, and any removal of those tax cuts would be a tax increase. Thank you, Senator Bragg. Uh, call Senator Waters. Thanks very much, uh, Acting Deputy President. Well, I think we're in a parallel universe because the people of Australia just voted to change the government, and yet the new government is keeping the policies of the last government. Now, people understand that a budget and governing is about choices, and they hear it loud and clear when the Prime Minister talks about how choices are being made. What this government is doing is choosing to keep the stage three tax cuts. They are actively choosing to give $244 billion over 10 years to people that are CEOs, that are billionaires and that are politicians. All of those folk are going to get about a $9,000 tax cut every year. Now, we're in a cost of living crisis. I don't think anyone disagrees with that. Why, of all things, would you be giving tax cuts to the rich when people are struggling to meet their daily cost of living challenges? Budgets are about choices. The Australian people did vote for a new government. Why are you keeping the policies of the last one? They weren't right then and they're even less right now. It is the most ill-timed policy decision that you could possibly make, and I think it is a betrayal of everyone that voted Labor that you are going to keep the stage three tax cuts. They are now your stage three tax cuts, I'm afraid. These are now Labor's stage three tax cuts for the wealthy, when at the same time the new government is saying the country's too poor to make childcare free. The country's too poor to fix homelessness. The country's too poor to make uh, Medicare include dental and mental health. I'm sorry, but that is just heartbreaking nonsense. If you axed those stage three tax cuts, PBO costings show that you could, in fact, end homelessness. 
make childcare free and put dental and mental health care into Medicare. Those are the sorts of things that will provide real cost of living relief to people and provide services on which they deserve to be able to rely and access free of charge. Now, on childcare, we've got 1,000 childcare uh, sector, uh, centres striking today because they are begging for better pay and conditions. So we could also make childcare free uh, for parents, but we should be paying those workers more. You could do that with the $244 billion over 10 years. Pay women more. Have a legislated increase above CPI to feminised industries. We heard a lot of talk at the Jobs Summit last week about women's workforce participation. There's a great idea. Pay women more. Then they won't have to strike out the front of Parliament House uh, desperately pleading for pay and conditions that reflects the calibre of their work and the importance of their work in raising the next generation. Free childcare would cost $9 billion a year. Now That's a lot of money, but that would ensure women can get back into the workforce. Importantly, it would ensure that kids get the best early childhood education that they uh, deserve, that sets them up for a bright future. And of course, it will reduce uh, the, uh, not only the gender pay gap, but it will reduce the unfair distribution of unpaid labour in the house, in the home, that is, in the domestic house. So this government has got a real choice to make. Are they going to be uh, Morrison light, or they're actually going to dump a bad policy and help people? It shouldn't be that much of a conundrum to decide whether to give $244 billion to the rich or to make childcare free, fix homelessness and put dental and mental health care into Medicare. I'll go now to Senator Roberts. Thank you. Mr Acting Deputy President. If the Senate is talking about tax and cost of living, we cannot ignore the most regressive tax on the poor and the vulnerable. Parliament is considering it now. $244 billion over 10 years barely registers compared to the trillions the trillions of dollars in economic mayhem that climate change and related energy policies are already inflicting and going to continue inflicting and getting worse. Make no mistake, climate change and related energy policies are a brutal, highly regressive tax on the poor and the vulnerable. Trying to tax carbon dioxide means trying to tax every single thing we do as humans, including breathing. That's why the United Nations and the World Economic Forum is pushing these burdens. They want to control every single thing we do. For these policies, the poor will always proportionally pay the highest price, by far the highest price. Rich inner city elites can afford to buy a brand new electric vehicle. The poor cannot. The rich can afford the outlay to install solar, while they get back with that they get back with subsidies that the poor pay for through higher electricity charges. The poor cannot. The rich will be able to afford, afford it when power bills go up. And despite promises about the wind and solar pipe dream, power bills are skyrocketing and will skyrocket. The poor cannot afford it. And while life gets harder and more expensive for the poor, Billions of dollars are being poured into the doomed wind and solar pipe dreams. Companies receiving government subsidies to build wind and solar complexes are giant multinational companies, quite often Chinese, associated with the Chinese Communist Party, and run for the benefit of billionaire CEOs, billionaire owners. Climate change policies are like a reverse Robin Hood taking taxes from the poor and giving to the rich, thanks to the Greens, the Liberal Party, the Labor Party and the Nationals. People on the minimum wage will suffer as life gets more expensive, much, much more expensive. As more intermittent and unreliable wind and solar is forced into the grid and reliable baseload power is prematurely forced out, power bills will go ever higher. As productive farming land is locked up for carbon dioxide credits that the Nationals, Liberals, Labor and the Greens want, groceries will get more expensive. So let's talk briefly about the carbon dioxide credit rort. 
If a producer of carbon dioxide pays for enough trees to supposedly offset carbon dioxide, they'll get the green tick of approval and continue producing carbon dioxide. It's a tax, a hypocritical tax, a destructive tax about everything in life. Because the end user, the customer, the people will pay. The credits don't stop anything. They just say companies can do it as long as we, the people, pay a, f a tree fee. Of course, that includes a fee to the companies and government and the United Nations for their apparent services in managing the system, a tax. There are many more examples, and no one should be in any doubt. Climate change policies and related energy policies try to change the entire country, the entire economy. These changes will restrict almost everything, everything, making life more expensive. The rich will be able to afford it. The poor will not. Climate policies are a highly regressive tax on the poor. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Put simply, Greens are bad, tax cuts are good. Cutting taxes is good for your family, it's good for Australia. Indeed, it is our patriotic duty as Australians to fly our flag, cut our taxes and have a barbecue. Because I don't know about you, Mr Acting Deputy President, I want Australians to have more money in their back pocket. I want, more, I want Australians to decide how they spend their money. So I want to cut taxes. I came into this place to cut taxes because we believe in freedom. We believe in the right and the might of the individual to decide how they spend their money. And what we're seeing today is the Greens come into this place because they think they know better than Australians. The Greens want to tax Australians more. They want to tax Australian business and Australian families because the Greens love taxes. Well, I love cutting taxes. So the more taxes we can cut, the better Australia will be and the freer Australians will, will be. Because the Greens have come in here, and because they're a pack of liars, Mr Acting Deputy President, they are saying that this is a tax cut for billionaires. Well, they are a bunch of liars, the Greens party. Uh, let me say this, because McGrath, guess what? Senator McGrath, I will have to ask you to withdraw. I, I wasn't yeah. reflecting on an individual. I just said the Greens were a pack of liars. It's a, yeah. Yes, uh, Senator McGrath, uh, I ask you to withdraw. I've been advised that it would be against. I will withdraw, uh, Mr. Mr. Acting Deputy President. But let, let me put it this: the Greens um, and people who sit uh, with the colour green uh, in between, to the teal, towards the dark green, uh, they wouldn't know truth if it fell on them from a high, high place. Because if these stage three tax cuts are repealed, it means a teacher who earns seventy thousand dollars a year will lose. $620. A nurse earning $90,000 a year will lose $870. And a diesel fitter, oh, diesel, oh, it's a scary word for the Greens because they don't like diesel. A diesel fitter earning $100,000 a year would lose more than $1,370 a year. The tax cuts are all about middle Australia. So the Greens come here, these, these, these whinging, whining, pathetic people, they come in here with their extensive property portfolios. Do you know the member for Ryan, Mr Acting Deputy President, has four homes? Homes, oh. uh, but four homes, but how many of those homes do you think are out for social housing? So I say to the Greens, who love taking the money but don't like sharing, because they are a bunch, a bunch of hypocrites. Because, and here's the other fallacy being spread by, by, by these fairies at the bottom of the garden. They're saying that those who earn more don't pay their fair share. Well, how wrong is that? Because when stage three is fully implemented, an individual with a taxable income of $200,000 who earns 4.4 times more than an individual with a taxable income of $45,000 will pay 10 times more tax. 10 times more tax. So this is why we come into politics, ladies and gentlemen. We come into politics because we believe in freedom. We come into politics because we want individuals, we want businesses, we want families to grow. And the best way for, for Australians to grow is for them to have more money in their back pocket. And this is why these tax cuts, when they are implemented, are so good for Australia. But, but Mr Acting Deputy President, I'm going to let you in on a secret. And the secret is that I suspect that, that the jellybacks on the other side of the chamber will do a deal, and they'll do a deal with the Greens. 
and they'll do a deal with the Greens. And, and it'll be a power sharing uh, a deal, as Senator Scar pointed out. And they'll do a deal, and these tax cuts will be no more. But they'll do a deal because you listen to the language of, of people like the, the Minister for Finance who's sitting over there, and they're not strident in the defence of these tax cuts. They're using the, the wishy washy language of, of, of the Labor Party. So do not be surprised, and this is breaking news, that these tax cuts will not proceed because of the weakness of that side. And how wrong is that? For those of us who believe in freedom and believe in cutting taxes, you, because Senator we Gar. want you to have more money Thank in your you, back Senator pocket. Uh, Senator Shoebridge. President, this government's priorities are cooked. Labor's giving a $244 billion tax cut, largely to the wealthy and to billionaires, but less than $2 a day to people on job seeker. Does that sound fair? No. These tax cuts are grotesque and they're self-serving. Members in this parliament are proposing to give themselves a $9,000 plus tax cut, billionaires a $9,000 a year tax cut, uh, and no doubt, no wonder the coalition senators are here supporting it. $9,000 sounds nice, thanks very much. Meanwhile, I've met nurses, nurses just last week, who have been forced to work 31 shifts in 28 days because there's not enough money in our public hospital system. I've, I've met students who are sick from the black mould toxicity in the, in the substandard housing that they're struggling to pay rent for, uh, and it's still costing 50 per cent of their income. And we have Labor and the coalition saying they want to give billionaires and politicians a $9,000 tax cut. It's disgraceful. This parliament should be fighting for the many, not the few. But right now, this government is dishing out favours, favours to billionaires and big corporations. And they talk about a living crisis. They say they're standing with workers. But on the really big decisions, the ones that are the $244 billion decisions, which is make or break on fairness, they say they can't do anything about it, that they agreed to it a few years ago and they've just stuck. Well, here's a message to the Labor government. You are now in government. You're not stuck with the coalition's uh, rotten tax agenda. Have the courage, stand up and, and, and reverse these tax cuts. Cancelling these tax cuts mean we can get dental and mental care into Medicare. Think about the changes that that would make. Dental into Medicare. It is outrageous that in this country one of the key indicators of your class and your wealth is the state of your teeth. And the only reason that is, and the only reason that will be next year and the year after, will be if Labor doesn't have the courage and reverse these outrageous billionaire-focused tax cuts. We can make childcare free, and we can pay early child educators and all teachers a fair wage. But we can't do that while we hand out $244 billion in tax cuts to billionaires and politicians, and those already have enough. This parliament should be standing alongside those early childhood educators who are out there today taking action for better pay and conditions so they can look after our kids and our grandkids. That's what they want to do. And a shout out to the United Workers Union and every single childcare worker. Stand strong. The Greens are with you. We support your calls and we'll keep fighting for you until we reverse these tax cuts and give you the pay and conditions you deserve. Childcare educators are striking today. And they're calling for this parliament to put children before profit. Yep. And that's what Labor needs to do. Put people before profit. Put nurses, midwives, healthcare workers before profit. Put teachers and students before profit. Put First Nations people across this country before profit. That's who this parliament should be for. Not the billionaires who don't need another tax break, but for the millions of Australians who are desperate for help while their wages are stuck and expenses are skyrocketing. This parliament should be standing up for young people, for people on Centrelink, people with disabilities, First Nations people, people without a home, people renting and unable to even think about owning a home in this country. But these people will be worse off under Labor's tax cut. This parliament should be for every single one of you who needs our help. And to all of you, I say this. The Greens believe this parliament should be for you and Thank will you, keep Senator fighting to make good on that promise. Expired. I'm now going to Senator Barbara Pocock. Thank you, Acting President. Australia has a proud history of a progressive tax system. 
The stage three tax cuts are a watershed in relation to that history. They represent a turning away, and we know that we will never get back what we are going to give away with this reform if it proceeds. We need to hang on to a proud Australian tradition, which is a tax system that looks after the bottom and fairly distributes the resources to the services that every Australian needs. These tax increases will give, give as we all know, I hope every Australian knows, $9,000 to billionaires, $9,000 to every one of us in this place, but nothing for those on minimum wage, nothing for the working poor that Senator Pocock spoke about, the other Senator Pocock, nothing for the workers out the front of this parliament today who every day turn up for a, a job that pays them just over $20 an hour. I think a lot about the care economy. I think about the economy that delivers care for our children, care for people with disability, care for our older citizens. All of us in this place over our lifetime depend on that care. And we all know that in depending on that care, we need to, to look after it fairly. We need to make sure that those who are helping looking after our kids and grandchildren and our parents and other friends or whatever with disability, that we uh, properly reward and support those workers. We have a care economy in this country which is starved. It is thinned out. It is underpaid. It is overworked. It is disrespected. And the, the stage three tax cuts are a doorway to making a historic intervention to fix that economy, which we, will be good for um, the future of our country and good for our country um, and the citizens of this country. As an economist, I know that when, th when things change, when economic circumstances change, we have to change strategy. Only a fool doesn't do that. This policy was wrong at the time it was shaped. Labor knew it and Labor opposed it. It is totally wrong now in such different economic circumstances. We are in an inequality crisis. The top of Australia has run away from the bottom. We can measure it in housing, we can measure it in the quality of care, we can measure it in our health care, we can measure it, as my colleague says, in our teeth in the quality of our teeth, and we can certainly measure it in a cost of living crisis, which is leaving so many Australians uh, under such pressure. Today I met with Sam, a, a worker at Port Lincoln in South Australia, who came to the parliament to talk about his life as a carer of a, for a household of people with disability. Ta Sam works for $23 an hour. He's been doing the same job for four and a half years as a casual. He feels disrespected. He feels underpaid. He feels exhausted, and he loves the people he cares for. He says, "I love the guys I care for." He is working for love, and he has not paid enough money. And it is vitally important that we uh, stop the stage three tax cuts and turn to the parts of our economy that are so desperate for our attention, for our resources, and for our care. We must not pass the stage three tax cuts. Thank you, Senator Pocock. And we will come back to this debate, but it's now time to move to first speeches. Pursuant to order, I now call Senator Little to make her first speech and ask honourable senators that the usual courtesies be extended to her. I call Senator Little. Thank you, Thank you President and fellow senators of this 47th parliament. In my, making my way as an elected member to this place, I contested two Liberal Senate pre-selections, two federal election campaigns, one in 2016 and again in 2022. I have spoken with many hundreds of party members, listened to thousands of voters at shows, street corners and shopping centres across South Australia on the issues that matter to them most. At the 2022 election, with a marked level of concern, people spoke of increasing costs of living, individual and nation security and safety, health and mental health, housing for owning and renting, and environment, and it was not all about climate change. The observation, in a nutshell, there's a desire for relative certainty and looking forward to a better future, not looking back. What I learned from these interactions was the importance of listening not to the loudest, 
not to the most resourced, not to the most organised, but to all the voices. With experience in executive management and leadership across some of our largest and most economically significant industries, much of my work has been in the true engine room that fuels our economy, the private sector. I've owned and operated several successful small businesses, worked and volunteered in not-for-profits in health, the arts, tertiary education and more, focusing on governance and on social and economic participation. As a working parenting adult, I earned undergraduate and postgraduate university and coveted industry qualifications, securing the tools that I have since known have served me well. In life, education and work success, success has not just been mine. I am here because of those who gave unwavering support in regular, reliable and sufficient measure, and somewhat ironically also by those who did not. When the detractors, the hecklers, the naysayers told me my dreams were impossible, unachievable or simply unlikely, my response was, was quite quickly, sit back, watch carefully, they are not. Standing six feet tall, 183 centimetres, I'm used to references in relation to height. So it is with that that I acknowledge those who stood beside me, behind me and in front of me, and on whose shoulders I leaned on, almost cried on, but most definitely stood on to get here. To my grandparents who have long since passed, who laboured to build vast pastoral empires on country to which they will forever belong, Corporate Harold Little enlisted to fight under that flag and on, and on behalf of that flag on that what then was king and country. His sacrifice is rightly forever remembered. To my mum and dad, Jeff and Jean, watching from their home in Alice Springs, Arunda country, I watched you show up, stand up, speak up, time and again, with courage and conviction. Together you've defied the narrative, the stereotypes, the statistics, holding sacred belief in individual responsibility, reward for hard work, a fair go, and being the masters of your own destiny. From the stars up above and from the Senate gallery and across this country and the globe are the children and grandchildren that have benefited from observing those values. My older sister worked in education and administration before her potential for greater contribution was cut short by a despicable act of violence that killed her. My younger sister joined the South Australian Police as a police officer, completed a science degree, an honours law degree, and is now contributing to the area of justice to tackle injustice. Another younger sister completed a degree in agriculture science, then a PhD in environmental science, to further enhance her love, understanding and respect for traditional Aboriginal land management practice. The youngest of our clan, my brother, who's actually made it here, has possibly the highest level of responsibility. He's flown in the skies in a now 30-year career as a captain, in fact, a training captain for a major international airline. My parents knew that structural, emotional and economic barriers and challenges were real for everyone, but could be overcome by commitment to a very good plan and support from decent, good people. Indulge me as I thank my own family, my partner of 30 years and our children, who I have been asked not to name for fear of embarrassing them. <laughs> I love you more than you could possibly imagine. I thank aunts, uncles, nanas, extended family, dearest friends, old and new, too numerous to name, many of whom have been on this long journey and been forgiving and patient. To the Liberal Broad Church, thank you for backing me to back enduring belief in freedom to choose our way of life and living, subject, of course, to the rights of others, for backing individual initiative and enterprise, freedom of speech, religion and association. 
To the many volunteers who supported the campaign, this was simply not possible without you. I acknowledge especially the work of Liberal members and senators representing South Australia who helped voters make the decision to deliver a sixth senator for the state. I acknowledge all senators who welcomed me here and the work of parliamentary staff who settled me in. Fellow South Australians, now elected, I turn to the responsibility of representing you faithfully with clarity and confidence. My South Australia is a state of more than 1.8 million people who live beside the mighty River Murray, the imposing Flinders Ranges and on the shores of the Southern Ocean. We have the rolling hills of Adelaide and the Flurio Peninsula, the stunning Kangaroo Island, as well as the city of Adelaide, once awarded one of the world's most livable cities. We're already known for our world-class food and wine regions, its rich and vibrant arts and cultural scene, tourist attractions and experiences. We're a place of imagination and invention. Think the Hills Hoist Clothesline, Container Deposit Schemes, the Stump Jump Plough and David Unipan's Shearing Handpiece. It's people with confidence and capability and the right legislation and policy levers that will unleash the full capability of systems, processes, environments and infrastructure. So based on my personal story, my values and political party, you will see me on my feet for a robust economy, not just for today but for tomorrow, stability and certainty for business and lower taxes and less red tape, good service delivery and accountability, data, monitoring and outcomes, strong borders to protect our people, industry and our native flora and fauna. Safer streets, communities, homes and workplaces, no matter your postcode, culture or income. And a sensible, measured approach to addressing the issues around climate that consider diversity and who and how people are affected differently and disproportionately. More locally, my home, South Australia, is at the forefront of building Australia's sovereign defence capabilities building what we need to help keep us safe. Critical to our security and prosperity, it was the coalition's belief South Australia should lead the creation and delivery of our vital defence and associated industries. I will be a strong advocate for growing South Australia. It's our food, wine, wool, grain, meat and seafood industries and advanced manufacturing with unprecedented workforce vacancies that must be filled to reflect the diversity of South Australians. Moving now from productivity to people, Australians have contacted me lamenting the devastation and chaos they know will revisit their lives with the intended removal of the cashless debit card. The card is an important part of a broader suite of solutions. It gives power and respite to the most vulnerable men, women and children and the elderly. Yes, those who need it most, and it is those people, not the drinkers and drug users, not the abusers, who will suffer the most from its withdrawal. Indeed, in response to what is a philosophical objection to the card, residents living in areas from Queensland, Central Australia, the Kimberley, Sojuna and surrounds, despite raising their concerns, are not being heard on this matter. Instead, the people are, who are being heard are those screaming human rights, but I say, whose rights are they defending? Maybe you need to live in a town devastated by alcohol, drugs and violence and seen it eroded from within. Not convinced yet? Keep walking in my shoes, having helped care for foster children. Yes, wards of the state, that may help you come to a different conclusion. I've looked after a child. Hello, Joe now a man who has fetal alcohol syndrome, never able to live with his parents. Yes, he's had some big hurdles, but he's recently graduated with a certificate four and is still in work. Yeah. I'm here to tell you his family and the families who raised him couldn't be more proud of him. And yet another child, again from a remote community, who lost his mother to alcohol fuel dysfunction and now lives forever with the consequences of that. 
So rather than unleashing the rivers of alcohol and drugs, and with it more associated abuse and neglect, how about ridding our communities with the miscreants, pretenders, controllers and rescuers? Leave them nowhere to hide or thrive. You know who they are, the ones that are there for the ride, for the cultural immersion, or where their apathy and paralysis prevails. Our regulators, our government officials, need to do their jobs better and reward those people working hard to work against the tide of culture of mediocrity and keeping only those people delivering outcomes who we know are there for the right reasons. So it was with frustration I watched on, quarantined by COVID, as the Age Care and Other Legislation Amendment Bill passed this House. In relation to Aboriginal community controlled service delivery, I paraphrase subsection 2, clause A, which does not require the governing board to have a majority independent uh, executive directors. B, have at least one member of the governing body of the provider having experience in the provision of clinical care. Clinical care is assistance with mobility, communication, catheter care and wound management and more. It is one of eight aged care quality standards for safe and quality care and service identified in the Aged Care Quality Standards Commission. The passing of this legislation means Aboriginal community controlled organisations do not have to meet those requirements in the same way as everyone else. Despite caring for the most vulnerable of the most vulnerable, clients with multiple and complex chronic illness and lower life expectancy and in the most isolated regions, there is no expectation of even partial transition to a model that satisfies that standard. Go your hardest if you think that this pushback is racist, ill-conceived, ill-informed or unreasonable, because I'll continue to call out double standards, disturbing assumptions and what I call reverse racism. More broadly, I want our country to think different, act different, demand different, push away from the pressure of sameness, the rejection of discourse, the perils of groupthink. Reject over-policing of language, cancel culture and aggressive social media commentary. All that does is conjure ridicule, creates fears and stifles our potential to do better. I want this country to stop doing what doesn't or won't work, have higher expectations, be tolerant of mistakes, missteps and admit when we get it wrong and celebrate when we get it right. I get angry when others seek to define me firstly or only by race and I know from experience it is getting worse. I was not an Indigenous news reporter, nor an Indigenous businesswoman, or an Indigenous company board director. I had the same qualifications and experience as everybody else. First and foremost, I am just me. I look forward to objecting loudly to navel-gazing, paternalism, box-ticking, quasi-consultation, <laughs> silly reporting that returns little value, and ideas that fail to provide evidence of change. I'm inspired by, the, by words in 1942 by Liberal Sir Robert Menzies, pushing back on government that seeks to control and limit freedom, one which seeks to nurse us, rear us, control us, maintain us, pension us and bury us. In short, give me the tools and information I need to make decisions and to prepare for my own future and help me only when I truly need it. Senator Neville Bonner made history with his first speech 51 years ago this week on the 8th of September. A Liberal senator, he was the first Aboriginal person to enter federal parliament in a casual vacancy and later by popular vote. He believed the interests of Indigenous Australians would best be advanced by working within the existing political institutions and he lamented too much the unwarranted focus on race. I quote, I am Bonner proudly an Aborigine and a member of the Australian community, a token of no person. I acknowledge his contribution and that of all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander politicians of all political persuasions, both past and present. My identity is with Aranda of Central Australia, the cultural group of both my parents. With that, I acknowledge the people and land of the Ngunnawal people on which this house now lies and pay respects to the ancestors, elders, past and present. I want to talk more about equity because 
It is good for individuals. It's good for our nation and it's good for our future. I think perhaps some of the most rewarding work I've done to date is in helping others into work. But from here, I can encourage that on a much bigger scale. It is in everyday workplaces with sameness, the sharing of water coolers, meeting rooms or boardrooms, the same qualification, yes, the same expectation that destroys stereotypes based on disability, rage, ace, culture or religion, and all workforces and workplaces, workplaces must be safe. As Chief People and Performance Officer at Voyagers Airs Rock Resort, with around 1,000 employees, the target was also to employ 400 Indigenous Australians, around 40 per cent of the workforce. At Santos, yes, Santos, a co company-wide functional oversight on matters related to Aboriginal affairs in employment and training, community investment and cultural heritage, the target was over 700 outcomes in the energy sector, and that was long ago. With opposition leader Peter Dutton, I recently visited Intract, an Aboriginal-owned and operated company. It was Santos that gave contract Intract its first major project, which now employs 75 Aboriginal employees, 90 per cent of them Indigenous. With a target of 5 per cent by 2030, it won't be the public service that will deliver these job seekers work. Instead, look to the private sector, where they've already delivered well beyond single-digit outcomes. In conclusion, we need to teach what it takes for bystanders to speak up and push back regardless of how inconvenient or uncomfortable, and that's in our workplaces, our individual lives, in everything we do and will be better for it. Although, although our television, radio, newspapers and social media echo loudly with tales of panic, dread and doom, I am confident ordinary Australians, the battlers, the fighters, are ready for a sensible, measured conversation on tough matters of mutual and country interest. Having worked on projects to provide protection for vulnerable and threatened species, I too have great interest in the environment but not in a way that supports hands glued to sidewalks, stop others going about their business, or stands in the way of agreements struck with traditional, traditional owners under their right to negotiate legally, transparently, transparently, freely and with informed consent. Common sense beats the emotional, the hysterical, on every issue, every time. Shh, listen. You can already click and hear the click of the keyboards, the ping of the posting and the landslide of protest. I make a commitment to myself that I start each new day, every day. My message to self is rightly quite simple. In opposition, I'll relish working with colleagues to hold this government to account for its promises, legislation and policy in this chamber, in committees and in the public domain. I can't change yesterday, but today, I might just help change tomorrow, and that's why I will stand what I will stand for in this place. Thank you.
Uh, senators, we will return to the order of business now, and I just ask senators to either take their seat or leave the chamber quietly. Um, Senator Wish Wilson, are you? No. Senator McKim. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Well, budgets, of course, are all about priorities, they're all about choices, and they're all about values. And government policies are about choices and values. And the Australian Labor Party has made a choice, and that choice is to adopt Holus Bolus, Scott Morrison's $240 billion worth of tax cuts for the top end, for the billionaires, for the politicians, for the CEOs. And when I say Scott Morrison's tax cuts, of course they were designed by him as treasurer, treasurer and introduced by him as Prime Minister. But as of today, they are the Australian Labor Party's tax cuts. They belong now to the Australian Labor Party. And the choice in adopting those tax cuts, those obscene $240 billion tax cuts for the top end that Labor has made, is stark. Because this is the Labor Party that has made it clear that for folks who are on job seeker in this country, they will be condemned to abject poverty. They will be condemned to starvation rations. They will be condemned to having to make a choice every week about whether to put food on the table or pay their rents or pay their power bills. And yet, at the very same time that the government is crying poor, saying we can't afford to raise the amount of money we give to people on JobSeeker, they are in the same breath proposing to give $240 billion worth of tax cuts to the top end, to the billionaires, to the politicians and to the CEOs. And what's their excuse? Oh, they're legislated. And we're not going to relitigate that, said the Prime Minister in the press club last week. Well, uh, a little bit of um, educative uh, work here for the Australian Labor Party. Section 1 of the Australian Constitution vests the legislative power of the Commonwealth in, wait for it, the Federal Parliament. Section 51.2 of the Australian Constitution gives who, wait for it, the Federal Parliament the power to make taxation laws, and the Federal Parliament has the power to, you know what, repeal taxation laws. And that is exactly what we've got the numbers to do and the only thing stopping the repeal of these obscene stage three tax cuts is the Australian Labor Party. Shame. Senator Allman Payne. We've heard a lot of rhetoric from some people in the chamber around the stage three tax cuts. But we need to remind ourselves that what we are talking about is people's lives. Just before I came into this place as a senator, I was a secondary high school teacher in a public school. I taught students whose families are doing it tough in this cost of living crisis. I taught students who are working four and five nights a week, not for pocket money, but to help put food on the table for their family. Those students come to school tired. They don't have time to do their assignments and they do poorly on their exams because they are working to help support their families. That should not be happening in a rich country like this. I taught students who came to school hungry because their parents or their carers were on job seeker and their families did not have enough money to put food on the table. Again, that should not be happening in a rich country like this. Students who are hungry find it very difficult to learn. 
they too suffer when they are sitting assessments, doing homework and exams. I taught students whose families were living in a shed. I taught students who were living in the open air under houses. I taught students whose families were living in cars. This government is going to give $244 billion to the top end of town while students and their families and their carers suffer. That is shameful, it is reprehensible, it is obscene. How about we take that $244 billion and we raise JobSeeker so that families and their kids can afford to eat? How about we take that money and we put it into housing so that students and their families have a roof over their head? And how about we take that money and we properly fund public education so that every kid in this country has the same opportunities for a good life? Okay, the, the question be that the urgency motion is agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I no. believe the noes have it. Is a division required? Sorry, was that a, is a division required? Okay, a division is required. Ring the bells.
lock the doors. The question is that the urgency motion be agreed to. The ayes will move to the right of the chair and the noes to the left. Oh, sorry, I've already done that bit. <laughs> um, I'm going to appoint Senator McKim as the teller for the ayes and Senator Askew for the, for the noes. There being 14 ayes and 39 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. I shall now proceed to the consideration of documents. Senator Stilljohn. President, I seek leave uh, to table a non-conforming petition uh, in relation to a fair go uh, for Vietnam uh, War era national service personnel um, uh, in relation to a campaign led by President Jeff Parks of Fair Go for Nationals. Is leave granted?
Leave is granted. Uh, I table the petition and seek leave to make a one-minute statement. Is leave granted? Leave isn't granted. Leave is granted. It's not granted. Oh, he's right there. Go on. I wish to take note of documents on the notice paper. Okay, I'll now proceed to the tabling and consideration of committee reports and government responses. Are senators seeking to speak on this? Senator Urquhart. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy President. Oh, acting Deputy President, I mean, sorry. Um, pursuant to order and at the request of the chairs of the respective committees, I present reports on the examination of annual reports tabled by 30th of April 2022. Senator Smith. Thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. I present scrutiny judges number four of 2022 of the Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Bills, and I move that the Senate take note of the report. The the Senate Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Bills performs the vital role of examining all bills introduced into the Parliament against a set of technical principles set out in Standing Order 24. These principles focus on the effect of proposed legislation on parliamentary scrutiny and individual rights, liberties and obligations. Importantly, the committee does not consider the policy merits of bills or acts. As a result of this approach, the committee has a strong and long-standing commitment to non-partisanship. When the committee identifies potential scrutiny concerns with a bill, its usual process is to write to the relevant minister requesting information in relation to those concerns or requesting that certain actions be undertaken by the minister. If ministerial responses are not provided within the requested time frame, this can significantly impact the committee's ability to report on its scrutiny concerns while a bill is still before the parliament. The committee's expectation is therefore that responses be received from ministers in a timely fashion and prior to the bill being brought on for debate in the Senate. <laughs> Digest 4 of 2022 reports on the committee's consideration of 39 bills which were reduced, introduced into the parliament between the 26th of July and the 4th of August 2022 or restored to the notice paper during that period. The committee has identified potential scrutiny concerns in relation to 13 bills including seven private senators and private members bills. In particular, I wish to highlight the committee's comments in Chapter 1 of the Digest regarding the Aged Care Amendment Implementing Care Reform Bill of 2022. Item 2 of Schedule 1 to that bill introduces proposed subsection 54.1a into the Aged Care Act of 1997. That section would require an approved provider to ensure that at least one registered nurse is on site and on duty at all times at an aged care residential facility. This new requirement would apply to all approved providers who are providing residential care or flexible care at a, as a, at a residential facility. The committee has technical scrutiny concerns in relation to the proposed subsections 54.1a3 and 4 of the bill. These subjects, sub, sub, subsections provide a broad power to grant exemptions to the new registered nurse requirement using delegated legis legislation. The bill does not set out any detailed criteria to limit this broad instrument-making power, nor does the face of the bill include any guidance as to how the power be exercised. The committee has therefore requested the minister's advice as to why it is considered necessary to confer such broad instrument-making powers on the minister in relation to granting exemptions to this new requirement. The committee has also asked the minister whether the bill can be amended to include at least high-level guidance on the face of the bill as to the circumstances in which an exemption may be granted and general guidance in relation to the conditions which may apply to an exemption. For example, the committee has suggested that it may be appropriate to include a requirement that any exemption is no longer valid if the circumstances under which it was originally granted no longer exist. Importantly, and as I have already noted, the committee's concerns relate to matters of technical scrutiny. The committee does not express a view as to the underlying policy of a bill. In addition, I note that two bills highlighted within Digest 4 passed shortly after they were introduced. While the committee works to ensure that its comments on bills are available to all senators prior to the passage of a bill, this may not always be possible where bills are passed in short timeframes. Bills which pass within short timeframes can therefore significantly impact upon the technical scrutiny process of the Senate. For example, the Aged Care and Other Legislation Amendment Royal Commission Response Bill of 2022 passed both Houses of Parliament 
on 2 August after being introduced the previous week, while the committee welcomed the inclusion of provisions within that bill which limited the scope of a broad power to delegate administrative powers, the committee also had significant scrutiny concerns in relation to other provisions within the bill. For example, the committee had significant concerns in relation to a provision which provides immunity from civil and criminal prosecution to individuals who have used restrictive practices on individuals within aged care homes who lacked capacity to give informed consent. As the bill passed within a short time frame, the committee was not able to publish its comments on this and other provisions in time for consideration by the Senate. The committee looks forward to engaging constructively with new ministers and other bill proponents in the 47th parliament to facilitate the resolution of technical legislative scrutiny concerns prior to the passage of bills. With these comments, I commend the committee's scrutiny digest number no. four of 2022 to the Senate. The question is that the motion put by Senator Dean Smith is agreed to. Those in favour say aye. Those against, the ayes have it. Senator White. The Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Delegated Legislation, I present Delegated Legislation Monitor 5 of 2022 and a volume of committee and ministerial correspondence from the 46th Parliament, and I move that the Senate take note of the reports. I rise to speak uh, to the tabling of this Senate Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Delegated Legislation's Delegated Legislation Monitor 5 of 2022. This committee is one of the Senate's oldest and most respected standing committees. It performs the important role of examining all instruments made under the authority of acts of, of the parliament which are of a legislative character. The committee can, uh, engages in the technical scrutiny of delegated legislation in accordance with the scrutiny principle set out in Standing Order 23. Now, these principles focus on compliance with statutory requirements, principles of parliamentary oversight and the protection of individual rights and liberties. Importantly, the committee does not, not consider the policy merits of delegated legislation. As a result of this approach, the committee has a strong and long-standing commit commitment to non-partisanship. This monitor reports on the committee's consideration of 825 legislative instruments registered to the on the Federal Register of Legislation between the 26th of February and the 26th of July 2022. This includes 656 disallowable instruments and 169 instruments exempt from disallowance. It also details the committee's ongoing consideration of instruments registered in previous periods. In this monitor, the committee is seeking advice from ministers in relation to 13 instruments. The committee is raising initial concerns in relation to eight instruments and seeking further advice in relation to five instruments previously considered. I wish to particularly highlight the com committee's comments in relation to four of these instruments. The first instrument is the Financial Framework Supplementary Powers Amend Amendment, Prime Minister and Cabinet's Portfolio Measures No. 2, Regulations 2022. This instrument amends the Financial Framework Supplementary Powers Regulations 1997 to establish legislative authority for the government spending on the Australian Future Leaders Program. The scrutiny of instruments made under the Financial Framework Supplementary Powers Act 1997 is a key aspect of parliamentary scrutiny and, con and control of Commonwealth expenditure. In this instance, the explanatory in this instance, the explanatory statement to the instrument specifies the amount that will be spent on the program, but does not appear to include the eligibility criteria for the program, and it is unclear to the committee if the criteria will be made public. The status of both the relevant expenditure and of the grant recipient who will deliver the program is also unclear. The committee has therefore resolved to seek advice from the new Minister for Finance as to whether the eligibility criteria can be made publicly available, whether funding authorised by the instrument has been expended on the program, the status of the entity to which funding is being provided, and whether this information can be included in the explanatory statement to promote parliamentary oversight of Commonwealth expenditure. The Australian Renewable Energy Agency Amendment Clean Energy Technologies Regu Re Regulations 2022 were made and registered prior to pro 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 progression yeah, sorry, of the previous par parliament. This instrument has uh, since been superseded by the Australian Renewable Energy Agency Amendment Powering Australia Regulations 2022 made under the new government. 
Both instruments seek to prescribe additional functions uh, of the Australian Renewable Energy Agency arena. The most recent instrument seeks to prescribe electrification te technologies and energy efficient technologies as functions of arena. On the information provided in the explanatory statement, it remains unclear to the committee whether the prescribed functions fall within the scope of the Australian Renewable Energy Act 2011, under, wi under which the instruments are made. The Senate has previously disallowed instruments which sought to prescribe ARENA's functions due to related concerns. The committee has therefore resolved to seek the minister's further advice about this matter and the extent of consultation undertaken in drafting the most recent instrument. Finally, the committee has resolved to seek further advice about the financial sector reform Hain Royal Commission response hawking of financial products regulations 2021. The instrument amends the corporation's regulations to create an exemption to the pro prohibition of, um, on hawking financial products in, in the Corporations Act 2001. The corporation's regulations are not subject to sunsetting. Consequently, the e exemption to primary legislation by, made by the instrument will remain in, in place indefinitely unless later amended. The committee engaged in extensive correspondence with the former treasurer about this instrument. The committee's long-standing view is that delegated legislation should not be used to create exemptions to primary legislation. Where it is absolutely necessary to use delegated legislation for this purpose, the committee considers that the relevant exemption should be time-limited to, facilit to facilitate regular parliamentary scrutiny. Despite the, pre the committee's previous engagement with the former treasurer, it was unable to resolve its concerns and recommended the Senate disallow the instrument. As the disallowance motion was unresolved when the previous parliament Parliament was prorogued. The instrument was deemed to be tabled again in the Senate on the first sitting day of the new Parliament, and the disallowance period now expires on the 25th of October 2022. The committee has therefore resolved to seek the new Treasurer's advice in relation to whether the relevant exemptions can be limited, can be time limited. With these comments, I commend the committee's delegated legislation monitor 5 of 2022 to the Senate. The question is that the motion moved by Senator White. Uh, be agreed. Those in favour say aye. aye. Those against? The ayes have it. Senator Brown. Thank you, Acting Deputy Chair, Chair Deputy President. Sorry. Uh, I present the government's response to the interim report of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security on its inquiry into extremist movements and radicalisation in Australia and seek leave to have the document incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? Yes, leave is granted. Yes. Shoebridge. <laughs> Sorry, Senator Shoebridge. Yep. Uh, I rise to speak on the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security Interim Report, Extremist Movements and Radicalism in Australia Government Response, and I seek leave to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? Yes, leave is granted. Is anyone else seeking to speak to this item? Uh, I'm advised by the clerk that there are no ministerial statements and no committee memberships, so we will move to messages from the House of Representatives. The President has received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the Defence Veterans and Families Acute Support Package Bill 2022 for concurrence. Minister. I move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be read a first time. The question is that the motion moved by Senator Brown is agreed. Those in favour say aye. aye. Those against? The ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to veterans entitlements and military rehabilitation and compensation and for related purposes. Senator Brown. I move that this bill now be read a second time and I seek leave to, leave the, uh, to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. I move that the debate be now adjourned. The question is that the debate now be adjourned. Those in favour say aye. Those, those against? <laughs> the motion is carried. I call the clerk. 
Business of the Senate, Order of the Day, number two. Code for the Tendering and Performance of Building Work Amendment Instrument 2022. Motion for disallowance, resumption of debate. Senator Dunningham. Uh, thank you, Acting uh, Deputy President. And, uh, I was partway through my contribution the other night on this very important disallowance, and so I'm pleased to be able to continue uh, to make my remarks on this. Um, I, I was making the point uh, when debate um, was uh, interrupted around uh, what motivates uh, a government to want to disempower an entity such as the ABCC uh, that has done such important work protecting employees on work sites, like we've heard many examples of throughout the course of this debate. And I don't intend to go over all of the examples that have been provided, though it is important to reflect on how appalling some of these examples are. It is important to, as we go to cast our votes on this disallowance, which I say, and as my colleagues have made the point before, is, um, yeah, it's important to reflect on what it is we are actually doing here. The government seeks to take away powers from the ABCC, which protects employees from terrible behaviour. They seek to gut it, as Senator Scar says. But I don't understand why, at this time, in this political environment, in this world we live in today, where workers' rights, the right to feel safe, the right not to be discriminated against by virtue of uh, or on the basis of a particular attribute, be it your sexual orientation, your gender or any other factor, is something that I thought everyone in this place, including government members, thought was universally important. I'm struggling to think of a workplace where it is deemed appropriate to do the things that have been cited in the examples given by my colleagues who have already made a contribution, to make homophobic slurs, to make sexist remarks, to intimidate people with reference to one or more of their personal attributes. Which workplace is it in which that is okay? Well, if we don't support this disallowance, we are saying that it's okay to do this in the construction industry, that it is okay to turn a blind eye to the claims that have been made, um, and that that is somehow okay behaviour. What message does it send when here in this place we seek to ensure that we lead, set the standard, and make sure that uh, workers in all industries can go to work, feel safe, no matter who they are, what sexual orientation they have, what gender they have. So again, I am just mystified, uh, Acting Deputy President, as to why the government would seek to take away these powers from the ABCC. What is it? And what is more disturbing is a number of the contributions I've heard in this debate as to why uh, we would um, uh, think it's okay to do so by minimising the work of the ABCC, trivialising it, claiming that all the ABCC ever did was go after people with stickers, stickers. on helmets. Stickers. Stickers, stickers and flags. Stickers and flags are not what we are talking about. And indeed, as Senator Hughes says, you know, they might have been hung the right way, but the reality is that is not the bulk of the work that we have been seeing the ABCC focus on. So one, the safety the integrity of the workplace, the rights of workers to be able to go about what it is they seek to honestly do without fear of persecution, fear of bullying from others, from union thugs. You know, this is the kind of thing that this entity has been focused on. Indeed, of course, the economic <coughs> consequences that flow from a decision of this nature, and we've seen it all before because, of course, history is repeating itself. We've had the abolition of this entity before, and we know what happened in the workplace. We know what happened to the economic performance of this sector. We know how many days were lost, almost quadruple the days lost on the work site. 
because of a Labor decision to abandon workers, to leave them at the mercy of union thugs who have nothing at heart other than their own interests. Power on the workplace, and indeed, of course, a union we've heard many times over calling the shots within the Australian Labor Party. And so I think it is wrong for anyone who doesn't support this disallowance to try and minimise what it is we are seeking to do here, to try and bring it back to and uh, equate the work of the ABCC as simply pursuing a union that uh, placed stickers on helmets and hung flags. What madness! And I think people know enough about it. We only have to look at some of the activities, of course, that have been um, pursued by the ABCC. And I turn to my home state of Tasmania. And uh, there was a case, of course, uh, in 2017, where an official, a senior official of the CFMMEU, uh, was done for unlaw unlawful action and putting workers' safety in, quote, harm's way at an excellent project, actually, the Devonport Living City Project, something funded by the Australian government and some, a project that, of course, has uh, made a tremendous difference to the regional economy of the northwest coast. But uh, the official in question here put the safety of workers at risk by climbing into the cabin of a crane while it was being operated. Of course, that same official the very next day climbed again into the crane, the cabin, while it was being operated, again compromising workers' safety. And this was uh, to in, uh, claimed by this official to uh, inform the worker of their rights. I'm not sure why you'd have to interrupt a shift or, in fact, op hop into the cab of a crane while it's operating to uh, in inform someone of their rights on the workplace. While they couldn't wait until the end of the shift, I'm not 100 per cent sure. But as a result of this, um, and uh, despite the fact that there were signs around saying no unauthorised interruption of the operator during crane operation, and we are all about workplace safety, at least I thought unions were and the party that they are most closely aligned to, there was a $137,000 fine uh, um, taken to the CFMMEU for that particular conduct. The same official, of course, appears uh, in a number of other cases related to Tasmania. Um, and uh, in our state, of course, sadly, there are countless uh, um, examples of it. Um, another official um, in the year 2019 uh, willfully contravening <laughs> right of entry laws, intimidating managers at a Hobart construction site, and the uh, court found that uh, this individual did not hold a federal right of entry permit, claimed the site erroneously had asbestos issues, returned again five days later. Uh, and said to the head of contractor staff, don't get smart with me, delete expletive here. I'm at the end of my career. I don't give an F what happens to me, but that bloke over there will, pointing to another official. He could do whatever he effing well likes. That sort of behaviour. And I know, Acting Deputy President, that, of course, uh, uh, people who represent workers through unions or other organisations feel strongly about what it is they do. But if anyone in this place can point to that behaviour, the examples that have been provided to my colleagues and say, hey, that's OK in any workplace, I defy anyone who can do that. And in fact, I'd love to see, if we did it in our own workplaces, I expect we'd be called out for it. In fact, I'm pretty sure it's been happening. There's been a high degree of interest in the safety uh, of workplaces, be it the political realm, the private sector, the public sector, wherever it is, you name it, and rightly so. Workers, workers need, workers need to be uh, protected in their workplace, and of course that's what the ABCC has been doing, day in, day out. And all of this against the backdrop of an economy that needs every bit of turbocharging it can get to ensure that we don't uh, have jobs lost and costs going up. When it comes to the construction sector, this is especially important. Um, and of course, 
uh, when the ABCC is no longer doing its work, um, who's going to protect these workers? Do we honestly believe we aren't going to see a return to the bad old days the last time this happened? And here we are in the first 110 days of this government, and this is a top priority to gut, as Senator Scar said, the, C uh, the ABCC, to enable the CFMMEU to continue to do what it is they do, with flagrant disregard for the law, absolutely no regard for the rights of these employees of various construction businesses across the country, uh, absolutely no regard. And so, I, again, as I say, I'm just absolutely mystified how anyone could vote against this disallowance. Uh, why those who claim to come into this place to stand up for workers' rights, to make sure that this is a safe country in which people can work, go and seek to earn an honest living, get home safely at the end of the day, why on earth this sort of behaviour, a couple of very brief and minor examples compared to some of the other ones that have been referred to by my colleagues, why that is okay? Is it okay in other workplaces? No, it certainly is not. So why, therefore, is it okay for the CFMEU to, CFMMEU to continue to do this? Um, and uh, again, back to uh, those who seek to vote against this disallowance. I did listen to the debate as the bulk of it took place over the last couple of days, and I think I might have counted two or three contributions of people speaking against it. And it made me wonder why. Why aren't people defending the decision to gut the ABCC? Why is it that uh, they are just hoping this will disappear, uh, that the disallowance will get voted down, the CFMMEU can get back to business, uh, its officials can get back to abusing people on work sites, denigrating people, uh, making homophobic slurs, uh, misogynistic remarks, sexist remarks, things that you would just never deem acceptable in any other workplace. They are hoping that their mates in the CFMMEU, the Australian government, want this uh, disallowance knocked off so that they can just get back to business. Uh, and hopefully nothing more will be said about it between now and the next election. That's what they're after. That's what they're hoping for. I urge senators to vote for this disallowance so that we can actually protect workers in this industry. Your time has expired. Minister. So the question is that the motion for disallowance of this instrument be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. Aye. Can I just confirm that uh, you are seeking to finalise the debate or are you seeking to have a vote on the decision? Because I think we don't have any more speakers. We can say well, ourselves. That will be a unanimous uh, decision in that case, <coughs> won't it, Mr Acting Deputy President? Uh, I am moving to conclude the debate so that we can vote on the disallowance motion itself. In that case, the question is that the uh, question be put. Those that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. In that case, there being no more speakers and that having passed, the question now is that the motion for disallowance of this instrument be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells.
Lock the doors. So the question is that business of the Senate orders of the day number two, the code for tendering and performance of building work, uh, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left, and I appoint order. I appoint Senator Askew as teller for the ayes and Senator Ciccone as teller for the noes. Order, there being 31 ayes and 34 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. Order, those senators not participating in the subsequent debate, would you please leave the chamber or resume your seats quietly?
you could leave the chamber quietly with some haste, please. We will move to business of the Senate orders of the day number three, Clark. Business of the Senate order of the day number three, Export Control Animals Amendment, Northern Hemisphere Summer Prohibition Rules 2022, motion for disallowance, resumption of debate. Senator McDonald. Is this week the Labor government would ban live sheep exports sent a shiver up the spines of every grazier in Australia? And there is absolutely no doubt that banning sheep exports would open the door to banning live cattle exports, crippling the $2 billion live export industry and the 10,000 jobs it supports. Animal welfare is at the forefront of our live export trade. We have banned the shipment of sheep to the Middle East during the Northern Hemisphere summer, and the official mortality rate of, ship being trans of sheep being transferred are transported is just 0.2 per cent and dropping each year. In cattle, it's 0.1 per cent. Research is already being conducted into using cameras on ships to enhance monitoring of animals on their journey. Animal health is the top consideration at every step of the supply chain, from the farm to feedlots to the ship. And participants in the live export trade are constantly scrutinised and face exclusion if they fail to meet the high standards set by industry. Another consideration ignored by activists is that of the 100 countries exporting live animals, Australia has the highest standards in the world. Not only that, we are the only country in the world that demands animal welfare standards from our customers. So we are holding our own people to higher standards and we are exporting these high standards around the world, training receiving countries to improve their own practices. And if Labor removes Australia from the world live export market, we are condemning animals in other countries to exceptionally poor outcomes. After Labor banned live exports in 2011, the backlash from the beef and sheep industries was immense. But that hasn't stopped the party from plotting to do it again. In fact, it was left up to animal, animal activists to reveal Labor's plans uh, shows the live export ban was being orchestrated to avoid scrutiny before the election. This policy by stealth is disgraceful and entirely in keeping with Labor's campaign strategy of, we have a plan, but we won't tell you the details until you vote for us. And also concerning is Labor has planned the demise of live exports without consulting with industry, relying instead on the emotion charge, biased arguments by activists. Live export has enormous benefits for all of Australia, not just regional areas. Port of, uh, Townsville Port is Australia's largest live export hub, supporting hundreds of jobs in Australia's unofficial northern capital. Live exports also go through Broome, Darwin and Fremantle. The northern cattle industry supports city-based transport companies and truck drivers. Graziers spend their incomes in cities and the taxes they pay benefit us all. Primary production is hugely important for all of Australia. It's sustainable and it's in demand by scrupulous foreign customers, but Labor treats it like an afterthought. Because without a strong ag sector, Australia will go backwards and that will affect everyone no matter where you live. For Australian graziers, life certainly won't be easy under Albanese. The live uh, animal export trade is important not just to Australian graziers and farmers, though. It is terrifically important to our near neighbours. And the damage we did to our relationship with Indonesia with the overnight banning of that export market has damaged that relationship beyond repair. Uh, over 10 years later, that is a country that still treats us with distrust, and it resulted in a two, over $2 billion bill for this incoming government, both for damages uh, at the time to graziers, uh, transport operators and other businesses in the north, but as well as the growing interest bill that needs to be paid to those people. Uh, we saw poor animal welfare outcomes uh, because of the overnight cancellation and not to mention the massive mental health bill uh, that was inflicted on uh, all sorts of businesses and graziers and families in the north. It was just a horrific time. And for those people who attended those uh, public forums, uh, it was certainly 
um, devastating to see how, how those people had been affected. But live animal exports fills a portion of the market that is not just uh, about exporting food, which is so incredibly important. Food security has been identified by the US Secretary of State at the recent UN uh, World Peace Conference as being one of the most significant issues facing us in our time. Food security for Australians and for our near neighbours is of critical importance. And the part that we have to understand about live animal exports is that it is not just about receiving the best quality food that we grow here in Australia. It is also about being cognisant of uh, religious requirements in those countries. This is something that we don't have to understand here, but in those countries, to receive live animals uh, suitable for their markets, to be eaten in an appropriate, uh, killed and eaten in an appropriate way, is significant for them. And that is a part of the exports that we consider when we have a live animal trade. It is not just about food, it is about cultural and religious beliefs, and in parts of the world it's also about their, belief, uh, their, their economic conditions, where they don't have the electricity and the reliable power to enable to that, have the refrigeration and the cold store chains that we enjoy in this country. So when Australia exports live animals to other countries, uh, there is a, a number of issues that we are complementing our near neighbours and our trade partners. It is an important relationship that we understand uh, culturally their, their challenges, uh, economically their challenges, and of course, and most importantly, their food requirements. Because there is nothing more important in the world than growing and providing food and fibre. That is the human condition. Everything else that we do uh, adds to the quality of life that we have. But without food, uh, we, we don't survive. So I'm very proud of the work that uh, particularly the, the sheep industry of Western Australia does, uh, the cattle industry of Northern Australia, because they've developed relationships that are beyond just that simple provision of food to, to suit the human condition. They are relationships and friendships that have now developed uh, over generations as we've done that. And it's important. It's important, particularly in this uncertain geopolitical time that we live in, that we have strong relationships with our near neighbours. And that's why it was so distressing to see during the close of the last government when we were negotiating the ag visas, uh, so important to uh, agricultural businesses right across this country, whether it be in horticulture or uh, animal production, um, piggeries, feedlots, uh, that the sort of workforce who was skilled in these, um, these um, expertises uh, from Indonesia, uh, from the Philippines, from other near neighbours, was damaged. And it wasn't actually damaged by activists, it was damaged by the AWU, mm -hmm. the Australian Workers' Union, who went and lobbied with those embassies and said, Australian farmers will exploit your people. What an outrageous thing to do, so un-Australian, <coughs> uh, because uh, it showed such a lack of understanding of the requirements during the post-COVID environment where workforce shortage has been so, so difficult that farmers have had to leave uh, crops rot on the ground or in trees, not planted as much food as they possibly could because they didn't feel confident in being able to harvest that at the end of the year. Uh, but instead, uh, some poor behaviour from some contractors meant that the AWU was calling Australian farmers exploiters and saying it was part of business as usual for them. It is shameful. It is shameful. And uh, it, it has shaken me to the core to understand that people who advocate for Australians, for Australian businesses and Australian workers could so willfully undermine our industry, our own people, and not just our people, but the people who do the important work of growing food and fibre not just Australians but our near neighbours, uh, how shocking that is. And to hear Labor continue these outrageous claims that the ag visa didn't get up because of any reason apart from their own henchmen going around and lobbying and bullying uh, embassies and calling our farmers exploiters. 
it was a truly a very dark day uh, in Australia's history and certainly in the agricultural history. So I support the work of Australian farmers as they export not only food and fibre to our near neighbours, they understand and are sympathetic to the cultural differences of our near neighbours, and they understand the economic environment where there may not be good cold store chains uh, for the people that we're supplying food to. Because there's a whole lot of businesses that also spring up around live animal exports. Once the animals arrive in those countries, uh, where farmers might only take two or three head to take off to fatten in their own, in their own uh, mini, mini um, feedlots. Uh, these are important parts of the, of the industry and commerce of those towns. And then, of course, Australia does the most important thing of all, which is that we export our very, very high animal welfare standards. Our closed supply chain in those countries mean that we demand the same export standards in our receiving countries as we demand in our own countries, whether it be in the way that animals are cared for, whether it be in the, the process of slaughter. We demand that they stand up to the same rigorous requirements that we have here in this country. And for anybody to suggest that that's not the case just flies in the face of the science and the research that has been handled, uh, both by uh, the Department of Agriculture, uh, by industry groups, uh, and the fact that we had uh, uh, whistleblowers being paid, being paid for their photos, being paid for their evidence, uh, is just extraordinary. Because if that was in any other situation, you discovered that the person giving evidence was uh, being being paid to provide evidence, uh, then you would call into question the whole credibility of that complaint. That's exactly what we've relied on in this case, is somebody who we don't know if they're actually intentionally trying to hurt those animals, uh, trying to make them distressed in order to provide uh, footage for activists' intentions to shut down the very important work that Australian farmers and Australian exporters do in providing food security to these countries and allowing them to eat in a way that is culturally appropriate uh, and in a way that suits their lack of a cold store supply chains, and so I, I, I oppose this um, uh, this uh, particular um, uh, requirement because of this motion. I'm sorry, because I know that Australian farmers and Australian exporters do hold to the very highest standards. We should feel proud of them, and in fact, I would welcome any of these activists, any of the, uh, the members opposite to go and visit a live export sheep, uh, ship, to go and visit with the, the farmers and graziers who, who take their, their stock there, to travel on the ship and to see just how excellent and expert uh, these, sh these uh, ships are, the staff are, uh, the inspectors are. And, and the advent now, where they've been trialling having remote cameras on ships, I think is an extraordinary extraordinary development because it shows how transparent the industry can be right around the world. We've, we've just lived through a period of remote everything, uh, remote uh, schooling, remote meetings, uh, remote um, leisure activities, and now we can even remotely watch stock as they uh, travel across the seas to our trade partners, and we can be assured ourselves of just the high standards that they're being looked after in. So, you know, I, I just can't believe that, um, with all the work that is done on, in this regard, uh, with the Inspector General for uh, live exports, uh, with the independent uh, observers, uh, and of course with those very, very important trade relations uh, with our near neighbours, in this time where food security is the number one issue that is affecting our countries, uh, we know that when people feel insecure when food supply is threatened, it is the most dangerous thing that we can do uh, to our trade relationships. We saw it in Indonesia. We saw it with that trade relationship that has barely recovered. Uh, and I, I fear for the, for the outcomes that would happen if we were to close down this very appropriate live export industry with sheep, this very high standard of export 
uh, the very um, tight restrictions that we have on weight um, and, and standards. And anybody who thinks we're killing the sheep has never been on a ship, has never been to see the standards, who are so poorly informed that they should hang their heads in shame at their criticisms Order. of the standards that we uh, uphold. And I can only ask them, please, go on a ship. Go out and see what actually happens. Stop listening to poorly informed uh, activists. Thank you. Senator McKim. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I move that the question be put. Uh, did you seek leave? I, I moved no? that the question now be put. Sure. Thank you. Uh, the question is that the sorry. So the question is that the question be put. Those that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. Aye. I think the noes have it. Aye. Ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells.
Order. I lock the doors. So the question is that the question be put. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Ciccone as teller for the ayes and Senator O'Sullivan as teller for the noes. Order, there being 34 ayes and 29 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. I'm, uh, Senator Birmingham. To make a short statement. Is leave granted? <laughs> seeking uh, leave to make a short statement. Senator Birmingham is seeking leave to make a short statement. Really? You want me to move a suspension? I'm seeking leave to make a short statement, Murray. You don't need to hear about it. The general courtesy is that we give leaders that option, but it's, it's your decision. I need an answer. No, it's not. Uh, one minute, thanks, Senator Birmingham. Thank you, Senator. President, here we go. The virtual team motion. For all the occasions we heard from Labor and the Greens previously about how outrageous it was to shut down debate. We now have the remarkable situation where the Greens, the Greens have just voted to guillotine debate on their own disallowance motion, where they will now sit there and watch Labor come over this side and defeat their disallowance motion. That is how much the Greens are willing to contort themselves in relation to these matters. The Greens they are contorting themselves to now shut down debate in defiance of everything that they have had to say along the way. The Labor Party shutting down debate on an issue when there were only two speakers left on the list. Two speakers. They couldn't allow another two speeches to proceed before they had to come in here, shut down debate, close things off, Thank again you, in defiance Birmingham. of everything Your they time used to has say. Expired. So the question is that business of the Senate. I'm putting the question, business of the Senate, uh, number three, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. Uh, I believe the ayes have it. Aye. Division required? Yes. Ring the bells. One minute. One minute. Ring the bells for one minute.
applause. So the question is that uh, business of the Senate orders of the day number three be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator McKim as teller for the ayes and Senator O'Sullivan as teller for the noes. Order. There being 12 ayes and 47 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. I call the clerk. Government. Government business orders of the day number one, climate change bill 2022 and a related bill, resumption of second reading debate. Would senators who are not participating in this debate please leave the chamber or resume your seats in silence. Senator Hughes.
you, Mr Acting Deputy Speaker. I rise tonight to speak to the Climate Change Bill 2022 and the Climate Change Consequential Amendments Bill 2022. The Coalition will not support either of these bills. This is legislation that their own minister has called not necessary. To quote the minister, he stated, whilst this legislation is not necessary for the Albanese government to embark on the policy actions we have sought and received a mandate for, it is best practice. The minister is also quoted as saying, we have designed our Powering Australia plan so that it can be implemented whether legislation passes or not. It's difficult for me to understand that this remains such a priority for Labor if it's not necessary. This legislation will introduce serious externalities. Why impose those consequences on the Australian economy if the legislation is not necessary? Australia has already made known its formal 43 per cent target, regardless of how the parliament deals with this legislation. The government updated Australia's nationally determined contribution, the NDC, in June. One would have thought that the priority of the government would to be, address, to be addressing the inflationary pressure and cost of living pressures that Australian families are suffering through. Amidst their broken promise to reduce power bills for families and businesses by $275, they have now overseen the highest electricity prices on record. So I repeat the call from the Leader of the Opposition. If you actually want to help Australians at the moment, keep the promise you've abandoned. Reduce their power bills by $275. Rushing to legislate an emissions target does nothing to fulfil that promise. This legislation has serious problems, which will have significant unintended consequences. So I wanted tonight to briefly summarise the coalition's main concerns. We believe that the consultation process overlooked significant stakeholders. The government chose to alleviate itself of rural and regional concerns instead of properly consulting with those most likely to be impacted. The legislation will invite green activists to enter vexatious claims in our legal system for political purposes. Environmental activist groups could now challenge crucial projects under Commonwealth legislation, potentially delaying or halting them altogether. Furthermore, the Coalition believes the government's Order. Powering Australia plan is not achievable or genuinely practical plan to firm 80 per cent renewables by 2030. We are, however, concerned that the legislation is not equitable nor fair. And what I mean when I say that this legislation gives no consideration to how an increase in power bills could cause economic distress to families or businesses. These bills are actually also likely to restrict crucial government agencies such as the Northern Australia Infrastructure Facility, Infrastructure Australia and Export Finance Australia from supporting important projects. Furthermore, there are grave concerns that these restrictions will inhibit our national security and particularly objectives in the Pacific by reducing Export Finance Authority's flexibility. The Coalition believes that the Labor government's continued rejection of sensible debate on latest generation nuclear power is disingenuous. Stakeholders have said to us and have said to the inquiry that was held, such as the Australian Forest Products Association, raise concern with the legislation as it relates to, con to consultation, or rather I should say the complete lack of consultation concerning certain aspects of the bills. The Department of Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry was not consulted on the Climate Change Consequential Amendments Bill 2022 prior to its introduction. This bill could have serious impacts on the agricultural industry as an emissions-intensive industry, but the Climate Change Department failed to consult with the Agricultural Department on how this bill might impact on our primary producers. So this leads me to believe that the consultation process failed in its duty to inquire upon all communities about the manner in which this legislation may impact them. The consultation process of heightened concern 
because of the government's failure to conduct proper socio-economic modelling. Whilst providing evidence, the Department of Climate Change, Energy, the Environment and Water and the Department of Agricultural Fisheries and Forestry admitted they've done no modelling on the impacts of the Climate Change Bill and the Consequential Amendments Bill on rural and regional Australia. The government failed to properly consult rural and regional perspectives and failed to conduct socio-economic modelling on the impact that it would have on these communities. Absolutely disgraceful. And without such processes, these bills may now have provisions that lead to incredibly serious unintended consequences. These are significant oversights on behalf of the government which should have been addressed, and the government should have sought to facilitate general consultation and discussion around this legislation. Unfortunately, though, despite claiming they would govern under a new style of politics, the government's haste is an attempt to influence political outcomes and obviate genuine criticism and different perspectives. As stated in our dissenting report to the inquiry into these bills, the coalition believes rigorous consultation, modelling and social impact assessments have been overlooked in the drafting and introduction of these bills. And if the Labor Party continues to insist on passing this legislation, they will have effectively entered Australia into a new, area of green, a new era of green lawfare. The coalition believes that these bills will invite unacceptable and fundamentally vexatious green activism into the courts and our legal system. And I note the experience of other countries who have uh, codified into law some of these uh, pieces of legislation, the UK in particular has been subject to significant legal consequences as a result of the codification of emissions reduction targets. Activists in the UK have challenged crucial projects such as a new high-speed rail network, challenged government decisions to invest in the maintenance and the construction of new roads because this would lead to increased traffic and thus greater emissions, and a delayed third runway at Heathrow Airport for years by challenging it in the court system. The government of France has been ordered to take all necessary message on climate change by the end of 2022, or it will be subject to penalties by the court. In Germany, the courts ordered the government to increase its emissions reduction target. These scenarios have eventuated through the legislation of emissions and emissions reduction targets. These scenarios are something that is very much real for, that Australia is facing now. Disappointingly, though, at the inquiry as well, environmental groups such as Greenpeace and others absolutely refuse to rule out using this legislation to challenge agriculture, primary producing, infrastructure, energy, resources or forestry projects. The coalition is gravely concerned that these may impact on access to the justice system if the court system is to be used to this. Uh, and already, many of these projects are already subject to significant delays and for allowing for green activism to add to the court's workload would not be in the interest of our legal system. And the government's target of 43 per cent includes a plan to have an 82 per cent renewables by 2030 under their Powering Australia plan. The committee inquiry into these bills received evidence that this plan would actually lead to an increase in power bills. So after breaking their promise of providing families with $275 relief on their power bills, the government is actually going to be contrib contributing to additional costs to families and businesses. And we do know the variability of renewables cannot be firmed by current battery storage technology. As outlined in our dissenting report, evidence was, uh, was provided to the inquiry into these bills. Current bar battery technology could power a city the side of Sydney for seconds if the grid failed. This is especially concerning given that members of the government continue to demonise fossil fuels. So to introduce such significant variability with no visible manner with which to firm that technology would be a very large misstep. The coalition also has very serious doubts concerning the Labor government's ability to deliver on its commitment to 82 per cent renewables by 2030. And as raised by Nuclear for Climate Australia in their submission to the inquiry into these bills, and I quote, it's intended that emissions reductions in electricity generation throughout all sectors of the economy be achieved using renewables with storage. In view of the embodied carbon emissions in wind, solar and storage devices, it is physically impossible to achieve net zero using these devices. Their constant replacement, weather dependency and lack of reliability 
will render methods of negative emissions such as carbon sequestration or atmospheric removal entirely uneconomic. So for Australians who are already under constant cost of living pressures, any rise in their power bills will have a detrimental impact on their lives. And this legislation, though, fails to address the economic cost of rising power bills. But we do know that this government has very little concern for families who are managing very expensive power bills. Amidst the highest electricity prices on record, this Labor government, as I said, has abandoned their $275 better off plan for families. They ditched the promise, and I believe that one of the primary responsibilities for government when altering energy policy is to ensure that people can keep their lights on, they can turn their dishwasher on after 6 pm at night, and that they can afford to do so. I've said this time and again, and will continue to do so. These bills will put pressure on already very high cost of living pressures on families. This will potentially inhibit some Australians from being able to afford to keep their lights on, to keep their fridge running, to keep the air conditioning on in summer or the heater on in winter. This will have significant impact for our communities. But of what could even almost be of some greater concern or equal concern is the fact that this legislation could actually inhibit our national security objectives, particularly in relation to the Pacific. Our region, I think everyone can agree, is going through a period of heightened tensions. China has certainly become more assertive in the region, and they're pushing their objectives into our neighbourhood via the Pacific. We have heard and, and, and believe that the export finance, Australia's ability and flexibility and reducing that is not in our national interest. Export Finance Australia do critical work supporting projects in the Pacific, and if we don't continue to provide that important support, other countries may attempt to do so on our behalf. So restricting Export Finance Australia's flexibility could lead to exactly that. If we do not support these projects, we can be opening up the door for China to do so. We need to ensure and I and the coalition object in the strongest possible terms to any legislation which may negatively impact upon our national security objectives. But it's not just the export, export finance Australia, it's also the Northern Australia Inf Infrastructure Facility from supporting projects in various industries which are considered emissions intensive. So these agencies manage and support the funding of projects which create significant investment, provide economic stimulus and create jobs. But by restricting their decision making and, and putting, you know, it's, it's just not in the national interest and could inhibit these opportunities. I do just also want to touch on nuclear energy. And the government, with its Powering Australia plan and its calls for 82 per cent renewables in the grid to achieve their target of a 43 per cent emissions reduction, that there needs to be input into the grid, more variability into the grid. And it needs to be firm. So, given the government's focus on reducing emissions, it would appear to me now that this conti its continued rejection of a genuine debate—that's all, a discussion—on nuclear power is purely ideological. So, the coalition urges the government to please engage in sensible discussions with us on these matters. So, in closing. And I know we have a long night ahead of us because, again, in transparency, we're going to push this through and maybe guillotine at some stage. We won't be supporting these bills because we support Australians. They are founded upon unachievable policy principles and they will have very, very serious unintended consequences. The government has in no way done adequate consultation. In fact, it would look like they've gone out of their way to not consult those sectors like agriculture, like primary production, like forestry, that will be so affected by this. They have done no modelling of how this will impact rural and regional communities as they shut down jobs. These bills will also increase green activism, the lawfare, the lawyers' picnic, the vexatious claims that are about to be launched will be significant. We will see a continual increase in energy prices, and as I said, this has the potential to have a very significant impact 
on our ability to further our national security objectives in the Pacific. Senator Altman Payne. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak this evening to the climate change bills. I note that many of my Greens colleagues have spoken to these bills and done so with eloquence, intelligence and passion. So while I wish to make a contribution to debate on these bills, I want to focus on a few key areas. You cannot end the climate wars while opening up new coal and gas projects. It really is that simple. In the month since these bills passed the House of Representatives, Labor has opened up 47,000 square kilometres of ocean to oil and gas exploration. The Prime Minister has said that Australia will keep on selling coal and gas to the world. Queensland Labor has given approval to the new Ackland coal mine. These are not the actions of a party that is committed to reducing emissions. Let me be extremely clear. The Greens will be supporting these bills, but they are a very small step forward, and Labor has committed to kicking real action on climate change to the curb. This is a government that is captured by the likes of Woodside, Chevron and Santos. In Western Australia, literally two-thirds of all offshore gas is given away to these companies for free. The state government gets more money from vehicle registrations than they do from gas royalties. Federally, the petroleum resource rent tax is broken. Australian people are paying for the privilege of having our climate destroyed for the sake of multinational profit. That's a disgrace. While these bills go nowhere near far enough, we are pleased to have secured improvements. The Greens have made sure that Labor's unscientific target of 43 per cent is a minimum, and we are aiming to see that target be raised substantially. We have made sure that the Climate Change Authority will be guided by the global temperature goals set out in the Paris Agreement. Crucially, large financing bodies such as Export Finance Australia and Infrastructure Australia will have to consider climate targets when financing projects. This is significant, as these bodies have been vehicles for significant fossil fuel financing. And finally, the government has agreed to consider our proposals for a National Energy Transition Authority to support coal and gas communities and give them control over their futures as Australia tackles the climate crisis. There is a real opportunity here for collaboration on protecting workers and their communities and ensuring an equitable transition to renewable energy that ensures well-paid employment and world-class services for those communities. I look forward to working with the government to get this done and to meaningfully deliver for working people in fossil fuel communities like mine. But a National Energy Transition Authority will have its work cut out managing the transition for existing fossil fuel projects. There are 114 coal and gas projects in the pipeline at the moment. Even a single one would blow Labor's target out of the water and make a mockery of any commitment to transitioning workers and their communities. The Labor Party might think that they can keep exporting coal and gas for decades to come, but the reality is that our international partners will stop buying it. If Labor intends to achieve even their inadequate target of 43 per cent, not one of the 114 coal and gas mines currently green-lighted can go ahead. Whilst the Greens will vote for the climate bill, this bill cannot be the be-all and end-all of climate action. We will fight tooth and nail against all new coal and gas projects, and we will make sure that workers engaged in existing fossil fuel projects are protected and given secure, well-paid jobs in their communities. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. And I rise to speak on the Climate Change Bill 2022, 
and Climate Change Consequential Amendments Bill 2022. And what a historic moment this is, because these bills mark <coughs> the end of the climate wars in this country, the end of 10 years of inaction, the end of 10 years of division and denial by those opposite. We are in a global race, and now Australia is taking our place in that race, a race to prevent the devastating climate events that are destroying communities and regions here and around the world, and a race to seize the opportunities of a decarbonised world, including bringing the jobs of the renewables future right here to our shores. And with the climate change bill, that is exactly what we are doing. This bill sends the signal that the Albanese government is committed to action on climate change, a signal that gives certainty to our region, to investors, to Australian businesses and to this parliament. Because this bill is also a commitment that our government will not just announce a target and hope we get there. We won't use accounting tricks or rely on future technologies that may or may not ever exist. We will be held accountable to our targets and we will deliver our plan to not just meet them but exceed them. We'll report on our progress every year to the parliament on meeting the targets and on how our policies are contributing to that success. Because our government knows that Australia should be a renewables superpower. We know that Australia should be leading the this global race and securing the jobs of the future for Australian workers. And now we can do just that. I am incredibly proud that my home state of Victoria is leading Australia's transition to the renewables future. The Andrews government, led by Australia's longest serving climate change minister, the Honourable Lily D'Ambrosio, was one of the first in the world to legislate a net zero emissions by 2050 target. And to make sure those targets are met, they've made the largest investment in clean energy of any state ever, investing $1.6 billion to identify and create renewable energy zones, zones that support businesses, jobs and towns across regional Victoria to transition to new industry, ensuring maximum benefit for local communities by delivering thousands of good, secure jobs and billions of dollars in new economic activity. To ensure Victorians are prepared for these new jobs, the Andrews government has also introduced a clean energy workforce skills initiative. This is a $10 million initiative that encourages collaboration between the training sector and industry. This will ensure that our training curriculums are fit for purpose for the jobs of the future and ensure that Victorian workers have the skills that they need to take up those jobs. So it is Labor governments that are leading the way on climate action in this country. It is Labor governments that are delivering on climate action in this country. Labor governments. That is who is delivering on climate action in this country. We are sending a message to the world that now is the time to invest in Australia's transition, attracting large nation-building investments in renewable energy right now. Investments like the Star of the South project off the south coast of Gippsland, a project that has partnered with the Victorian government to deliver Australia's first offshore wind site. The Star of the South project won't just help Victoria and Australia meet our climate targets. It will create thousands of local jobs, good, secure jobs. It will support a community transition from fossil fuels to a greener future. The Star of the South is bringing the local community along with it by working with unions and local businesses to ensure that there's an ongoing supply of local jobs and that there is an ongoing supply of local contracts for local communities. Australia, and particularly my home state of Victoria, has an incredible opportunity to establish a significant offshore wind industry, an opportunity that was held back for so long by the coalition government and their failure to deliver legislation allowing offshore wind to even be considered in Australia. But the Labor government in Victoria didn't let, them, uh, didn't let that hold them back. And to make up for the lost time as they waited for those opposite to deliver critical legislation to enable offshore wind, the Victorian government announced a plan to accelerate the rollout of offshore wind projects. This was a strong message to the world that if you want to invest in offshore wind, Victoria is the place to be. 
and that message was received loud and clear, with investment now flowing from international and local investors, including industry super funds who are getting involved. Because the best thing we can do to attract investment in our transition is to show the world that we are serious about reducing emissions and that we are serious about becoming the renewables superpower that everyone, except those opposite, know that we can be. There has been a decade of missed opportunities from those opposite, missed opportunities to make Australia a global leader, missed opportunities to secure Australian jobs in the rapid transition to renewables, including a failure to prioritise Australian-made products. We saw this at the Ryan Corner wind farm project, where Keppel Prince, Australia's only manufacturer of wind turbines, were primed and ready to provide the content for this project. But instead, they were passed over in favour of imported products and overseas companies, a decision that saw 50 jobs lost in the community of Portland in just three weeks. Three weeks. A devastating blow to that community. And this is the legacy that those opposite have left behind. No support for local content, no support for local business, no support for local jobs, no support for local communities. Australians know that under the Albanese government, the move to a renewable energy future will create secure jobs for workers here in Australia. Our Powering Australia plan will reduce emissions and help us meet the targets that we are setting today. Uh, and create over 600,000 new jobs for Australian workers—600,000 good, secure jobs, many of them in Australia's regions. Five out of six of new, those new jobs created in our regions. And we'll join together the Powering Australia plan with our Buy Australian plan, which will improve the way that government contracts work to make sure more opportunities are available to Australian businesses. At the same time, the National Reconstruction Fund will drive new manufacturing jobs in renewables. All of this creates even more jobs for Australian workers because the world's climate crisis is Australia's job opportunity, and it's an opportunity that the Albanese government is not willing to miss. We are embracing that opportunity, and we are embracing the future. Thank you, Senator Walsh. Senator Rennick. Thank you, Acting Deputy, Deputy President. And I'm very pleased to rise to speak to this bill because, as I listen to the uh, speeches today, there's been very little talk about science indeed. And matter of fact, I haven't even heard of one mathematical equation that actually underpins any of this science since this whole debate started. But I'll get on to that point in a minute. I do want to lay down my credentials uh, in terms of how much I care about the environment. And I want to distinguish the environment and my passion for the environment and the Liberal Party's passion for the environment versus the shoddy mathematical modelling, indoctrination and intimidation of the climate change propaganda. Now, When it comes to looking after our riparian zones and reducing pollution, looking after our biodiversity, our land management, all these things are very, very important. And I stand with the party. It's one of the values of the LNP is to protect our environment. But, as I stand here, I get worried because I know what these so-called renewables, which aren't renewables, they are reliables, and the damage that they will do to the environment if they go ahead. I'll give you one example. These wind farms killed both bats and birds. They're killing our uh, apex birds uh, that it feeds down into the food chain, and they're killing our bats. Now, unbeknownst to most people, bats pollinate lots and lots of flowers. Right? So if we're going to go around killing bats, it's estimated that in the US that the wind farms over there kill up millions of birds each year, along with millions of bats. Uh, and it's been known in other countries, in Scotland and places like that, there's a real anti-wind farm sentiment. Uh, they are tracking, doing a fantastic job tracking the number of apex birds that are being killed by wind farms. But it just doesn't stop with wind farms. It also is lithium uh, with these batteries and the rare earth mining. Uh, that has to be carried out in order to build a battery. Now, not many people realise, for example, that lithium is a 1 per cent ore body. You've got to mine 100 tonnes of ore to get one tonne of lithium. Right? But the thing about a mine is, is that you, just don't, the ore body, you can't just go and dig the ore body out of the ground. You've got to go around and around and around in order to get to the ore body. So that means you've probably got a, 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 what they call a stripping rate of about 10 to 1. So you would 
quite possibly with many of these lithium mines, and don't forget that's just one of the many metals that go into a battery, have to mine a thousand tons of dirt in order to get one ton of metal. But here's the rub. You don't just get the one ton of metal out of you all that easily. You've got to put it through a number of electrolysis processes to extract the ore metal from the ore. And then once you do that, you then put it on a ship to uh, China, where it then goes into a battery. From, there, from that battery, it then goes into— yeah, I don't disagree with that. We should value our debt. Um, but uh, it then goes over to Texas into a Tesla factory, where it goes into a car, and then from the car, the car comes all the way back to Australia and then gets used. But having said that, the actual uh, power is put into a uh, wall socket where most of the power actually comes from a coal mine anyway. anyway. Now, if you compare that to, say, for example, uh, that Kogan Coal Creek mine close to my hometown of Chinchilla, there's a, it's what you call a mine mouth uh, coal mine, which is where the mine is only four kilometres away from the power station. And coal is coal. There is no actual extracting coal from the ore body. You burn it, you, you, you strip it, you, you mine it, you put it straight into the power station, and the power is transported via the southern uh, inner connector. It is a very efficient form of producing energy. But it doesn't stop there. These batteries that go into cars weigh up to 700 kilograms. They add a significant amount of weight to a car. They increase the braking distance. They are going to increase accidents. If you, want it, you do not want to get hit by a 700 kilogram solid object. They are going to increase uh, the uh, rubber burn, uh, burn off in cars and increase the rubber pollute, pollu pollutants in the air. This is not going to end well. On top of that, you have to build so much more security uh, services in order to do with the frequency and the, uh, volatility control because we're going to have renewables coming on and off, on and off, on and off. So we're going to have to spend hundreds of millions of dollars on synchronous cadences. Now they are these big spinning wheel, uh, flywheels that sit on an inverter at the end of the uh, coal-powered fire station, and when there's an overload or a surge of too much energy coming from solar, say for example, that power has then got to get diverted off into the actual spinning wheel. And then if there's a dip in the energy, if that spinning wheel's still spinning, you can divert some of that energy back into the actual um, the grid. But this all requires a lot of, lot of extra costs. Um, you know, there's been a lot of false assumptions. Now, for example, the cost gen report assumes that there's no extra transmission required until renewables hit 50 per cent of the grid. Now, that's farcical because the Labor Party have got a $20 billion rewiring the actual um, grid uh, scheme, so that's going to be a loan, of course, and I don't know what the conditions of that loan are, but that's going to cost a lot of money. So we're now going to have all these extra transmission lines across the country. They themselves kill heaps of birds. That's a well-known fact. I'm, and I just can't wait for the farmers to, you know, there's going to be once more and more of these transmission lines start getting built. I know in Western Victoria they're protesting about that at the moment. You're then going to have all these impacts on farmers. You're going to have transmission lines going crisscrossing the country. You know, in the old days when we had 80 per cent of the east, uh, eastern seaboard powered by coal, we only had about 30 power stations, and it was all very efficient when it came to transmission. Now, on top of that, we've got the problem of recycling. Now, uh, the head of the CSIRO, Larry Marshall, said in estimates it costs three times to recycle a battery than it does for the cost of the metals that go into the battery. So I want to know how are we going to recycle all of these uh, lithium slash cobalt slash aluminium and copper and all the stuff that go into these batteries. I don't think it's ever going to be economical to recycle these batteries because it is so uh, metal intensive. And this is, this is the big fallacy of all this. All you're doing is shifting from mining coal to mining rare earth metals that are one or two per cent of the actual earth's crust. Now, Richard Harrington from the London Natural uh, the head of geology at the London Natural History Museum has said there is not enough. He was just talking about Great Britain, but there wasn't enough copper, nickel, um, neodymium, and a few other uh, metals in, 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 on the Earth's crust to actually power the UK um, fleet. Um, so, where are we going to find all these rare metals to actually, you know, basically have enough battery storage? So that the renewables, so, well, I call them unreliables, and they're not renewable. The hardware isn't renewable, right? Um, uh, it, it, it's just totally unsustainable. But look, you know, these things are unfortunately, and, I, and I've just realised that I'm never going to win this argument. Whenever I talk about this stuff, I'm, I'm called a climate denier. I, I somehow don't care about the environment. I, and I have to say, I find that incredibly insulting. As someone who grew up on a farm, who yearns for the sound of the whipbird in the morning or the sound of the glass out at Chinchilla, 
uh, you know, and the beautiful noises they make. I love the environment. You know, when I was, I was offered a partnership in an accounting firm when I was 23, I turned it down to go overseas. And the first place I went to was Africa. I, I climbed Kilimanjaro in the first week. I went to see the gorillas in the mist. I went and dived at Zanzibar. I went to the Serengeti. I went to Europe. I climbed the Alps. I rock climbed in the Alps. You know, I then went over to South America, Machu Picchu Trail, uh, Nepal, climbed the Concagua. I've surfed, skied, paddled down so many rivers. I love the environment. But yet, whenever I raise these genuine concerns about the environment, you're just castigated uh, with intimidation, indoctrination, and shoddy mathematical modelling that somehow you know, the debate's moved on. Well, let me tell you, the debate hasn't moved on, and it will never move on because, at the end of the day, all science is underpinned by mathematics. And if there isn't a mathematical algorithm that demonstrates cause and effect and quantifies that cause and effect, then that's not science. Because behind every good scientist is a mathematician. Okay, and if you go and watch these movies and that and these so-called science boffins, they're on the wall proofing their algorithm. And that's what I'm going to finish this speech up on tonight. Because I want to talk about the scientists, no greater scientist himself than Albert Einstein. And in his 1917 paper on the quantum theory of radiation, and let me quote his conclusion, is that one feels justified in this because the momentum transferred by radiation is so small that it always drops out as compared to that from other dynamical processes. What does that mean? There's three forms of heat transfer: convection, conduction, and radiation. Now, at the end of the day, Albert Einstein, the great man himself, the greatest scientist that ever lived, said radiation was so small is it insignificant. Okay, so just remember that. So if you want to talk about science and the science of climate change, I say there's no such thing. It's the science of heat you need to focus on, and the science of heat is called thermodynamics. And those rules were first settled 200 years ago by guys like Robert Joule and William Thompson, who later on became Lord Kelvin, who was the first scientist to be made a lord in the House of Lords 200 years ago. And Leo, uh, uh, Leo Carnot, a great Frenchman who actually worked on the second law of thermodynamics, technically speaking it was the first law of thermodynamics because he got to that before uh, Boyle and uh, Joule. But anyway, um, I digress. But I want to um, touch on uh, these laws of thermodynamics to actually prove that this whole concept of adding carbon dioxide to the atmosphere is somehow going to increase the heat. Because as anyone who understands science knows, E equals MC squared. Energy comes from the uh, combustion of energy in the sun. 600 billion tonnes of hydrogen are burned every second. That's converted into 596 billion tonnes of helium and 400, uh, 4 billion tonnes of energy. Now, energy, radiation energy is carried by a boson known as um, a photon. Now, that, some of that photons come here to planet Earth, and it comes about in, in the form of about 8 per cent uh, infrared uh, above the visible spectrum, about 42 per cent visible spectrum, and about 44 per cent infrared energy. Now, carbon dioxide, ironically enough, only actually absorbs energy at certain frequencies. One of those frequencies happens to be 2.8 microns, which is incoming radiation. Okay? Another frequency it absorbs at is 14.8 microns, which just happens to be outgoing long-wave radiation. Now, here's the thing. If you actually apply Planck's law, E equals, e equals hv, that the energy consumed by carbon dioxide on the way in is actually five times stronger than the energy absorbed by carbon dioxide on the way out. Okay, because they never want to tell you that, right? What do you think actually slows down the adiabatic lapse rate? If it wasn't for the actual greenhouse gases, and we know this because the maximum temperature in Singapore is about 34 degrees, you actually, it's been actually proven that the H2O water vapour actually cools. So if you go to places in outback Queensland or Australia, you'll get 50 degrees in the summer. In Singapore, you won't get that because the humidity actually stops the, the um, radiation, incoming solar radiation from getting too hot. It gets very muggy, but that's actually the water, not the radiation. So that's two laws. So we've basically broken so far. E equals MC squared, special theory of relativity, 1905 by Einstein. He did four great papers that year. He didn't actually get a Nobel Prize for that. He got that for the photoelectric uh, effect that he did later that year. Um, and of course, we've now broken also Planck's law. But then we go on to Wine's law. Now, Wine's law actually describes the uh, temperature, actually calculates the temperature at which carbon dioxide will actually emit any energy it absorbs. 
Now we know that that's basically uh, what's the word? It's called. Uh, I did have to print this off. I can't remember this. It's called the constant of proportionality, and that's two. 0.2898 centimetres, and you actually put that over the wavelength the carbon dioxide absorbs, 14.8 microns, and that will give you 192 degrees in Kelvin. Now, 192 degrees in Kelvin, for those of you who don't know your Kelvin scale, is actually negative 80 degrees Celsius in real life. So, in other words, carbon dioxide actually only emits heat at negative 80 degrees. So, if you want carbon dioxide to be so-called trapping heat, as you guys like to claim, you'll need to either go to the bottom of Antarctica or about 10 kilometres up in the actual troposphere to actually start getting carbon dioxide to actually emit heat. But here's the thing. You see, carbon dioxide is only ever going to emit what comes in uh, via radiation in the first place via the photons, right? But the problem with that is, is and that's if you use the first law of thermodynamics, which we'll now go to, is that energy is neither created or destroyed. And this matters because this because of this rule, it means that carbon dioxide only absorbs energy on a logarithmic scale and not a linear scale. So, first law of thermodynamics: If I'm a one-ton car and I'm travelling at 100 kilometres and I hit another stationary car at one that weighs one ton, the most that that stationary car can move is 100 kilometres. It can't go at 110 kilometres, right? So, likewise, with a photon that is absorbed by carbon dioxide. It only absorbs an existing photon. It doesn't actually increase the overall energy intake that's actually in the atmosphere. Right? You cannot do that. But here's the thing, and I'll accept you, this little bit of the climate change theory is right. It will emit radiation in all directions, and some of that, albeit at negative 80 degrees, will radiate downwards. And that's where we use the second law of thermodynamics. Uh, which is that the entropy of a system will always increase. Now, if I have a glass of water here, half a glass of water here at 10 degrees, and half a glass of water here at 20 degrees, and I tip one into the other, and assuming we trap the heat, we will actually end up uh, measuring out 15 degrees of uh, the water will end up at 15 degrees. Now, likewise, if we had a little bit of radiation come down, so let's just say you know the lower part of the atmosphere, or the, the one glass went to 9.9 .9 degrees, and the other one went to 20.1, and you still tip them into each other. Entropy, the entropy will always increase. It's still going to level out at 15 degrees. So the point of the matter is, is that the very small amount of radiation emitted downwards, and it's next to nothing, uh, as, as Einstein said, it's so small it drops out. It's going to be levelled out by the wind, and we know that. We all know that because every day we see the wind constantly moving. That is the second law of thermodynamics in action. However, so I'm going to have to finish my speech here. Sorry. But can I just say I will vote against this bill because it is junk science. It has been based on uh, false lies for far too long, and I'll continue to fight this to the day I die. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak to the Climate Change Bill 2022, and I would like to associate myself with the fabulous comments that have already been made by my Greens colleagues. The Climate Change Bill, as first introduced by Labor, was a flimsy purely symbolic bill designed to take an election promise uh, and provide Labour with an opportunity for self-congratulations. The Greens have worked hard to improve it. We've ensured that the target can be ratcheted up over time. We've dutton proofed the bill with a genuine flaw, which means that targets cannot go backwards. And we've ensured that government agencies, such as Export Finance Australia, that in the past have funded coal and gas projects, will, for the first time, be forced to take climate targets into account when making decisions. But there is so much more to be done. The first and most obvious thing is that we have to stop making the problem worse while we're trying to solve it. Exacerbating a crisis that we are trying desperately to fix is a brazen act of self-sabotage. That's why it beggars belief that Labour have not ruled out backing new coal and gas projects. Right now, there are 114 of these in the pipeline. And this includes projects like the Pilliga Narrabri coal seam gas project in my home state of New South Wales, Woodside Scarborough gas field, and what will likely be the world's dirtiest gas project, Santos's Barossa in the Northern Territory, which will add billions of tons of carbon emissions over the coming decades. On top of that, the Albanese government is opening up nearly 47,000 square kilometers of ocean waters to oil and gas exploration. These will erase any climate gains made by the emissions reduction target many, many times over. In fact, Labour's target would be blown out by just one of these. As climate expert Ketan Joshi puts it, 
Labour is, pour is pouring a full tanker of petrol onto the fire while spraying it with a plastic water pistol at a distance. So weak targets like this one are really a bit of a fig leaf. The real fight, the fight the Greens are going to throw everything at, is to keep coal and gas in the ground. This includes introducing a climate trigger in environmental laws, a strong safeguard mechanism, and ending fossil fuel subsidies. We will push for massive investment in publicly owned renewable energy. The harsh reality is this. We are in a climate emergency. We are facing an existential crisis. The planet and people all over the world are suffering. As I speak, about one third of my home country, Pakistan, is underwater because of monsoon rainfall estimated to have been 10 times more severe than usual. Melting glaciers are adding to these floods. You know, one third of Pakistan is an area roughly the size of the UK, from which 33 million people, more than the entire population of Australia, have been displaced. The UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, described this. The Pakistani people are facing a monsoon on steroids. The re relentless impact of an epochal of epochal levels of rain and flooding, and then called on the world to stop sleepwalking towards the destruction of our planet by climate change. In this country, we are sleepwalking. This is the climate emergency Labour is making worse every time it approves a new coal or gas project. Meanwhile, China is coming out of the longest and hottest heat wave it has ever recorded. For more than 70 days straight this year, nearly a billion people suffered through a heat wave that saw sustained daily temperatures above 40 degrees. This is the climate emergency Labour is making worse every time it opens up a new coal and gas project. The Horn of Africa has seen the worst drought in 40 years, which has killed millions of livestock, destroyed crops and forced 1.1 million people from their homes in search of food and water. 22 million people are at risk of starvation, according to the UN's World Food Program. This is the climate emergency. Labor is making worse every time it opens up a new coal and gas project. And of course, there are our neighbors, the Pacific Islands nations, for whom the climate emergency is a daily lived reality and has been for some years. Some, such as the low-lying atoll nations of Kiribati and the Marshall Islands, are only six feet above sea level. I mean, water is literally lapping at their doorstep. Many of the Pacific Island nations, which are amongst the lowest emitters on the planet, face intense cyclones, changing rainfall patterns, coral bleaching, ocean acidification, and coastal inundation as a result of the climate crisis. This crisis is global, and the decisions that we make here have global consequences. Right-wing commentators love to claim that Australia's contribution to global climate change is small in the grand scheme of things. But we emit far more than our fair share and are one of the largest exporters of fossil fuels in the world. If we export our emissions overseas, that doesn't mean that they're not contributing to the climate crisis. We are also far more able than most countries to manage the costs of moving away from fossil fuels because of our wealth and bountiful access to sun, wind, and water. Rich countries of the global north, like Australia, bear the overwhelming responsibility for climate change. The climate crisis is essentially something rich countries are doing to poor countries. The Greens believe global justice must be at the forefront of tackling the climate crisis. Human rights need to be at the forefront of tackling the climate crisis. Decolonizing needs to be at the forefront of tackling the climate crisis. Indigenous sovereignty needs to be at the forefront of tackling the climate crisis. And that means listening to First Nations people who don't want the destruction of their land, their water, their air, and their culture in Beetaloo, Scarborough, Pilagan Arabri, and anywhere 
for that matter. After a decade of climate stupor by the Liberal and National governments, this bill does represent some progress. It is a small step in the right direction. But after a decade of coalition ruin, Australia is in such a state of despair when it comes to climate that even the smallest step is quite notable. But it's not near enough the solution that we need. No government should be let off the hook on climate action. It's vital that the media, activists, NGOs, and the community at large not let the Labour government rest till we see real climate action. Without strong action, we are still hurtling towards climate disaster. Without urgent action, we are robbing the futures of young people all over the world. The planet is cooking, and it is cooking fast. That's what's happening. So this is an emergency. We need a response that matches the scale of this crisis. We need urgent action. We need decisive action. We need strong action. We need an end to all new coal and gas. We need to stop killing the planet and its people. We need climate justice, and we need it now. Senator Billick. Thank you very much. The Climate Change Bill and the Climate Change Consequential Amendment Bill were the first bills that the Albanese Labor government introduced into parliament, and there's a reason for this. It helps us send a strong message that we acknowledge that climate change is a major threat and one that needs to be dealt with urgently. It's a threat to our prosperity, our safety, our national security and our way of life. The likelihood of it threatening the very survival of the human species is enough that we cannot afford to deny action. Even the climate change impacts we are seeing in Australia right now are disastrous enough to warrant urgent action. There has been a dramatic increase in extreme weather events such as heat waves, floods and wildfires, with the consequent loss of property, livelihoods and even lives. To give you a picture of the impact of climate change on Australia so far, Nine out of ten of the hottest days on record in Australia were experienced since 2005. During January and February 2009, a period which overlapped with the devastating Black Saturday bushfires, 374 excess deaths were recorded in Victoria due to heat-related illness. The 2018 fire season began in winter, while the 2019 bushfires created air pollution in areas such as New South Wales, 11 times the hazardous level. The disastrous 2019-20 bushfire season caused around $80 billion of damage across Australia and burnt somewhere between 3 and 4 per cent of our land mass. This year's floods in Queensland and New South Wales have led to almost $5 billion in damage and have killed 22 people. The world has warmed by 1.1 degrees since 1880, and as it continues to warm, we will see a loss of biodiversity and an increase in extreme weather events. Not only do these extremes threaten people's safety and property, but we're also likely to see the increased spread of infectious diseases as changes in climate force the migration of species to new areas. Climate change has also exacerbated the severity of drought, putting pressure on agricultural production. Australia has always been a vast, rugged country, subject to weather extremes, but what's been happening in the past two decades is something entirely different. This is not normal. Australians see these impacts and they suffer from them, which is why increasing numbers of Australians keep calling for real action on climate change. Sadly, the time spent in office by the previous government was a wasted opportunity for climate change action. Every year that went by was a year of delay, denial and inaction. Among the Liberals and Nationals, we heard a variety of views on climate change while they were in government. They could not move forward because they remain hopelessly divided on the issue. Among the ranks of the coalition were the outright deniers, ranging from those who refused to believe changes in climate were influenced by human activity through to the even more bizarre view 
that the climate was not changing and government agencies were deliberately falsifying data. Those in the coalition who accepted the evidence that human activity is responsible for the extreme weather events we see offered an array of excuses for refusing to act. Some suggested that Australia should not be taking action to cut its emissions until other countries make stronger commitments. Despite the fact that Australia has the highest emission in the world on a per capita basis. Others talked about the size of Australia's contribution to global emissions. But the question of Australia taking action is not just about our emissions. It's the example we set to the rest of the world, particularly the countries with the highest overall emissions. For years we've been seen as a pariah. We need to do our share of the heavy lifting if we're going to encourage others to do the same. Even when the previous government accepted that climate change was real, their actions failed to match their words. We saw policies advanced under the pretense of action. For example, the backbone of the coalition's policy for many years was the Emissions Reductions Fund, which wasted hundreds of millions of dollars on projects that did not deliver real cuts to emissions. Another great example was the so-called Net Zero by 2050 blueprint, which relied on a series of costly, unproven and underdeveloped te technologies to do the bulk of the heavy lifting. A policy that makes heavy cuts to Australians' emissions has to rely on the renewable energies that we know are cost-effective and work at scale, and they are wind and solar with backup battery storage. But those opposite have shown contempt for renewable energy. They tried to abolish the Clean Energy Finance Corporation under the guise of cutting red tape, even though the agency was making a profit. They also tried to abolish the Australian Renewable Energy Agency, and when they failed at that, they tried to get ARENA in to invest in fossil fuel and carbon capture and storage projects. And they even proposed underwriting coal power generation to the tune of billions of dollars. It's incredible that the previous government had such a pathological hatred of renewable energy that they opposed it, even when it made fiscal and economic sense without reference to emissions. The legislation sends an interim target of a 43 per cent cut in emissions by 2030. And we know we can achieve a 43 per cent cut because it's the outcome predicted by the modelling of our climate change policies. Reaching this target will get Australia well on the way to our ultimate target, also enshrined in these bills, of net zero emission by 2050. The 43 per cent target, mind you, is a floor, not a ceiling. We can be more ambitious if the circumstances call for it. In addition to these two emissions reductions targets, the bill now before the Senate will provide for an annual statement to parliament from the minister responsible for climate change. The statement will include an update on Australia's progress towards meeting our emissions targets. The bills will also restore the Climate Change Authority to provide independent expert advice to the minister on, an, on the annual statement and to provide advice on any new or updated emission reduction targets to be communicated to the UN under the Paris Agreement. I was pleased to have the opportunity to participate in the Senate inquiry into these bills and to hear from representatives of business, academia, environmental organisations, unions, think tanks, welfare groups. The list goes on. Overwhelmingly, those who contributed to the inquiry via written submissions um, and addressing our public hearings were in favour of the objectives and provisions of the bill, with only a small minority opposed to them. These bills are just the foundation for our climate change action. We will get to work on our other plans, which include rewiring the nation, an enhanced safeguard mechanism and Australia's first ever electric vehicle strategy. Rewiring the nation will get us to 82 per cent renewables by 2030 and will put downward pressure on power prices for Australian households. It's sad that against the weight of public opinion, the opposition would oppose those bills. They remain stuck in the past on this issue, their heads firmly planted in the sand. After their almost a decade of delay, denial and inaction, they have finally had an opportunity to end the climate wars for the good of all Australians, but they rejected it. 
Incredibly, they are even going against the wishes of the business community who they purport to represent. But we are not deterred. We know that the overwhelming majority of Australians want climate change action. We will legislate these targets and we will make a meaningful contribution to global action under the framework of the Paris Agreement, because Labor is getting on with the job. Senator Scar. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy President. I rise to speak in relation to the two bills before the Senate this evening. Uh, in doing so, I might address a few preliminary comments, if I could. Um, first, uh, in reference to Senator Faruqi's speech, uh, can I just, uh, with indulgence, give my sympathies and thoughts uh, to the Pakistan diaspora uh, in Australia, who no doubt are uh, suffering seeing what is happening in Pakistan at the moment with respect to the devastating floods that are occurring in Pakistan. And my thoughts and prayers uh, with you, uh, as I'm sure the thoughts and prayers of everyone in this place uh, is with them. And I do hope the Australian government can lift its game in terms of providing assistance to the people of Pakistan. I simply don't believe we've done enough in that regard. The second point I'd like to make in relation to the debate is just in relation to gas. And it is one of the touch points in this debate. And uh, whilst the Greens and Labor will be both supporting the legislation, the, there is a material difference between their positions with respect to gas in particular and the approval of future gas projects. And I just wanted to put um, a number of observations on the record with respect to the importance of gas. Uh, for the foreseeable future. I note this, that with respect to what is happening following Russia's invasion of Ukraine, Germany at the moment is going as fast as it possibly can in terms of uh, constructing LNG uh, terminals to allow them to export uh, additional LNG uh, imports. Uh, they've just recently a company called EMBW Energy, a major uh, German power producer, has entered into a 20-year contract commencing in 2026. So this is 2026 to 2046 to purchase an immense amount, an immense amount of LNG from the United States. Second point I'd make with respect to the imports of gas: if one looks at a company like POSCO in South Korea and its recent investment in a great, great Queensland company called Senex. Uh, again, you can see that our near uh, neighbours in North Asia are absolutely focused on securing their LNG supplies and are investing in Australian companies in order to secure those supplies on a long-term basis. And I should say POSCO at the same time is investing an immense amount of money, capital, in relation to hydrogen. Uh, third reflection in relation to gas. Japan uh, is again looking at uh, increasing its LNG imports and is also, I should note, uh, reconsidering its position with respect to nuclear energy, uh, given its energy constraints. So there you have a number of our major trading partners, all of whom recognise uh, the issues relating to climate change, all of them recognising those issues, who are each and every one of them searching the world searching the world for LNG uh, in order to assist them meet their energy requirements and deal with climate change issues. So that should be recognised and it should be put on the record. The Senate is a House of Review, Mr Deputy President, and I know that you know that very well and indeed you have experience uh, in, a, in another uh, place's uh, upper house which uh, presumably has a similar uh, perspective. And I think uh, can I commend everyone who participated in relation to the committee report that was prepared in relation to this legislation? I've read it very carefully. And there are 10 points I'd like to make in relation to the committee report in relation to these bills, which are considered by the coalition senators who served on that committee. The first is there was insufficient consultation with respect to this legislation. There was insufficient consultation. And in, in a situation, in a situation whereby the government's own admission this legislation is not necessary, it is absolutely gobsmacking 
that they haven't engaged in sufficient consultation with respect to this legislation. So, to give you a number of examples, the Australian Forest Products Association has raised concerns with respect to the legislation, with respect to the lack of consultation. The Department of Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry was not consulted in relation to the legislation, which is just baffling. And in addition to that, if one looks at paragraph 1.13 of the dissenting report of the coalition senators, and I quote, these concerns are bolstered by evidence from the Department of Climate Change Energy, the Environment and Water and the Department of Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry, admitting that they have done no modelling no modelling on the impacts of the Climate Change Bill 2022 and the Climate Change Consequential Amendments Bill 2022 on rural and regional Australia. I mean, that is just astounding that the relevant departments, including the Department of Climate Change, has done no modelling with respect to the impact of this legislation on rural and regional Australia. How can that be? How can that be? And in this place, I represent the great state of Queensland, as does my uh, friend uh, Senator James McGrath, who's in the chamber this evening. And we represent the people of rural and regional Queensland. We represent the people of rural and regional Queensland. We do so proudly. And to see a situation where this government is putting forward legislation where the Department of Climate Change hasn't done any modelling to consider the impact of this legislation on rural and regional Queensland is just unacceptable. It is unacceptable. Second point I'd like to make is that there has been no credible pathway thus far presented with respect to how the government is going to achieve its plan of firm, and I emphasise that point, firm 82 per cent renewables by 2030. We simply don't have a credible plan with respect to how the government is going to achieve that goal. And I don't think it's too much to ask that, just as the previous government did prepare a credible plan with respect to the goal of net zero by 2050, for the government to provide a convincing plan with respect to achieving their nominated goal of 82 per cent renewables by 2030. Secondly, thirdly, I should say, there's no assessment of the economic cost of higher power bills that will flow from this policy. Be honest with the Australian people. Be honest. Do the work. Tell us how much their electricity is going to cost. Do the work before you come to this place and introduce a bill such as this. The fourth point, lawfare, something we're very, very familiar with in the state of Queensland in relation to actions being taken by non-government organisations. The concern has been raised that there will be unintended consequences from this legislation in relation to NGOs, in particular environmentally focused NGOs, bringing legal action on the basis of this legislation to stop development on a piecemeal basis. On a piecemeal basis. And an example of that in the overseas context is the action that was taken by an organisation called Plan B against the expansion of Heathrow Airport. And that legal action went through a number of levels of the UK court system. And in fact, they tried to refer the uh, legal action to the European Court of Human Rights, I think it was, uh, when they were unsuccessful before the United Kingdom Supreme Court. All of this causes cost, all of this causes delay, and it's done on a piecemeal basis, not, not on the basis of an overall overarching strategy and plan. And I refer those who are listening to this debate to one, paragraph 1.27 of the Coalition Senators' dissenting report, where they state, and I quote, environmental groups which provided evidence to the committee refused to rule out using this legislation to challenge agriculture, primary producing infrastructure, energy resources or forestry projects." End quote. So the actual NGOs who would potentially use this legislation in order to engage in this lawfare, notwithstanding the fact that the government says nothing to see here, it, it, you don't have to worry about it, the actual NGOs who are the ones that society should be concerned about in terms of undertaking this piecemeal lawfare activity, they're not ruling it out. They're not ruling it out. In fact, when given the opportunity to rule it out, they specifically don't do so. They specifically don't do so. And when one of my colleagues raised that earlier this evening in the debate, a number of the Green senators—I don't think the leader of the Greens was in the, in the chamber at the time—actually applauded 
and clapped and said, no, fantastic, fantastic. So we're concerned about those unintended consequences and what it means to major infrastructure projects, major development projects which are needed by this country. The fifth point I'd like to raise is with respect to the change of the objectives and functions of a number of major Australian government agencies. And I'll give you the example of Infrastructure Australia. And again, I refer to paragraphs 1.43 and 1.44 of the Coalition Senators' dissenting reports. I quote, Coalition Senators are also gravely concerned that Infrastructure Australia could not explain the consequences of the bills on their own decision making. They couldn't, they couldn't explain how the bill would impact their own decision making. I continue the quote. The agency could not explain how they would weigh the emissions of applicant projects versus the job creation opportunities. When asked repeatedly how this legislation would alter Infrastructure Australia's decision making, officials stated, quote, we're still determining that and we are receiving advice on it at the moment, end quote. Well, prior to this legislation coming to this place, perhaps that should have been determined. Perhaps we should have been in a position to understand, in practice, in practice, moving away from the, the written word in the Act, but the practice of application. How is Infrastructure Australia going to practically implement the changes put forward in this legislation? We do not have the answer. We don't have the answer. The sixth point I'd like to raise in terms of I've got ten Senator Ayres. I've got ten. I've got ten. It's got to be an even number. The sixth point I raise is in relation to the possible impact on regional communities. Again, I quote from paragraph 1.52 of the Coalition Senators' dissenting report. The Department of Climate Change, Energy, Environment and Water has admitted it has not undertaken any modelling on how these bills will impact regional and rural Australia. End quote. No modelling on the impact on rural and regional Australia. And I know my friend Senator Ayres comes from regional New South Wales. And they haven't actually. They haven't actually. Um, I don't need four minutes even. Um, they haven't actually considered the impact on regional Australia, in terms of their, in terms of their consideration of this legislation. The seventh point: we're concerned about the impact on the agricultural production of this country. Senator Faruqi rightly referred to the devastating famine that's occurring in the Horn of Africa at the moment, in, in Somalia. And again, I extend my um, consideration and concern to our great Somali diaspora in, uh, in Queensland. They're going through a devastating famine, and again, Australia should do all we can to help uh, that region of Africa. I quote paragraph 1.56, the committee heard testimony that farmers are already troubled by the land already locked up by governments, end quote. Are we going to see a situation where, in order to achieve net zero, that major industrial players more and more seize, take, purchase through the market our prime agricultural land, and our prime agricultural land gets locked up, and that has a negative impact in terms of food production. I don't know the answer to that. Point eight. The legislation removes the Productivity Commission's five-year review into the socio-economic impacts of our nationally determined contribution and how it may potentially disproportionately affect rural and regional communities. Why would, you, why, would you possibly, why would you possibly remove the Productivity Commission's obligation, its function, to actually review the impact, in particular the socio-economic impacts, of this policy in practice? Why would you remove the Productivity Commission's purpose in that regard? I simply don't understand it. I don't understand it. Point nine. What will be the economic cost of higher power bills on Australians? What will be the impact of higher power bills on Australians? I quote paragraph 1.75 the dissenting report for Australians under constant cost of living pressures, any rise in power bills will have a detrimental impact on their lives. End quote. What is going to happen to power prices? Tell us. Tell us before you introduce this bill. Tell us what will happen to power prices. And my last point, point 10, nuclear. Nuclear energy. We are seeing, as I mentioned earlier in the speech, that Japan is moving back towards reconsidering nuclear. If we're going to adopt this focus in relation to 
replacing our fossil fuels, we need to look at base power stable energy production. We need to be considering nuclear, and it's irresponsible for us not to consider nuclear. And yet, again, this isn't dealt with in terms of this legislation. So on that basis, Madam Acting Deputy President, I will not be, I will not be supporting these bills. And I do note um, in relation to this very important matter that uh, there aren't many present in the chamber at this moment, uh, and I do call your attention to the state of the chamber. Quorum. Um, a quorum is required. Ring the bells for four minutes. Nineteen. My age. Mine. I overrule you. Oh. I think that's what he really said. present. Very glamorous. Senator Fawcett, um, you have the call. <laughs> well, thank you, uh, Madam Deputy President. I, too, rise to make some comments on the Climate Change Bill of 2022 and the consequential amendments. It's important to note up front, as some of my colleagues have, that the nationally determined contribution to the Paris uh, has already been advised by the government to the Paris Agreement Secretariat on the 22nd of June this year, and that Labor, with the support of the Greens, uh, will have the numbers to pass this legislation, so that itself is not in doubt. What I would like to do, though, is go to clause number three, which is the objects of the bill, and the objects state that the bill is to add to an effective global response informed by science. Now, for those of you who have read my speech, and I trust that's all of you here, uh, you'll know that I have tertiary qualifications in science and that in my maiden speech I emphasise the fact that I'm a great believer in evidence-based policy that is effective in addressing the problem at hand and that does not have unintended consequences. Also, having worked for much of my career as an experimental test pilot uh, in the technical world of aerospace, which is underpinned by systems engineering, I recognise the need to scrutinise the basis and the assumptions of the science that underpin a design, or in this case, legislation. So, According to the explanatory memorandum, this bill and the consequential amendments are informed by the consultation which led to Labor's Powering Australia plan. Now, that consultation and the analysis of the plan's impact by the consulting firm Reputex has been informed in large part by studies such as the GenCost report, which have been produced by the CSIRO and AEMO, being the energy market operator. Now, reading GenCost in detail, I note that they appropriately refer to stakeholders who are responsible for global best practice regarding the science and economics of energy, 
In particular, reports by the International Energy Agency, the IEA, and the Organisation for Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD's Nuclear Energy Agency, the NEA. So as an example as to why scrutiny is useful, I'm concerned that while GenCost report reflects the major themes reported by IEA and OECD, for example, such as the need to move beyond the simple metric of the levelised cost of electricity when comparing technology options, some references used in the GenCost report to underpin their cost assumptions are seriously outdated, as in we are talking back to the last century when more recent information from these same independent expert bodies is available. I'm also concerned that some key observations of the GenCost report questioning the ability of wind and solar to get us to net zero are omitted in the ALP plan and subsequent analysis. So the question has to be, has the plan of the Albanese government been based on the most recent and complete science available? Will it be effective in achieving its stated aims. So what does the latest credible science say about the best way to provide abundantly and cheap electricity while reducing emissions? Well, in April this year, the OECD NEA, which is quoted by Jen Cost and recognised as a global expert, released their latest report on meeting climate change targets. It's an authoritative assessment of the key issues relating to energy policy and creating sustainable, low-carbon economies. Now, much of the OECD report covers familiar ground regarding their view as to why global action is required urgently. There are major elements of the report, however, that challenge the Australian government's stated approach to reducing emissions. And at the heart of these elements are three statements. And I quote first. Decarbonising the electricity sector in a cost-effective manner while maintaining high levels of electricity security requires policymakers to recognise and equitably allocate systems costs to the required responsible technologies. Second, while all technologies impose some systems costs, variable, intermittent and uncertain sources of power generation impose far greater grid-level systems cost, which is why it is so important to take a systems-level perspective when preparing, pre comparing costs of variable renewables with nuclear, baseload hydro and fossil generation. And the third statement from the OECD report was that all low-carbon technologies, including nuclear energy, must be included in the relevant discussions about the energy transition in order to maintain the integrity and the evidence base of the policy dialogue." End quote. The report also considered the impact of emissions constraints for the different technologies. Now, the Albanese Powering Australia plan looks to achieve 82 per cent market penetration of renewables by 2030. But figure 20 in the OECD report shows the breakdown of systems costs as the share of variable renewables grows from 10 to 75 per cent of the mix. And it includes profile costs, which are to compensate for variability and intermittency, connection, distribution and transmission costs, and balancing costs, which are to compensate for uncertainty, and it shows the effects on those total costs as carbon emissions are increasingly constrained. Now, if that sounds complex, that's because it is, and this is classic systems engineering. But to quote the OECD's comment at the end of this analysis, I quote, the policy implications of these systems costs findings are significant. It may be possible to reduce emissions to meet 2030 targets by growing the share of variable renewables in the mix. However, the costs of reaching net zero with high shares of variable renewables are likely prohibitive." End quote. That recent statement by a stakeholder regarded by the CSIRO and AEMO to be a global expert on energy is very different to the predominant political narrative. This OECD report changes the debate because it shows that the most recent credible science demonstrate that the approach proposed in the Albanese plan will not be effective in achieving the stated aim of the policy. As well as the financial cost, the OECD report also considers other costs. First, they consider the environmental impacts of grid-scale generation options, and for wind and solar as primary sources, 
They include measures required for firming. The variation, for example, in the requirement for critical minerals is surprisingly large. There's a minimal impact in the order of nuclear power with around 15 kilograms per megawatt hour. But that rises exponentially to 155 kilograms per megawatt hour for solar PV or 180 kilograms per megawatt hour for onshore wind. The report demonstrates that as the percentage of variable renewable generation and associated firming in a grid increases, the volume of mineral extraction and pro processing required becomes immense. And this takes on a new relevance when the IEA also report, and I quote, that looking further ahead in a scenario consistent with climate goals, expected supply from existing mines and projects under construction is estimated to meet only half of the projected lithium and cobalt requirements and 80 per cent of copper needs by 2030. And it's not just a case of constraints in digging those critical minerals up. People often overlook the high energy demands that are required to actually produce the usable critical minerals. The OECD report also considers other costs, including land, environment and social impacts. And so as an example, the Albanese plan requires spending $20 billion to upgrade the electricity grid to connect more renewables. The capital cost is one consideration, but take, for example, the 10,000 kilometres of new transmission lines as recommended in AEMO's 2022 Integrated Systems Plan. Using data from Infrastructure Australia, you can obtain figures on the steel and concrete necessary for high voltage transmission lines. Even being conservative and using the midpoint figures, it shows that 46 tonnes of steel and 71 cubic metres of concrete are required for every kilometre of new transmission. And that means that three quarters of a million tonnes of iron ore have to be mined and then smelted with all the associated energy and emissions. And to make that much concrete, 180,000 tonnes of cement is required. And bear in mind that a single tonne of cement requires around 4.7 million BTU of energy, which is equivalent to about 180 kilograms of coal and generates nearly a tonne of CO2. So just meeting AEMO's 2022 plan uh, will result in an additional 180,000 tonnes of emissions. The OECD report highlights that for all these reasons, despite the rhetoric, renewable energy is not free, nor is it even the cheapest option available, nor is it effective in achieving net zero. The OECD report details that there is an affordable, safe technology to complement renewable power and which acts as an essential element to constraining emissions while retaining reliable, affordable power. The best science that's currently available, which is contained in the OECD NEA report, shows that despite ideological positions to the contrary, one, all credible models, e.g. the 90 IPCC pathways to limit warming to 1.5 degree, demonstrate that nuclear energy is required to affect climate change mitigation by 2050. Two, that the levelised cost per megawatt hour of electricity from long-term operation of nuclear generators is actually lower than fossil fuels hydro, wind and solar, and that new build nuclear is competitive with wind and solar now, and it will be cheaper when systems costs are attributed as emissions constraints are imposed. And three, that recent developments prove that nuclear energy can be a low carbon technology with rapid delivery times. Evidence to the 2019 inquiry by the House Committee on Environment and Energy showed that the integrity and evidence base of the policy dialogue in Australia has not been maintained, with AEMO and CSIRO detailing the impact of the legislative prohibition on even considering nuclear power. Now, that prohibition is not related to science or safety or cost or efficacy. The prohibition resulted from trade-offs with minor parties in the Senate over 20 years ago and is predominantly given effect through Section 10 of the Radiation Protection and Nuclear Safety Act of 98 and Section 140A1B of the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Act. The energy emissions policy has a significant effect on Australia's economic and national security, job security and quality of life, and the consequences of getting it wrong can almost be existential, as we see currently in Europe, which is suffering geostrategic paralysis and crippling growth in power costs because of poor energy policy. The prohibition in the EPPC Act must be repealed to allow Australia to engage 
on the International Atomic Energy Agency milestone process to have an evidence-based consideration as to whether the nuclear option is indeed the most reasonable path for Australia to pursue in combination with wind and solar and hydrogen and other partial solutions to Australia's energy mix. It's important to recognise that nuclear is not a standalone solution, and in Europe it's currently working with solar and wind to load follow and to provide firming for when renewables are not able to produce power. Any consideration of value must also recognise the other industrial uses for nuclear energy, such as the production of green hydrogen for desalination and for energy-intensive products such as fertiliser and cement. In summary, the most recent science from recognised global experts refutes the assumptions underpinning the Albanese government's plan that increased investment in variable renewables will deliver abundant cheap power while reducing emissions to net zero. The science highlights that there is a solution, but the point is we will never know what is possible and effective for Australia unless the prohibition on nuclear power generation is lifted. Australians should demand effective policy that is transparently based on all available evidence. And this will only be possible if the government acts to repeal the outdated, ideologically driven barriers to evaluating the option of nuclear power generation. If Australia is serious about achieving net zero while still having affordable, reliable power with minimal impact on our people and our land, our focus should be more on targeting legislation than legislating targets. Thank you, Senator. Senator Shoebridge, you have the call. Yes. So we finally get a climate change bill into this parliament, and there's only one reason why. At the last election, the mood for change for climate action and integrity was, elect was electric. And I stand here today as part of a proud 16-strong uh, Green team delivered as part of that movement for change at the last election. And in just the last two years, people have lived through the black summer bushfires. They've lived through repeated catastrophic floods. And they're seeing the world suffering through the real impacts of the climate catastrophe in real time, and all while we're only at 1.2 degrees or less of warming. And now they are demanding action. We have for too long had governments who let corporations dictate the speed of climate action. And we've lost decades with policy drift and fossil fuel greed failing to take the opportunities of innovation and forward thinking and invest in that safe and livable future. But unfortunately, in an economic system, an economic and political system based on endless growth and the myth of limitless extraction and consumption, this will not happen without far greater leadership than this bill shows. And instead of leadership, instead of the action needed, to, ma to map out that safe future, we get this bill, Labor's compromise bill, which if you had to give a mark out of 100, you'd give 43 per cent. A bill that is striking for failing to deliver on even Labor's 45 per cent target that it took to the election in 2019, let alone the 75 per cent reduction by 2030 that all the science is telling us. And this is a part of compromise that we've seen from Labor, trying to have it both ways, to be making sounds and noise on climate, but while really delivering for the fossil fuel donors and the corporate interests that ruled this place in the last parliament. The problem is you can't compromise on climate. You can't compromise on physics or cut a political deal with a law of nature. A bill that seeks to compromise on climate can't be anything but a very, very modest starting point. The very first slow step on a much longer path that we need to be running down. And on that path must be the refusal of the 114 new coal and gas proposals currently in the pipeline and a commitment, rock solid and in law, that we will keep all coal and gas in the ground. Because without decisive action on that, this bill will utterly fail to deliver even its very, very modest goals. You can't put out the fire when you're pouring petrol on it. And while we're debating this bill, as we've been watching this bill grind its way through Parliament, 
In my home state of New South Wales, the Independent Planning Commission has just approved an extension to the Mount Pleasant coal mine to extend its operations up until 2048, with a likely impact of something in the order of a billion tonnes of CO2. That will be pumping out coal and greenhouse gases for 18 years after this bill's 2030 target. And you don't need to be a mathematician to recognise that pretending to take climate action by 2030 with this bill and simultaneously allowing the approval of a mega mine to operate until 2048 are grossly inconsistent. When the environment is being destroyed like this, the messages you hear come from activists, come from students, come from people who care about their future, their kids' future, their grandkids' future, but they also come powerfully from First Nations communities. And I'd like to read on the following words from a man I've worked with for many years, Scott Franks of the Plain Clans of the Wanara people. And he sent this message this week about this appalling coal mine approval, just the one, the one of so many on Wanara lands, his family's lands, his lands that he has been trying to protect. And he said this, this mine has one of the largest concentrations of Aboriginal recorded sites on it in the Hunter Valley, including a recorded mythological site. The concentration of sites has not happened by chance, but it's the result of over 30 operational open cut coal mines in the Hunter Valley. Currently, the coal mining operations in the Hunter Valley have had a significant impact on Wanara heritage, and as Wanara people have only 3 per cent of our country left intact. And as Scott has told me on so many occasions about this mine and about other mines, the idea that the conditions we see in this week's IPC, Independent Planning Commission approval, talking about monitoring and mitigating the impacts on Aboriginal lands and monitoring greenhouse emissions. They're all gumph. They're all gumph. That the idea that any of that is a safeguard for land or water or culture or climate is plain preposterous. It's a joke, and, and we're calling it out for what it is. So, yes, let's pass this bill with the improvements that have been negotiated through the hard work of climate activists, and, and, I, and I particularly pay tribute to our colleague Adam Bant, our Greens leader, for the hard work he and his team, team did in negotiating improvements, putting in a genuine flaw, putting in greater transparency, making the bill better. But we acknowledge that this is nowhere near we, where this parliament needs to be on climate. So let's do it, because it shows we can at least take one step away from the climate vandalism of the former coalition government, and let's take some strength from that. But then let's get on with the real work needed, and that's the work to permanently keep coal and gas in the ground. And Acting Deputy President, I, I move the amendment on sheet 1615 circulated by, and I do it on behalf of, Senator Wish Wilson. Senator McKim. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Well, this is a mediocre piece of legislation. It's one that doesn't come close to reflecting what climate science is telling us, and it falls even further short of reflecting reality. And it's the reality, it's the truth of what is happening on our planet that I want to talk about tonight. And here is the reality. Here is the truth. The planet's capacity to sustain human life is crumbling away. The ecosystem, that beautiful, complex web of life that sustains everything about this planet and makes our planet so much more than just a ball of rock orbiting a star is crumbling away. Oh, we are losing the very essence of this planet and it is happening 
because of what one species, human beings, have done and are doing. And it's this collapse, this crumble of uh, our ecosystems and the planet's capacity to sustain life is being caused by a relatively small group of people. They're so, they are genuine psychopaths, the people that are doing this. They are relentlessly pursuing profit at the expense of the very lives of billions of people, let alone all of the other species who are suffering and in so many cases are facing extinction. And those psychopaths are the people running the big polluting corporations, the fossil fuel corporations, the logging and land clearing corporations, those big emitting polluters who've got their blinkers on and are lining their filthy pockets with these rivers of gold at the expense of the very lives of some of the poorest, most vulnerable people on the planet. And it's those people, the poor and the vulnerable, almost overwhelmingly the brown-skinned and black-skinned people on this planet who are going to pay the price for the things that the overwhelmingly white male psychopaths have done and are doing. So that's the truth. That's the context in which we debate this bill today. And I want to make the point that this bill obviously, self-evidently, has not yet passed the parliament and Labor has already started undermining it. I mean, just this week we had the Prime Minister get up at a dinner hosted by the Mineral Council of Australia, the peak body of the big psychopathic emitters in this country and assure them that they could basically keep on exporting fossil fuels indefinitely. I bet he got a good round of applause from the merchants of death in the Minerals Council. I bet he did. And you know why they'd be so happy? Because their ROI, their return on investment for their political donations, that is the best investment they ever made. Because it's not just the CEOs of the big emitters who are psychopathic. There are psychopaths in this place, and I use that term advisedly, and they are the shills in this place, those who shill for the big corporate emitters. You know who you are. You are psychopaths because you are putting your own political well-being, or at least what you perceive it to be in the short term, ahead of the very lives potentially of billions of people this century who are facing death, who are facing starvation, who are facing di dying of thirst, who are facing dislocation as a result of your greed and your self-interest. That is what is happening as we debate this bill. So these big emitters, time and time again, they make it clear that they want to continue opening new coal, new gas, new oil. They want to continue clear felling our precious, beautiful, carbon-rich native forests, despite those actions being contrary to every single piece of legitimate climate science that we know as humans. And what we get from a lot of the media in this place when they report on Labor's climate position is actually a projection of what they wish the Labor Party was, rather than an accurate reflection of what the Labor Party actually is. And that is a massive problem in our public conversation in this country that so much of what happens is filtered through centrists and incrementalists 
in our press gallery. And why is that the case? Because far too many journalists are more interested in maintaining access to power than they are in reporting the truth. And they'll continue to peddle the lie that close enough is good enough when it comes to our climate. Because if they call the Labor Party out for what this bill represents, mediocrity at best, they'll get a few less contexts, uh, uh, they'll get uh, a few less invitations, a few less texts uh, out of the cabinet uh, meetings or out of uh, the Labor Party caucus, a few less drops from Labor ministers. And I want to be really clear about one thing about this bill and this debate. Contrary to what the Prime Minister would have us believe, this is by no means the end of the climate wars. This is by no means the end of the climate wars, because the climate war is not some cosy little uh, dinner club conversation. The climate war is not some little political tease in this place. The climate wars, and they will escalate into the future, mark my words, the climate wars are being fought in our communities. They're being fought on the fossil fuel infrastructure. They are being fought in our native forests. They are being fought by people who are standing up and uh, strength to their collective arms, I say, standing up for our future and for the future of our children and, the, and to give our children and our grandchildren the chance at the kind of opportunities in life that so many of us had and so many people in this place take for granted. The climate war is not some little chat between the backroom operators of the Labor Party and a handful of press gallery minions. It is actually and literally a fight for the future of humanity and for this planet's capacity to sustain life. That is what the climate war is about, and that is why it will continue to get more and more serious as time goes by. And that is why I will, why I will be fighting it until the day I draw my last breath on this planet. And you know what? They can put me on the compost heap when I'm finished. I'll keep on fighting it. And um, uh, thank you, uh, Senator Shoebridge, indeed. And I want to. Uh, I do want to credit um, one of. Um, my actual heroes in life for, for first using that phrase. Uh, that was Peter Cundall, one of the greatest leftists this country has ever seen. Peter Cundall of Gardening Australia uh, fame. And he would be, uh, Vale Peter, he would be so proud to be described in this place as one of the greatest leftists this country has ever seen. And I'm absolutely certain uh, uh, in saying that. So, I'm going to pinch my nose and vote for this bill, but mark my words, the Greens are not going to settle for something that's simply better than nothing. We won't be settling for this. We will push Labor all the way, and we will push them in relation to their blind addiction to fossil fuels. We will push them in relation to their blind addiction to logging native forests in this country. And we'll do that because we are going to stand on the side of humanity, we're going to stand on the side of nature, we're going to stand on the side of environment, and we're going to stand against those psychopaths and the big corporations who profit from destruction, and we will stand against the political parties they have in their collective pockets. So to the centralists, the centrists and, and the incrementalists, who are not just in the press gallery but uh, unfortunately exist in some environment and climate groups in this country as well, um, I say this. Imagine if over the last few years you'd spent as much time cheering on the Greens as you did cheering on the Labor Party. Imagine over the last few years if you had spent as much time urging the Labor Party to increase its climate ambition as you spent urging the Greens to decrease our climate ambition. Just imagine how much better this legislation would be if you had taken those actions 
over the last few years, instead of crab walking into the centre and urging incrementalism on the body politic uh, in this country. Just imagine the kind of future you could have actually worked to achieve for your children and your grandchildren, and imagine the better life, the better world you could have helped build, and imagine the better legislation you could have helped craft if you'd taken those actions. But instead, you let mediocrity be the enemy of the good. I say to you all, do better next time. Right, Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. So it has come to this. The, the globalist 50-year long march through the institutions has come to this. 50 years of bribery, coercion and censorship of the few remaining honest scientists has come to this. And 50 years of inciting hatred and violence against anyone who opposes the climate change agenda, of fear-based control, has come to this. Our scientists, crony corporations, political parties and mouthpiece media have failed Australia. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I always speak up for what is right, and again today I will speak up for what is right. The Climate Change Bill 2022 seeks to exploit fear based on fraudulent science to enshrine in legislation the subjugation of everyday Australians. On many occasions, now I have sought to alert Australians to the nightmare our lives will become under net zero. Those many speeches, motions and bills have made little headway in mainstream media where dodgy journalists protect the interests of their advertisers and billionaire owners and ignore the truth. The public have been deceived into thinking that human activity is, causing, is, is what is causing natural events and that this bill is necessary to save Australia. Instead, the truth is Australia will need to be saved from this bill. This is not conjecture. There's ample evidence to support this position from overseas experience of the nightmare that results from acting on fake science and feelings instead of hard, costed data. Here's a quick summary. Firstly, greening the world and growing food. According to the NASA's Goddard Institute for Space Studies, one quarter of the increase in carbon dioxide in the last 30 years has been absorbed into plant life, leading, leading to an increase in forest cover. This demonstrates the fertiliser effect of carbon dioxide, or as it's known, CO2. Although climate catastrophists think we can control the level of carbon dioxide in Earth's atmosphere, Henry's law of chemistry, nature and empirical scientific evidence show we cannot and we do not. Let's assume, though, contrary to the science and nature, that we can. If it was possible for humans to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, it will reduce the health of native forests and vegetation. Reducing CO2 will reduce crop yields, remove food from the tables of the world's hungry, and require the increased use of chemical fertilisers that are made from natural gas. An irony lost on this bill's proponents. The world is finding out, as Sri Lanka has found, the trade-off here is between plant food and starvation. It's that simple. Forestation levels around the world have been rising since the 1980s because of the increase in CO2. Australia is currently gaining forests. Let me be clear for the disinformation media. Our continent is gaining trees, meaning the density of vegetation is improving thanks to carbon dioxide. We're losing extent, though. Much of it chopped down as part of so-called green energy construction, building wind turbines, solar plants, access roads and transmission easements to take unreliable energy from where these things are built to where the power is needed. 13,000 hectares of native vegetation is planned for destruction in North Queensland alone. I remember when greenies hugged trees, not chopped them down. Forests are being chopped down for biomass. Wood chips, can you believe it? Apparently wood chips are now renewable energy. Oh really, spruiked on the BBC back in 2018 when the Drax coal plant was converted to burn trees imported from America in the name of reducing carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Burning trees produces more carbon dioxide than coal, yet warmers never let the facts get in the way of their feelings. One Nation has always supported preserving our old growth forests because One Nation supports real environmentalism. Let's look at ocean health. According to NASA, one half of the increase in carbon dioxide over the last 30 years has been absorbed in the ocean carbon dioxide cycle. CO2 is sequestered in silt and in biological sinks. Seagrass, mangroves, tidal swamps and wetlands all sequester carbon dioxide and grow 
improving habitat for fish breeding. CO2 is a vital ingredient in phytoplankton, the start of the marine food chain, and we're at the top of that chain. The more carbon dioxide produced from all sources and then absorbed in the ocean carbon dioxide cycle, the more phytoplankton, leading to an increase in marine life. Healthier seafood density supports the continued harvesting of seafood as an affordable source of protein for people. The marine carbon dioxide cycle absorbs nitrogen and phosphates coming from natural and from man-made sources. Phytoplankton absorb these elements as part of their growth cycle, producing oxygen in the process. The less carbon dioxide available to be absorbed, the less oxygenation and the less healthy our oceans become. These are simple facts. If you understand nature and conservation, you'll understand this. Coral is calcium carbonate, CaCO3. Some of the CO2 sequestered in oceans has helped coral growth most likely contributing to the record coral cover across the Great Northern Great Barrier Reef announced just a few weeks ago. Another inconvenient truth. Let's look at the third point. Greening the earth mitigates temperatures. A new study reported on NASA's website shows increased vegetation during the current greening earth period, as NASA calls it. And that has a strong cooling effect on the land due to increased efficiency of water vapour transfer to the atmosphere. Without this, the world would be hotter. Instead, it is slightly cooler. Increasing carbon dioxide, plant food, fertilises our forests, increasing transpiration, leading to more water vapour transfer, which in turn cools the earth. Earth's history shows periods of increased temperature cause increased evaporation from oceans, and that water evaporation, water vapour transfer further cools the earth. We have a beautiful, self-correcting ecosystem that's maintained the Earth in a livable temperature range for millennia. Fact. This climate change bill is based on self-interest, arrogance and hubris and deceit, risking a natural ecosystem that will protect us from any variability in atmospheric gases and always has protected us. Next, renewable power is a fairy tale. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could get all our energy from the sun and wind for free? Oh yes, that is the extent though of the thought process in many Greens and Teal voters. Missing the obvious problem. Solar panels, wind turbines, transmission lines through the middle of nowhere, battery backups and access roads are not free. The direct loss of natural habitat from wind and solar is significantly greater than from any other form of power. Any other form of power. Four megawatts of wind or solar generation is needed to replace each one megawatt of coal, hydro and nuclear. To explain that with an example, the New South Wales government's own website on wind power mentions their 850 megawatts of wind turbine capacity generate just, wait for it, 1,941 gigawatt hours of power annually. 850 megawatts running 24-7, as with a coal or nuclear plant of that size, will generate 7,440 gigawatt hours per year. The actual wind turbine output of 1941 gigawatt hours represents just 26% of rated capacity for the wind turbines. What a joke these things are. And solar, far worse. So let's look at battery backup. The Australian energy market operator, AEMO, recently assessed the battery requirement for a net zero grid stability at 60 gigawatt hours. Power going into a battery loses 20% in resistance, meaning 72 gigawatt hours of generation will be needed to produce just 60 gigawatt hours of output. <coughs> now batteries cost 1.5 million dollars per megawatt hour, meaning batteries for short-term grid stability will require an investment in, in excess of $100 billion every 10 years, which is as long as these bloody things last. This is just the start. Germany experienced an 8 per cent reduction in output from wind and solar in the first half of 2021 owing to poor weather. No battery can keep the lights on during a sustained period of wet weather such as Australia has had these last two years. Blackouts will be normal. For those who want 2050 net zero, nuclear is the only way to do net zero. Other countries who descended into renewable hell ahead of us are being forced to rethink to save their economies. South Korea has given up and announced a move away from wind and solar to nuclear. Germany will extend their last three nuclear power plants until baseload power can be restored from gas. 
that produces carbon dioxide. Last week, the UK government announced a huge new 3,200 megawatt nuclear plant. Nuclear plants across the world will grow 26 per cent through to 2050. Australia can supply the world with reliable, safe coal for many lifetimes. Instead, the world is going nuclear simply because wind and solar cannot supply reliable baseload power and coal has been demonised. If this climate change bill passes, Australia will be forced to make this decision for nuclear power. Those who vote for this climate change bill, you are voting for nuclear power. Let's look at the insane power bills that will destroy the Australia we know. Last week in Britain, the household energy cap increased from $2160 to $60,020, tripled in just one year. And you're doing this. How can people afford that? We cannot. Commercial power has risen 600 per cent in one year—600 per cent. Widespread business closures are now likely. A glance at the graph of UK GDP shows that UK citizens are less wealthy now than back in 20, 2007. The correlation of GDP stagnation with the retirement of affordable baseload power and the switch to wind and solar is undeniable. German households are so desperate for heating, firewood is now being hoarded and wood chips are back in commercial use. Seriously, what's next? Is whale oil going to make a comeback? Despite $250 billion spent on solar and wind so far and $250 billion still to come, Germany is planning for blackouts next winter. 10 per cent of German industry is threatened with closure and 40 per cent is under financial pressure. No wonder Prime Minister Anthony Albanese is holding a job summit concurrent with the climate change bill. Here's one nation's submission to the job summit. Stop destroying affordable, reliable coal power. The mouthpiece media are blaming the war in Ukraine for the gas shortage in Europe, deliberately avoiding the real question. How did energy independent nations lose their energy independence and become reliant on Russian gas? Wind and solar did that. Is this empirical proof wind and solar are unable to sustain baseload power, or is it just stupidity in shutting down baseload power before replacements were built? The answer is both. With unrealistic and unnecessary timelines now embedded in the climate change bill, Australia is about to walk the same path that's brought the rest of the world, especially the UK and Germany and Texas, only misery. So let's look at cost. Wind and solar is only effective, cost effective to build and operate if the cost is offset with taxpayer subsidies. Australian subsidies for wind and solar currently total $13 billion every year. Reuters reported last week Australia will need about 40 times the total generation capacity of today's national electricity market to achieve that, achieve net zero. 40 times. This includes 1,900 gigawatts of solar, 174 gigawatts of wind. Not megawatts, gigawatts. How is that even possible? It's not. As a comparison, Liddell Coal Plant is 2 gigawatts and at full capacity can supply 5 per cent of our current energy needs. Charging electric vehicles is a large part of this huge increase in power generation needed to reach net zero. The $20 billion cost of rewiring, upgrading the national electric, natural electric energy grid to allow for the charging of electric cars dwarfs the total value of the national electricity market, which is only $11 billion in sales. What will that do to power prices? There is no costing in the climate change bill because the costings are coming out at insane amounts of money. So I have a second reading amendment to this bill to introduce a cost-benefit analysis for every government decision. Surely that is just prudent economic management. So blackouts. Last week, AEMO announced its latest 10-year outlook for the national electricity market, which warned of reliability gaps affecting New South Wales from 2025 and affecting Victoria, Queensland and South Australia from 2030. 2030. Gaps in this context mean structural blackouts, not enough generation to meet demand. Today, we know there will be blackouts in 2025 and even worse blackouts in 2030. What is the government's plan to stop the blackouts we know are coming due to coal plant closures? There's no plan because the climate change bill is not about increasing energy output. Its aim is forcing a reduction in energy consumption. They want us to use less energy. The climate change bill is about control. The only way to achieve any partial long-term stability under net zero is to use smart meters to restrict energy use. Germany and America have already started that rollout. The South Australian government has announced the rollout of smart meters. Smart meters allow the energy operator or government to go in and turn off any appliance in your home that's connected to the fuse box. Air conditioners, the hot water service, light and power circuits can be switched off remotely. This is not intended as an emergency measure. It will be normal under net zero. Big Brother will reach into your home and decide for you what appliances can use, you can use and when. In what used to be a free country, this is terrifying. To the Greens and Teal supporters who voted on the basis of feelings, not facts, I say, you have been deceived. The experience from countries ahead of us on the net zero slippery slope
has, been, has seen the destruction of small and medium business, the decimation of the middle class and intrusive government control. You will have less and elite billionaires will have more. We are paying for our own enslavement. It's time to vote against creating a world where native vegetation, crop yields, the marine environment, the entire biosphere, the beautiful biosphere, is being damaged through an absurd attempt to reduce carbon dioxide. Nature's essential trace gas, essential for all life on this planet. It's time to vote against a world where hunger and poverty will increase by design as a means of control. Have some decency. Vote against the Climate Change Bill 2022. Take a stand. We have one flag. We are one community. We are one nation. We are proud and grateful carbon-based life forms. We are proud and grateful carbon-based life forms. Uh, uh, Senator Roberts, you can foreshadow your second reading amendments. That's fine. Senator McKenzie. Thank you very much, Mr Acting Deputy President. And tonight I rise to contribute to the debate on the Climate Change Bill, a bill which legislates the Albanese Labor government's nationally determined contribution change uh, under the Paris Agreement of 43 um, per cent emission reductions by um, 2030. So, In their words, and uh, listening to the debate today, this bill is neither necessary, if you listen to some, or, as the Greens say, it's largely symbolic. So, just to be clear, this isn't a debate today in this chamber about the science of climate change. It's actually a debate about the bill before us, which is to indeed legislate that target. The Albanese government won the last election and have already changed our nationally determined contribution under the Paris Agreement, as uh, they're able to do as the government of the day. They've made some changes to that document that we no. took to Glasgow last year, which I also am foreshadowing um, amendments that to actually insert back in some of the um, mechanisms that we as a coalition government put in. Um, but it is actually around the concern that legislating the target will bring. And I guess from my perspective as a proud National Party senator and a regional Australian, this bill fails to take into account the impact that legislating the target will have on regional Australia. It fails to appreciate that there are some Australians, some industries, which will more disproportionately be impacted by this than others. And that has been one of the great myths and, I believe, one of the great follies of the public debate over recent years, is that somehow uh, a move towards net zero by, to, by 2050 will somehow be painless, uh, will be sweetness and light. Uh, no one will have a change to their job, no one will have uh, an impact on their earnings, and that there will be no negative impacts. In the words of Helen Haynes, there's only going to be upsides, there's only going to be benefits for rural and regional Australia. Well, the fact is, when we held the committee inquiry into this bill, fast and furious as it was, it wasn't just the National Party saying that rural and regional communities and industries were going to be disproportionately negatively impacted by this. It was the unions, it was the trade unions, one after another, acknowledging that workers in traditional industries like mining, like agriculture, like manufacturing would be significantly impacted. We also heard issues that increased lawfare. Uh, by vexatious green activists was going to, as we've seen overseas when they've legislated targets, uh, was going to occur. Similarly, in the UK, when the Friends of the Earth uh, actually took action against the Secretary uh, of State for Transport over the Heathrow Airport runway, third runway, holding up that project for an incredibly long time. In Germany, we've seen this level of lawfare because they've legislated. A whole raft of countries, which is actually outlined in the coalition's dissenting report. Uh, and that is concerning, particularly as this sort of level of public infrastructure is so essential um, for us to increase productivity and prosperity and security and safety for our citizens and our nations going uh, forward. And again, Concerningly, during the Senate inquiry, when we asked environmental activist group, 
after environmental activist group after environmental activist group legislating this target, putting it into law. You're all in favour. You want greater action on climate change. You're signing up. Does that mean then you will refuse to take this, the Albanese federal government, or any future federal government of Australia to court uh, by using this legislated target? And one after another, they all refuse to guarantee that they would not weaponise what we're doing here tonight, legislating a target that's already in you know, something we've agreed to as a country. It's already in our nationally determined contributions. Well, I assume the government's got a plan for us to get there. I haven't seen that yet. But they both have said it's neither necessary nor symbolic, and is symbolic, uh, that we're actually opening up that sovereign risk for their own government and future governments, um, thanks to green activists. We also heard about the significant impact on regional jobs and industries. Unions, industries, researchers didn't take a backward step when asked the question. Absolutely it's going to be rural and regional communities. Absolutely it's going to be agriculture, mining and manufacturing as in, um, areas of our economy that are going to be impacted. And there was a variety of um, ways that these different stakeholders uh, sought to address that impact, and I'll leave that uh, for another day. And the third issue that was raised was a lack of transparency and accountability and, and measurement of what that impact uh, would be. Lack of a roadmap uh, underpinning the target and to actually understand who was going to be negatively impacted. As the Shadow Minister for Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Development, what I was incredibly concerned about was that the bill requires uh, puts this overlay on 14 federal government agencies to assess any given project uh, on a methodology yet to be made public or understood. And when we questioned these agencies, they had no idea how they were going to do this um, and what impact it would have. And so that raises justifiable questions. Are public transport projects in major capital cities going to be prioritised over dams in central Queensland, prioritised for federal public funding over roads like the Outback Way or the Inland Rail? Probably. But they couldn't tell me. So one of the things this chamber is supposed to do is actually hold government and executive to account. And you can't do that if they don't know what they're doing. And it was very clear, all those agencies from the North Australia um, authority, Infrastructure Australia uh, and others, that the methodology hadn't been determined and they couldn't answer basic questions about how legislating this target and making their assessment decisions subject to it were going to impact the decision and who in this country, which communities were going to benefit from federal government decisions into the future. When it comes to regional jobs, throughout this debate, um, you know, industry bodies like the Business Council of Australia said, you know, we're going to get 195,000 new economy jobs to 2070. Uh, other um, research providers like the IPA say 653,600 jobs are re at risk in the regions. That's actually a negative shortfall of over 458,000 jobs. I want to see net zero impact on regional jobs, and I want that guaranteed. One mechanism to future-proof regional jobs in a future Paris pledge was to insert caveats to protect the regions, to make it transparent what the impact of these pathways to net zero were on particular people, particular industries and particular places. And that's why when our government updated the nationally determined contribution last year in Glasgow, we inserted the need for an independent socio-economic impact assessment for rural and regional Australia, something the Albanese government removed when they took power. They upped their target and took out the caveats of protection. They took out the caveats of accountability uh, for future pathways to net zero. They took away the transparency that would ensure future governments took heed not only of the benefits that will supposedly come 
with this trajectory, but also, to quote the mining council mayors, the disbenefits. These mayors uh, were very, very concerned that uh, MPs were only talking about the benefits, and indeed amendments moved in the other place only sought to assess and measure the benefits that this trajectory would bring for rural and regional Australia. Let's be honest about this. You can't just say we you know, accept the science of climate change and then not accept the reality that some people are going to be more impacted than others. Um, and they haven't been consulted, these mining mayors. The Labor Party has not gone to these Labor towns and actually had the conversation with them around the impact of legislating this target. Only the National Party had, has entered the debate on carbon emissions concerned not with the electoral impact but with the actual impact. One benefit of, of belonging to a century-old party is that we've been around long enough to understand the impacts of the decisions of previous generations in this place. We've seen it. And the brutal truth is that net zero uh, path by 2050 will have losers and winners. And it's why we were able to secure, as a first tranche of investment for our communities on that path last year, in excess of $20 billion of additional new funding into rural and regional economies to build that critical nation-building, future-focused infrastructure, to diversify cities like Gladstone, that places like the Hunter on this pathway. And we inserted that um, caveat around assessing the impact, the benefits and the disbenefits for future governments to build on that $20 billion over the next uh, 15 years. Because if you look at Europe, where uh, you know, everybody likes to take their lead uh, on action on climate change from, uh, they have significantly inputted into their regional communities hundreds of billion dollars of euros uh, over, over this time to help those communities take uh, advantage of the opportunities but also to overcome many of the challenges that are coming uh, with this pathway. But we hear precious little debate uh, about the impact of this legislation on actual people. There's a lot of self-congratulatory speeches um, and there's a lot of barely a reference to the realities that uh, world carbon emissions will continue to grow even as we do the right thing in this country and continue on a downward trajectory with our emissions profile. So, as I foreshadowed, uh, we will be moving an amendment to the bill to establish a five-yearly assessment of socio-economic impact by the Productivity Commission. That evidence is to be tabled in Parliament every five years prior to uh, future governments resetting that um, nationally determined contribution target so that they can do it with eyes wide open of who's paying the price. And if you want to know why uh, this is important, just check out Europe. It's led the way on global efforts to decarbonise its economy. Its members' countries have also been confronted with and subsequently been forced to deal with unexpected, unforeseen geopolitical, economic and indeed climate realities that have resulted in member countries pausing their ambitions for the benefit of their citizens. Individual EU member countries have recognised that protecting their own citizens must come first to ensure adequate supply of the basics, heating and reliable and affordable baseload power to, to sustain their national industries. And others, uh, through the course of this debate, have highlighted uh, what European countries, everyone from the UK to Germany, are doing in the face of unforeseen uh, so circumstances. And we must be prepared to do the same. We cannot be naive to the fact that we live where we live and some of those particularly geostrategic um, considerations that may be coming our way into the future. Our priorities have to include protecting our natural environment but also ensuring that regional jobs, regional communities and industries uh, benefit from everything a government does. We heard evidence in the inquiry that the legislation will have significant economic and social consequences including all 89 coal, gas and oil projects currently in the construction pipeline must be cancelled. 
This is a direct quote from a submission. This will come at a cost of at least $274 billion across Australia, equivalent to 14 per cent of our annual GDP—480,000 jobs. It's not ideology. It's not emotion. They're just the facts that we're all going to have to deal with. I'll let others uh, talk about the benefits of nuclear. It was great to see the AWU out in force uh, supporting zero emissions based on fuel source to keep their workers in high paid manufacturing jobs into the future and ensure we can also do our bit uh, to take down global emissions. I didn't enter politics to help rich people get richer. I actually came into politics to help the marginalised, the vulnerable and the voiceless. And a lot of them are out where I live in rural and regional Australia. They are the people who provide the Commonwealth that we too often take for granted in this place, the truck drivers, the miners, the foresters, the farmers. And as a proud national, we'll continue to stand by them, we'll continue to stand up for them and continue to hold this government to account on their behalf. Senator Cadell.